Yo Atlas speaking and welcome to part 8 of what if I was reborn in Naruto as a civilian orphan trained and became the wind calamity. As always the playlist is above and with that being said, let the tale begin. Chapter 341 While one of Fujin's clones had some success in killing, the other clone couldn't get rid of his opponents so easily and was stuck fighting. He realized the same too. He analyzed, did IWA know that I was coming here? Regardless, mid-ranged wind jutsus isn't all I can do. Suddenly, a massive amount of wind was blasted behind him. He disappeared and appeared next to a ninja in the blink of an eye and slashed his sword at his neck. The ninja immediately raised his kunai while moving backwards and leaning backwards. At the same time, his teammates attacked Fujin's clone with shurikens. The sword sliced through the kunai, but the ninja leaned back enough to avoid the sword and the wind chakra flowing along it. The clone couldn't keep attacking due to the incoming attacks. Fujin's clone used assassin's rush again and tried attacking another ninja but the ninja dodged once again while the others attacked the clone. This time, the clone hardened his body with the iron skin jutsu to block the counterattacks. At the same time, wind flowed along his blade as his sword released a wind slash along with the swing of his blade. The IWA ninjas quickly got out of the way of the slash and weaved the hand signs for the iron skin jutsu. All four of them saw their skins turning black and hard to defend against the accompanying wind slashes. However, dozens of slashes still appeared on their bodies, including a few cuts across their necks, killing them on the spot. The clone looked at them coldly. The hand signs made him realize a crucial point. He thought, they are too familiar with my fighting style. If not for Susumu's Jinjutsu, they would have managed to block all the accompanying slashes. Though the IWA ninjas thought that they had used the Jutsu, in reality, they hadn't. While Haruzen had asked him to keep the technique a secret, the current circumstances didn't allow him to hold back much. That said, it was still difficult for the bystanders to figure out why the IWA ninjas didn't use the Jutsu to defend themselves. Fujin's clone turned his eyes towards the two squads rushing towards him and analyzed, all of these guys are Jounins. Though their speed isn't as high as mine, they are able to anticipate my attacks, movements and react at the last moment to barely save themselves while the others distract me. Even though I will win eventually, I don't have the luxury of time. Once the remaining IWA ninjas rush in, I will be the one at greater risk. Fujin himself felt the same issue. Despite having more chakra than his clones and his teammates to assist, his performance wasn't much better as they were facing two elite jounins along with multiple jounins. Though he managed to kill five ninjas, he wasn't happy. He analyzed, these guys never come too close to me so that they will have sufficient time to dodge. In addition, every one of them is aiding others in defense. And all their attacks come from my blind spots. It is almost as if someone has properly studied my fighting style and trained these guys to fight most optimally against me. The only way I can overturn this situation and get a quick victory is by spamming Shadow Clone and eliminating their advantage of numbers. But, in this situation, dividing my chakra that much is suicidal. 50 clones fighting means the amount of chakra I use would be 10 times higher than what I'm currently burning. He let out a sigh and thought, it would have been so much more convenient if I was here by myself. I could just run away like I did in the Land of Wind. Unfortunately, though these three are quick, they don't share my expertise in running away. Unknowingly, Fujin fell into a similar situation as his sensei had not too long ago. But it was unknown whether he would make the same choice as his sensei or think of any other way. On the other side of the battlefield, Separated by a firestorm and a massive wall, Kitsuchi thought, I had to waste so much chakra. If it wasn't for his wind vacuum attacks, we could have just escaped underground and sneaked upon them unharmed from this attack. But I can't keep waiting. The more time I waste here, the more my men will die at Fujin's hands. I can't afford to lose so many well-trained ninjas. He suddenly increased the amount of chakra he poured into the wall. Thousands of spikes appeared on the outer surface of the wall. In an instant, all were launched at the Kanoha ninjas. The two clones saw the incoming attacks. They couldn't dodge as the attack would hit Fujin and the rest who were behind them. 
one clone slammed his hands on the ground while the other charged up his chakra. Wind release, vacuum cannon jutsu. Earth release, earth wall jutsu. A clone shot a vacuum cannon at Kitsuchi. Immediately after, a wall rose from the ground. In terms of size and majesticness, it was far less impressive when compared to the wall raised by Kitsuchi. However, it did its job by blocking the Earth's spikes moving towards Fujin and his team. At the same time, the vacuum cannon pierced through the gigantic wall and headed straight at Kitsuchi. A look of surprise appeared on Kitsuchi's face. He immediately dodged by moving underground. He thought, Rashi wasn't kidding. This kid is very dangerous. He concentrated chakra on his body. Earth release, earth instantaneous body jutsu. Kitsuchi suddenly began moving towards Fujin's squad at a fast speed from underground. Fujin's clone sensed him and immediately shot vacuum bullets into the ground. To their surprise, Kitsuchi maneuvered around and dodged all the bullets and passed from under them. The clones thought, so fast while under the ground? Even Renjiro isn't this agile under the ground. Fujin immediately sensed the massive chakra moving towards him from under the ground. A frown formed on his face as chakra gathered on his fist. Just before Kitsuchi was about to reach his location, he punched the ground with all his might. The punch instantly cracked the ground. The ground trembled as a strong shockwave moved towards Kitsuchi. The shaking caught the remaining IWA ninjas off guard and they immediately retreated momentarily in order to not give an opening to the Kanoha ninjas. Kitsuchi, who was about to launch a couple of jutsus, was shocked. He immediately hardened his skin. Due to the shockwave, he felt some impact of the punch. Sweat appeared on his face as he thought, fortunately, I used the iron skin jutsu. Otherwise, I could have been injured. Rashi didn't mention this absurd strength. Did he manage to hide some cards while fighting Rashi? Unlike Kitsuchi, Fujin didn't bother thinking much. The punch had brought him a slight breather. He immediately shot a dozen vacuum bullets at Kitsuchi. Kitsuchi immediately moved. However, the vacuum bullets fired by Fujin targeted all his escape routes as well. He could only move in one direction. By twisting his body far beyond what someone of his size should have been capable of, he barely managed to avoid the attack. The vacuum bullet grazed his left arm, leaving a slight cut despite the iron skin jutsu protecting him. Kitsuchi immediately appeared out of the ground. Before Fujin could attack, he said, Suzuki Fujin. You are very impressive for your age. Fujin's eyes widened. Seeing Kitsuchi facing them, the other IWA ninjas quickly surrounded the Kanoha ninjas in a couple of seconds. Fujin glanced and understood, looks like escaping normally is not possible. But I guess that isn't my main concern right now. Since the IWA ninjas weren't attacking, Fujin asked, how do you know my identity? And why are you targeting the civilians? Fujin had understood by now that Rashi had leaked all his combat abilities and fighting style to IWA. But he was surprised to know that IWA managed to link the Spectral Swordsman's identity to his real identity. Of course, what disturbed him the most was that they had prepared an army of Jounin specifically to counter his style of combat. Kitsuchi smirked and replied, You gave us quite a scare with your fight against Rashi. Did you think that we can't see behind your mask? Fujin watched back without replying. Kitsuchi's statement gave no information. More importantly, he was building up a massive amount of chakra. Fujin understood why the remaining IWA ninjas weren't jumping on them. Of course, Kitsuchi won't give him the answer. When a secret gets leaked, a lot of suspicions arise. If Fujin suspected a Kanoha higher up, it could decrease his loyalty to the village. Kitsuchi looked at Fujin and thought, six months of planning just to bait and trap him. It's time to deal the final blow. Six months ago, Iwavikure. Kitsuchi walked into Inoki's office and put a few files on his desk and said in a tired voice, it's too difficult to trap him, old man. Inoki looked at all the files on his desk. Every file had information on Suzuki Fujin. 
Unknown to Fujin and anyone in Kanoha, Iwabakura had begun scheming against Fujin a few weeks after his clash against Rashi. Chapter 342, Kitsuchi reported, There is very little information on Fujin. None of our spies in Kanoha have seen him in action or heard about his abilities. The only information they have is his fights during the Chunin exam three years ago. And that information is very outdated. And since he is in the Umbu, it is very difficult to track when he leaves on missions and to where. So trying to ambush him during a mission is almost impossible. We will have to lay a bait and hope Kanoha sends him over. A frown formed on Inoki's face. He said, though it is normal for ninjas to hide their skills, some information eventually leaks out. To be so secretive, Hiruzen must be scheming something. If it wasn't for sending Rashi on that mission, we would have been completely in the dark. It's an even greater reason to eliminate him now. Any news from Suna? Kitsuchi shook his head and replied, No. I wanted to get information about the ninjas who wreaked havoc there and see if that was this kid as well. However, none of our spies saw the culprits and Suna has refused to give any information regarding the culprits. Anoki chuckled and commented, It looks like they have been badly humiliated to hide it so deeply. Kitsuchi said, So our only source of information is Rashi. Anoki replied, It's fine. He should have used most of his tricks against Rashi. Just make a plan based on it. Did you decide on the location? Rashi nodded and replied, The land of waterfall. He opened a map and lay pointed at a location and said, Around a year ago, our scheme against the Ito family was suspected to be destroyed by the spectral swordsman. Two of our Umbu died while the Kawaguchi family forces were decimated. So there is a chance that he will be sent here once again. If he does, we will eliminate him and withdraw in order to avoid any retaliatory actions by Kanoha and prevent escalating the conflict. If he doesn't and Kanoha doesn't send anyone equally powerful, then I will destroy the Ito family. We use their territory as a base and change the power structure in nearby territories. So at least a third of the influential families in the land of Waterfall will be on our side. By the time Takigekir and Kanoha react, it will be too late for them to do anything. Kitsuchi further explained the details of his plan to target the civilians to create panic in the land of Waterfall. Anoki thought for a bit and nodded. He replied, It's a good plan. Both situations would be advantageous for us. The second situation will be a great diplomatic victory for us. It will offset the losses we had in the land of grass and make the situation more advantageous for us. However, if we manage to kill him, it will be another diplomatic disaster for us as the land of Waterfall will be completely pushed into Kanoha's camp just like the land of grass. But, considering his potential, it's a trade-off I'm willing to make. Kitsuchi nodded. He agreed with Anoki's decision. Someone forcing Rashi to resort to the tail beast mode and still managing to escape at the age of 14 was a huge future threat to Iwabakur. Anoki asked, have you begun the training? Kitushi nodded. He, along with Anoki, had discussed Fujin's fighting style, jutsus, their mastery and specialties extensively with Rashi and Jin. After analyzing Fujin's skills, they came up with a proper training plan to counter Fujin. Kitsuchi replied, I have selected 43 Jounins and 52 elite Chunins so far. I am still looking for around 30 more. The ninjas I have selected all have good speed and reactions. I have already begun training the ones who don't know, the Iron Skin Jutsu. The ones who know it are working on reducing the hand seals needed for the Jutsu. This Jutsu will make most of his wind and fire release Jutsus pointless against them. The only threats it leaves are the Vacuum Jutsus and getting hit by his sword directly. Anoki nodded and thought, good. I would have done the same. I could have created a plan myself, but I'm not sure how my back will be during the next war. Kitsuchi will have to be the one to lead our forces on the battlefield. This will be a good opportunity to test his tactical skills. As for leadership, he has already proven that in the previous war. As his back problems kept worsening, Anoki knew that he would need to find a successor quickly. 
Unfortunately, though Kitsuchi was strong and was considered a rank S ninja, he was no match for the other Kages. The fourth Rakage, the Sanans, and the fourth Mizukage all outmatched him by a large margin. Raza was the only one he could compete against. So Anoki was reluctant to pass that such a kitch position to him. Kitsuchi continued, the bigger problem will come next. Rashi said that Fujin could flicker continuously without making any seals. He seems to have trained his body a lot to increase his natural speed to a ridiculous level as well. And he has mastered Assassin's Rush Jutsu on top of it. In order to counter that, I want you to ask Han to aid in our training. It is impossible to increase their speed to such a level quickly. But we can raise their reaction speed and ability to defend, dodge and survive by letting Han make them experience what facing someone so fast will feel like. In fact, we could do even better. Rashi said that though Fujin was faster than him, his speed is still lesser than Han's. So after facing Han for a few months, they might be able to see and react to Fujin very easily. A smile formed on Anoki's face as he replied, All right, I will send Han over. Kitsuchi understood why Anoki smiled. He thought, this will allow Han to interact closely with our ninjas who may fear him. More importantly, after this training is done, all the elite chunins will be as strong as Jounins. We will have around 60 new Jounins who will have very high survival skills during the next war. If our luck is good, then a couple of Jounins could also reach the elite Jounin level. Kitsuchi added, I also need a few Injutsu Grandmaster to trap Fujin. I will send a few squads over to scout the land of Waterfall and create a proper plan of action. Anoki nodded and assigned one of the three few Injutsu Grandmasters to aid Kitsuchi. The two discussed a few more details before Anoki said, Good work. I will leave this matter to you. Kitsuchi nodded and took his leave. Anoki looked at his back and thought, since the time of peace started, the readiness of our ninjas has dropped several levels. Especially after Minato died and Kanoha became weaker. This is a good opportunity to start rebuilding our famed elite armies. Once this mission is completed and the ninjas have high motivation, I will push Kitsuchi to expand the numbers of this force to 500 ninjas. At the same time, I will start rebuilding the thousand ninja elite army units that we are famed for. With the third rakage and the fourth Hokage no longer alive, we won't suffer similar losses as in the last great war. Once the armies are raised, the only thing missing will be commanders. I, Rashi, Han and Kitsuchi could handle the next war. But we will need the next generation to step up for the wars after that. Thankfully, this generation does have some promising youngsters. Akatsuchi has shown a lot of promise. So has my granddaughter. There is also the Daidara kid who has the explosion release Kekiai Jinkai. If these three reach the S rank, then IWA will be safe for another 50 years. After Kitsuchi left, he selected more suitable ninjas and began the training with full intensity. For three months straight, the ninjas trained with a plan tailored to counter Fujin. Every single ninja became capable of using the iron skin jutsu rapidly and had sufficient defenses to defend against normal wind jutsus. At the same time, Han used his speed in order to give the ninjas a taste of what a fight against Fujin would be like. The initial phase of that training resulted in a lot of pain for the ninjas as they couldn't even see Han move. However, after three months of being beaten daily, the reactions of the ninjas improved several times they could finally protect themselves from Han's attacks. As an added bonus, the beatings also motivated them to learn the Iron Skin Jutsu better. A few ninjas managed to learn how to use that Jutsu without any hand seals. Three months later, Kitsuchi left for the Land of Waterfall along with the ninjas who were adequately prepared in his opinion. The remaining ninjas continued their training and joined his campaign at a later stage. Chapter 343 after entering the land of Waterfall, Kitsuchi kept a major chunk of the ninjas he trained with himself and distributed the remaining along with more IWA ninjas around the Ito family's territory. They immediately began their plan of creating unrest in the territory by kidnapping civilians. At the same time, Kitsuchi summoned his best spy. Sho appeared in front of him and asked, What are your commands for me, Kitsuchi-sama? Kitsuchi said, 
I want you to infiltrate the Ito family's main town. Keep an eye on the ninjas coming in and out of the town. Sho nodded and asked, All right. Is there anything, in particular, I should keep track of? Kitsuchi nodded and answered, Yes. I'm looking for a Kanoha ninja named Suzuki Fujin. Kitsuchi showed Fujin's appearance from the bingo book and added, He is now in the umbu and generally wears hawk or turtle masks. The last time he moved, his teammates were a blonde Yamanaka ninja, a long purple-haired Kunoichi who uses a sword, both likely in their early twenties. And the last member was probably around the same age as Fujin. If a squad that is similar in appearance shows up, then you have to inform me right away. Kitsuchi handed him forty seals of five types. The seals were specifically made by the Fuinjutsu Grandmaster sent by Anoki to assist Kitsuchi. He picked up the first seal and said, If you recognize Fujin's squad, then crush the seal. I will understand the message. He pointed at the other four seals and said, This seal is if an elite Jounin from Kanoha arrives instead. This seal is for any other Kanoha squads. And the last seal is for considerable reinforcements being sent by Taki Gekir. Like at least more than twenty ninjas. And the last seal is to inform us about when Kanoha's squad quit their mission and leave. Are the instructions clear? Sho took the seals and said, I will do my best, Kitsuchi-sama. Kitsuchi smiled and said, Good luck. Don't engage in any battles with them though. We won't be able to provide much aid. Sho nodded and took his leave. A few days later, he entered the Ito family town under disguise. Around a week after entering, Sho convinced that servant to work for him. When the previous Umbu squad from Kanoha arrived, he quickly crushed the appropriate seal to inform Kitsuchi. When the Umbu squad went to investigate the villages with the missing population, Kitsuchi checked them and confirmed that they weren't Fujin's squad. Due to the seals, the Umbu squad never suspected anyone spying on them while they were inspecting the village. Kitsuchi waited patiently for a month until the Kanoha Umbu retreated and began the attacks after they left to force Kanoha to send an even stronger squad. Luckily for him, Fujin's squad was the next one to be sent. When Sho learned about the appearance of Fujin's squad, he immediately crushed the seal to inform Kitsuchi. As soon as he received the message, Kitsuchi was thrilled. His six-month-long effort and patience were finally rewarded. He cooperated with the Fuinjutsu Grandmaster to create the perfect trap for him. He redistributed his forces, calling back the majority of the ninjas that he had trained to counter Fujin. Once the distribution was done, they did multiple attacks at the same time to force the Ito family to split up their forces so that Fujin's squad would have little to no reinforcements and thus prevent any unforeseen circumstances from occurring. When Fujin reached the village with just his squad, his tactic succeeded. The only part of the plan that didn't succeed was that Fujin didn't step into the village. Kitsuchi didn't manage to find out about Fujin's expertise in Fuinjutsu and thus revealed a flaw at the last step. Despite that, Fujin was in a very bad position in Kitsuchi's eyes. So his plan could be considered a complete success. As he continued building up his chakra, Kitsuchi said, Surrender. Otherwise, you and your teammates will have no means of survival. Yugao, Fumito, and Bunjiro became very tense. However, to Kitsuchi's surprise, Fujin chuckled and said, I recall Rashi saying something similar. Still, what a good scheme! Formation 66 As soon as they heard that, Chakra gathered at the feet of the four Kanoha Umbu and Fujin's clones. All jumped high into the air. Almost instantly, Kitsuchi slammed his hands on the ground. Earth Release, Opening Earth Rising Excavation Jutsu A large mound appeared under the Kanoha ninjas and a huge blast of force was released at them. Fujin looked down at the attack and thought, I thought that this attack could only be used to target the ones hiding underground. To think that he would use this against us. If we were hit directly, even I might have been blown apart even if I used Iron Skin Jutsu. Fortunately, Kitsuchi couldn't hide the high amount of chakra built up for this jutsu, giving Fujin plenty of time to plan a counterattack. Fujin's clones all made the same hand seal. At the same time, 
wind moved blasted around their bodies and helped them move in such that they were vertically above each other with the four Kanoa ninjas at the top. Immediately, four layers of barrier appeared. A frown formed on Kitsuchi's face as he noticed the barrier. The frown became worse as he noticed a large amount of chakra Fujin was building up. He thought, such proficiency with the barrier. But it won't help him much in this situation. All barriers can be destroyed. He will eventually run out of chakra. The bigger issue is the chakra he is building up. What is he planning? The blast force due to Kitsuchi's jutsu hit the first barrier. It crumbled instantly. The clone dispelled itself before the attack hit him. The second barrier endured the impact for a couple of seconds before crumbling as well. The second clone dispelled itself as well. Finally, the attack hit the third barrier. Multiple cracks appeared on the barrier but it held on. Seeing that Kitsuchi's attack was stopped, the remaining IWA ninjas weaved hand signs. Earth Release, Stone Pistol Jutsu All the IWA ninjas shot small stones at the barrier. As they traveled up in the air, their size increased until they could be considered boulders. However, Fujin wasn't concerned about the attack. He bit his thumb and thought, it was great that I didn't expose this against Rashi. Otherwise, I'm afraid that Inoki might have shown up to kill me. Summoning Jutsu Just like how Kitsuchi patiently waited for Fujin, Fujin had been patiently hiding his trump cards as well. Very few knew about his summon or his mastery of Fuin Jutsu and barriers. Not a single person was aware that he could use lightning jutsus. Those were the trump cards he saved when a day like this arrived. The summoning jutsu directly consumed nearly 35% of Fujin's chakra. The stone shot by the IWA ninjas crashed into the third barrier and crushed it as well, but the clone safely moved above the last barrier. Despite there being only one more barrier, the IWA ninjas didn't rejoice. A loud jagged roar was heard throughout the region for multiple kilometers. A massive silhouette of a winged saber-tooth appeared above the large barrier. He spread his wings wide and stared at the IWA ninjas below as the Kanoha ninjas landed on his back. The IWA ninjas gulped as they felt a menacing stare. Kitsuchi was shocked. He thought, what the hell? He has a flying summon? Up in the sky, the beast said grumpily, took you three long years to summon me? Fujin chuckled and said, Kiragain, everyone below is an enemy. So feel free to go on a rampage. But be careful. They spit out rocks at a high speed. Kiragain said, all right. I had always heard about how humans are very innovative and skillful. I hope they live up to it. Fujin smirked. All three of Ryo's children were unique. The youngest, Goro, had a mischievous personality and loved pranking and having fun. The middle one, Kaido, loved flying and spent most of his time sailing over the vast world. And his oldest, Kuragain, was a battle maniac. He regularly sought strong foes and entered into bloody duels or wars. It was the reason why his body was covered in fearsome scars. Kitsuchi thought, shit, my plan didn't consider his ability to fly. If he decides to fly away, there isn't much I can do. Kitsuchi's expression became very ugly. Fujin had rarely shown his summon to anyone. So even in Kanoha, very few knew what his summon was. In fact, even Renjiro, Hoka, and Teru, the three people closest to him didn't know what his summon was. So there was no way for IWA to get this information. Despite the unfavorable circumstances, some hope appeared in Kitsuchi's eyes. He analyzed, I expected him to fly away with the help of his summon. But surprisingly, they are hovering in the same area. If he decides to stay and fight, I might have some opportunity but it is still very low. An opponent who could fly and attack from a range was very annoying to deal with. But Kitsuchi had trained the ninjas in survival. So he had some confidence in fighting against Fujin. As he planned his counterattack, the last barrier disappeared and the two clones began falling to the ground. At the same time, nature chakra gathered in Kuragain's wings as he flapped them. A very strong windstorm, multiple times stronger than Fujin's infinite breakthrough jutsu, 
was released towards the ground. Kuragain perfectly controlled the wind so that they wouldn't hit the two clones. As soon as the winds passed the clones, they got in action as well. Fire release, searing migraine jutsu. Both exhaled a massive amount of fire into those strong winds. IWA ninjas looked up as hellfire rained down on them. Chapter 344 A squad of four Takigakir ninjas were rushing towards the Ito family's town. One said, Captain, what do you think is happening in this territory? It's been nearly four months since the first missing case was reported. And despite sending so many ninjas, they have still failed. The captain of the squad replied, It's difficult to say. The situation is very serious and peculiar. If the Ito family doesn't resolve this soon, then they might be overthrown. The ninja was surprised. He asked, Is it that serious? After all, only some civilians went missing. The captain answered, That is why no serious action has been taken until now. However, as the number of missing cases keeps rising, everyone will become very serious. After all, what's the use of a ninja village if it can't protect its citizens? Everyone will begin migrating to other countries. So it is a critical period for the Ito fam. He suddenly stopped speaking. All four ninjas stared in the western direction. Their eyes opened wide and their throats dried as they saw a massive firestorm raining down from the skies. One of the ninjas bulked and muttered in terror, What the hell is happening there? Another gulped and commented, This, this looks like Armageddon. The captain said, I don't know. But we need to get away and go to the town very quickly. If something like this falls on the town, the entire town will be destroyed. They immediately ran away. Unlike them, IWA ninjas didn't have the option to run away. Kitsuchi rapidly made hand seals and shouted, Take cover. Hearing his command, every IWA ninja who wasn't close to him went underground. Kitsuchi slammed his palms on the ground. A gigantic dome rose from the ground and covered him and the ninjas around him. The firestorm finally impacted the ground. In an instant, all vegetation in the vicinity was destroyed. The fire spread in the surrounding areas and soon a massive forest fire would spread in the land of Waterfall. The sharp winds released by Kuragain impacted the ground and the dome. The dome and the ground were instantly covered in long scars. However, the dome held on and the sharp winds couldn't dig into the ground. The attack, which the Taki ninjas believed would destroy an entire town, ended up not injuring even a single IWA ninja. Fujin observed from the sky, normally, digging into the ground against me is suicide. But everyone who went underground is at least 40 meters deep into the ground. I can't penetrate that deep. They know how deep my attacks can penetrate. Sigh, this is why I like keeping my abilities a secret. Fighting is infinitely easier when the enemy doesn't know what to expect from me. Still, though hiding deep underground counters me to an extent, they are trapped there as I can attack when they try to come up. Unfortunately, there was no way for Fujin to hide his exposed secrets once again. In fact, after this battle, even more of his secrets would be exposed. Iwabakur might even spread them around, so even the other hidden villages might become aware of his capabilities. While Fujin was observing, Kuragain said, Killing them won't be easy. Fujin, support me. Fujin didn't need to be told twice. He immediately riled his chakra up and said, My clones will provide you with ground support. Take advantage of the openings. Fujin's clones landed on the ground. At the same time, Fujin shot a vacuum cannon at the top of the dome Kitsuchi had created. At the same time, Kuragain opened his mouth and exhaled wind breath at the same spot. Within the dome, some sensors said, They are attacking the dome from the top. Be ready to defend yours. Before they completed saying, the vacuum cannon hit the top of the dome. It penetrated the dome with ease, leaving a gigantic hole. Kitsuchi, who was standing at the center of the dome, immediately moved out of the way while hardening his body. He weaved a hand seal. Earth release, fist rock jutsu. The vacuum cannon hit the ground and created a 25-meter deep hole in the ground. Mere fractions of a second later, 
Kuragain's wind breath arrived at the opening created by the vacuum cannon. At the same time, Kastucci's right arm turned into rock and he punched towards the hole, aiming to block the opening. He shouted, Be careful. We don't know what that summon can do. The ninjas nodded and all instinctively hardened their bodies with the iron skin jutsu as well. They didn't want to escape underground as they knew that coming back up and joining the battle would be a challenge. Kuragain's wind breath, which traveled like a beam, suddenly dispersed into all directions, filling up the inside of the dome. A second later, Kitsuchi's rock fist hit the hole and blocked the attack. Seeing the winds, most IWA ninjas quickly used more defensive jutsus. Numerous walls of varied shapes appeared in the dome. However, three ninjas were slower by a few milliseconds. The wind breath hit them. Despite being covered by the iron skin jutsu, hundreds of small cuts appeared on their bodies. Blood began sprinkling from their bodies like a fountain. The surrounding IWA ninjas watched in horror as their bodies were turned into minced meat in mere seconds. At the same time, Kitsuchi's rock fist was rapidly being eroded. He thought in shock, such terrifying affinity to the wind nature. And the ability to fly. Shit, he will be a menace in the next war. Probably only the old man Anoki and the two Jinchurikis can force him to retreat. The IWA ninjas didn't have any time to grieve for their fallen comrades. They sensed the dome getting damaged. Thanks to their long training, they all knew what was coming. At the next moment, 36 newer and smaller holes appeared in the dome as Fujin and his two clones shot a dozen vacuum bullets each at the dome. The IWA ninjas quickly took evasive actions. Thanks to being exposed to Han's blinding speed, they were all able to dodge the attacks despite the low distance between them. At the same time, Kitsuchi weaved more hand seals and slammed his hands on the ground. The dome began transforming into spears. In a second, hundreds of pointed earth spears were launched in all directions at a very high speed. Fujin's clones immediately raised an earth wall to protect themselves. Despite being a couple of hundred meters above in the sky, Kuragain was under attack as well. He immediately flapped his wings again. Hundreds of wind blades were launched from his wings. They hit the incoming spears and knocked them back to the ground. A few continued down towards the Awabakir ninjas who quickly moved out of the way, allowing the wind blades to hit the ground without harming anyone and raising a dust cover. A frown formed on Fujin's face as he analyzed, This is getting annoying. Why does everyone have to be so nimble and evasive? Though Fujin had fought against enemies while being outnumbered vastly, he had never been troubled so much by them. In most cases, he could use the weaker ninjas to create a handicap for the truly strong enemy ninjas. The losses would instantly make their hearts bleed and make them reluctant to continue the fight. For the first time, he truly had to experience what it was like to be outnumbered helplessly. He turned his eyes towards the ninjas hiding underground and thought, even them. Instead of coming up to the surface, they are staying that deep and moving towards the village. Once they enter the barrier, I might not be able to harm them. Kitsuchi had established strict protocols and procedures to be followed while fighting Fujin in order to keep his losses to a minimum. Anyone who escaped underground had to retreat back to the village and then rejoin the battle instead of coming up normally. Though it would take more time, it was better than dying needlessly in Kitsuchi's opinion. Fujin observed the situation while analyzing, what should I do? I knew that killing Kitsuchi wouldn't be possible, but I wanted to eliminate these ninjas that were specially trained to deal with me. But, is there any point in doing so if it is so difficult? After all, Kuragain's summoning has a time limit. And I can't sustain my chakra for a very long time either. As Fujin was planning, his clones moved towards the IWA ninjas who were with Kitsuchi. Sensing an opportunity, Kuragain dived down. Fujin quickly ate a soldier pill and said, Kuragain, focus on safety first. It's fine if we can't kill many, but ensure that you can fly us away from here. He quickly instructed his teammates, if you see an opportunity, use your long-range jutsus, especially your lightning-release fumito, to kill or injure them. But don't fall off Kuragain. It will be very difficult to save you if you do. 
Fujin's teammates ate the soldier pills as well and nodded. They all knew that survival would be impossible if they were to fall off. Kitsuchi saw Kuragane dive down and thought, finally, I can have an opportunity. But if he is diving towards us, he must be very confident in his close-range fighting abilities. The long-range battle would soon end and instead, a mid- and close-range battle would begin. Chapter 345 Fujin's clones approached the IWA ninjas from opposite directions. Wind chakra flowed through both their swords and at the same time, they puffed up their cheeks, preparing the vacuum bullets. The two elite jounins immediately phased each clone. Though this was the first time Fujin and Kuragane were fighting together, both had practiced several times. He knew what the clones were about to do. He quickly closed in on the IWA ninjas from the top while gathering wind energy in his mouth. At the same time, Fujin created another shadow clone. The clone looked towards the village with the missing people. Wind release, instantaneous body jutsu. He disappeared from Kuragane's back and appeared right on top of the IWA ninjas who were traveling towards the village through the underground. At the same moment, the two shadow clones swung their swords, releasing two long wind slashes along with accompanying winds, sandwiching the IWA ninjas between them. The elite Jounins slammed their hands on the ground and shouted, their cheeks are puffed. Keep an eye out for the vacuum bullets. The wind slashes hit the walls, leaving a large scar at their centers, but the wall withstood the attacks. A second later, dozens of vacuum bullets pierced through the walls. At the same time, Kuragain opened his mouth wide. Kitsuchi's eyes widened as he noticed eight spheres of wind in Kuragain's large mouth. Kitsuchi shouted, Keep an eye on this guy as well. In an instant, he fired them at the IWA ninjas who were dodging the vacuum bullet. Kitsuchi had a very ugly expression. Though Fujin was frustrated by the IWA ninja's consistency in dodging his deadly attacks, Kitsuchi was equally frustrated with Fujin's tactics, if not more. He rapidly weaved hand signs as he thought, first those deadly vacuum jutsus. And now a three-directional attack. My ninjas are barely even able to dodge the vacuum bullets by paying full attention to him. But now, not only do they have to dodge attacks from the front, but they also have to keep an eye on their back while also keeping an eye on the skies. Not to mention, just like his vacuum jutsus, the perverse attack of his summon also cuts through iron skin jutsu. The attack from multiple directions finally made the IWA ninjas struggle. They dodged the vacuum bullets coming from the front and quickly twisted their necks to look at the attacks coming from behind. Fortunately, they could sense Fujin's vacuum bullets and Kuragain's air bullets moving rapidly through their chakra fields. Unfortunately, they had very little time and space to maneuver their bodies. They moved their bodies in a manner that allowed them to save their vitals and avoid any lethal injuries. A few vacuum bullets grazed past the hardened arms and legs of the IWA ninjas, leaving a few deep scars. However, to make matters worse, the large air bullets fired by Kuragain maneuvered as well and targeted eight IWA ninjas. In the nick of time, eight inclined walls appeared from the ground, providing a cover for those ninjas. Unfortunately, Kitsuchi couldn't accurately calculate the directions in which they would dodge nor was he aware that the air bullets could maneuver in the air. He ended up miscalculating for two ninjas, both of whom were engulfed by the air bullets. The ninjas could only hope that their iron skin jutsus protected them. Though the winged sabertooths called the attack as air bullets, that was only due to their large size. In terms of size, they were thrice as large as Fujin's vacuum cannon. Despite their comrades being hit, the IWA ninjas, who weren't under attack, ignored it and counterattacked. Six ninjas each, led by an elite Jounin, rushed to intercept the two shadow clones. The remaining shot stone pellet jutsu at Kuragain who had come much closer to the ground. Only Kitsuchi kept an eye on the two ninjas that were hit, as his eyes turned red. On Kuragain's back, Yugao and Bunjiro immediately used defensive jutsus while Kuragain flew out of the way. The IWA ninjas continued their attack but were met by Fumito and Fujin's counterattack. Fujin shot vacuum bullets at the IWA ninjas through the incoming stone pellets while Bunjiro weaved hand signs. Lightning release, 
false darkness jutsu. He launched multiple spears of lightning, forcing some of the IWA ninjas to dodge. However, he controlled the jutsu and chased after the IWA ninjas, forcing them to use a few defensive jutsus while evading. Meanwhile, Kitsuchi was surprised. He looked at the two ninjas who were hit by Kuragain's attack. Despite taking the full hit, only a few scars appeared on their hardened skin. He thought, so this attack isn't as powerful as the previous one? I was afraid that they would be shredded into pieces as well. He turned his attention towards Kuragain who was still being attacked and analyzed, so far I have seen three attacks from him. The first one is where he flaps his wings and generates a windstorm. Though that attack is strong, it can't break through our wall defenses. Though considering their momentum, they might still harm us despite the iron skin jutsu. The second is the beam he shot earlier. It gets stopped by walls as well, but iron skin jutsu doesn't protect against it. And the giant balls of wind look to be his weakest attack. Kitsuchi looked at Fujin on Kurigane's back and thought, though killing him right now is very difficult, I should collect all the information I can about him. It will be useful if we plan another trap or if he makes a move against IWA in the future. Kurigane also noticed that the IWA ninjas weren't harmed badly by the attack. He analyzed, these guys have a tough body. It's almost similar to those tortoises in the northern lakes. Unfortunately, I haven't yet completely mastered infusing nature energy into the air bullets like I can with the wind breath. And the amount we can infuse in the windstorm created by flapping wings is very low. It looks like wind breath will be the only method I can kill them with. But, it takes a lot of chakra and nature energy. I can concentrate that much nature energy into that attack only three more times. Closer to the village, Fujin's shadow clone placed his palms on the ground. He converted 80% of his chakra to supercharge his jutsu. Wind release, geyser creation jutsu. Numerous cracks appeared around the clone, forming a web-like appearance. The cracks spread up to 50 meters under the ground. The IWA ninjas, who were traveling underground, were surprised by the sudden change. They all instinctively used iron skin jutsu to protect themselves. A second later, sharp winds ran through all the cracks, hitting the IWA ninjas. As they endured the sharp hits, they thought, thankfully we mastered this jutsu. Otherwise, all of us might have died. None of them had expected to be endangered despite staying so deep underground. Fujin's clone took a few heavy breaths as his chakra became very low. He thought, time to end this. On the other side of the battlefield, Kuragain once again shot multiple air bullets at the IWA ninjas. He followed it up by flapping his wings and launching a windstorm at the IWA ninjas. Kitsuchi ignored the bullets as they didn't pose many challenges and could be dodged. He slammed his hands on the ground. Multiple rocks of large size were launched into the air, blocking the way of the sharp wind slashes within the windstorm. The wind slashes hit the rocks and sent them flying towards the IWA ninjas. However, the rocks neutralized their sharpness and eliminated their threat towards the IWA ninjas. Though the rocks were still coming at them, they were far easier to dodge than the unpredictable wind slashes in the windstorm. However, Kuragain didn't mind this result. Seeing that all the IWA ninjas other than Kitsuchi were focused on dodging the rocks, he immediately sped up and appeared right on top of him. He raised his massive front foot. In an instant, a massive amount of wind chakra gathered, engulfing his leg. Kitsuchi's eyes widened as he noticed wind chakra gathering on his paw. He immediately weaved a hand seal. Earth release, rock fist jutsu. His right arm was covered by rocks which kept increasing its size. He moved backwards as he punched towards the incoming paw. The paw and the rock fist clashed. In an instant, Kitsuchi was dragged backwards due to the force of the paw. The rock first kept crumbling at the point of impact. Kitsuchi thought, such physical might. Thankfully I moved backwards. Otherwise, I could have been crushed under this enormous paw. Kuragain's paw almost entirely crushed the rock fist. Knowing that he couldn't hold on, Kitsuchi flickered backwards. 
However, his eyes widened as he saw a figure flicker even faster towards him. Noticing the opportunity, Fujin flickered towards Katsuchi, his sword overflowing with wind chakra. Chapter 346 Under the Ground the IWA ninjas were hit by extremely sharp winds. Despite their defenses, a few cracks appeared on their hardened skin. Wanting to take advantage of the momentary distraction, Fujin's clone entered the ground. However, the IWA ninjas were aware of the danger they would face if Fujin's clone got close to them. A few ninjas immediately sensed the clone's location and weaved hand signs. Earth Release, Spear Trap Jutsu in an instant, the surface walls of the entire crack that Fujin's clone was traveling through began transforming. Hundreds of spears appeared from both walls, leaving no space for a normal-sized person to move through. In addition, the walls themselves began moving closer to each other. The clone frowned and immediately hardened his skin using the iron skin jutsu. He thought, I wanted to go closer and try using vacuum jutsus underground. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like I can do that. My main body calculated correctly. That is why I was given so little chakra. Dozens of spears hit his hardened body and were stopped. But Fujin's clone wouldn't be able to travel normally. He weaved a hand seal and thought, oh well. Time to do what I was created for. A thousand explosion tags appeared around him. A breeze appeared carrying the explosion tags into all the cracks created by the geyser creation jutsu. Some also flew where the Awabakure ninjas were. Their eyes widened. Without the need for any command, everyone took evasive actions focusing just on their own survival. Kitsuchi saw Fujin flicker towards him and noticed his sword as well. Rock engulfed his right arm once again as he sent a punch at Fujin. The remaining IWA ninjas, other than the ones engaged by the clones, also noticed the attack and immediately sprung into action. Fujin observed the incoming rock fist, sidestepped it and shot a vacuum bullet at Kitsuchi. Kitsuchi barely managed to move to his right to dodge the attack. Fujin used that time to move around the rock fist and appeared on Kitsuchi's left. Kitsuchi's left arm also started transforming into rock, but he frowned and thought, shit, there is not enough time. He immediately used Iron Skin Jutsu to cover his body. Suddenly, two IWA ninjas appeared next to Fujin, attracting his attention. At the same time, the remaining IWA ninjas also launched Jutsus at Kurigane and Fujin. Fujin observed some lightning sparks on their bodies and thought, Lightning Transformation Jutsu. I will only get one attack. He immediately puffed his cheeks, preparing a few vacuum bullets and ignored the two ninjas who appeared using the lightning jutsu and slashed his sword at Kitsuchi. The two IWA jounins slashed their kunai at Fujin. However, before they could hit him, two large air bullets shot by Kurigane hit them at point blank. Since they were using enhancement from lightning jutsus to enhance their speed, neither could use the iron skin jutsu. Numerous cuts appeared on both their bodies as both were sent flying to their deaths. The threat to Fujin was temporarily alleviated. At the same time, Yugao, Fumito, and Bunjiro used defensive jutsus to protect Kurigane from the incoming attacks. Kurigane flapped his wings as well and generated additional winds to knock off some of the attacks. However, due to being attacked by over 30 ninjas, their defenses were easily overwhelmed. Fujin slashed his sword horizontally at Kitsuchi who kept moving backwards but wasn't in a position to dodge. He tried blocking with the rock fist on his left arm. However, Fujin cut through the partially formed rock fist and his sword landed on Kitsuchi's chest. The IWA ninjas watched with their eyes widened as a long cut appeared on Kitsuchi's hardened chest. Kitsuchi gritted his teeth and endured the pain. He thought, this attack won't kill me but if he uses vacuum bullets from such close range. Until now, IWA ninjas took advantage of their large numbers and specialized training. They didn't provide Fujin or his clones with any opportunity to focus on and overwhelm a single ninja and ensured that they aided each other to reduce his danger. However, at such close range, Kitsuchi wouldn't be able to dodge a dozen or more vacuum bullets even if he saw them. Fortunately for Kitsuchi, Fujin disappeared from his spot, 
leaving behind an afterimage. As soon as he disappeared, multiple stone pellets pierced through the afterimage. Fujin appeared on top of Kurigane and shot the vacuum bullets at the Jutsus launched at Kurigane. The vacuum bullets pierced through stone pellets, spears and other Jutsus that they hadn't managed to defend against, successfully stopping them. As soon as he felt Fujin on his back, Kurigane flew up in the sky once again and muttered, They are good. Those attacks would have injured me to an extent. Fujin replied, Yeah. Be careful. He thought, Though I could have landed a fatal blow on Kitsuchi, I would have been hit as well. Though I might have been able to defend against, if Kurigane got injured and was forced to return, then these three would have been goners. Kitsuchi also looked at Fujin who had gone back into the sky. He stopped using his iron skin jutsu. A sword slash was visible cutting across his chest. He felt a lot of pain in his ribcage. One of the IWA Jounins, who could use medical ninjutsu, flickered next to him and said, I will heal you. However, Kitsuchi replied, No need. I can still fight. Look out for attacks for now. He looked at Fujin and thought he could have landed a deadly attack on me. Even if I had survived, the injuries could have permanently decreased my capabilities. Fortunately, he wanted to save his teammates and his summon. It looks like he isn't as heartless as Jin thought. Had he been like Danzo, he would have accepted the loss of three Umbu ninjas for the chance of killing or maiming me. Kanoha would have heavily benefited as a result. Fujin, of course, knew that. However, he didn't see the point of doing that. He thought, sacrificing my teammates to kill Kitsuchi would have been more beneficial for the village from the point of view of other ninjas. But, I know that the next great war won't be fought between the villages. So I have no benefit to gain from killing or maiming him. Unlike Suna, IWA won't be going to war against Kanoha. Instead, we would lose a capable commander. And the drawbacks could be worse. After all, Raidenoki only wants me dead due to my potential. But if I kill his son-in-law, then it would be personal. Though I could run away from him, it's better to not have a needless headache. That is why I didn't try to hack his arm and instead just cut through the rock fist to leave a scar on his body. This should be enough to force a Wagakure to think multiple times before trying to pull off another stunt like this. They would be far less likely to send someone like Kitsuchi after me if it meant that they could lose them. As for Anoki and the two Jinchurikis, they won't move so easily. His eyes turned towards the village as he thought, regardless, it should be about time. At the very next moment, a loud explosion rocked the entire place. The ground trembled, forcing the IWA ninjas to turn their attention towards the source of the explosion. Fujin's clones, his teammates and Kurigane were surprised as well. However, the clones instantly received the memories and noticed an opportunity. For the first time since their clash began, the IWA ninjas weren't focused entirely on them. They wasted no time in shooting multiple vacuum bullets. The elite Jounins immediately noticed and shouted, Pay attention. They got out of the way and counterattacked. Unfortunately, the short distraction was all Fujin's clones needed. Despite their quick reflexes, one clone managed to kill four and the other managed to kill three Jounins. Both clones were very low on chakra due to the intense combat. They didn't even attempt dodging the counterattacks and were dispelled. At the same time, Fujin built up his chakra and instructed, Kurigane, fly over there. You three support me. The trio understood Fujin's intentions. Wind release, infinite breakthrough jutsu. Fire release, great fireball jutsu. Wind release, air bullets jutsu. Wind release, wind dragon jutsu. Fujin exhaled strong and sharp winds at the IWA ninjas below him. Yugao launched the fireball and the winds he generated, turning the windstorm into a firestorm. Bunjiro and Fumito added more attacks into the wind to make life difficult for the IWA ninjas. The lethal combination attack forced the Iwabakure ninjas to use defensive moves. At the same time, they were on their guard. They had just seen seven of their comrades die because they dropped their guard for a second. They didn't want to fall prey to Fujin's vacuum bullets again. However, 
their eyes soon widened. Instead of sensing Fujin's attacks, they sensed him moving away at a rapid speed. Kiragain flew towards the area where the blast had taken place and reached it in a few seconds. Kitsuchi understood Fujin's intentions and had an ugly expression. Chapter 347 Kitsuchi had an ugly expression as he sensed where Fujin was heading. He thought, there are at least forty ninjas there. We can't lose them all. He looked at the storm that was obstructing them and commanded loudly, we will move underground and chase them. If they return to attack us, we will escape deeper and move towards the village. If they don't, then we will return to the surface after getting out of range of the storm and chase. Immediately, all the IWA ninjas followed him. Despite his quick thinking, Kitsuchi was much slower than Kiragain who reached the location in merely a couple of seconds. Fujin looked down and sensed, oh, there are forty-four trapped here due to the explosion. But they won't be trapped for long. In fact, thirteen have already escaped even deeper and are moving towards the village. The simultaneous explosion from one thousand explosion tags had blown up the ground and transformed it into the soil. More than sixty percent of this soil was blown into the air while the remaining stayed in the depression that the explosion created, burying the IWA ninjas within. However, thanks to iron skin jutsu and using the ground itself as cover, none of the IWA ninjas were critically injured. And despite being buried, they weren't in any danger. They just needed slightly extra time to move through the soft soil. But, in high-speed intense combat, time was a luxury. Without wasting any time, Kiragain once again infused a massive amount of sage chakra in his breath and shot a beam towards the location where he sensed the maximum number of IWA ninjas. Fujin was even faster. He shot a dozen vacuum bullets where the soil cover was the thinnest. Since more than half the soil was blown away, the defense provided was reduced by more than 50%. In addition, the loose soil provided far lesser resistance than hard ground. Fujin's teammates just stayed alert, prepared to defend in case they were attacked. They didn't have any jutsus to pierce that deeply into the ground despite the weakened defenses. The vacuum bullets pierced into the soil. Kiragain's wind breath also hit the soil and moved straight through it, pushing the soil out of its way and creating a large hole. The IWA ninjas sensed Fujin's and Kiragain's attacks and tried to move. However, they couldn't move as freely under the ground as they could above it. Of the twelve vacuum bullets, seven pierced into the hearts of the IWA ninjas. The remaining five ninjas managed to avoid taking a fatal blow but were still left with a hole in their body. The wind breath directly hit five IWA ninjas that were in the path. All five were obliterated on the spot. Fujin created another dozen vacuum bullets and shot them at the five injured IWA ninjas and another seven ninjas who were escaping. He thought, finally some easy kills. I was so sick of them dodging every attack. Meanwhile, Kiragain changed the direction of the beam towards the IWA ninjas in the vicinity. He managed to kill another three when he and all the Kanoha ninjas looked to their right, towards the village. A strange bird made of rocks flew from inside the barrier and moved towards Kiragain. The Kanoha ninjas and Kiragain were shocked. Fujin immediately made a hand seal while Kiragain flapped his wings and began soaring into the sky. Fumito muttered, Such high chakra! The rocky bird tried to give chase but was too slow. As soon as the distance began growing larger, the rocky bird pointed its wingtips towards Kiragain and began glowing. In the next moment, it exploded. Fujin immediately pointed his hand forward. A barrier appeared under them, shielding Kiragain. Thanks to their quick response, the distance was quite large. Despite the massive explosion, only a small impact was felt on the barrier. But Fujin didn't let his guard down and kept pouring more chakra into the barrier. As he expected, two rock spears crashed into the barrier at tremendous speed. They were the rock spears inside the rocky bird's wings which it had pointed at Kiragain before detonating. They created multiple cracks in the barrier before losing their power and crumbling into the soil as they fell to the ground. The Kanoha ninjas were finally relieved as Kiragain continued rising in the air. Bunjiro looked towards the village below and asked in shock, what was that? 
Fujim replied, explosion release Kekiai Jinkai. He wondered, that didn't seem like Daidara. Besides, he should be younger than me by a year. It looks like there are others with this Kekiai Jinkai and IWA. But who and how strong is the one hiding inside the barrier? The intensity of the chakra in the jutsu had surprised Fujin. His first thought was that the attacker might be as strong as Katsuchi. His eyes glowed as he observed the village but wasn't able to gather anything. He asked, Kurigain, can you sense anything inside that barrier? Kurigain tried sensing using nature's energy. However, he shook his head as well and said, No. I can't sense anything. I didn't even notice that barrier earlier. What do you want to do? Fujin calculated, I still don't know who is inside the village. Considering that they didn't come out to help, I assume that they aren't strong or confident enough to finish me off. But this attack was strong. Even flying on Kurigain won't guarantee our safety. Should I test out who it is and why that ninja hasn't revealed himself? Fujin thought for a few seconds and decided, leave it. It's not worth the risk. My chakra is already very low. And creating another opportunity to kill them easily will be difficult. Not to mention, if the ninja hiding inside the barrier is as strong as Katsuchi, then even my life would be at risk. He said, let's retreat. We have killed enough today. Kurigain agreed with Fujin's decision and his teammates didn't object either. Fujin pointed Kurigain in the direction of the Ito family's town as he flew away. On the ground, Kitsuchi's group arrived a couple of seconds after the rocky bird exploded. Kitsuchi sighed and muttered, Old Man Yashiki was forced to make a move. Inside the barrier, an old man was on his knees, coughing heavily. He had a very pale face. It was the same old man who warned Kitsuchi about Fujin's attainments in Fuinjutsu. He thought, Fortunately, my bluff worked. I poured almost my entire chakra into the jutsu and would not be able to perform another any time soon. If he had stayed, then we could have faced more losses. A younger man supported him and asked, Are you fine, master? Yashiki caught his breath and said, I am fine, Makoto. It's just that I used too much chakra in that jutsu. Looks like my old bones won't support me much. Makoto sighed. Yashiki was 76 years old. Though he was an elite jounin in his prime, his prime was far behind him. Of course, he was still highly respected. The reason was that he was among the only three Fuinjutsu grandmasters in Awabakure. As for Makoto, he was one of the seal masters that Yashiki was guiding. Makoto looked into the sky and saw that Kurigain was flying away. He asked, why did you scare him away? Now we can't kill him. Yashiki got up and shook his head. He said, the battle was lost even before we started. Kitsuchi wasn't aware of his summon nor did he know about his expertise in Fuinjutsu. So killing him today wasn't possible. He would have just continued attacking until he ran out of chakra and then escaped. The only thing that would happen is that more of our ninjas would have died. Makoto had a complicated expression. He was being guided to become the next Fuinjutsu Grandmaster in Iwagakure. Though he wasn't anywhere close to reaching it, his future prospects were very good. But, to know that someone seven years younger than him from an enemy country was not only strong enough to fight against one of Iwa's strongest ninjas but also better than him in his speciality was a bitter pill for him to swallow. He muttered, but isn't he just fourteen? Yashiki sighed and nodded. He said, in every generation, Kanoha produces many such talents. Two decades ago, it was the three Sanans. A decade ago, it was the fourth Hokage. And now they have the copy ninja, Kanoha's green beast and this youngster, the spectral swordsman. Not to mention, I heard that the children of their clan leaders will be graduating from the academy in little more than a year. Once they do, Kanoha would likely gain even more elites in another four to five years even if they don't reach the same level as these three. Makoto didn't have any response. He could just sigh helplessly. Chapter 348 Outside the Barrier, Kitsuchi began checking in on the ninjas who were caught in the explosion. He thought, 
I thought I could make him let his guard down and kill him in one blow. But it looks like Yashiki disagreed with my analysis. Makes sense considering the massive losses we took. I miscalculated badly in this fight. Not a single ninja was alive in the pit dug up by the explosion. The reason was that whoever was alive quickly escaped after the rocky bird forced the Kanoha ninjas away. They entered the village before appearing back on the surface. Everyone had minor injuries due to the geyser creation jutsu and the explosion tags. Only three had critical injuries. One ninja had a hole in his right thigh, another was missing his left arm and the third had a huge chunk of flesh and bones missing on the right side of his chest. Fujin's last attack managed to kill the five injured ninjas while killing two more and injuring three. Two ninjas managed to get deep enough into the ground just in time. The medical ninjas hiding inside the barrier quickly began healing the injured ninjas. In a few minutes, Kitsuchi and the rest dug out the IWA ninjas that had been killed underground. They found 16 dead bodies that had one or more holes in them. There were three more spots where blood and minced flesh and bones had mixed, forming a gory site. The IWA ninjas understood that a ninja died at each spot. The worst was that spot that Kuragin had targeted first. The sight of the gore made even the most experienced ninjas nauseated. Kitsuchi stood still realizing the losses they took. The IWA ninjas around him had solemn expressions. They had trained intensely for months to kill Fujin. However, after encountering him, nothing good happened. Not only did Fujin manage to escape uninjured but a lot of IWA ninjas died. Kitsuchi asked everyone to gather the remains of the fallen IWA ninjas and went inside the barrier. He met up with Yashiki. Yashiki looked at him and said, It's fine. You didn't have all the information. You won't experience such a failure the next time. Kitsuchi sighed and said, There might not be a next time. His summon can fly at a high speed. We can't trap him even if we know about this information unless Lord Skikage makes a move himself. Not to mention, Kanoha will be very careful next time. Yashiki didn't say anything. He agreed with Kitsuchi's analysis and only said those words to lift his spirits. Kitsuchi glanced at the village once and said, Make preparations to leave. We will destroy all the seals and evidence that might be linked to us. We will retreat after everyone is healed. Yashiki nodded and looked at his students. Everyone nodded and got to work. A few seconds later, an elite Jounin approached Kitsuchi and Yashiki and said in a grim tone, we have tallied our losses. Kitsuchi, Yashiki, and a few ninjas around them had dejected expressions. The ninja said, We found 36 dead bodies. 34 of them were killed by Fujin and two by his summon. A hint of anger could be felt in his voice as he said, And there are a few more ninjas whose bodies were minced by that beast's attack. We tallied the missing ninjas and calculated that the place with the largest amount of blood and flesh should have had five ninjas so eleven more ninjas should be dead. We lost forty-seven capable Jounins in this clash. He clenched his fists very tightly as he finished speaking. The nails dug into his palms, making them bleed. He wasn't alone. The remaining IWA ninjas couldn't believe the losses they took in that fight. Almost half the ninjas that participated in the attack had died. And they didn't kill or maim even one Kanoha ninja. Kitsuchi gritted his teeth. He thought, I wanted to use this opportunity to train a special elite army unit. But 47 are dead and another is handicapped. To think that I would lose 40% of the ninjas I trained in one blow. Damn it! He hated Fujin a lot at this moment. However, he couldn't do anything but sigh. He wasn't stupid enough to make a move that would cause a cure more losses. He thought, Along with losing so many ninjas, we will also face the consequences of our earlier actions. Just like the land of grass, the land of waterfall will hate Iwagakure as well and would closely align with Kanoha. With the land of rain having Hanzo and Suna being allied with Kanoha, Kanoha has completely secured their western borders. And Kiri is embroiled in a civil war. At this rate, only Kumo would be in a position to attack Kanoha. Of course, 
That is if Suna doesn't betray Kanoha. He looked towards the direction of the land of wind and thought, I never imagined that after being humiliated so badly in the last war, Sanagakir would become the kingmaker in the next war. Kitsuchi was surprised by the conclusion he reached. However, he stopped thinking about the future and turned his attention to the present. He ensured that all the injured ninjas were being treated and the dead bodies were properly stored in seals to be brought back. After storing the dead again, Kitsuchi looked at the scrolls and his heart with a heavy heart. He wondered, 47 lives just to gain information on a 14-year-old ninja who is very close to becoming a fearsome rank S ninja in the future. Is it worth it? Kitsuchi couldn't say for sure. Though the Iwagakure ninjas were upset that they had losses while Kanoha didn't, Fujin wasn't pleased by the result either. In fact, he was even more upset than Kitsuchi. Kitsuchi at least gained knowledge about the skills Fujin kept hidden until then. But Fujin had no gains at all. While this wasn't the first time he had to run away from a fight, it was the first time that Fujin was so disgusted by a fight. He thought, this feeling is almost as bad as when I had to escape from Derui. Though my life isn't under any threat this time, it feels like I was paraded naked in front of an entire city. Bastards knew almost every move I would make in advance. Fortunately, Rashi didn't see Goro, or else I might have been in grave danger. At the very least, these three would have died. Though I am not very attached to them, I don't want to develop a reputation for being someone who runs while his teammates are killed. Though I could live with such a reputation, it will create a lot of inconveniences for me in Kanoha. While Fujin wasn't too concerned about his reputation unlike some others, he understood the importance of maintaining a good reputation. He still had a lot of more important knowledge and resources that he wanted from Kanoha. If he had a good reputation, Hiruzen would not make it very difficult for him to get it. But if he had a bad reputation, then getting them from Hiruzen would become very difficult. Not to mention, he was no longer as young as he was during his academy or Jinin days. Trying to use his innocence to get rewards from Hiruzen would no longer work. Fujin sighed internally thinking, but now, they know almost everything about me. The only thing that is definitely a secret is my lightning release. One of my clones even used the wind-style Jinjutsu. I can only hope that no one figures it out. Though I did manage to kill many Jounins, that doesn't give me any benefit. If anything, it might make Iwavikur want to kill me even more. I'd prefer keeping my skills a secret rather than killing some ninjas that don't pose me any direct threat. If it wasn't for the fact that Fujin had already exposed his secrets, he wouldn't have bothered to even kill them. But since they were, he was forced to make use of those secrets to make IWA suffer some losses. If he hadn't, then he would have been the only one to experience losses and IWA would have come after him again after making even more preparations and a better plan. Just like Fujin, his teammates were also silent and in thought. During the entire battle, forget about killing, they hadn't even managed to injure one ninja. Bun Gyro thought, I felt that I was getting stronger. But every single one of them was stronger than me. I didn't think that I would still be so weak. Fumito and Yugo had similar thoughts. They knew how ridiculously fast Fujin was and that he could have escaped if he was by himself. They thought, we were the reason why Fujin didn't escape and had to fight against such terrible odds. Though things turned out well this time, it might not always be the case. At the same time, all three thought, we need to become stronger. We need some time off so that we can train and catch up with Captain. Chapter 349 Kirigane noticed the gloomy mood on his back and was annoyed by it. He muttered to himself, I'd rather fight those ninjas than keep getting this depressed feeling from my back. He snapped them out of their thoughts by asking, how far do you want me to carry you, Fujin? You know that I don't like flying for a long time. Fujin answered, We have to pass by a town which should be very close. After reaching it, just fly south for an hour. You can drop us in the land of fire. Our chakra is very exhausted. I'd prefer to not have any more surprises. Kurigame replied, All right. You'll have to guide me though. I have no idea about the geography here. Fujin nodded. Fujin's words surprised Yugo. She asked, 
are we not going back to the town? Fujin shook his head and replied, No. The enemy is stronger than us. Staying in this country is very risky. If there is any other such force here or they decide to chase us to this town, then we could be in danger. The seals in the village were made by a few Injutsu Grandmaster and they have someone who can create that strong explosion. So they have multiple means of trapping us in the city or even destroying the mansion when we might be resting. So it's not worth it. None of his subordinates disagreed and they continued moving forward. Since no one was bothering him, Fujin began thinking about the situation again. He thought, what's done is done. There is no point in getting upset over it. I need to analyze why I fell into such a mess in the first place and how Awabakir knew I would be sent here. I need to calm my mind as being annoyed won't help me analyze it properly. He began meditating. A few minutes later, they reached above the town. Fujin created a shadow clone who jumped off Kurigane. As for Kurigane, he changed direction and began flying towards the land of fire. The town was still in panic. It had only been an hour since they had heard about the incidents. Though the Ito family tried to calm the public down, it wasn't very effective. While the Ito family was thinking about what methods they should use to quell the panic, their guards noticed something in the air. Their eyes widened as they noticed someone falling down. Fujin's clone used Assassin's Rush in short bursts to slow down his fall. When he reached close to the ground, he exhaled a forceful but harmless infinite breakthrough jutsu on the ground to slow down his fall and landed on his feet. Though the guards were surprised, they immediately recognized his attire. However, they weren't sure if it was him or an enemy under disguise. Fujin's clone didn't bother talking with them. He flickered and appeared inside the mansion, next to Ito Yuya. The guards were surprised and hurriedly ran inside to inform them what they had witnessed. Yuya was taken aback by Fujin's sudden appearance. Fujin's clone said, I have important information. Call another meeting instantly. Yuya frowned and wondered, why did he come back so quickly? More importantly, is it him or someone else disguising as him? He quickly asked, why did you come back so quickly? And how can I be sure if you aren't someone else in disguise and want to gather our family and kill us at the same time? Fujin's clone wasn't surprised by the questions. The Umbu frequently faced such issues. He said in a plain voice, You sent most of the ninjas in this town out. If I wanted to kill you and your entire family, then no one could stop me. Yuya was intimidated by his words. Fortunately, the clone didn't continue threatening him and said, But I don't have much time. If you want to listen to it yourself, then that's fine as well. As for what you do after is none of my business. The one behind the recent incident is a Wabakir. Yuya's eyes widened. He said loudly in disbelief, How can that be? Why would a major village do something like this? Fujin's clone answered, No idea. We didn't talk much. The village with the missing people is covered with seals by a few Injutsu Grandmaster. The village itself had around a hundred IWA ninjas. Maybe more if they stay hidden. And they are led by the third Suchikage son-in-law, Kitsuchi. Yuya's heart became increasingly heavier as Fujin's clone provided more information. Though the Ito family was the most dominant family in the territory, they were no match for a behemoth like Iwabakure. Just thinking about 100 IWA ninjas led by Kitsuchi made his knees weak. Fujin's clone added, We clashed but were forced to retreat. They would likely not make a move for a few hours, but I am not sure what they will do afterwards. Since their cover was blown, there are two possibilities. The first possibility and the one you might prefer is that they will retreat back to the land of stone. The second is that they might try to speed up whatever they were planning. It might involve an attack on this town. Yuya's mind went blank for a few seconds. The information was too much for him to handle. However, as an experienced politician, he gathered himself quickly. He bowed and pleaded, Please help us defend the town. Fujin's clone shook his head and said, The amount of IWA forces is enough to start a war. This matter is something that Takigakir needs to handle. As someone from Kanoha, 
I can't be involved lightly in this matter. Slowing them down and providing you with sufficient time is the most I can do. My squad is already heading back. I'll report the details to Lord Hokage and he will make a decision on Kanoha's further involvement. In the meantime, you should coordinate with Takigakure and take appropriate measures. Yuya immediately understood his mistake. He realized, if the Kanoha ninjas get involved, then this could result in a war between Kanoha and Iwagakure fought in the land of Waterfall. Our country will be one to suffer the most. I can't make such a decision. It will have to be made by Takigakure. He replied, All right. Thank you for your suggestions. We will act hurriedly. Fujin's clone nodded and replied, Good luck. He dispelled himself. Yuya thought, so he was just a clone. He immediately gathered the important members of his family and informed them about Fujin's words. The entire Ito family was terrified. Thankfully, while the meeting for taking place, the ninjas from Takigakure, who were terrified by the flames raining down, reached the town. They quickly met up with the Ito family and informed them about what they had witnessed. The Ito family was shocked once again. Yuya wondered, is that what the Kanoha ninja meant by slowing them down? Who was he to be capable of doing something so crazy? Though Kanoha was known for having ninjas with very good fire affinity, it was the first time they had heard about something like this. The fact that a single jutsu could burn down the town they were proud of was a bitter pill to swallow. The Ito family informed the Taki ninjas about what Fujin had informed them, shocking the Taki ninjas. After discussing it for a bit, they quickly formed a plan. They quickly sent messenger birds to Takigakure. In less than 15 minutes, the entire Ito family quietly departed from the town and went into hiding. Fujin and his squad were still flying on Kuragane. Fujin had calmed down. He analyzed, I need to start from the very basic question. How did Iwabakure know I would be sent here? He thought of many possible answers, my first thought was that someone from Kanoha leaked my movements. Possibly someone like Danzo. But it doesn't seem very practical now that I think about it. After all, IWA had started this mess around four months ago. There is no way Danzo could have known that I would be sent here. Unless he or someone else influenced Eagle to send me on this mission. Still, the chances of this are low. I haven't irked Danzo or any other ninja in power as of yet. But even though unlikely, I will need to check on this. I don't want to leave myself vulnerable to someone scheming against me in the dark. Other than that, there is only one possibility. Iwabakure somehow predicted that I would be dispatched here. Or at least, they bet that I might be dispatched here. Maybe they hoped I'd be dispatched but were willing to trap any elite Jounin who might have been dispatched here from Kanoha. A good scheme indeed. Fujin felt a chill as he realized how much IWA had planned and how much effort they were willing to take to eliminate him. Chapter 350, Fujin analyzed, they should have started planning right after I clashed with Rashi. These ninjas should be trained with the help of Rashi so that they can anticipate my attacks and movements and take preventive measures to avoid being killed by me. Training a hundred ninjas just to kill me. What a freaking overkill! I'm not even an elite Jounin officially. Though it might not be just for me. The skills they develop will help them survive tough battles against others as well. With such a good trap, there were only three ways for me to counterattack. The one that I used was my summon. Another way was using lighting release. But I don't think it would be as effective as Kuragin. Though my lightning release is good, it is a far cry compared to my wind release. The last method was wind-style Jinjutsu. The three skills they didn't know about. Of course, the simplest option was to just run away with wind instantaneous body Jutsu. Had I been alone like I was in the land of wind, I'd have directly left. The plan would have been nullified without much effort. So despite being in a difficult spot, my life wouldn't have been in any danger had I abandoned these three. I guess since I disappeared using reverse summoning Jutsu, Rashi and the rest don't know about my skill with that jutsu. They should have some speculations, which is why that barrier was probably placed around the village. But they should be unaware of the specifics. Regardless, 
This makes my life incredibly difficult. If they provide this training for more ninjas then all my future confrontations with IWA will prove to be a challenge. And what if they provide my information and the training plan to other villages? If that happens, then there will be special forces in all major villages just to counter me. Maybe others might come up with even better tactics in the future and create even more devious traps for me. Fujin sighed at that thought. He began analyzing why the trap was so successful against him. He thought, the main reason why I fell in such a position is my actions after I clashed with Rashi is that most of my skills were exposed in that fight. So I knew that IWA would have a lot of information on me. Despite that, I made no effort to upgrade my skills or learn newer ones. Due to this reason, Iwa's plan was so effective. In another way of speaking, my power has become stale. Though I can't be entirely blamed for that as I spent most of my time on Fuinjutsu, it still left a flaw. A flaw that I was aware of but didn't act on as I never expected anyone to make use of it. After all, if the information about a ninja is available, no matter how strong that ninja is and how well-rounded his abilities are, this world has enough smart and intuitive ninjas to come up with ways of defeating that. Though the performance of these IWA ninjas against me can be considered remarkable, it isn't even comparable to Shikamaru defeating Haydn. The two were leagues apart in strength and abilities. And Haydn was still someone with a lot of weaknesses. Even someone with no visible weaknesses like the third rakage was defeated by Naruto's clone after he received information from Eight Tails. Another example of this can be the Uchiha Sasano. Though most ninjas will be very alarmed by that jutsus, for me, it's the least threatening of all the Manjiku abilities that I know of. After all, it is very exhaustive to maintain a Sasano. I can easily run away when it is activated and return when it is deactivated during the fight, making it useless. Of course, that is if it is used with normal Manjiku. Since others can be dealt with after getting enough information, I too am vulnerable despite my high speed and the penetrative power of the vacuum jutsus. While it still isn't something that could kill me, if I stay complacent, it is only a matter of time. I will have to start working on those ideas that I have. Sigh, I'm so close to becoming a Fuinjutsu Grandmaster. It would have been great if I could have achieved that before being made to work on this. But delaying this any longer will be more harmful than the gains from Fuinjutsu. After all, though I have the ideas, it would probably take me over a year to successfully master them. Then I can get rid of this vulnerability. Fujin had reached a satisfactory conclusion when his eyes suddenly widened. He realized, no, that is not correct. Even if I create a new fighting style, even that can be countered when information about it gets known. What I need to do is keep working on it consistently and keep upgrading it. My speed of developing new styles needs to be faster than my enemy's speed of countering my fighting style. Only then I can truly avoid such scenarios. This will have to continue until my strength reaches a perverse level like Hashirama and Madara where I develop and learn jutsus that can't be countered like the Flying Thunder God and perhaps the Blood Jutsus of the Jashin Grand Priest. Sage Mode would also help, but Ryu is still unwilling to teach me. Regardless, I need to start working on my ninjutsu once again. Having made up his mind, Fujin stopped analyzing further and rested. Kuragane carried the Kanoha ninjas into the Land of Fire and dropped them before returning to Mount Matiki. Fujin's squad continued moving towards Kanoha at a high speed. A couple of hours later, Takigakir received messages from the messenger birds. As he read the details in the scrolls, Shibuki's expression became very grim. He cursed, this is bad. Very bad. We can't fight Iwagakir right now. One of his advisors said angrily, Lord Shibuki, this is unacceptable. We have to respond to this provocation. Please give us permission to lead our troops and force the Iwabakir ninjas out of our country. Shibuki looked at him and retorted, Fight against IWA? Are you crazy? Didn't you read that the Kanoha Umbu captain reported that Kitsuchi and a few Injutsu Grandmaster were there? What if they fight back instead of retreating? His reply had everyone in the room looking at him with a deadpan expression. They all had the same thought, as expected. 
Shibuki ignored those looks and instructed, send the highest priority message to the Hokage. Request him to dispatch an army towards our borders. Once they are in position, we will dispatch our forces to confront Iwagakure. If they retreat, then it is for the best. Otherwise, Kanoha will be allowed to enter and we will ally against IWA. Everyone nodded and got to work. After leaving the room, one of the advisors sighed and muttered, he is so cowardly. Another nodded and said, yeah. He reminds me of his father in all other aspects. But in terms of courage, he is the complete opposite. The time needed to dispatch our forces and have them confront IWA would have been sufficient for the Kanoha ninjas to arrive. He sighed as well and said, leave it. He is still a very good leader. Everyone nodded and began working. Thanks to Shibuki's inaction, Kitsuchi gained valuable time. In the village where they were staying, the IWA ninjas who weren't injured placed the people back in their homes. The people were still asleep due to Jinjutsu. Similar actions happened in the other villages with missing people. Thanks to Yashiki's Fuinjutsu, he had kept all the people in those villages in underground basements, hidden from the eyes of anyone who tried to inspect the villages. They deployed some ninjas in those villages to ensure that the villagers could be kept under Jinjutsu and not die of thirst or hunger. As for other people they had randomly kidnapped, IWA didn't have any choice but to kill and bury them silently. Though they sent a considerable force, they couldn't handle so many people properly. So keeping them alive would have created some chances of their operation being exposed. After moving the villagers, the IWA ninjas destroyed the underground basements and filled them up using earth-release jutsus while the seal masters destroyed all the seals. They removed every trace of their involvement. After confirming that no evidence was left, all the IWA ninjas in the land of Waterfall began stealthily moving towards the village where Kitsuchi was at. Though Fujin inflicted a lot of damage on the ninjas that attacked him, the remaining IWA forces didn't have any casualties. Kitsuchi waited until everyone had returned to the village and then retreated to the Land of Stone along with everyone else. Only Sho was left back to continue spying. Kanoha It was late at night. Hiruzen had wrapped up all his work and was sleeping peacefully at his home when his sleep was disturbed. An Umbu woke him up and handed him the high-priority message scroll. Hiruzen opened the scroll and began reading. His eyes immediately widened before going back to their usual size. He said, Call Shikaku to my office. The Umbu nodded and flickered away. Chapter 351 Shikaku grumpily walked towards Haruzen's office. He muttered, It has just been a couple of months since the situation with Suna cooled down and I could sleep comfortably. Don't tell me that they have become active again. He reached the office and asked, What's the situation this time? Hiruzen tossed him the scroll and said, Take a look. Shikaku began reading. He muttered in dissatisfaction, What does IWA want in that country? Hiruzen said, To send that many ninjas, for so long, and take action against so many civilians. It looks like they were looking for something. Or planning something huge in that country. Shikaku nodded. He added, It's tough to say exactly though. With those actions, they could annex the western half of the land of Waterfall. But it won't benefit them much. After all, Takigakure itself would have been safe and that's where the forces of that country are accumulated. And hurting a buffer country between our villages will cost them diplomatically. So overall it would be a loss. I have a feeling that they were searching for something or someone. Which Umbu squad did you send? Hiruzen replied, Fujin's squad. Shikaku became mildly annoyed on hearing Fujin's name. He muttered, Nothing good happens when that brat is involved. Our relationship with Suna is still brittle. And Kumo is eyeing us like wolves. If he provokes a war with IWA, then we will be in a tough spot when hostilities begin. Hiruzen sighed and said, Even if he doesn't our situation won't be any different. We have always had to face all four villages. Regardless, Fujin has calmed down a bit since he clashed with Rashi. Let's wait for him to arrive. In the meantime, start deciding who we should send to the border. Shikaku nodded. 
Fortunately, they didn't have to wait for long. A few minutes after Haruzen and Shikaku met, Fujin and his squad arrived in Kanoha. Since they had eaten soldier pills, they traveled non-stop until they reached the village. After entering, Fujin said, It's nighttime. Lord Hokage should be asleep. You guys can go to your homes. I'll report the mission to him. His teammates nodded. But before he could leave, Yugao said, Captain, I thought a lot during our journey here and have a request. Fujin stopped and turned around. He asked, What request? Yugao said, During this mission, every one of the enemies was as strong as me. I couldn't do anything to help you. I want a few months break to train so that I won't be a burden the next time. Fujin was surprised by her request. Before he could speak, Bunjiro said, I have the same request. Fumito added, same here. Fujin said, the enemy was strong this time. Even if you get stronger, there will still be someone stronger than you. So don't be too discouraged. But all right. Taking time off to train is good. I was thinking about it as well. I'll discuss with Lord Hokage to see if I can get a training vacation for our team. Yugao said, Thank you, Captain. Fujin nodded and flickered away. His team stayed in the same spot for a few seconds. Fumito chuckled and said in a self-mocking tone, We were completely useless during this mission. Bunjiro didn't know what to say. Yugao sighed and said, They were probably all Jounins. If not for his summon, we would have died there and could have dragged him with us as well. Fumito said, they had a few chances to deal fatal blows to us during the initial phase of the battle. But for some reason, they didn't. Thinking about it, I believe they wanted to keep us alive so that he would be forced to stay and defend us. Yugo nodded. She had realized it as well. That was the main reason she asked for a break. Bunjiro's eyes widened. He thought, I was wondering about that as well. I never imagined that this would be the reason. Fumito said, Anyways, we have managed to return in one piece. Let's train so that we won't feel this way again. Good luck to both of you. Yugao and Bunjiro wished him luck as well and went their separate ways. Fujin was unaware of their conversation. As he approached the Hokage building, he thought, if they trained seriously for a few months, Yugao and Fumito will quickly get promoted to Umbu captain. Though Bunjiro wouldn't, his strength will reach close to this rank as well. That's good. I'll convince Haruzen to give us a long break. After the break, I'll recommend Yugao and Fumito for the Umbu rank and quit the Umbu using that opportunity as my team will be dissolved. Hmm? Fujin focused his attention towards the Hokage office and sensed two chakras. He wondered, what are these two doing awake at this hour? Did Taki send a message? Anyway, this is good. I won't have to wait for an Umbu guard to go and wake him up. He quickly went to the office. An Umbu guard appeared and asked, Tortoise, what are you doing here at this hour? Fujin answered, Here to meet Lord Hokage. The Umbu guard said, He is having a secret meeting. Fujin replied, I'm pretty sure the discussion inside is regarding my mission. Regardless, this is a high priority. The Umbu guard said, All right. Go ahead. They had interacted on several occasions. So, he knew that Fujin had a great relationship with Haruzen. Haruzen and Shikaku immediately looked at Fujin, who entered the room. Fujin closed the door, looked at the scroll on Haruzen's table and asked, did Takigakir send a request for reinforcements? Haruza nodded, something like that. But there isn't much information here. Report what happened. Fujin nodded and said, it was probably a trap. After we reached the town, the attack stopped once again like what happened when we sent a squad earlier. But a few days later, a big incident occurred and everyone in one of the villages went missing. When we went to investigate, I realized that the village was covered in seals that were extremely difficult to detect. I believe that they had a few Injutsu Grandmaster hiding in the village. Though we avoided the trap, we were attacked by the IWA ninjas hiding inside the barrier. Fujin took a pause. Shikaku looked at him and thought, 
Why do I get the feeling that what he says next will be very troublesome? Fujin continued, the attackers were led by Katsuchi. Hiruzen and Shikaku weren't surprised as his name was mentioned in the scroll sent by Taki Gekir. But what Fujin said next shocked them. He added, along with him were 96 other ninjas, every single one at the Jounin level. Shikaku asked in disbelief, they moved 96 Jounins along with an s rank ninja and a few Injutsu Grandmaster there? Rank S ninjas making a move was very common. After all, they could move freely throughout the world and very few would be willing to oppose them. Just from Kanoha, Jiraiya and Tsunade would frequently be heard about roaming randomly in the smaller countries. Hundreds of ninjas moving also happened frequently. Not too long ago, all the major villages were moving over a thousand ninjas each around their countries due to the volatile conditions. But a hundred Jounins moving together was extremely rare. Even during wars, that would be a rare occurrence. Fujin nodded. Shikaku asked, what was their goal? Fujin answered, I am not sure, but my best guess is they wanted to kill me. Shikaku and Hiruzen were surprised again. Hiruzen asked, why do you say that? Fujin answered in a serious tone, Kitsuchi recognized my real identity. And every single one of those Jounins was trained to counter me. They all were quick on their feet and could use iron skin jutsu quickly, which protected them against most of my wind jutsus. In addition, they were very on guard against my wind vacuum techniques. They would observe the slight changes in my body and take preemptive measures to assist in dodging my attack. They also had a few chances to deal a lethal blow to my teammates, but refrained from doing so to keep me from running away. If it wasn't for the fact that they didn't know about my few injutsu skills and my summon, I would have been in deep trouble. Hiruzen and Shikaku went silent on hearing that. Both realized how serious the matter was. After a while, Shikaku asked, How did they know you would be sent there? Fujin replied, I was hoping you'd find out. If the locations of Umbu ninjas are getting leaked, then we will be facing a lot of trouble. Even more so if they have some degree of control over who gets dispatched on some missions. Neither Haruzen nor Shikaku opposed him. Both could see the Umbu squads getting picked one by one by enemies if that was the case. Haruzen said seriously, I will look into this matter. If someone is leaking information, then that person would be eliminated. Fujin nodded. Just like Fujin, Haruzen's first thought was Danzo as well but he couldn't think of any reason for Danzo to do that. Shikaku asked, what happened after that? Fujin continued, well, I summoned my summon and began attacking from the air. After a long difficult fight, I managed to kill 47 ninjas and a few more were injured. But someone hiding inside the village attacked us with explosion release Kekiai Jinkai. The power behind the explosion made it look like it was another s rank ninja but I'm suspicious as that ninja never showed himself. I decided that it was too risky to continue and withdrew along with my team. Once again, Shikaku was left speechless. He wondered, did they set a trap for him or offer him their heads? Chapter 352, Shikaku asked, You killed 47 Jounins who were trained to counter you. Fujin replied, Well, they didn't have any defense against my vacuum jutsus so I had to create opportunities to make them drop their guard momentarily or make a slight mistake. Though difficult, I managed to do that a few times and managed to kill a few of them. But I didn't manage to kill many. Thankfully they made a big mistake towards the end of the battle that allowed me to kill more than 20 in one go. It's probably what forced the explosion Kekiai Jankai Ninja to act. Shikaka didn't know how to respond. He thought, Killing 47 Jounins is a huge achievement. But there isn't even a single bit of joy in his voice or a sense of achievement in his expression. Instead, he sounds like he was the one who lost 47 Jounins. Unlike Fujin, who was very frustrated over his skills being countered, Shikaku and Hiruzen weren't worried about it. After all, Hiruzen was probably the most all-round ninja in the world. He had no weakness and he could freely switch to any fighting style to counter his opponent. As for Shikaku, his opponent's intelligence was the last thing he worried about. 
he could make numerous strategies on the battlefield to counter whatever plan the enemy came up with. So neither shared Fujin's vulnerabilities. Though they understood his position, from their point of view, it was just a natural obstacle that any top-level ninja would have to overcome. Hiruzen thought, if Fujin can overcome this by himself, he will become a force to reckon with. If not, then I will have to provide him with more jutsus to ensure that he doesn't stay susceptible to such tactics. But if I have to do that, then his future prospects won't be as bright as I expect. He will still become a rank S ninja but won't reach the same heights as me or Minato. Hiruzen said, You did great. Take a break. We will be sending an army to reinforce Takigakir. Fujin said, Thank you. I have a request though. Hiruzen said, Speak. Fujin said, I was hoping to get a long vacation. This mission was difficult for my team. But on the positive side, it has motivated them a lot. They all want a break to train and get stronger. I want a break as well to avoid being vulnerable to such traps. Shikaku's face became dark. He thought, this brat. He keeps increasing my workload and then asks for a vacation in front of my face? Hiruzen wasn't a stranger to this request. Fujin had asked for vacation several times in the past. He thought, though I refused his requests in the past and kept him busy with missions, it won't look good to reject this time. Plus, this incident should motivate him to train more instead of just meditating in the training rooms. And I'm curious to see how he breaks through his current situation. He asked, how long of a vacation do you want? Fujin replied, preferably six months. Hiruzen replied, that's too long. I'll give your squad a three-month vacation. But, if the situation in the land of Waterfall worsens, you will be called back to duty. Fujin replied, All right. I'll convey the message to my team. Hiruzen was puzzled. He thought, That's it? He didn't argue for more? Meanwhile, Fujin thought, That's good. I didn't think he'd agree so easily. I'd have been happy with one and a half months break. Three months should be plenty for what I have planned. Before leaving, Fujin asked for another favor. He said, I have one more request. Hiruzen said, Speak. Fujin asked, Do we have any soldier pills that could aid in training longer? I have tried using the best ones available for Umbu, but they aren't sustainable for long-term use. And, the chakra they provide is very less at my level. Fujin hadn't used soldier pills to train for a long time. The only time he used them without much restraint was during his academy days. Back then, since his chakra was much lower, he would need lower quality soldier pills. They wouldn't cause much strain on his body. In addition, as a student, he wouldn't be called suddenly for any missions that could pose a danger to his life. So he wasn't worried about the time when the collective exhaustion would hit him and would force him to rest for a few days. But the normal soldier pills didn't have much effect on him anymore. With the crazy amount of chakra some of his jutsus needed, even the highest quality of soldier pills available to him didn't provide him with much help in training. And despite that, the exhaustion it would cause was greater than ever. So Fujin had been reluctant to use them to train. Since he wasn't in a hurry and felt that he still had plenty of time before the important incidents took place, he hadn't bothered to look for other means. But the trap set by Iwavikur created a sense of urgency in him. Hiruzen replied, No soldier pill is sustainable for long-term use. They are meant to be used only in war to help you fight for a longer time. He opened his drawer, grabbed a bottle and tossed it at Fujin. He said, These pills are specially made for me. The amount of chakra they provide is several times what the Umbu use. In addition, it works for two additional days. But, the exhaustion it causes is very bad as well. Don't train for a day after the exhaustion hits. And don't consume another pill for a week after you recover from the exhaustion. Fujin observed the pills in the bottle and said, Thank you, Grandpa. I'll see you later. He left the room, leaving Hiruzen and Shikaku alone. Shikaku asked, Was it safe to give him that pill? Hiruzen replied, It's fine. He trains a lot but takes good care of not overexerting himself. 
He also has some expertise in medical ninjutsu and regularly gets himself checked by Yoshi and Isamu. As long as these pills don't land in guys' hands, we won't have any issues. Shikaku replied, true. His training is just too much. Shikaku glanced at Haruzen and asked, by the way, can I get a Vekati? Before he could complete his question, Hiruzen interrupted and said, No, get to work. Shikaku let out a sigh and got back to work. He wrote a reply to Takigakir and sent it to them through the same messenger bird. While the bird traveled, the two of them worked through the night. After leaving the office, Fujin wondered, So, what should I do now? As he had eaten the soldier pill, Fujin wouldn't be able to sleep for another two and a half days. He thought, Though my chakra isn't completely exhausted, it is still very low. It will take around 8 to 10 hours to recover. Until then, I can't train or create a lot of clones for Fuinjutsu. Looks like I only have one choice. Fujin went straight to the wind training room and began meditating. As he meditated, he thought, the wind crystals barely have any effect on me anymore. Though thousands of small, minute improvements could still create some qualitative change, the process will be very slow and might need decades. I don't need to waste my time in these rooms anymore. Though there is no harm in coming here when I have to meditate for any reason. Fujin eliminated all thoughts from his mind and began meditating earnestly. The energy from the wind crystal began dissipating rapidly. By noon, Shikaku had assembled 250 ninjas. Around 60 were Jounins while the rest were Chunins. Once again, the leadership was given to Kakashi. Kakashi stood in front of the small army and muttered, Are we doing this too frequently? Guy, who was standing close to him, said, Yeah, and we don't even fight anyone. We just move around until the situation diffuses itself. Kakashi sighed. He wasn't a big fan of war. But since Haruzen wanted to nurture him, he had been assigning Kakashi to all such leadership roles. Due to frequently leading hundreds of ninjas and in addition to his reputation, almost everyone in Konoha had begun seeing Kakashi as the leader of the next generation. Under Kakashi's orders, the Konoha forces began moving towards the land of Waterfall. An hour later, the messenger bird reached Takigakir. Shibuki received the message and called for another meeting. He informed the council, Konoha said that they will send out 250 ninjas this noon meaning that they should have already left. In addition, they will dispatch 500 more ninjas tomorrow. One of his advisors said, Konoha is quick as always. The first force should arrive at our borders by tomorrow morning. So they will be in a position to reinforce us quickly after our clashes begin. Shibuki asked, How is our preparation? Another advisor answered, We have prepared all our ninjas. All 2,000 ninjas are available and are awaiting orders. Shibuki thought for a bit and said, If we move now and run into a Wabakir's trap, then we will suffer a lot before the Kanoa forces arrive. We will wait for a bit more to prevent any needless casualties. At midnight, you will lead half our forces towards the Ito family's territories. We will use the cover of the night to sneak attack any enemy forces in our territory. The remaining half will stay back and defend the village in case this is some sort of distraction. Everyone agreed with his decision and began making preparations. Chapter 353 While Takigakir got busy, Fujin finally stepped out of the Umbu training facility. He stretched his body and thought, My chakra has completely recovered. Looks like I can return to training. But first, I need to inform them of the vacation. Three shadow clones appeared around Fujin. They immediately flickered away and informed his teammates about the three months long vacation. Everyone thanked him and promised to spend the entire vacation training to become stronger. The clones gave some tips to them, especially to Banjaro, before dispelling themselves. When Fujin received their memories, he was back in his home. He thought, not bad. Their determination hasn't decreased. But, how should I move forward? He thought for a bit and analyzed, my initial plan was to have my clones continue learning the four symbol seal while I begin ninjutsu training. But, I won't be able to sustain such training until I eat the soldier pill Haruzen gave me. 
so for the next couple of days, I will focus on ninjutsu. Even in ninjutsu, I can't keep moving blindly anymore. Though I did create a few combat systems in the past to ensure that I have no weaknesses, those systems won't be very useful against rank S ninjas or jounins who have been trained to counter me. But, that doesn't mean I need to scrap everything I learned in the past and come up with something completely new. After all, these techniques are still very lethal and provide a skeleton for my future combat systems. I just have to make a few additions or changes that would make any preparations against the current me useless against the future me. As he analyzed, Fujin walked into his basement and entered one of the rooms. This room was his study room. It had a few desks, a lot of books, scrolls and writing and drawing tools. Of course, nothing in the room was something that needed to be kept a secret. Fujin grabbed a pen and a piece of paper and made a few notes as he thought, my current strengths are my high movement and combat speed, high speed and penetrative power of vacuum bullets, cannon and waves, the versatile nature of my infinite breakthrough jutsu and my swordplay. In these aspects, I can compete with almost everyone except the ones that stand at the very top like Haruzen, I or Inoki. Among the ninjas still alive, I guess I and Abito are the only ones who can dodge my vacuum jutsus with ease and would dare to get hit by it. Even though Haruzen and a few others could dodge, while some like Orochimaru and Kakuzu have their quirks, they would still be very wary when facing me and would be forced to place the majority of their attention on me. But, it's this penetrative power that made me a bit complacent. IWA took the perfect advantage of this complacency. I currently use three vacuum jutsus regularly. Vacuum bullets, vacuum cannon, and vacuum serial waves. All three have to be shot from my mouth. And though short, all three need some preparation time. The IWA ninjas use this fraction of a second to comfortably dodge my attacks. And, this isn't something I can improve on. The time I take is already very low. Decreasing it any further by a substantial amount isn't viable. So that leaves me with two options to make my vacuum jutsus even more threatening. Fujin raised his left palm. A wind sphere with a vacuum core began forming quickly. Fujin looked at the vacuum sphere and thought, this was the first vacuum jutsu I learned. IWA ninjas didn't know about this. I could have used it in the battle, but I didn't because I wouldn't have got a lot of kills. The main reason is that unlike vacuum bullets and cannon, this attack is much slower. After killing two or three with the element of surprise, the rest wouldn't have fallen for it. I would have just needlessly exposed the fact that I have other methods of using vacuum jutsus. What I need to do now is to develop vacuum jutsus that don't need to be shot from my mouth but can still be fired at a high speed. Like say, if I could fire high-speed vacuum bullets from the tip of my fingers, the IWA ninjas wouldn't have dared attempt something like this. So this will be one thing I will need to work on. He dispersed the vacuum sphere and continued analyzing, the second thing is the scale of my vacuum jutsus. Other than serial waves, all my vacuum jutsus are single-target attacks. And those serial waves can target multiple, it is much slower than the other two in speed. I remember that Danzo had somehow used vacuum serial waves to pierce Sasuke's Susanoo. Though that attack was named the same, it was more like a vacuum version of the Great Breakthrough Jutsu. I need to develop one such jutsu. An AoE attack that shares the penetrative power and speed of vacuum jutsus. Once I develop it, just barely dodging my attacks won't be of any further help. The opponent will either need a very good defense or be fast enough to escape the range of the jutsu. A feat that very few would be capable of. Fujin kept the pen down and thought, once I master these two aspects, Iwa's current preparations against me will become useless. Unless, of course, they could come up with something new to counter that. But, Fujin's expression became very serious and determined as he muttered, but, in order to get that information, they will have to pay the lives of hundreds of jounins. A loss that would make their hearts bleed. Fujin shook his head and analyzed, this should be enough to break out of the current situation. But, it won't be enough to dominate the rank S ninjas. I need to create jutsus and techniques that complement my fighting style and keep improving them until I can reach rank S through this. One idea I have had for a long time was using wind chakra for taijutsu. 
Though the Senju Taijutsu style is strong, just like vacuum bullets, dodging them is easy. But if I can cover my fists with wind, then merely dodging won't be sufficient. If I succeed, my punches can become as lethal as my sword. If I can go a step further and create a wind cloak similar to Rakage's lightning chakra mode. But that will be very difficult. I will have to see how I could use wind to enhance me. I can see how I can use it to make a threat to anyone attacking me, but if I can also use it to increase my speed and power, then the effect will be numerous times higher. And, I will have to do the above without putting a huge strain on my chakra reserves. Apart from this, there is the idea I had with the rank E and D jutsus before I decided to drop them. That idea might be the key to implementing the idea I had when I was learning Susumu's wind style jinjutsu. If I can master this and reach the level I am imagining, then I'm certain that I will be able to go against any rank S ninja. Though that is a big if. This will be a long-term project. I can't complete this one or the cloak in a short time. But I will begin studying the basics. I will get more ideas to improvise once I start the training. Fujin stopped thinking and looked over the notes he had made while analyzing. After a few minutes, he nodded and crumbled the piece of paper in his fist. The paper caught fire and was soon reduced to ashes. Fujin left his home and stepped into training ground 23. He entered into the deepest part of the training ground as he thought, it's been a while since I learned a new jutsu. More importantly, this is the first time I am developing my own jutsus without much reference from this world. He stretched his body and muttered, oh well, I hope everything goes well. He clenched his right hand into a tight fist and stared at it. Chakra gathered around his fist and forearm. The chakra transformed into the wind and began revolving around Fujin's arm. Fujin focused on the wind and made it revolve faster. Under Fujin's control, the wind began revolving at a higher speed, almost forming a mini tornado around his fist and forearm. Suddenly, a long cut appeared across Fujin's forearm. Blood spouted like a fountain and mixed with the mini tornado, giving it a reddish shade. Chapter 354 Fujin immediately stopped providing the chakra. The winds lost their sharpness and slowly dispersed away. Three long cuts had appeared on Fujin's forearm. Fujin sighed and thought, I was expecting something like this to happen. That is why I didn't try this idea when I had it. Unfortunately, after learning medical ninjutsu, I became busy with a lot of matters. Since high-level ninjutsu were readily available, I didn't bother learning this jutsu. A green glow appeared on Fujin's right forearm. The three cuts stopped bleeding and started healing at a rapid speed. If Hiruzen saw this sight, he would be shocked. Fujin was healing himself without using any hand seals. An extremely small number of ninjas were capable of this feat. Fujin observed as the cuts closed up and thought, sealless healing sure is convenient. But the chakra control needed for this is nuts. I needed over two and a half years to learn this. And my current speed of healing isn't high enough to shrug off any damage I take in between a fight. Fortunately, I can play a game of cat and mouse until I am healed. Once the cuts closed up, Fujin's right forearm became black in color. He once again gathered chakra around his fist and forearm. The chakra transformed into wind and began revolving around his arm at a rapid speed. As the speed increased, Fujin felt several blows to his arm. Fortunately, the iron skin jutsu prevented any more injuries. Once the speed reached an optimal level, Fujin flickered and appeared before a tree. He sent a punch towards it but stopped just before his fist made contact with the tree. The mini tornado around his fist moved forward and hit the tree. It created hundreds of cuts on the tree every second. After around five seconds, the winds began losing their sharpness and dispersed away. Fujin withdrew his fist and observed the tree. The tree had thousands of small cuts on its trunk and a few small holes drilling through it but was still standing. Fujin analyzed, hmm. This is much weaker than I thought. But it's understandable as this is the first time I did it and didn't physically punch the tree. Once I master it, I should be able to blow the tree apart. The power will still likely be weaker than the Senju Taijutsu style but it will be more lethal. 
but something doesn't feel right. It's as if the jutsu wasn't as free-flowing as I imagined it to be. Fujin went silent. He once again hardened his right arm and created the tornado around it. He closed his eyes and allowed the winds to flow rapidly for a few minutes. He submerged his mind focusing only on feeling the wind to understand what was wrong. After five minutes, the wind slowed down and dispersed. He opened his eyes and thought, there are two main problems. Though using iron skin jutsu protects my hand, it also takes some of my concentration away from the winds. The reason for this is that I have to simultaneously convert my chakra into wind and earth at the same time. So the jutsu isn't as free-flowing as I envisioned. The other issue is the very fact why I need to use the iron skin jutsu. I can feel the wind hitting my arm randomly. Just like the tree, the wind hits my arm hundreds of times per second. Even though the iron skin jutsu protects my arm, the hit from the wind imparts some force to my arm. And this force isn't aligned with my punching force. One way of seeing this can be me punching an opponent and my opponent using his palm to attack my forearms and divert my punch away. Due to these random hits on my arm, the direction of my punch will change slightly. So my punches won't necessarily hit where I want them to. But, is this a bad thing? After all, some unpredictability is always good. Fujin began analyzing the pros and cons of his wayward punch. Soon, he shook his head and realized, no. This waywardness will be useful only when my opponent is dodging. If my opponent hits back, then this uncontrolled punch can cost me dearly. The most ideal way would be to properly control when the wind would hit my arm and use it to catch my opponent off guard. Unfortunately, that is quite difficult. I will first have to completely prevent any such random winds from hitting my forearm and fist. Then I will have to find a way to hit my arm with the same winds, but without their sharpness and in a controlled manner. Either that or I could use the assassin's rush as a reference to do something like that. But first thing first. I need to stop getting hit. Luckily, this training will also allow me to improve my control over the winds further. Something that will be very useful for my plans to create new vacuum jutsus and wind jutsus. Fujin began his training. Since the technique didn't require a crazy amount of chakra, he created three shadow clones. Fujin and a clone continued hardening their right arm and tried to control the winds while the other two did the same with their left arm. While Fujin lost himself in his training, Shikaku and Hiruzen were very busy. Shikaku had already arranged for the next 500 ninjas to move. So he and Hiruzen focused on the next most important issue, how a Wabakure could know that Fujin would be sent there a few months in advance. Hiruzen entered Eagle's office. Eagle, who was busy handling the files, looked up and saw Hiruzen standing in front of him. He asked, What brings you here, father? Hiruzen said, The current deployment is due to the mission you assigned to Fujin. The one behind those incidents in the land of Waterfall was a Wabakure. Fujin's identity was compromised and a Wabakure knew about his arrival far in advance. Eagle's eyes widened. He was surprised to hear that. Hiruzen obviously wouldn't doubt his own son. He asked, Did Danzo or anyone else influence you to send him? Eagle shook his head and said, That's impossible. No one asked me or even hinted at sending Fujin to that mission. In fact, I didn't know I would send him there myself. I only decided that after the previous Umbu squad returned empty-handed. Considering that the incident started around four days ago, there was no way Iwabakir knew that he would be sent there. Hiruzen fell into a thought on hearing his words. He thought, his words are logical. How could anyone know that Fujin would be deployed four months ago? The only way would have been if IWA could arrange for him to be sent. But that doesn't seem to be the case. Did they somehow predict, or perhaps gamble, that we would send Fujin when we learned that this matter needed an elite Jounin to handle? Hiruzen said, All right. If you find or recall anything strange about this incident, come to my office. Eagle nodded. Hiruzen disappeared as quickly as he arrived. Later in the evening, Shikaku once again arrived in Hiruzen's office. Dark bags were visible under his eyes due to his lack of sleep. He asked, Did you find anything from Eagle? 
Haruzan shook his head and answered, No. No one influenced his decision to send Fujin. Did you find anything? Shikaku replied, No. I didn't find anyone suspicious. This means that IWA didn't know that Fujin would be sent there in advance. They might have been wanting to target any elite Jounin we send sneakily and eliminate him. It's likely that they had some spies in the land of Waterfall who identified Fujin's squad when they reached there. So they either activated the trap that they had in place or called for reinforcements within the three days when they were silent. Hiruzen nodded. He had reached the same conclusion as well. He said, so that leaves us with just one more question. Shikaku muttered, how hard IWA will retaliate considering the losses they took. Hiruzen nodded and said, 47 Jounins is a huge number. Anoki should be in a rage once he gets the information about the losses his forces took. But, he should also know that a war between us will be detrimental to both our villages. Suna and Kiri aren't in shape to take advantage of it. So Kumo will benefit heavily. Shikaku agreed. He said, yeah. In addition, though they suffered a heavy loss, they were the ones who attacked first. And the war won't be just between us. Taki will assist us as well. Kusa might help as well considering that IWA sent their Jinchuriki into their territory a few months back. At the very least, we can ask them to deploy their forces on Awagakure borders to pressurize them and split their forces. Chapter 355, Hiruza nodded and said, Yeah. Let's hope that Inoki follows common sense and doesn't act irrationally. Keep a close eye on the situation. If the situation worsens, deploy any tactics you can to inflict heavy losses on Awagakure as soon as the war starts. That would deter IWA from escalating the situation, or at least slow them for some time, allowing us important time to reaccess the situation and mobilize our forces appropriately. Also, call Renjiro here. Call Eagle as well. He will act as Renjiro's deputy and both will lead tomorrow's army. If a war starts, then they could inflict high damage quickly. Shikaku nodded and left the office. He sent messengers to call for Renjiro and Eagle. In Training Ground 23, Fujin dispelled his clones. Over the past seven hours, he had frequently dispelled his clones to get their experiences and chakra and created new ones to continue training. His right arm hardened once again. Winds began flowing around it. The amount of times the winds hit his arm was very low compared to when he had started. Fujin flickered and punched at another tree, stopping just before his fist hit the tree. The sharp winds around his fist bombarded the tree, creating thousands of cuts and a few holes through the stem. Though the tree still stood, it looked like it might split into two with just a small force. Fujin observed the damage and thought, much better. Currently, I'm only being hit around 22 times per second. I should be able to reduce it to zero in a few more training sessions. The damage also has increased. It looks like I'll be able to add this attack to my arsenal soon. Unfortunately, my chakra is too low right now. I'll go to meditate again. After my chakra recovers, I should be able to train for another session before the effect of the soldier pill is over and I'm forced to take a long sleep. Fujin immediately flickered towards the Umbu training facility. Shikaku returned to the office with Renjiro and Eagle after some time. Both Haruzen and Shikaku briefed them on the situation and properly explained the plan they had come up with. Renjiro and Eagle immediately understood the severity of the situation. Both immediately got to work. In order to have the ability to quickly inflict damage on IWA, both used their connections to call multiple veteran Jounins to assist them during the mission. Neither called in Fujin as they knew that he needed some time to rest. Land of Waterfall At midnight, a thousand ninjas snuck out of Takigakir in search of a Wagakir ninjas who had long left. So they didn't find any enemy en route. Before dawn, the Takigakir forces reached the village where IWA forces had clashed with Fujin. They were welcomed by a massive fire, covering the entire horizon. Before leaving, IWA ninjas had eliminated any and all traces of combat. The ground was brought back to normal. 
All the holes dug due to Fujin's vacuum bullets or craters formed due to explosions or changes due to other earth jutsus were fixed. The only thing they couldn't hide was the massive forest fire Fujin's and Kurigan's combination attack had created. Though they could douse the fire, they weren't confident of hiding the traces. Kitsuchi had analyzed, fixing this is impossible. I can't raise so many new trees in the blink of an eye. What we could do is douse the fire and bury the burnt trees deep underground. This will remove all traces of the fire. But, it will leave a lot of flaws. For one, the people familiar with the surroundings will notice a huge patch of forest missing. Also, since the fire was shot from the skies, it is possible that others noticed it as well. Leave it. I'll let this forest fire spread. Hiding it will raise more questions than solving them. Besides, IWA isn't known for fire jutsus anyway. It might align properly with our cover. Kitsuchi decided against dealing with the forest fire. So for over a day and a half, the fire had been spreading throughout the area. Millions of trees had burned down. Even more wildlife was escaping the area. Despite the nighttime, the Taki ninjas didn't have any cover of the night due to the light from the massive fire. Fortunately, the forest fire was a long distance away from the village and was spreading in the other direction. The Taki ninjas tried to hide as much as they could and moved towards the village, encircling it slowly. Taking utmost precaution, they stayed some distance away and kept an eye on the village. They hadn't expected to find anything and were planning to send clones first and then a few weaker ninjas to inspect the village. However, to their surprise, they spotted a few people moving in and out of the village. The people looked like normal villagers. Confused, they decided to inspect properly. One brave Jounin, Kagon, along with a few Jinnins were sent into the village to inspect. Kagon inspected the people and interacted with them. He thought, what the hell is happening here? These people all look fine. The village itself has no damage at all. It's almost like nothing has happened here. Kagon quickly found the old village chief and said, What happened here? The village chief quickly recognized his headband. He immediately said, We are not sure ourselves. A few days ago, a few ninjas appeared in our village. They captured us all and did something. I and everyone else fell unconscious. We don't remember anything after that. We woke up around a couple of hours ago and were scared by the massive fire outside. Fortunately, our village is safe from it. Also, nothing from the village was stolen. We decided to fill our stomachs first as everyone was hungry and planned to send a messenger to the Ito family after sun rose. Kagon was confused. He thought, what the hell? Their falling asleep should mean that a Wagakure ninjas used Jinjutsu on them. But why did they keep everyone in the village alive? What were they planning? And where are those Awagakure ninjas? He looked at the village chief and asked, Do you remember what those ninjas looked like? The village chief tried to think, but he couldn't recall any face. He said, I can't recall anyone's face. But I remember one thing. Kagon asked, What do you remember? The village chief answered, they all wore a headband on their foreheads, just like you. But the symbol was different. It looked like a leaf. Like the symbol of Kanaha Bakur. Kagon's eyes widened on hearing that. He became serious and thought, does he mean to say that Kanoha was behind this incident? Or did Iwabakur try to set them up by disguising their headbands? He thought for a bit before deciding, I can't make a decision on this matter. I will have to report it to the advisors. He said, you don't need to send a messenger to the Ito family. Stay in the village and check whether everything is in place. If you remember something else, contact me. The village chief nodded. Kagon asked similar questions to others in the village. However, everyone he asked gave the same answers. He left the village and reported what he found to the advisors hiding outside. The advisors were also stumped by the information. But they decided to ignore it for the time being and decided to inspect the village. A couple of seal masters were sent to check the village for any seals. Iwagakure. 
A few hours after the Taki army reached the village, Kitsuchi returned to Iwabakure. The forces with him would return to the village in smaller batches to avoid any suspicions. In order to show that IWA had nothing to do with the incidents, Kitsuchi didn't deploy any forces on the border. He wasn't worried about Takigekure attacking their borders. If they did, then IWA would hit back hard and Kanoha wouldn't have any righteous excuse to help Takigekure. Kitsuchi entered Suchikage's office. Anoki looked up and saw him. He said, Good to see you back. A frown formed on his face as Anoki asked, Why is your expression so down? Kitsuchi sighed and said, Everyone leave. Immediately, all the ninjas and the umbu in the room left. The doors and windows were shut and the secrecy seals were activated. Anoki asked, What happened in the land of waterfall? Kitsuchi said, We lured Suzuki Fujin into the trap. But nothing after that happened as per our plan. Kitsuchi narrated the fight against Fujin to Anoki. Anoki's eyes widened. His expression became serious as he learnt the full range of Fujin's abilities. He muttered, Vacuum Jutsus, a summon that can fly and is equivalent to an elite Jounin in power, high few Jutsu attainments, 47 Jounins. He went silent for a minute. Despite having seen so much, the details were still too much for Anoki to digest easily. A well-planned trap that was created by Kitsuchi and overseen by him was broken. They suffered heavy losses and only received more information in return. Chapter 356 Kitsuchi waited without speaking, waiting for Anoki. Finally, Anoki sighed and muttered, This brings back the bitter memories of the last war. Kitsuchi understood what Anoki meant. IWA had paid a bitter price to eliminate the third rakage. Soon after, Minato eliminated an entire army of thousand ninjas consisting of only Jounins and Chunins by himself. The twin blows forced Anoki to back down and sign a peace agreement with Kanoha. Anoki could see that Kitsuchi was very dejected by his loss. In order to lift his morale, he said, though the losses are high, they show how dangerous this kid is. Any one of these three aspects would force us to take that ninja seriously. But this kid has all three. And that too at the age of 14. In the future, he will be as dangerous as Hataki Kakashi. Perhaps, he might even reach the same heights as Minato. If a similar incident like the QB assault doesn't happen again, Kanoha will once again enter a golden period. We have to crush him before he completely matures. Otherwise, we won't have anyone to defend against Kanoha in the future. Anoki thought, though we too have three promising youngsters, they are far lacking as compared to Fujin and Kakashi. It's very unlikely that Kuratsuchi, Akatsuchi, or Deidara will reach the same level as me. So once my power begins to fade, we will be very vulnerable to any attacks from Kanoha. Kitsuchi interrupted his thoughts and asked, I agree. But how should we kill him? On seeing his speed firsthand and knowing that he has a summon that can fly, I can't deal with him myself. In fact, when he works together with his summon, even I am at risk. Anoki nodded and said, Yeah, you can't. The only way to kill him will be by catching him off guard with my dust release or with the tailed beast bomb. Kitsuchi argued, but creating chances to do that will be very difficult. He will be more careful while going on missions from now on. Not to mention, you, Han and Rashi can't move around normally. It will raise a lot of questions if you do and enemy villages could set up traps to lure and eliminate you as well. Kitsuchi understood that Kanoha and other countries could set up traps as well. Kanoha especially was very dangerous in this aspect due to having intelligent and devious planners like Haruzen, Shikaku and Danzo and also had the Sanins to ensure the success of such traps. Anoki said, that's true. In addition, creating such chances will cause a lot of losses to our village. We could endure losing 50 Jounins once. But if it happens a couple more times, our strength will be crippled. So we will need outside aid. Kitsuchi was surprised. He asked, You mean? Anoki nodded and replied, Even though Fujin is a threat, he specializes in wind release. Hiruzen should be developing him to restrain Kumo. 
I would understand what threat he would pose to them in the future. In fact, he will be even more worried than us. Kitsuchi nodded. Anoki said, I will send a messenger to Kumo and ask them for 1,000 earth crystals in exchange for his information. Once they understand his threat, I will also act to kill him. Irrespective of whether Kumo kills him or he kills numerous Kumo ninjas, we will benefit from their losses. Once Kumo sends over the resources, I will increase his bounty from 20 million to 50 million Rio. Luckily, there is a certain mercenary organization that seems to need a lot of money. Kitsuchi asked, Akatsuki? Anoki nodded. Kitsuchi asked, What about Suna? Considering his skills, it was likely that Fujin was the one behind the incidents in the Land of Wind a year ago. Anoki snorted and answered, That brat Raza is useless. We have already provided them with so much information and yet, they have done nothing. Besides, they won't be able to afford the price of this information. Let them be caught off guard and suffer just like us. Kitsuchi replied, All right. Anoki said, For now, focus on the ones who were killed. Find suitable excuses for their death and inform their families one by one. Keep the matter as quiet as you can. If the news of so many Jounin deaths is leaked, panic will spread in the village. Kitsuchi's mood became heavy once again. He blamed himself for those losses. He nodded and said, I will get it done personally. He began walking out of the office. Anoki looked at his back and said, Though this loss was unfortunate, it isn't a reason to give up what you started. Continue building this unit. Raise its numbers to beyond 200. Use what you learn about him from this battle against him and train the ninjas to counter that. Even if we don't get to use this unit against Fujin, a unit like this will become an asset for our village. Its impact might be as good as a rank S ninja. Kitsuchi looked back and said with determination, I will keep working with the ninjas and provide them with more training. Next time, we won't suffer such a loss. Anoki nodded. Kitsuchi left the office. Anoki stayed silent for some time before letting out another sigh. He muttered, What a troublesome brat. I need to provide more training to the youngsters. Anoki grabbed a scroll and began writing a letter to Kumovikur. Land of Waterfall Around the same time that Kitsuchi exited Anoki's office, Kakashi reached the border with the Land of Waterfall. By then, the forest fire was doused and Takigakir sealmasters had checked the village several times. However, no matter how many times they checked, they found no evidence of any seals in the village. They declared the village to be perfectly safe. During this time, the other villages, where the villagers were supposed to be missing, sent messengers to nearby villages and the Ito family's town. Since those villagers also remembered just the headband, they informed everyone about the same. Due to the same thing being said to dozens of villages, a rumor started forming in the Ito family's territory. The rumor stated that Kanoha ninjas were behind the recent missing incidents. Neither Kanoha nor Takigakir were aware of the start of this rumor. Since the Ito family wasn't in their town, they were unaware as well and did nothing to stop it. Since the Takigakir army didn't find anything wrong in the village or any signs of Awabakir ninjas, they decided to move on. They left just two squads in the village so that they wouldn't fall into a trap if IWA had left one behind. They separated into smaller groups and began moving around the Ito family's territory to find any traces of IWA ninjas. However, despite searching for hours, they didn't find any traces of IWA ninjas. Instead, they found that people in the remaining villages that had gone missing months ago also reappeared safe and sound. In addition, they also heard the rumors that were spreading. They sent a message back to Takigakir and continued looking. Takigakir Shibuki sat in his office with a confused expression. He read the scroll once again and wondered, what the heck is going on in the Ito family's territory? First, so many people went missing without leaving any traces. Then Kanoha ninjas claimed that they fought against IWA ninjas and blamed them for the incident. But our armies found no traces of combat. They only found a burning forest. And the missing people suddenly appeared back without any harm done. 
Only the people who were kidnapped individually are still missing. But the people who return say that Kanoha is behind the incidents. He wondered, is Kanoha trying to make a fool of me? But what would they get from such actions? He analyzed for a few minutes before shaking his head. He concluded, no, Kanoha doesn't have anything to gain from this. If they wanted something, they could have easily hidden their identities from normal civilians. They won't do such a sloppy job. So IWA is still the most suspicious one. But why is IWA doing this? Shibuki called for a council meeting. After a long discussion, they reached the same conclusion. The only thing they couldn't agree upon was the intention behind Iwa's actions. They waited for a day to receive more updates from their ninjas. However, they didn't find any additional information. The only thing that happened was that the rumor spread even more and started spreading to nearby territories. Shibuki sent a messenger to Kakashi's camp, informing him about the situation. By the time the messenger reached, Renjiro and Eagle had already reached and joined up with Kakashi's 250 ninjas, taking the total number to over 750. Kakashi, Renjiro, and Eagle sat in the commander's camp with confused and peculiar expressions on their faces. All three were trying to make sense of the situation. Chapter 357, Kakashi asked, What is Iwavik you're planning? Renjiro said, It's tough to say. They might still be hiding considering that they have a Grandmaster in Fuinjutsu. But, if they wanted to attack, they could have already taken out a good number of Taki's forces without taking much damage. Unlike the two of them, Eagle, who frequently dealt with things in the shadows, could see a few clues. He said, it looks like they want to change the public perception. Rinjiro and Kakashi immediately understood. They thought for a bit. Rinjiro said, I see. The important part isn't what the people in the villages saw and instead, the rumor they started. Once the rumor spreads, the common people in the land of Waterfall will hate us or be fearful of us. Kakashi added, not just the land of Waterfall, the people in the surrounding countries will also be alert. They will develop some vigilance towards us. Rinjiro nodded and said, True. But it will only spread to the common people. The military leaders will be able to see the truth at first glance. Takigakir will be forced to ally more deeply with Kanoha. That's the most important matter. Kakashi argued, But if we leave this matter unchecked, it could develop into a big problem. Especially if the next generation of nobles and ninjas grew up hearing this rumor. However, Renjiro shook his head and said, that will take over ten years to happen. We can change the public perception a hundred times during this time. Eagle nodded in agreement. He could see that he would have to assign numerous Umbu missions in the land of Waterfall to clear their image. He said, it looks like IWA has accepted their defeat in this matter. These rumors are like a consolation win for them. Renjiro nodded. Kakashi sighed and thought, another big troop movement without any fight. He asked, so, do we stay or leave? Rinjiro replied, it's better to stay for some time to dissuade IWA from getting adventurous. Besides, Taki would want us to wait here as well. Neither Eagle nor Kakashi opposed his decision. Eagle sent a reply back with the messenger, asking Taki to rein in the rumors and lay the blame on IWA. However, Considering the bleak mood in the common people due to recent events, Taki decided against blaming IWA and instead just tried to clear Kanoha's name without much success. This would create a peculiar situation in the land of Waterfall. A situation that neither Taki nor Kanoha foresaw when they dispatched their armies. The ninjas and the nobles in the land of Waterfall believed that Iwavikir was behind the recent incidents and that Kanoha saved them. While the common people believed that Kanoha was behind the recent incidents and blamed them for the people who were still missing. When Haruzen and Shikaku received the reports, they analyzed the situation as well. After some time, Shikaku said, it looks like a last-ditch effort to get some sort of benefit. IWA really suffered in this adventure. Haruzen nodded and added, Anoki won't start a war. But, he might try to assassinate our top talent. Fujin and Kakashi would be at the top of his list. Start developing countermeasures if he does act. 
Shikaku replied, I will. It's also possible that he might get other villages involved. Especially Kumo. They might see Fujin's wind release as a threat. Hiruzen nodded. Just like Shikaku speculated, a messenger reached Kumo the Cure about a week after the clash in the land of Waterfall. He asked for an audience with the fourth rakage and handed him the scroll before being escorted into a guest house. In his office, a frown formed on Ai's face as he read Anoki's message. He muttered, What information does that geezer have to charge such an exorbitant price? Mabui, who looked into the scroll as well, said, 1,000 earth crystals is a huge price, Rakage Sama. It's worth billions of Rio. Do you think that the Tsuchikage is trying to make a fool out of us? I thought for a bit and said, it's unlikely. Though the price is huge, it's not enough to completely give up his credibility. And from his warnings, it's likely that isn't the information that is costly. Rather, the cost that we may have to bear if we don't know about this. Mabui thought for a bit and agreed. Though 1,000 earth crystals was a high price, it wasn't enough to give up Akage's credibility. I said, arrange for the crystals and hand it to the messenger. Mabui nodded and left the office. Despite many schemes being devised against him, Fujin was clueless about these developments. However, ever since his clash with Kitsuchi, Fujin was aware that it was only a matter of time before his information was leaked. So he didn't dare to slack off. Fujin's breathing was rough, he looked exhausted and both his fists were visibly bruised. Around him were several broken trees and numerous rocks with cracks on their surface. He sighed and muttered, I'm low on chakra once again. He took a few deep breaths. A smile slowly appeared on his face. He clenched his right fist and pulled it back while he thought, but it's worth it. Winds appeared around his right fist and forearm. In the blink of an eye, they began flowing like a tornado around his arm. To an untrained eye, it would appear that winds were revolving around his arm at a very high speed. However, there were multiple layers and features to this wind. Underneath the winds, his fist and arm were covered with concentrated chakra. The concentration was more on his fist with a very thin layer on the rest of his arm. If Fujin punched anyone who didn't use a good defensive jutsu or didn't have an insane physique, it was sufficient to kill that person. In addition, the chakra wasn't static. Instead, it moved in the opposite direction of the wind that was revolving around Fujin's arm. Due to this, in addition to its offensive nature, it also protected Fujin from his own technique. Fujin was inspired by the thin film of chakra that he used to isolate vacuum cores while using vacuum jutsus while creating this. In the past few days, Fujin had managed to ensure that no winds hit his arm. However, he decided to do this in order to ensure that he wouldn't be injured in case he ever made a mistake. If he ended up making a mistake in the heat of battle and got distracted by the pain, that split-second distraction could put him at a disadvantage or, in the worst case, cost him his life. The winds themselves were extremely sharp. They could easily tear apart a person leaving only his skeleton behind. Fujin flickered and appeared in front of a small hill he had raised earlier using earth release. He punched it with his full might. The chakra-enhanced punch immediately created a giant crater on the side of the hill. Several giant cracks spread throughout the hill. At the very next moment, the winds around Fujin's arm hit the damaged hill. Some winds bombarded the parts that were still undamaged, creating hundreds of deep scars in the hill. Some wind moved into the cracks that were created by the punch and began damaging the hill from inside. Fujin immediately jumped back. The part of the hill where he had punched crumbled and fell on the ground, releasing a lot of dust. Fujin looked at the damage with a smile and thought, Great. Iron Skin Jutsu won't be able to block this attack. The chakra-enhanced punch is sufficient to create cracks in iron skin jutsu used even by a top-level ninja like Kitsuchi. When followed up by sharp winds that invade into the cracks, the attack would end up ripping the person from inside. Fujin had a thoughtful expression. He analyzed, Actually, I can make this technique several times more lethal. No, I can make it so lethal that no one would dare to fight me with taijutsu. Perhaps only the last two gates of Gai, maybe the sixth as well, 
might be able to counter me then. It's likely that I could hurt Rakage with it as well. The way to make it so lethal is to add vacuum waves to the winds rotating around my arm. As long as I manage to add it properly, no one would dare fight me in close range. Unfortunately, a wry smile appeared on Fujin's face. The idea he came up with was great. It had the potential to be classified as a rank S jutsu and the potential to revolutionize taijutsu. But, Fujin didn't dare attempt it. He thought, if I mess up even once, I will directly lose my arm. No amount of chakra or protection from iron skin jutsu would help me avoid that. Though I could use shadow clones to master this, there is always a risk while using a technique like this even if I master it. Despite its potential, the benefits from this technique are just not enough to justify the high risk. Fujin shook his head and thought, anyways, even without adding vacuum, to develop a new jutsu from scratch in just a week, and such a lethal jutsu at that. Hee hee, these three months are going to be fun. Sadly, this was the easier part. I had some inspiration from Kuragain's attack as well as from the way vacuum jutsus were formed. The next part won't be easy. Regardless, this calls for celebration. He began walking towards Ichiraku while thinking, what should I call this jutsu? Hmm. Well, it doesn't have to be something very complicated. I'll just call it the Hurricane Fist. Chapter 358 Fujin celebrated his success in creating a new jutsu within a week by eating an Ichiraku until he couldn't eat anymore. He followed it up by taking a long, well-deserved sleep. At dawn, Fujin woke up as usual, freshened up and got ready for another day of training. He thought, it's been six days since the effects of the previous soldier pill ended. My body is rested sufficiently. There shouldn't be any danger in consuming another soldier pill. Let me see how good Haruzen's pill is. Fujin grabbed the bottle that Haruzen had handed him and moved to the lowest floor in his basement. He opened the bottle and tossed a pill in his mouth. At the same time, the chakra in his body separated into two parts, one having 80% of his chakra and another having 20%. At the next moment, the entire basement was filled with smoke. Eighty shadow clones appeared in the basement, each having 1% of Fujin's chakra. Without any word, every clone began working on the four symbol seal. As for Fujin, he left his home and entered the wind training room in the Umbu facility. As he began meditating, he thought, I'll skip my physical training when I'm using this chakra pill. While physical training is important, I won't be making any major breakthroughs anytime soon. I can delay it for a bit and use the time to focus on ninjutsu. Anyways, let's see how effective this pill is. Fujin closed his eyes and started his meditation. Two hours later, Fujin opened his eyes. A look of surprise could be seen on his face. He muttered to himself, this pill is incredible. The pill I was using earlier would have needed 10 hours to bring me back to full chakra. But with this pill, I managed to reach it in just slightly over 2 hours. This pill is nearly 5 times as effective. Such a good pill. I should have asked Haruzen about this earlier. Once this batch is consumed, I should ask him to procure more for me as well. These are too good. Anyway, it looks like I can train at full strength for at least 80 to 90 hours in the next 5 days. With his chakra back to full, Fujin immediately left the training facility and returned to training ground 23. He decided, it's time to work on wind vacuum technique. I will first start by creating vacuum jutsus that don't have to be shot from my mouth. Once I have a sufficient number of them, I will start creating a vacuum jutsu that can affect a large area. The first part will also have to be divided into multiple phases. The first phase will involve deciding on a structure of the jutsu and creating it. This should be relatively easier. The second phase will involve increasing the number of jutsus I can use at the same time as well as using the jutsu in creative ways to catch enemies off guard. And the last phase will involve granting speed to these jutsus. As long as I can reach the same speed as vacuum bullet, then this fighting style will become very difficult to counter. Anyway, enough planning. Time to convert my ideas into a reality. 
Fujin extended his right arm forward and pointed his finger at a tree. Slowly, a vacuum core, shaped like a bullet, began forming in front of his finger. As soon as the vacuum core was formed, it was covered by a multi-layered chakra film and engulfed by winds. Fujin fired the bullet at a rock. However, mid-route, the bullet collapsed and dispersed into the air. Fujin analyzed, though the concept is similar, I am not used to creating vacuum bullet outside my mouth. Still, I should be able to learn this quickly. The difficult part will be traveling speed. It was too slow. Fujin began practicing creating and firing a vacuum bullet with his finger. After a few tries, he managed to make a proper bullet which pierced through the rock. He continued the training as he couldn't do it with 100% accuracy. A few hours later, Fujin stood at the same spot in the training ground. Three shadow clones stood around him, facing in different directions. Each one was facing a different rock. Each rock had hundreds of small holes in them. At the same time, they pointed at the rocks. Vacuum bullets began forming in front of their fingers at a quick speed. One second later, they fired the bullets at the rocks. The vacuum bullets pierced through the rocks and traveled for over a hundred meters, piercing several trees in their paths. Fujin dispelled his clones and got their experiences. He thought, good. I can now use it without any mistakes all the time. Though the time needed to create it is still high, it should come down as I practice it more. I will begin creating multiple bullets at the same time. Fujin extended his right hand forward once again, this time extending all five fingers. Five vacuum cores began forming simultaneously, one in front of each finger. However, after forming partially, all five collapsed. Fujin sighed and muttered, looks like it won't be as easy as I imagined it to be. He created three shadow clones and continued his training. Half an hour later, Fujin sat down with his back against a tree while breathing heavily. He had already dispelled his clones. After catching his breath, a bitter smile appeared on his face. He thought, creating five vacuum bullets at the same time increased my chakra expenditure by five times as well. Using shadow clones here isn't very helpful. Since his chakra was very low, Fujin returned to the Umbu training facility to meditate for a couple of hours until his chakra recovered. For the next four days, Fujin followed this training plan. He would practice creating vacuum bullets with his hands until he ran out of chakra. Once out of chakra, he would go back to wine training rooms and meditate for a couple of hours until the soldier pill did its job. In addition, once every eight hours, Fujin would dispel the shadow clones who were learning the four symbol seal and create new ones. For the first time in his life, Fujin didn't take a single break for four days straight. Instead, he considered the meditation time as a break. As a result, he made rapid progress in two very complex techniques. He could feel that he was getting close to mastering the four symbol seal. And, his control over vacuum bullets created outside his body also increased. And, despite making such rapid gains, no one was aware of Fujin's progress. No one except one person who had rather mixed feelings about the same. Hiruzen watched in his crystal ball as a few drops of sweat rolled down his face. He swallowed his saliva and wondered, does he have to return to meditate there every time he runs out of chakra? Those wind crystals shouldn't even have any more effect on him. It's a complete ways for him to keep using so many of them. In fact, I think he has already consumed more wind crystals than I consume fire crystals. As the successor of the mighty Saratobi clan and Tobarama student, Hiruzen received abundant help from his clan and the village. So he used a lot of elemental crystals. But once the effect of the crystal began reducing, he was made to stop. After all, the Saratobi clan as well as Kanoha had a lot of other ninjas to nurture. Hiruzen understood it and never used an elemental crystal after its effect decreased under a certain level. However, Fujin didn't think about such matters. Unlike a young Hiruzen, Fujin couldn't care less about whether others received wind crystals or not. He just focused on becoming strong himself. Unfortunately, Hiruzen couldn't complain to anyone. He couldn't even ask Fujin to stop using them or use them within limits. 
After all, ever since the day Fujin stepped into the academy, he had bombarded him with the will of fire. Though Fujin was quite mature for his age, Hiruzen wasn't sure how Fujin would take the news of him not being allowed to use any more wind crystals. Hiruzen thought, considering his greedy nature, he will question my will of fire if I ask him to limit its usage. A bitter smile appeared on Hiruzen's face as he sighed. He muttered, now I see why he agreed for three months without any argument. I messed up. I should have said one month and settled for one and a half or two months vacation. Fujin was blissfully unaware of Hiruzen's sorrow. Of course, even if he knew, he would just grin and continue doing the same. Once his chakra reserves recovered, Fujin returned to the training ground. He extended both his arms forward and stretched his fingers. In about a quarter of a second, ten vacuum bullets were created. He launched them all at the rock in front of him. The vacuum bullets pierced through the rock leaving ten new holes in it. Fujin repeated the attack a dozen times until the rock crumbled. Fujin observed the result and analyzed, All right, I can use this attack without any mistakes. The basic form of this jutsu can be considered as mastered, though I still need a few improvements. Chapter 359, Fujin analyzed, the first improvement is increasing the amount of bullets I can fire. The ideal will be if I can fire 10 rounds of this attack in less than a second. That will make trying to outnumber me very expensive in terms of life. This attack alone could force an army to retreat. Of course, that is if that army isn't suicidal like the one that fought the third wreckage until he died. The second improvement is to increase my control over these bullets. Right now, I can change the direction in which I want to fire the bullets by pointing each finger in a different direction. But once I fire it, I can't control it any longer and it only travels in a straight line. Also, I can't twist my fingers too much. But if I can make the bullets curve in the air, or better, get the ability to freely change their direction mid-flight, then it will add even more aspects to this jutsu. It will completely make all preparations against me completely redundant. And the last and the most critical improvement needed is speed. Though the speed of these bullets is higher than my vacuum sphere, it is much slower as compared to the vacuum bullets I shoot from my mouth. In fact, it is even slower than the air bullet jutsu. At this speed, the jutsu wouldn't be as effective as I wanted it to be. Though it will still add a new dimension to my fighting style, it won't be that threatening. After all, those IWA ninjas could dodge the vacuum bullets consistently. In addition to the above, I also need to decrease the amount of time I need to create and launch the jutsu. But that will keep decreasing just like it did during the last three days. Fujin analyzed for a bit and decided, I will start by working on the speed aspect. I'll move on to the other two improvements once its speed is at least greater than the air bullet jutsu. Fujin began working on the jutsu again. Since he was only working on the speed of the bullet, he created three shadow clones and worked with just one bullet at a time. Fujin and his clones worked on the jutsu for around half an hour. A frown formed on Fujin's face. He dispelled his clones and got their memories. His frown deepened as he thought, I have made no improvements at all. Is this the max speed I can go? Fujin shook his head and thought, No. How can that be? There should be some method of increasing the speed. But, I will have to innovate because the normal method doesn't seem to be very effective. Fujin began thinking. However, even after ten minutes, he couldn't come up with anything. Fujin sighed and muttered, This is tough. I can't think of anything that could give me a breakthrough. When I shoot the vacuum bullets or air bullets from my mouth, I am able to give an additional push to it due to the wind chakra I gather in my mouth and throat and use it to blow the bullets. But doing so with hands is difficult. For some reason, when I try to infuse wind chakra from my finger in the same way, the result is very subpar. I need a better way. Should I ask Haruzan for help? Fujin thought for a few seconds before shaking his head. He thought, I'm sure Haruzan would have some methods to resolve this. Even if he doesn't, he could apply the concept behind Tobarama's high-speed water jutsus to wind jutsus and teach me. But, I don't want to take such a shortcut. 
at least not yet when I haven't given it my all. If I become dependent on him, then I will struggle a lot in the future when I try to develop even more advanced jutsus. Of course, if there is no choice, I won't shy away from asking him. I could think of at least a dozen ways of using the will of fire to make that old fox teach me. Having made his decision, Fujin immediately created shadow clones. A couple of dozen clones appeared next to him. All of the clones had very low chakra. They all sat down and began thinking about methods to increase the speed of the bullets. Despite thinking for another hour, Fujin couldn't think of any good ideas. He looked at his clones and thought, I hope some of them had better luck. He dispelled his clones and received their memories. After organizing all his thoughts, Fujin analyzed, hmm, nothing too revolutionary. The only decent idea I could come up with was using my own speed to grant more momentum to the vacuum bullets. But this isn't very promising. In combat, I might not always get the chance to move at a very high speed to provide momentum to the jutsu. One way to overcome this could be by providing momentum by just moving my hand at a fast speed. However, it is a problem as well. My main reason for making this jutsu is to not give a lot of signs to show that I'm preparing vacuum jutsu. The jutsu will lose its purpose if that is compromised. Regardless, I don't have any better ideas. I will first try with increased momentum and then try to increase the amount of wind chakra I infuse in the jutsu. Fujin extended his arm forward and began creating a vacuum bullet in front of his index finger. Suddenly, he moved forward at a rapid speed while the vacuum bullet was still being created. As soon as the vacuum bullet was created, he shot it straight in front of him. The vacuum bullet traveled at a high speed, piercing everything that stood in its way. Fujin analyzed, that's better. The speed is comparable to air bullet jutsu, though it is still slightly slower. Unfortunately, this method is one big weakness. Fujin began creating another vacuum bullet and moved at a high speed. As soon as the bullet was prepared, he turned his hand towards his right and fired it. The vacuum bullet began traveling towards his right. However, due to his momentum, the vacuum bullet also moved forward. Fujin missed his target by a huge distance. And, the speed of the bullet was much slower. Fujin thought, as I calculated. The momentum is only useful while firing the bullet in the same direction. But which fool will keep standing at the same place in a battle? The technique is almost completely useless while firing in other directions. Not to mention, it will put a huge retrain on my fighting style. Fujin raised his right arm and thought, I wonder if the momentum from a jab will be sufficient. Fujin pulled his arm back, preparing to jab the air in front of him. A vacuum bullet began forming once again. He jabbed forward as fast as he could. The hand stopped exactly when the vacuum bullet was formed. At the same moment, the vacuum bullet was fired. It traveled at nearly the same speed as the vacuum bullet Fujin fired earlier. Fujin analyzed, hmm, not bad. It's faster than I expected. This is more usable in battle. Though it still gives a little clue due to my arm movement, it's probably better than puffed cheeks. Unfortunately, the speed is still slower than air bullets. There is no point in comparing it to the vacuum bullets I shoot from my mouth. How can I increase it further? Fujin analyzed for a minute and concluded, I guess I could move at a fast speed while jabbing forward. The two boosts shout stack up and increase the speed to at least beyond the air bullet but it still has the same weakness. I should instead focus on making my jab faster. Fujin suddenly had an idea. He thought, the assassin's rush jutsu works by expelling a large amount of wind behind me at a high speed. What if I create a smaller, localized version of this jutsu? I could expel the winds just behind my elbow and move my arm forward at a high speed using the assassin's rush. It will not only increase the speed of my bullet but will also reduce the amount of time I need to jab and hence reduce the warning time that my enemy has. Fujin thought for a bit to analyze whether the idea was feasible. After a few minutes, he nodded and thought, yes, this should be the way to go. Not to mention, I could also use this method to improve my taijutsu. 
I can use a similar force to increase the speed of my punches and kicks. Maybe even the speed of my sword slash. In fact, I can even do a... Fujin's mind suddenly went silent as another idea appeared in his mind. A weird expression appeared on his face. He felt an overwhelming urge to facepalm himself. Chapter 360 A wry smile appeared on Fujin's face as he thought, Since when did I become so stupid? Why should I develop a localized version of the assassin's rush jutsu to increase the speed of my jab? Instead of releasing wind towards the back of my elbow, why don't I release it from the tip of my fingers? All the speed will be transferred to the vacuum bullet directly. And I won't need to do any wasted movements that could drop hints to my opponent. Fujin maintained a minute of silence for missing such an obvious trick to solve his issues. Finally, he shook his head and thought, leave it. Such things need to click. Otherwise, one may not see it even if it is in front of their eyes. Still, I should work on the localized version of Assassin's Rush as well later on. Perhaps I could test it against Guy. Fujin raised his right hand to his chest level and pointed his index finger forward. He closed his eyes and recalled how he normally used the Assassin's Rush Jutsu. Soon, a small amount of chakra appeared on Fujin's finger. It quickly transformed into wind and was released from Fujin's entire index finger instead of just the tip. Fujin watched with deadpan eyes as a gentle breeze moved for a couple of feet before dissipating. He let out a sigh and complained, This won't be as easy as I thought. Why does everything have to be so difficult? Fortunately, it consumed very little chakra. Fujin created a dozen shadow clones and started his training to modify the assassin's rush jutsu. Fujin trained till 2 a.m. Since the jutsu consumed very little chakra, he needed to visit the wind training room to rest just once. Due to his clones, he made rapid progress. However, he was still far away from reaching a satisfactory level. He walked to his home and took a bath before diving into his bed. Lying in his bed, he thought, just another couple of hours for the effects of the pill to end. To think that I still don't feel any physical tiredness. This pill is good. Still, this is so difficult. In the last 118 hours, I have had 80 clones working on the four symbol seal for at least 108 hours. Which means that I spent 8,960 hours learning that seal. That's more than a freaking year. A freaking year without any break. And still, I haven't mastered it. How the fuck did Minato, Jiraiya, Orochimaru, and Hiruzen even master this? I wonder if the Uzumaki clan had some sort of shortcut to learn this seal that they know of. Or is it simply a difference of talent? Then again, it is possible that all four of them took the same route as me and needed to work on it for a long time with numerous clones. All four have or had more chakra than I have right now. Leave it. It doesn't matter. I am very close to mastering it. I should be done in another session or two with these pills. Hiruzen said that I should take a day's break after the effect of the pill runs out. But I suppose he didn't imagine that I would train for so long. It might be better to take two days off. Then I'll focus on physical training while simultaneously improving my control over Assassin's Rush for a week. Then I can consume the pill once again and repeat the entire process five more times until the three months are up. Fujin closed his eyes and kept lying in his bed without thinking about anything else. The last five days were very taxing on his mind. He needed a long sleep and a break from continuously straining his brain to find ways of increasing his strength. At dawn, the effects of the chakra pill ended and Fujin fell into a deep sleep. While Fujin slept peacefully, a ninja entered a wavikure. He moved stealthily and entered into the Tsuchikage building without attracting much attention. The messenger, who Anoki had sent to Kumo, returned and silently entered the Tsuchikage's office. Anoki saw him and said, Everyone, leave. Immediately, everyone except the messenger left. Anoki asked, How did it go? The messenger said, It went as you predicted, Tsuchikage sama. The rakage didn't give me much trouble. He quickly handed Anoki a scroll. When Anoki grabbed it, a huge pressure was lifted from his shoulders. The messenger thought, finally. 
I was so tense and worried that someone might rob me. And I had to travel to such dangerous areas as well. Anoki noticed his expression and chuckled. He said, You have done well. You can take a couple of weeks off. When you leave, ask the umbu outside to call for Kitsuchi. The messenger quickly said, Thank you, Tsuchikich sama He took his leave. Anoki inspected the scroll and thought, All 1,000 earth crystals here. It looks like Kumo hasn't developed a substantial number of Earth Affinity Ninjas. Though Anoki was pleased with getting so many resources, there wasn't any happy expression on his face. He stared at the scroll and sighed while thinking, 1,000 Earth Crystals for the lives of 47 Jounins. This is so not worth it. Anoki kept the scroll down and began writing another letter. It was addressed to the fourth rakage and included numerous details about Fujin's abilities. While he was writing, Kitsuchi arrived and entered the room. He noticed the scroll on the desk and asked, Kumo paid the price? Anoki nodded. He finished writing on the scroll and tossed it at Kitsuchi. Kitsuchi grabbed the scroll and began reading. His eyes widened. He exclaimed, This? Shouldn't we? Anoki cut him off and said, None of the information there is a lie. Besides, we just suffered a heavy loss. Why should we ensure that Kumo doesn't lose any ninjas? Let them fight him. No matter which side gets hurt, both results are good for us. Kitsuchi nodded. Anoki instructed, send this scroll with a messenger bird. After a couple of days, increase Fujin's bounty. Raise it to 50 million Ryo. But don't mention any skills beyond vacuum jutsus and fuin jutsu. Kitsuchi became a bit thoughtful. After a few seconds, he asked, Do you want to deal with the Akatsuki as well? Anoki's expression became a bit grim as he said, That organization gives me a bad feeling. To have so many rank S rogue ninjas gathered together. If they decide to partner with some village in the future, that village will immediately have a huge advantage over the others. If they want to, they could take over a minor village and turn it into a major one. An organization that is so strong and with no mentioned goals can pose a lot of danger. Though I doubt Fujin would be able to kill their members, it'd be great if Hiruzen tasked his students to hunt them down. Kitsuchi nodded. He realized, no matter whether Kumo Vikir takes action or whether Akatsuki does, irrespective of their success or failure, IWA will get a lot of advantage. Sai, the old man is worthy of his title. Kitsuchi immediately got to work. Around a day later, Rakage received the scroll Anoki sent. Rakage's office. I sat in his chair, reading the letter. Around him, Mabui, Derry, and C were present. I read the scroll and muttered, This brat has become strong. He handed the scroll to the three to read. Derui, C, and Mabui's expressions became serious as they continued reading. Finally, Derui sighed and muttered, I knew that he would become strong. But I didn't expect him to reach this level in less than three years. Mabui questioned that Suchikage said that he could run away from Rashi and Kitsuchi. Do you think that he is telling the truth? I replied, it should be the truth. In fact, I suspect that IWA experienced some sort of painful loss against him. That's why they are trying to get us involved. The information he sent mentions the same vacuum jutsus that Darui reported. The only addition is the vacuum waves jutsu. The more critical matter is his fuin jutsu skill and his flying summon. This information, along with the fact he managed to escape from Kitsuchi and Rashi shows what threat his talent could be in the future. But, Anoki should be hiding a lot more information. Information that could cause us a lot of losses. We can only have a chance of killing him after we figure out this information. Mabui nodded and asked, That's right. We can't expect him to care about our well-being. But, should we still make a move against him? I answered, We don't have an option. Since Anoki sent this information, he must have concluded that this kid has a very high potential. Since he specializes in wind release, Kanoha likely intends to raise him as someone to handle our village during a war. So getting rid of him before he matures will be the best scenario for us. 
otherwise, he could cause a lot of deaths in our future wars with Kanoha. Chapter 361, Mabui, Derui, and Si listened silently. None of them objected to I's decision. After a few seconds, C said, I guess the only question is how we kill him. If Iwa's information is right and he is good at Fuinjutsu, we can't use it to set a trap for him. In addition, he is also a damn good sensor. Drawing him into a trap would be nearly impossible. Even if we succeed somehow, he can easily escape using his summon. Derry added, no, even without his summon, his escaping skill is very good. Last time, we only gave him a few seconds of rest and he created an opportunity to escape. And now, they should be even better. Pinning him down to kill him will be very difficult. IWA should be hiding this information or perhaps didn't get to see it as he decided to fly. C nodded and said, Yeah. Such a troublesome fellow. Considering his speed with wind instantaneous body jutsu and his summons flight, the only sure shot way I can think of killing him is if Rekage Sama and B Sama act together against him. C's words left the entire room, including the four hidden Umbu guards, speechless. To deploy their Kage and their perfect Jinchuriki against a mere fourteen year old ninja. However, no one countered C. Without I, Fujin could just run away by spamming wind instantaneous body jutsu. No one apart from I would be able to give chase. But, I didn't have any good means of attacking someone who flew at a high altitude. Though he could kill Fujin before he got an opportunity to use the summoning jutsu, if Fujin managed to summon, there wouldn't be much he could do. So, they would need Bee's Tail Beast Bomb to target Fujin in that case. But, to deploy them both would be very embarrassing for Kumovicure. I thought, for both me and Bee to go on a hunt to kill one 14-year-old boy. What an embarrassment will that be? Just like Anoki and IWA, I and Kumo fell into the same dilemma. Though Fujin wasn't necessarily stronger than their top ninjas, killing him was an incredibly difficult task. Even if Fujin was defeated, the victory would be pointless if Fujin managed to escape. Due to his young age, he would steadily grow stronger and eventually become a headache for them. Mabui said, that wouldn't be wise. If we have to deploy our leader and our Jinchuriki against him, we will become a joke in the ninja world. Not to mention, their movements will attract a lot of attention. And Kanoha could retaliate by sending their Sanans after our talents as well. I replied, I don't mind being laughed at. Killing him now will save a lot of lives in the future. But you are right. I can't move around rashly. Once I move, I will have to guarantee his death. Until that opportunity arrives, you will have to deal with him and find the information that IWA hasn't mentioned, Derui. Derui nodded and said, All right, boss. He followed it up by sighing and muttering, That's such a pain in the ass. Ice fury surged on hearing Derui complain. Veins visibly pulsated on his forehead. He scolded, It's all your fault for being soft. If you hadn't shown mercy the last time and killed him there, we wouldn't have this problem. Derry immediately apologized, sorry boss. I snorted and said, no need to keep analyzing. Have our spies checked to see what he is doing. We could try to attack him if he takes a mission in the land of frost or the land of hot water. Derry nodded. Both he and C left the room while Mabui continued her work. As he left, Derry thought, I'm curious to see how strong he has become since the last time. Despite their plans to kill Fujin, both Anoki and I missed one crucial aspect. That crucial aspect was the intense training Fujin was undergoing to eliminate his current weaknesses. Anoki, despite all his intelligence and experience, never imagined that his failed trap would result in Fujin taking training so seriously and working to completely revamp his fighting style and habits. Instead, both he and Kitsuchi believed that Fujin would be very happy considering the number of Jounins he killed despite falling into a Wabikure's trap. Any other 14-year-old would be thrilled by having such an achievement under his belt. But, with Fujin's mentality about caring just about himself, he didn't feel any sense of achievement and instead focused entirely on the huge threat to his life. Of course, 
that training could still not yield any result if he encountered the likes of Ai or Inoki prematurely. But if the two Kages and their Jinchurikis didn't make a move and instead sent their subordinates, their village could end up paying a heavy price for targeting Fujin. As he planned, Fujin spent a couple of days entirely resting. The backlash from using the pill was as bad as how effective the pill was. Fujin didn't have any energy or stamina to train on the first day. For safety reasons, he decided to rest on the second day as well while treating himself to a lot of delicious and nutritious food. On the third day, Fujin got up early and began his morning training routine. He increased the training seal pressure from 69% to 88% for the duration of the training to exert his body as much as he could. For hours later, Fujin sat exhausted in the training ground. He drank some water and ate a few ration bars while thinking, my taijutsu is stuck at the same level for quite some time. Even though my body is growing stronger steadily and my chakra control is improving, in terms of basic taijutsu, I have long grown stale. I guess the main reason for this is how rarely I use taijutsu in combat. Generally, my sword gives a far better result. And when I do use it, it's just a chakra enhanced punch or kick to win the fight or gain an advantage. Modifying the assassin's rush jutsu will aid, but the improvement will just be on top of my basic taijutsu which needs improvement desperately. Fujin thought for a bit before concluding, I need a taijutsu partner. And a damn good one. The only decent ones I can think of are Gai, Rinjiro, Kakashi, and Hoka, in that order. But, Hoka won't spar with me right now, Kakashi might not agree to spar on a consistent basis and Rinjiro and Gai are frequently out of the village. Even now, all four have been dispatched to the land of Waterfall Border due to my clash with Kitsuchi. Fujin sighed and decided, leave it. I'll work on my taijutsu forms with my clones and do a basic taijutsu spar without using any chakra enhancement. At the same time, I will continue training my control over Assassin's Rush Jutsu. It'll be the best if I reach an acceptable level before they return. Fujin continued his rest. After recovering sufficient stamina and chakra, he got up and created eleven shadow clones. Eight clones immediately moved away and began training. The remaining three stood around Fujin. At the next moment, two clones attacked Fujin, while the last clone tried to sneak attack the two clones. They began a four-way battle involving only basic taijutsu. Since a one-on-one -on -one taijutsu would be boring, Fujin decided to have some fun with a four-way battle with all four fending for themselves. The fight was as chaotic as Fujin imagined. Since all four had the same intelligence and thought process, they had to consider what others would think and do something that they normally wouldn't do. In addition, since there were no teams, temporary alliances would randomly form and when least expected, there would be backstabbing so they had to stay on alert even against any temporary ally. As the week progressed, Fujin's taijutsu began showing slight improvements. The constant scheming and backstabbing also raised his awareness and added some new aspects to his scheming abilities. However, what had the most improvement was his assassin's rush jutsu. Fujin stood on the training ground and pointed his index finger at a tree. Immediately, a stream or wind was released from the tip of his finger. The wind moved at a high speed like a ray for a dozen meters. After that it began spreading out, covering a slightly larger area. Finally, it hit the tree. The highest amount of pressure was at the center of the ray, while the rest hit around it, forming a circle of about a 5 centimeters radius. Despite having a high speed, the attack didn't have much destructive capability. It left no marks on the tree. Chapter 362 Fujin analyzed, it's almost like an entirely new jutsu. Though it can't maintain its form for more than 12 meters, that's not an issue. After all, I only needed to give a boost to the vacuum bullet. Fujin pointed at the same tree again. A vacuum bullet started forming in front of his index finger. As soon as it was formed, a stream of wind was released from his finger and the vacuum bullet was fired. Due to the force from the wind stream, the speed of the vacuum bullet was much faster than what Fujin was capable of earlier. However, its aim was a bit off. Instead of hitting the center of the tree, it grazed past it. Fujin analyzed, hmm, aiming became difficult. 
the vacuum bullet has to be right in the center of the windstream. If it is even a few micrometers away, my target will be off. Though this isn't entirely bad. Once I master this, I can use this to control the direction of my vacuum bullet. I can be pointing at one ninja and shooting another. More importantly, the speed is considerably more than the speed of my air bullet. Though it's still slower than the vacuum bullet I shoot from my mouth. But, with practice and as I become more efficient in this technique, I should reach a similar speed. In fact, it is likely that I could even reach faster speeds. Even if it doesn't and is slightly slower, it will still be sufficient to fulfill my needs. Though there are still a few more improvements that I need to make, I have overlooked one important fact. Fujin fell into a thought. He deeply analyzed and concluded, though I have modified the assassin's rush jutsu to create this, it is more like a completely different jutsu. While I am only concerned about the boost it provides, it also has the potential to become a jutsu on its own. Fujin pointed at another tree. This time, instead of releasing the wind stream instantly, Fujin concentrated a large amount of wind chakra on his index finger. Once the chakra reached the required level, Fujin released a highly concentrated beam of wind from the tip of his index finger. This time, the beam maintained its form and traveled like a laser until it hit the tree. On impact, it immediately created a tiny one centimeter hole in the tree. However, since Fujin was continuously releasing the stream, the hole was bombarded even more by the attack. Its depth continued to increase. In addition, the sharp winds also increased the size of the hole by hitting and eroding its walls. After around 15 seconds, Fujin couldn't continue supercharging the attack and finally stopped. His attack immediately lost effect and dispersed after increasing the hole's size a bit more. Fujin appeared in front of the tree and observed the hole. A smile formed on his face as he saw, the hole is around 20 centimeters deep. If I had continued for a few seconds more, it would have pierced through this tree. I was right. This attack can become a deadly one as well. When providing a boost to the vacuum bullet, I didn't pour much chakra into it. And whatever I poured was used to provide more momentum. But this time, I supercharged it with wind chakra. Its principle is similar to the wind breath of my summons. Though it doesn't have the same penetrative power or speed as vacuum bullets, it does have its own advantage. Fujin once again extended his index finger and began concentrating his chakra on it. A few seconds later, he released another stream of extremely sharp winds. This time, he targeted a rock. The wind stream hit the rock and created a few scratches on the surface. However, instead of focusing on one spot, Fujin moved his finger towards his right. As a result, the wind stream also moved towards his right. Fujin kept moving his finger and observed as the wind followed. He began moving it in a circular motion causing a spiral-shaped wind stream to be released. He stopped and thought, yes. This can be a good option in some situations. Though the speed is slower, I can release it continuously and keep targeting the enemy. Though harming a strong ninja with this is unlikely, I could use this to draw them towards a trap. So this will work great with few injutsu traps. Another possible way of using this will be by spamming it with shadow clones. A dozen shadow clones using this jutsu at the same time will make any enemy's skin crawl. And while defensive jutsus like earth wall and iron skin jutsu can stop it, I can just shoot vacuum bullets through this wind laser to break any defenses. In fact, the wind laser might make it difficult for enemies to spot the vacuum bullet. Fujin was very satisfied with the result. He was even more pleased as he basically learned that jutsu for free without having to spend additional time to learn it to wreck his brain for several days to come up with it. After all, creating that jutsu wasn't what he initially intended and he had developed it just for support. He thought, since it is almost an entirely new jutsu, I will need another name for the jutsu. What should I keep? Fujin thought for a few seconds before deciding, I will go with wind laser jutsu. Seems appropriate. But I will need to increase its power a lot to live up to that name. Regardless, I will work on this later to raise it to a level that can be used in combat. Right now, I still need to improve my control over this. 
For one, I need more speed. And more importantly, I have to be able to use 10 wind lasers at the same time to give a boost to 10 vacuum bullets. That will need some practice to perform this jutsu correctly and consistently. In addition, I also need to improve my aim and work on controlling it such that I don't necessarily have to fire straight. I will eat the soldier pill tomorrow. Hopefully, five days will be enough to bring this jutsu to a level good enough to be used on a battlefield. When I take the third pill, I should do both, master this jutsu and learn the four symbols seal. Since it was already dusk and his chakra reserves were low, Fujin decided to stop training and he returned to his home. The next day, Fujin consumed the soldier pill once again. Just like a couple of weeks earlier, Fujin created 80 shadow clones, who continued studying the four symbol seal while Fujin went to the Umbu training facilities. En route, he thought, the wind crystals barely have any effect on me anymore. There is no point in meditating there unless I can somehow increase my absorption speed by several times and compensate quality with quantity. Fujin thought of ways to do that until he reached the training facility. Unfortunately, he couldn't come up with anything once again. He sighed and decided, leave it. I'll visit other training rooms. A shame that I couldn't live up to the grand expectations of the benevolent Lord Third Hokage. Fujin entered one of the fire training rooms and meditated for a couple of hours to recover his chakra. After recovering his chakra, Fujin returned to the training ground. Fujin decided to focus on two things. The first was shooting vacuum bullets from his finger and propelling them forward using the wind laser jutsu. The second was shooting ten wind lasers simultaneously from the tip of his fingers. Of course, in both aspects, the wind laser wasn't the supercharged one that could do damage. Instead, it was harmless and just increased the vacuum bullet speed by providing it additional momentum. Fujin created a dozen clones and alternated his training between those two aspects. Unfortunately, the two aspects didn't require as little chakra as it did to try and master just one wind laser. Using ten wind lasers at the same time needed ten times more chakra. While shooting a vacuum bullet needed more chakra than even the ten wind lasers. So Fujin needed to take a meditation break several times to recover his chakra. Despite that, the progress was rather quick. After experimenting just for a day, Fujin got a feel of the vacuum bullet combined with the wind laser. He could position the vacuum bullet in the dead center of the laser about 70% of the time he tried. On the next day, the accuracy reached 100%. Fujin stopped training this and instead divided the training time into two more aspects. The first was the speed aspect. He tried to increase the power of the wind laser so that it would grant more speed to the vacuum bullet. The second aspect was positioning the vacuum bullet just slightly off the center so that Fujin could aim the vacuum bullet in a direction where his finger wasn't pointing. Both were considerably more difficult to achieve as compared to merely placing the vacuum bullet at the center of the laser. Chapter 363 On the third day, Fujin stood facing ten human-sized rocks on the training ground. His fingers were pointing at each of the rocks. At the same time, he fired ten wind lasers from the tip of his fingers. Every laser hit the top of the rock it was aimed at. Fujin stopped the attack and once again pointed his fingers at the ten rocks. Ten wind lasers were fired once again. However, this time, they didn't hit the rocks at the same time. Instead, the fastest reached in around 0.25 seconds while the slowest hit the rock in one second. The rest wind lasers hit at some moment in between those ranges. Fujin thought, great. I can use 10 wind lasers comfortably now. Not only can I aim accurately, but I can also control the speed. This will allow me to shoot vacuum bullets at varying speeds at the same time. This will make predicting the path of my vacuum bullets and dodging them much more difficult. In this aspect, this new vacuum bullet jutsu will be superior. The attack will be just too difficult to predict. Fujin stopped pointing at the rocks and decided, this is enough training for shooting ten lasers at the same time. I should move on to working on perfecting the aim with ten vacuum bullets at the same time. I can already do it with one vacuum bullet. So this will just need some practice until I get a hang of the remaining nine, as well. 
Fujin continued his training. However, shooting ten vacuum bullets assisted by a wind laser each was very exhaustive on his chakra. In addition, he also had a couple of clones training to increase the speed delivered by the wind laser and another couple of clones training to position the vacuum bullet at different positions inside the wind laser. So he had to take a meditation break after every hour. While Fujin was training, Hiruzen was reading the reports in his office. His main focus was on the report sent by Renjiro. He analyzed the report and thought, as we analyzed, Anoki doesn't seem to have any intentions of starting a war. I'll ask them to stay there for another couple of weeks. If IWA doesn't make any move, they can pull back and leave around 100 ninjas on our border to take care of any emergencies. He wrote a message and handed the scroll to an Umbu ninja to deliver. He picked up another file and began reading. His eyes widened immediately. He thought, the rate of consumption of the wind crystals reduced? How? Did that greedy boy finally think about the good of the village? Or was the effect too little for him? Hiruzen immediately activated his crystal ball and searched for Fujin in training ground 23. On not finding him there, he turned his attention to the training rooms. After looking for a bit, he found Fujin meditating in the fire training room. A relaxed look appeared on Hiruzen's face. He could feel a lot of pressure being lifted off his shoulders. It almost looked like he became younger by a few years. He sighed in relief and thought, his rate of absorbing energy from fire crystals is just a fraction when compared with the wind crystals. If he doesn't decide to switch back to wind crystals, I can finally rest easy. Had Hiruzen been an emotional person, he might have cried tears of joy. Fujin had given him quite a headache and he had to make a lot of efforts to ensure that Kanoha didn't run out of wind crystals. However, his confidence in his ability to do that was waning every day Fujin visited the wind training rooms. Despite the good news, Hiruzen couldn't help but pray, I hope his speed of absorbing energy from fire crystals doesn't increase like what happened with the wind crystals. Two days later, Fujin was sitting with his back against a tree while breathing heavily. He muttered, I need to find who made this soldier pill. And I need to ask that person to make a better one. Despite being so good, it still isn't sufficient for training non-stop. Needing to take a break after just 50 minutes is rather annoying. Regardless. A smile appeared on Fujin's face. He muttered, I have mastered shooting vacuum bullets from my fingers. That IWA army will be decimated if they face off against me right now. Fujin looked around him. There were hundreds of rocks and walls that he had raised from the ground using earth release. Every single one of them was riddled with holes. Several trees for hundreds of meters had suffered the same fate. If someone was to walk onto that training ground, they would wonder what exactly was happening there. Fujin thought, though this jutsu is considered mastered, there is still a lot of scope for improvement. I have increased their speed to just above half the speed of the vacuum bullets I shoot from my mouth. This makes this my fastest attack behind vacuum cannon and vacuum bullets but I can still increase this speed further. And I still need to keep working on the multi-directional variant by adjusting the position of the vacuum bullet. And I also need to work on firing multiple rounds in quick succession. Fujin analyzed for a few minutes and decided, I was planning to move on to my other ideas. But, I'll spend another five days, when I eat the third soldier pill, to improve this jutsu and master the multi-directional variant. After that, the improvement will become very slow. It will improve as I use them and I can spend additional time on this after I retire. In the week until then, I will begin practicing the forms of my next idea for vacuum jutsu. Still, just like wind laser jutsu, this one can also be said to be quite different. I should give it another name. Hmm, what should I give? Fujin thought for a few seconds before deciding, I will just call it Vacuum Gatling Jutsu as I fire multiple bullets at the same time and I intend on improving it further to fire several rounds within a second. That should make the Jutsu similar to the Gatling gun from my previous world. Yeah, I'll go with that. No point in thinking much about it. Fujin wasn't very concerned with the names of his Jutsus. He just thought of a basic one and stopped thinking about it. 
After meditating and recovering his chakra, Fujin continued his training. He stopped when just two hours were left for the effect of the pills to end and began moving back to his home. En route, he couldn't help but sigh and think, the four-symbol seal is still not mastered. And the constant influx of memories from those clones gives me such an intense headache. Processing a year's worth of memories in just five days repeatedly is a tough job. Especially when I am also training ninjutsu. Fujin sighed again and muttered, Oh well. I am almost done. I am very close now. My clones have succeeded in creating all parts of the seal. It's just that no one managed to make the entire seal by himself. Probably two more days of this torture and I will have this seal down. Three at max if my luck is bad. Exhausted, Fujin took a couple of days off once again. During this time, he visited Isamu in Kanoha's hospital to get his body checked and to heal any hidden injuries and eliminate the accumulated trauma. It helped Fujin in relieving the stress on his body and, to an extent, his mind. After resting for a couple of days, Fujin returned to training once again. After completing the morning workout ritual and getting some rest, Fujin decided to work on adding more jutsus to his arsenal. Fujin thought, this idea could be fun. Though vacuum gatling jutsu will be devastating, it'll be a shame if I have to expose it against normal jounins. This jutsu can make their preparations useless while keeping my vacuum gatling to catch any rank S ninja off guard. Even if I'm not able to kill them, causing them a serious injury should be sufficient to force these villages to back off. Fujin raised his right hand and extended his index and middle finger towards the sky. His eyes focused on the two fingers as wind chakra began concentrating on the two fingers. A 15 centimeters long vacuum core began forming on top of his two fingers. In a few seconds, the core took the form of a blade. It was soon enveloped by winds. Fujin didn't move his fingers. Despite that, under his control, the blade flew towards a rock and cleanly sliced it into two. A smile formed on Fujin's face. He muttered to himself, My compatibility with this jutsu is too good. Just like the blade of wind jutsu, I was able to succeed on its vacuum variant on my first try. Chapter 364 Though Fujin succeeded in creating the vacuum blade on the first try, the jutsu needed a lot of improvements, unlike the blade of wind jutsu. Fujin concentrated wind chakra on his two fingers once again. Five vacuum blades began forming above his fingers. However, before they could completely form, the vacuum core collapsed. Fujin immediately moved backwards and sighed. He analyzed, looks like mastering this jutsu won't happen on the first try. Oh well, it should still be done sooner than Hurricane Fist and Vacuum Gatling. I just need to increase the amount of blades I can create and be able to control them like I can control the blade of wind jutsu. Though this jutsu will be much slower than the vacuum bullet and vacuum gatling, it is far superior in maneuverability. That is why, the IWA ninjas, who could easily dodge my vacuum bullets, weren't able to dodge the blades of wind at a close range. Unfortunately, blade of wind jutsu could be defended against with the iron skin jutsu. The vacuum blade won't have that weakness. Fujin began his training. He started by increasing the number of vacuum blades to two. Within half an hour, he managed to successfully create two vacuum blades consistently. By the time the pre-lunch training session was completed and Fujin's chakra reserves started taking a hit, he managed to successfully create the third vacuum blade as well. Since he was low on chakra, Fujin decided to use the post-lunch training session to practice taijutsu with his clones and only continued training the vacuum blade jutsu in the evening. For the next four days, Fujin repeated the same training pattern. The only change was that as the number of vacuum blades increased, the rate of his chakra consumption also increased. So his training time for vacuum blade decreased while he focused more on the taijutsu spars. The terrain of training ground 23 became even more weird. The rocks that were riddled with holes were now slashed into several pieces. So now, Small rocks that had a lot of holes were spread throughout the training ground. Several trees also had similar holes. Luckily for them, Fujin stuck to testing the vacuum blades on the rocks. Fujin ignored the terrain and analyzed, 
I can already create seven vacuum blades at the same time and control their directions very well. This should be enough for the time being. Time for the next idea. Fujin slammed his hands on the ground and an earth wall appeared in front of him. Soon after, the seal on Fujin's bracer lit up and a sword appeared in his right hand. Chakra immediately began flowing alongside its edge and was quickly transformed into wind nature. Soon, the wind chakra just in front of the edge of the sword began transforming. An extremely thin vacuum core began forming along the edge of the sword. A few seconds later, Fujin pulled his sword back and swung it forming an arc in the air. Immediately, a sword slash was released along the arc that the sword created. However, unlike Fujin's previous attempts, this time the front part of the sword slash was a thin arc made of vacuum. The sword slash hit the earth wall in the center and cut it through into two pieces. The upper part of the wall was sent flying in the air by a few centimeters. At that moment, it was hit by the winds accompanying the sword slash. The impact of the winds pushed the upper half of the wall backwards, and it collapsed. Fujin analyzed, good. My normal sword slashes couldn't cut through the walls. But this attack can. I'll call it vacuum slash. If someone uses the earth wall and keeps standing like a fool, he will be cut in two. Even if they duck or jump to barely avoid the slash, they will be hit by the falling wall. The only way to completely avoid it is by moving backwards and jumping by a safe distance while using the iron skin jutsu to defend against the accompanying winds or escaping underground instead. But, Fujin raised his sword and observed it for a few seconds. He wondered, I remember that the way Danzo used the wind vacuum technique with his sword was different. He blew winds on his sword which hovered around the sword making it very sharp. But, was that technique a vacuum jutsu or just normal sharp winds? Fujin thought for some time before giving up. He thought, I barely even remember how it looked. I don't recall if any theory behind it was stated. Regardless, continuously maintaining vacuum cores around my sword doesn't seem feasible. Though I don't need to maintain vacuum cores. After all, I don't need to blow wind on my sword to create it. I can just create new vacuum slash cores whenever I need it. And I can use this attack in both close range combat and long range combat. In these aspects, my way of using the wind vacuum technique on my sword is superior to his, or at least superior to what I recall Danzo is capable of. That said, this isn't the max I can do. Though I couldn't add the vacuum waves to my hurricane fist, I should be able to use them with my SWO. Fujin was about to pour his chakra into his sword and try it but suddenly stopped. He thought, never mind. If I mess up, I'll destroy this sword. That'll be a rather expensive price to pay for no reason. Fujin placed his sword back in his seal and opened a scroll that had a few ordinary swords. He grabbed the sword and swung it around a few times to get a hang of it. He nodded and decided, yeah, this should be good enough. In combat, I'll leave this attack to my clones. I'll use it just as a last resort. Fujin sent his chakra flowing into the ordinary sword. Soon, it turned into wind and began revolving around the sword at a high speed. Unlike his arm, Fujin didn't bother putting a protective chakra cover that spun in the opposite direction on the sword. He didn't particularly care if the sword was damaged. Soon, three vacuum waves began forming just outside the hurricane. In a couple of seconds, they began revolving around the sword at a high speed as well. Fujin observed his sword and thought, it looks completely like a mini hurricane consisting of thousands of sharp blades moving at a speed. I wonder if I can make a full-scale version of this. A massive hurricane full of sharp winds and maybe a dozen vacuum waves spinning at a high speed. Preferably one big enough to consume an entire village. Fujin's eyes lit up at that idea. However, his excitement doused as he analyzed, unfortunately, the chakra consumption for such an attack will be too high. And, the ninjas who are good with body flicker jutsu or other movement jutsus can easily escape from the attack. They could even hide underground. The only way such an attack will work is if I attack a village having a lot of civilians that the ninjas care about. Not too useful. Oh well. I'll develop a medium-sized one later to see if I can think of better applications for the same. 
For now. Fujin pulled his right arm back and jabbed forward with his sword. The mini-hurricane was launched forward. As it traveled, its size grew. It hit the remaining part of the wall. The hurricane was stopped momentarily until the vacuum waves hit the wall and pierced through it, carving a path out for the hurricane. The hurricane broke through the wall and carried some debris in it as it continued moving forward, tearing apart everything in its way and creating a new path in the training ground. As it moved, several wind blades were launched from the hurricane into the surroundings, cutting even more trees. It finally lost its power after traveling for around 60 meters. Fujin had a thoughtful expression as he observed his attack. He analyzed, I see. I never thought of this possibility. The normal winds don't have the same penetrative capabilities as vacuum waves. So once they hit a tough obstacle, they get stopped and the vacuum waves move to the front. So anyone facing the attack will just have to dodge those vacuum waves if they are confident in their defense. Still, despite this oversight, this is a great attack. If any ninja were to just dodge the incoming hurricane, they could be cut by the wind blades that randomly get thrown out due to the centrifugal force. This attack can be very devastating when facing an army. A smile formed on Fujin's face as he muttered, Anyway, that's the one jutsu nearly mastered and two new learned today. I'll call this attack the Hurricane Sword. Chapter 365 Fujin spent the next couple of days practicing Vacuum Slash and Hurricane Sword to get used to them. Normally, getting used to such jutsus would take a lot of time. Fortunately, the jutsu suited Fujin a lot and quickly became his second nature. Fujin quickly got used to performing them as comfortably as their normal versions. Because a week passed, Fujin consumed the soldier pill and shifted back to his previous routine with his focus divided between the vacuum gatling jutsu and the four symbol seal. On the evening of the second day, Fujin stood in the training ground. His chakra was low to continue training further. He extended his arms and pointed his fingers at ten human-sized rocks. In an instant, ten vacuum bullets were launched. Each hit their target on the mark and traveled a long distance behind them. Approximately 0.23 seconds later, Fujin shot another round of ten vacuum bullets. They hit their target as well. Approximately 0.76 seconds after shooting the second round, Fujin shot the third round of the vacuum bullets. Fujin nodded and thought, good. This now looks like a Gatling. However, I still need to improve this more. It'll be great if I can fire 5 rounds within 1 second and 10 rounds in around 2.5 to 3 seconds. Only then it'll live up to its name. Fujin extended his index finger once again and pointed at a rock. He fired a vacuum bullet. However, instead of hitting the rock he was pointing to, the bullet hit a hole in the rock adjacent to it. Fujin muttered to himself, this has reached partial mastery as well. I can aim my target around 20 away in any direction from what I'm pointing at. I guess I'll be able to go up to 60 max by the time I'm done tra. Fujin suddenly stopped his analysis as he received a memory. Immediately, an elated expression appeared on his face. He screamed in his mind, finally. It feels like I have been working on this for fucking centuries. Had Fujin been as emotional and reactive as someone like Naruto, he might have screamed and jumped for joy. The memory he received was from a shadow clone who dispelled himself. He was the first and the only shadow clone so far to successfully create the Four Symbols Seal. Fujin decided, I will meditate later. Time to visit my basement. Since this clone passed on his memories, the other clones should be getting it done soon as well. Fujin immediately flickered towards his home. In his basement, 79 shadow clones were sitting, each and every last one of them in deep thought. Just like the clone who dispelled himself, the remaining 79 clones were very close as well. It was just that they were stuck at some level or the other. After receiving his memories, they compared their results with those memories and immediately had a breakthrough. By the time Fujin reached his home, they continued working on their seals. Fujin observed his clone sitting while making seals. He thought, no point in disturbing them. I'll take this opportunity to get a third person's perspective. 
Fujin sat on one side of the room and observed his clones closely. Within fifteen minutes, a second clone managed to complete the seal. As soon as he did, he dispelled himself as well. The remaining clones received his memories as well and increased their speed of creating the seal. Fujin observed, using shadow clones for learning is crazy good. Normally, even after learning a seal, I will have to practice several times to be more comfortable with it. But with clones, when one succeeds, they dispel themselves. Due to this, the knowledge is transferred to the remaining clones. This has two advantages. The more obvious one is that every clone learns the same method. And the hidden and the more fearsome one is that every clone can think of methods to improve the seal. So by the time the last clone successfully manages to create the seal, I will have improved the seal slightly 79 times. But, that will still not be enough. The current time needed to create this seal is too high. The first clone who succeeded was at it for 5 hours straight. The second clone had started working on it 6 hours 8 minutes before he succeeded. Even if I create a more optimized version, I will need at least an hour to create a 4 symbol seal. But I remember that the likes of Minato, Orochimaru, and Jiraiya were very quick with the seals. Fujin thought for a while as his clones kept completing the seals one by one. A few minutes later, Fujin shook his head and concluded, I can't think of any way to decrease the creation time of this seal to a few seconds. The only way will be if I create the seal beforehand and use it in battle. But how do I do that? Fujin analyzed, but once again, he couldn't come up with any solution. He sighed and decided, I will ask Haruzen. Though I could come up with a way eventually, it will take a lot of time. The weight has no benefits. Though Fujin didn't ask Haruzen for help in increasing the speed of his vacuum gatling, that was because he was creating a new jutsu. Creating a dependency on Haruzen for matters he could resolve could be detrimental to him in the future. But, the matter with Fuin Jutsu was different. It could be applied to all seals and Fujin wouldn't have to improve it. So he didn't mind asking Haruzen. Fujin kept waiting in his room while observing his clones. In two hours, all 80 clones had successfully created the four symbol seal. On receiving the last clone's information, Fujin realized, not bad. I think I can create this seal within an hour already. Of course, that's still too slow. Fujin created a shadow clone who left his home and flickered towards the Hokage's building. Fujin's clone thought, it's kinda late. I hope the old fox is still in the office. Otherwise, I'll have to wait till tomorrow. He reached the building in a few seconds. Fortunately, the lights of his office were still on. Fujin's clone wasted no time in flickering to the office. Inside his office, Haruzen was writing on a scroll. There were a couple of dozen more scrolls on his desk. Kanoha's decision to withdraw the majority of their forces was conveyed to Takigakir who immediately became worried. They tried making the Kanoha ninjas stay, however, they didn't have anything to convince them. IWA had left no clues in the Ito family's territory. So Taki refused to blame them openly. They had also been unsuccessful in curbing the rumors that were spreading. These two points caused dissatisfaction among Kanoha leaders. So Haruzen didn't intend to keep the army deployed for any longer. The only way Taki could make the Kanoha ninjas stay was by issuing them all missions. Unfortunately, they didn't have that kind of budget to splurge money. So they couldn't stop Kanoha from retreating. Haruzen had concluded his negotiations with Takigakir. The scrolls he was writing on were for the noble families in the land of Waterfall that supported Kanoha. He assured them of Kanoha's support and stated that they were retreating because the chances of IWA attacking were very low. Haruzen also assured them that if IWA attacked them, Kanoha would send an even bigger army. Haruzen had just started writing the second scroll when he heard a knock. He looked up to see Fujin's clone entering. A smile formed on his face. He said, Fujin. Why are you here? Haruzen had always been fond of Fujin. However, he had been more fond of him than ever for the last couple of weeks since Fujin stopped visiting the wind training room. Fujin's clone wondered, why is he so happy to see me? Wait! 
Does he know that I'm here to ask for help and he is so enthusiastic to help me? Yup, that must be it. Sigh, we have such a benevolent kage. Fujin asked, Grandpa, are you done with your work? Hiruzen, who was in a happy mood a few seconds ago, suddenly became alert. He thought, I know that tone. He is here to ask me for something that would cost me a lot. He put up an exhausted expression and replied, Unfortunately I had some extra work today. I will be busy here for another couple of hours. He thought, sigh, I thought I'd leave in twenty minutes. Now I'll have to keep waiting here for another couple of hours in case he tries to check where I am. Meanwhile, Fujin's clone wondered, Really? Or is this old fox faking? He said, That's rough on you, Grandpa. I'm here because I need your help. I was hoping you'd come with me. But since you are busy, you can send a shadow clone with me. Hiruzen was speechless. He thought, despite being Hokage for so long and having helped so many young ninjas over decades, this is the first time someone directly asked me to send a clone to help him. Wait! He isn't even asking. He is directly giving me a choice. Chapter 366 Haruzen took half a minute to compose himself and gather his thoughts. However, despite his lively thoughts, the look of exhaustion never disappeared from his face. Of course, Fujin's clone completely ignored the long pause he needed. Haruzen asked, What help do you need? Fujin's clone replied, I am working on few injutsu but have hit a roadblock in terms of speed. At my current speed, I need around an hour to create that seal. It makes it useless in war. I need some help and advice in regards to that. Hiruzen was surprised. He thought, he has already reached that stage? A seal that needs an hour to create will be a very complicated one. It looks like he will soon be a grandmaster. No harm in teaching him seal imprints. But, Hiruzen said, all right. I can help you with that. But, I have a question as well. Did you ask anyone else to help you? Fujin's clone tilted his head and asked, Why would I ask anyone else, Grandpa? You are the one everyone calls the professor. Despite his vast experience, Hiruzen couldn't help but look at Fujin's clone with a deadpan expression. He muttered internally, I have led Kanoha for over four decades. I have lived through three deadly wars. I never expected that I would experience so many firsts within a few minutes at this age. This is the first time anyone sent a clone to ask for my help outside of wartime. Apart from my students and children, this is the first time anyone has come to me directly for help without asking anyone else. And, this is the first time someone directly asked me to send a shadow clone to help him. Fujin's clone maintained his innocent expression. However, he was laughing in his mind. He thought, old man, you have tried brainwashing me with the will of fire so many times that I don't even remember the count. I guess you even believe that you have succeeded. You even asked me to call you grandpa. Let me see with what face you decline my request when there is no good excuse. Hiruzen was in the same dilemma as Fujin had calculated. Though he regularly preached the will of fire to motivate his ninjas to push themselves harder for the village without having to do anything himself, the will of fire was a two-way street. Just as he had expectations from the younger generation, the younger generation also had expectations from him that he had to live up to. Of course, that wasn't necessarily bad for Haruzen. After all, unlike Fujin who viewed the will of fire as an ideological tool, Haruzen believed in the will of fire completely. In fact, he could be even said to be the most devout follower of the will of fire. So he usually did what was expected of him even before anyone asked him to do so. However, when faced with someone like Fujin, Hiruzen realized an issue. He shuddered while thinking, if I agree, it will create a dangerous precedence. What if everyone else begins running to me for every small thing? How many shadow clones can I even create? Until now, though everyone knows that they can ask me for help, they are very respectful and mindful to not disturb me too much. But this boy. Unfortunately, Hiruzen could just sigh internally and hope that others didn't get any ideas from this instance. His principles didn't allow him to say no to Fujin without any reasonable reason. 
he replied, All right. I'll send a clone to help you. Fujin's clones smirked internally and thought, Lord Hokage really is the best. I can't imagine this being done in any other village. Even among the Hokages, I guess just future Naruto and maybe Minato and Hashirama would agree to such requests. He weaved a hand sign and a shadow clone popped next to him. The clone approached Fujin's clone and said, Let's go. Fujin's clone immediately said in a respectful and excited tone, Thank you, Grandpa. The two clones immediately left and arrived at training ground 23 where Fujin was waiting for Haruzen while thinking about the four symbols seal. He looked up and looked at the two arriving and thought, I see. He sent a clone. As their eyes met, Fujin's clone dispelled himself and passed the memories to Fujin. Fujin smiled and said, Thank you for coming here despite being so busy, Grandpa. Haruzen's clone's eyebrows involuntarily twitched. However, he immediately put up a smile and said, How can I say no to a youngster who is working so hard? Which seal are you working on? Fujin replied, The four symbols seal. But I'd like the same advice for other seals as well. I recall you sealing up the Suna Jounins using Juinjutsu. But despite learning almost all Juinjutsu, I can't activate them that quickly. I still need more than a few seconds which is just too slow to be used in a battle. Hiruzen's clone was surprised. He thought, he has already learned the four symbols seal? That's the most difficult seal available in the library. Has he learnt all the other seals or did he just focus on this seal? But why does he need this seal? He became suspicious but didn't show it on his face and asked, Have you learnt all the other seals in the library? Or did you focus on the four symbols seal after becoming an umbu captain? Fujin answered, I am done with all Juinjutsu and simpler seals in the library. I still have a few complicated seals to learn. But they didn't seem as good as the four symbol seal at restraining enemies. Especially the enemy Jinchurikis. So I decided to leave them for later. Hiruzen's clone realized, I see. I guess he is more obsessed with this seal due to his encounter with Rashi. Normal chakra suppression seals have no effect on a Jinchuriki. Even advanced ones are useless against ones that can use most of the tailed beast chakra like Rashi. Regardless, such speed is very good. In terms of speed of learning this seal after getting access to it, he is slower than only Kushina and Minato ever since I became the Hokage. And his chakra is lesser than theirs at his age. So the effect of shadow clones should be lesser for him than them. He nodded and answered, I understand. It is a good choice. Your issue is a pretty basic one that all seal masters have to face. Unlike ninjutsu, you can't create seals in the blink of an eye as it isn't entirely dependent on merely manipulating your chakra and is much more complicated. Especially complicated seals like the four symbol seal. Fujin analyzed Haruzen's words and nodded. He asked, so, how do we shorten the time? Haruzen's clone said, it's pretty easy. The concept is similar to pre-made seals that you use instantly in battle. Can you figure it out? Fujin began thinking. After a couple of minutes, he shook his head and answered, No. I had thought of creating seals for the same. But, those are for one-time use. While I can make a lot of them as a preparation and have a similar effect, it won't be the same. In addition, I won't be able to modify the seal if I use seals I drew on paper. The only workable idea I have is probably creating the seal partially so that I can use it by just completing the remaining seal. But I am not sure how I could sustain a partial seal for that long without it putting a drain on my chakra reserves and taking a lot of my attention. Haruzen's clone smiled and said, Not bad. You are a bit off, but the method is similar to the two ideas. The clone raised his right hand and showed his palm to Fujin. In an instant, the four symbol seal appeared on his palm. Fujin's eyes widened in surprise. He thought, that was almost instantaneous. It's as if he merely needs to think about it to create the seal. Hiruzen's clone said, most people consider Grandmaster as the peak level of Fuinjutsu. Every Grandmaster in Fuinjutsu is respected by every ninja. However, 
for the ones who reach that level, becoming a Grandmaster is just the start of the journey. Once you reach this level, there are two things you need to do. The first one is imprinting all the seals you have learned on your body, preferably the palm. This allows you to use every seal that you have imprinted instantaneously. I would have taught you this after you became a Grandmaster. But since you asked me before you became one, I'll teach it to you now. Fujin smiled and said, Thank you, Grandpa. But what is the second thing? The clone smiled and said, It's to create new seals. Fujin thought, Ah, that was a stupid question. What else could they do? He replied, I'll leave creating newer seals for the future. For now, can we start learning the imprinting part? Chapter 367 Haruzen's clone nodded and said, Yes. But before we start, I need to warn you. To complete this is even more difficult than becoming a Grandmaster. In Kanoha, we have ten Grandmasters, the most of any village. But, including me, there are only three ninjas who have completed this step. And even we can't be said to have truly completed this step as we didn't imprint hundreds of seals that we judged to be unneeded in combat. Fujin raised an eyebrow and asked, Why is it so difficult? Haruzen's clone answered, It is easy to imprint seals at the start. But as you keep increasing the number of seals imprinted on your body, it becomes increasingly difficult. The reason has to do more with your ability to create multiple imprints on your body and your ability to remember everything about them without any error. Due to this reason, this step becomes very difficult to complete. It takes around a couple of decades to complete this step as the shadow clones won't be of any help here. And, the high time required makes every Grandmaster reluctant to complete this. They will just imprint a few important seals and instead use their time for other tasks. So before we begin, remember this. Only imprint the seals that are important for you on your body. If you create a good seal in the future that you want to imprint, you will face difficulties if you imprint all the useless seals on your body. In the future, if you want to complete this step like me, go ahead. But don't waste your time on this in the short term. Fujin thought for a bit and nodded. He said, All right, Grandpa. Now can we begin the process of imprinting the four symbols seal? Hiruzen's clone immediately shook his head and said, No. For symbol seal is a very high level seal. Creating that imprint will be a task for you so you can learn how to do this by yourself. I will teach you how to create imprints with two other seals. Though Haruzen's words sounded sensible, Fujin couldn't help but think, why does it feel like he is not saying something? Haruzen's clone didn't say the following out loud and only muttered in his mind, not to mention, making an imprint of the four symbol seal will need around one and a half to two weeks and will have to be done in multiple phases. I don't want to keep sending a clone daily for the next two weeks. Unfortunately, Fujin couldn't read his thoughts. He replied, All right. Which two seal imprints will you teach me? Haruzen's clone replied, The two seals that you'll use the most. Chakra suppression seal and self-cursing seal. Fujin said, I see. A few injutsu and a juinjutsu so that I'll get a hang of both. Haruzen's clone nodded and said, Yes. Once you get a hang of how to imprint these seals, you should be able to slowly work the rest out yourself. But I'll advise you to not work on the imprint of the four symbol seal until you try a few other seal imprints to get a hang of this technique. Fuji nodded. Haruzen's clone said, Before we start, extend your hand and show me your palm. Fuji followed his instructions. The clone asked, Are you aware of where the chakra points in your palm are located? Fujin nodded. Inspecting chakra points on his own body wasn't a difficult task. After all, those were the points from where his chakra would be emitted from. Haruzen's clone said, Good. Create the chakra suppression seal and observe from which chakra points your chakra is being released to support the seal. Fujin nodded and created a chakra suppression seal on his right palm while observing the chakra points that were releasing the chakra. He mentioned the location of the chakra points to Haruzen's clone who nodded his head in agreement. The clone instructed him to memorize those chakra points. Once Fujin was done memorizing, Haruzen's clone said, Now, place this seal on your palm without activating it. 
Remember to place the seal such that it covers all the chakra points that release the chakra to power the seal. Try to place the seal as much as the center of those chakra points as you can. Fujin followed his instructions. Haruzen's clone continued giving instructions to Fujin on how to imprint the seal on his palm. Around 15 minutes later, Fujin exhaled a lot of air. On his right palm, the chakra suppression seal was imprinted. Fujin observed the seal and thought, Wow! The seal is completely imprinted on my palm. I can activate it with a mere thought. This is different from my earlier uses of this seal. Though I could use this seal rather quickly, it isn't even comparable to my current speed. But, the imprint is a problem. Won't everyone be able to see this? I don't see any such imprints on Haruzen's hands either. Haruzen's clone immediately noticed his confusion. He asked, Are you wondering why my palms don't have any such imprints? Fujin nodded. The clone answered, Because you have just completed the first step. Now sit down and focus entirely on this imprint. Flow your chakra through it, control the seal and reduce its size to as much as you can. The clone extended his palm and showed it to Fujin and said, Focus chakra in your eyes and observe me properly. Fujin's eyes began glowing as he concentrated chakra in them. A chakra suppression seal appeared on the clone's palm. Immediately, chakra began flowing through it and its size began decreasing. In mere seconds, the size became so small that no one could see it with a naked eye. A couple of seconds later, Fujin couldn't see it despite concentrating chakra in his eyes. Haruzen's clone instructed, Now that you have seen how it works, copy the method and try it yourself. Don't worry about messing up. You can always destroy the imprint and create a new one. But the process is a bit complicated. So try to get it done on your first try. Fujin nodded and began copying Haruzen's method. Soon, chakra began flowing through the seal. Fujin took control of the seal and began decreasing its size without changing the shapes and proportions of the symbols. Over the next five minutes, it decreased to the size of a mere black dot. Fujin's concentration was at its highest level. His mind didn't have any thought apart from maintaining the shape of the symbols while decreasing the size even further. Haruzen's clone observed, I didn't expect him to do so well on his first try. His chakra control is better than I thought. It looks like he kept working on the Senju Taijutsu style even after leaving Renjiro's squad. And his skill with the seals is very promising too. Though seeing his performance, it doesn't look like it's due to his talent in Fuinjutsu and is instead due to the amount of practice he has. He took a look at Fujin's face again and wondered, how long does he use the Shadow Clones to practice seals? He sighed internally and thought, though he becomes very greedy when he wants something, his work ethic is admirable. It is comparable to my three students and Minato when they were young. In terms of Fuinjutsu, he is already superior to what my three students were when they were his age. Only Minato did better. But he had Kushina's help which not only made his path simpler but also gave him a lot of motivation to become a Fuinjutsu Grandmaster. And unlike those four, Fujin has done it while staying hidden in the Umbu and keeping his skills a secret. To be able to push himself without having a friend to push him or having the common people and other ninjas sing his praises is remarkable. It looks like my previous analysis of him becoming capable of leading Kanoa's darkness was on point. While Haruzen's clone was analyzing Fujin, Fujin made rapid progress. The size of the seal was finally reduced by so much that Fujin couldn't see it. However, he was very much aware of where the seal was. Haruzen's clone observed it as well and said, Good work. You have succeeded on your first try. Can you feel where the seal imprint is? Fuji nodded. The clone continued, Good. I'm sure you can sense it very clearly. But the reason for this is that this is the only seal imprint you have created. Once you create hundreds or even thousands of seal imprints, sensing every seal individually becomes very difficult. As for remembering their locations, that is difficult as well. While you may remember the seals that you use regularly, you will struggle with the seals that rarely get used. That's why I instructed you to not imprint too many seals right now. Internally, Haruzen sighed and thought, 
seeing the crazy work he has done with his house, I have no doubts that he will create hundreds of imprints on his body if I don't stop him. He turned his head to his left and gazed towards Fujin's house, which was just outside the training grounds, and thought, three years ago, that house had more than 2,500 seals. Its number has been steadily increasing since then. Right now, there are so many seals that even I can't see them all. Despite being better at Fuinjutsu, the quantity of the seals is so much that I couldn't keep track after the number crossed 5,000 as even I can't see through all of them. Chapter 368 Fujin noticed Haruzen's clone's gaze and a wry smile appeared on his face. He realized, so that's why he keeps saying that again and again. He isn't wrong though. This method, though complicated, is still very easy to implement. If I didn't know that it would get complicated at a later stage, I would be tempted to do just that. Fujin replied, All right. I'll limit the number of seal imprints to just the essential seals. I have a question though. Since I created the imprint on my right hand, doesn't that mean that I can use this seal quickly with just my right hand? So do I need to create the same imprint on my left arm as well? Hiruzen's clone answered, If you want to, then yes. But it's pointless to do that for a seal like the chakra suppression seal. This seal merely suppresses your enemy's chakra. There are many other seals that offer similar or even better effects. Like the self-cursing seal which paralyzes your opponent. This is another reason why I suggested you start with these two seals. You can use the chakra suppression seal with your right hand and the self-cursing seal with your left. If you feel like a seal is very important and irreplaceable, then feel free to create imprints on both your hands. Fujin nodded and said, All right. I'll keep that in mind. Another question. Does the seal have to be in between the chakra points that release the chakra? I was thinking about imprinting a few stealth seals on my body, perhaps barrier seals as well. That way, I could activate them instantly and gain an advantage, be it in stealth or defense. Hiruzen's clone answered, Well, seals don't need to be imprinted between the chakra points. But, the closer they are to the right chakra points, the faster you'll be able to activate them and the lesser the chance of any of them failing. Since your main concern was speed, Placing them in between the chakra points is the most reliable method. As for seals like stealth, hardness, barrier, and other similar utility seals, having them on your clothes like you have now is more than sufficient. There is no need to create imprints for them. Fujin thought for a bit and decided, yeah, you are right. Doubling them up won't help a lot. If someone is strong enough to deal with those seals on my clothes, having those seals on my body might not help me much. Fujin recalled the time he was escaping from Rashi's tailed beast bomb. Just the mere blast wave destroyed his clothes despite the high number of seals he carved on them. Only the iron skin jutsu managed to hold on for a few seconds. Hiruzen's clone replied, Good analysis. Let's start creating the imprint for the self-cursing seal. Though it is Juinjutsu, its process is almost completely similar to that of Fuinjutsu. He began guiding Fujin once again, who absorbed all his teachings in no time. An hour later, Fujin completed imprinting the self-cursing seal on his left palm. Fujin observed it and thought, no wonder so few use Fuinjutsu in battle despite there being so many seal masters. Without completing this step, it is very difficult to use seals in combat. Hiruzen's clone said, you have learnt the way to create imprints for both Fuinjutsu and Juinjutsu. I will leave the work of imprinting the remaining seals to you. Just remember my warnings. If you face any confusion or have any doubts, you can come and see me. Fujin nodded and said, Thank you, Grandpa. I will. The clone smiled and dispelled himself. In his office, Hiruzen, who had already completed his work, received the memories. He sighed and thought, Fortunately, everything went well. I just hope that I don't end up regretting that last sentence. Hiruzen left his office and returned to his home to sleep. As for Fujin, he still had three more days for the soldier pill to run out. He sat in the training ground while analyzing, what do I do now? Should I begin working on creating the imprint for the four symbols seal? Should I make imprints for a few more important seals? 
or should I just focus on learning the remaining seals? After analyzing for a while, Fujin concluded, creating an imprint for the four symbol seals might take a longer time. It's probably why Haruzen didn't want to teach me that. While the imprints of some simpler seals will take a lesser time, they will be a waste. Imprinting seals need a high amount of concentration and not a lot of chakra. Though I could create shadow clones to train, if one pops and sends me the memories, I will fail in creating an imprint. For now, I'll continue with learning the remaining seals while I train vacuum jutsus. Once I run low on chakra, instead of meditating in the training rooms, I'll begin imprinting seals. However, I need to decide which seals I should imprint. Sigh, that will take a long time as well considering the insane number of seals I have learned over the last year. Fujin got up, went back to his house and entered the basement. He created 80 shadow clones with 1% chakra each so that they could continue working on the remaining seals. Though he had learnt the most complicated seal in section A of the library, he still had a few more top-level seals to learn like the five element seal, five elements unseal, evil sealing method and iron armor seal. His clones immediately began working on the five element seal. Thanks to having already worked on the four symbol seal, their progress was much smoother. As for Fujin, he sat down in the basement and began analyzing which seals to imprint while waiting for his chakra to recover. For the next hour, Fujin recalled and analyzed all the seals he had learnt over the past few years. A complicated expression appeared on his face as he let out a sigh. He thought, though I have learnt thousands of seals, the seals I can use directly in battle are almost non-existent. Hiruzen knew what he was doing when he asked me to create imprints for these two seals. Apart from the four symbol seal, none will be as effective as these two. The issue is that though many seals are very good, they are designed to fulfill just one purpose. Though they are useful in one way or another, they aren't so useful in battle. While I can use them by becoming creative, like say storing a lot of one element in element-specific storage seals, their effect in battle would be equivalent to just rank D jutsus. And I can't supercharge them. And, in almost all cases, I can just inscribe those seals on my clothes and activate them when needed. There isn't much reason to create imprints. So, what do I do? Fujin fell into deep thought. After a few minutes, he decided, though my main reason for learning Fuinjutsu was for the tailed beasts and the flying thunder god technique, it will be a shame if that's all it is good for after spending such a long time learning it. Though I can still use it to set up traps or create defensive bases like this house, it still isn't good enough. There is only one way to make my knowledge implementable in battle. A very simple way. I need to create seals that I can use during battle. Of course, creating entirely new seals would be a very difficult and time-consuming task. It won't be worth it as the chances of success will be low. What I need to do is use the knowledge of my current seals to create complex seals that contain several of those seals and replicate their effects at the same time. Only such combinations of seals could be of some help in battle. Though this can be complicated as well, fortunately, I already have two good ideas. Hopefully, I'll get more in the future. For now, I'll create imprints for the two seals that might be of some help to me. A slash in, more ideas are always welcomed, smiley face. While Fujin became busy with learning more Fuinjutsu seals, creating seal imprints and perfecting vacuum gatling, the Kanoha's army, which had stayed on the borders with the land of Waterfall for over a month, began withdrawing. During the past month, the Kanoha ninjas had created a large and permanent base on the border with the land of Waterfall. Though the majority of the ninjas withdrew, 100 ninjas under the leadership of a veteran Jounin from the Nara clan stayed behind. This base served two purposes. The first one was that it acted as a forward base. If a Wabakura took any action in the land of Waterfall or even in the land of Grass, the ninjas from this base could act as a vanguard and slow them down while cooperating with Kusa and Taki. Secondly, it also acted as a mission center for missions coming from the land of Waterfall. Thanks to the Kanoha ninjas being stationed directly on their borders, their location was closer than Takigakur for some of the citizens in the land of Waterfall so it would bring in more mission revenue from the land of Waterfall. Now, in addition to the land of tea and the land of noodles, 
Kanoha had a forward base alongside the border with the land of waterfalls as well. Not only were those countries not offended by it, but they requested for these bases to be created and even paid Kanoha to keep them running. Chapter 369 In the Hokage's office, Hiruzen was sitting in his chair while reading something. He had a complicated expression on his face. Even though he expected Inoki to do this, when it truly happened, he couldn't help but feel a bit gloomy. After a couple of minutes, he exhaled the smoke and said softly, Bring Fujin here. He should be in training ground 23. Immediately, an umbu guard disappeared from the room. Fujin, who was training his vacuum gatling, stopped because he sensed a ninja entering the training ground. After getting the messenger, he left to see Hiruzen. He entered the office and before he could ask anything, Hiruzen pushed forward the book on his desk and said, Take a look at this. Fujin picked up the book while muttering, Bingo book? As soon as his eyes landed on the page Haruzen had opened, his eyes widened. He sighed and muttered, IWA finally decided to do this. Haruzen nodded. IWA had increased Fujin's bounty from 20 million Rio to 50 million Rio. Surprisingly, his summon and Fuinjutsu skills weren't mentioned in the report but they labeled him as the Spectral Swordsman. Fujin said, exposing this identity will cause a lot of trouble. I have killed way too many people in the last three years. Hiruzen replied, yes. It will be a diplomatic disaster. To avoid this, you won't ever accept this title. Fujin nodded and said, that goes without saying. But I doubt the neighboring countries will accept that so easily. Hiruzen replied, it doesn't matter. IWA can give no proof. I can just deny everything they say. And considering the recent movements in the other four major villages, these smaller countries don't want any trouble with Kanoha. They can only accept their losses and move on. But, they might try something against you when you are on missions. Be it for revenge or the 50 million Rio. There are a few bounty hunters as well who would be tempted. Fujin replied, yeah. I will be careful. But, why didn't IWA mention all my details? Haruzen chuckled and answered, They want others to suffer losses against you just like they did. Fujin was surprised. He thought, that's smart. And so fucking shameless. Irrespective of whether I'm dealt with or if I deal with the attackers, they will benefit. Hiruzen understood what Fujin was thinking about and said, It doesn't matter what they are scheming. Just ensure that you don't fall prey to any more traps. Fujin nodded and said, Yes, I won't. Thanks for the warning. I have another question though. Did you find out if anything was fishy in the previous incident? Since there were umbu guards in the room, Fujin was vague about the question. Hiruzen understood and answered, It wasn't anyone from the village. Shikaku and I concluded that they set a trap for any top-level ninja we send. Though you might have been their primary target. Regardless, you were just the unlucky one. As for your identity, that should be due to the previous information about you in the bingo book. Fujin thought, that's just as I predicted. Oh well, I'll just need to be more careful in the future. I can't take the lazy route. He placed the bingo book back on the desk and said, all right. Thanks for the information, Grandpa. I'll return to training. Hiruzen nodded and saw Fujin leave. He looked back at the bingo book and thought, 50 million Rio. The same amount as Kakashi. Looks like Inoki sees the same potential in him as he does in Kakashi. He closed the book and continued working. As for Fujin, he wasn't very worried. While walking back to his training ground, he thought, I had expected such a thing to happen. In fact, I am sure that a few schemes that are several times worse than this are already cooking behind the scenes. I just have to be more careful to avoid falling for such schemes and be strong and resourceful enough to destroy those schemes if I get caught up. Unperturbed, Fujin continued his training. However, many influential people paid great importance to this news. On an obscure island in the middle of nowhere, a camp containing more than 500 ninjas existed. In the central tent in this camp, a lady with long, auburn hair sat while reading the bingo book. 
Her eyes showed a glint of interest in what she was reading. A smile appeared on her face, and she said, He is very good at bluffing. Since he is Renjiro's student, it was unlikely that he would have carried out the threat he made when we met. Ao, who was standing next to her, said, We benefited heavily from the information he shared. So it doesn't matter much. Still, he is merely fourteen years old. I didn't expect him to be so young. May nodded and said, Yeah. He is already as strong as me. If he successfully keeps growing for another decade, Kanoha will once again have a fearsome rank as ninja. No wonder such a bounty was placed on his head. I'm sure that whoever placed the bounty is scheming a lot in the background. Ao thought for a few seconds and said, If he has such a potential, should we try to kill him? If a second Minato appears in Kanoha, then we won't be able to defend in a war against Kanoha. May shook her head and said, No. That would be a big mistake. Since the third Hokage sent him to meet me with the secret information, it should mean that he is hoping for an alliance in the future. If it does happen, then I will have to negotiate with this boy. Those negotiations won't be easy if we try to kill him and fail. Not to mention, Kumo will do everything they can to eliminate him considering that he specializes in wind nature manipulation. Besides, I doubt all his skills are mentioned in the bingo book. Even if they are all, killing him will still be a very costly affair. But, if the Mizukic faction wants to take him out, then we could benefit heavily. Ask our spies to spread out rumors. There is a lot of hatred in the Mizukic faction for the Spectral Swordsman due to how many of their fake rogue ninjas he killed. Let them try to fight him and lose their elites. Ao nodded and got to work. Sitting in his office, Raza had a thoughtful expression on his face as he read Fujin's information for the umpteenth time. A frown appeared on his face as he thought, I remember Iwabakur sending information regarding him and speculating that he was the troublemaker. This sudden increase in his bounty should be Iwa's work. But, is he worthy of such a bounty or does IWA hate him for some reason? He fell into deep thought. After a few minutes he shook his head and concluded, Regardless of whether he is worthy or not, I can't overlook him. For IWA to be so troubled, he should at least be at the elite Jounin level. And at such a young age too. Not to mention, his skill set is too similar to the culprit who created so much chaos in my country. It doesn't matter if it was the copy ninja or him, I need to eliminate him if I get the chance. Kumo and IWA leadership didn't have much reaction towards this news for obvious reasons. However, the information caused a lot of chaos in the minor villages that were allied with Kanoha. Their leaders immediately called for council meetings and sent a scroll to Haruzan asking for an explanation. The people who took this news seriously weren't limited to other countries. In an office under the Kanoha, Danzo sat with a thoughtful face as he read Fujin's bounty and information. He thought, the boy I asked Haruzan for less than four years ago has already reached this stage? No wonder Haruzan refused to tell us who the spectral swordsman was no matter how many times I asked him. Danzo was genuinely surprised. However, he curbed his surprise and wondered, who exposed him? And who did he offend to get such a huge bounty? Danzo thought about the recent events and realized, recently, Iwabakur created a mess in the land of Waterfall. Haruzan didn't tell me or the other elders what happened, but according to my information, one of our Umbu squads clashed with IWA there. So it should be his squad. But why would that make IWA so alarm? Danzo's left eye widened as he recalled, Wait, around half a year ago, the Four Tails Jinchuriki, Rashi, went on a rampage in the Land of Grass. Information regarding that incident was buried as well. I thought we benefited only due to Iwa's folly. But if I assume that Rashi clashed with him, then it would make sense for Kusa to trust Kanoha so much and for IWA to attach so much importance to him. But, can Fujin go up against Rashi? Danzo looked at his bounty and a frown appeared on his face. He thought, no wonder IWA put up such a huge bounty. He must have survived against Rashi and they probably set up a trap for him in the land of Waterfall. I should have been more forceful and inducted him in the route. Such a talent will now be corrupted by Haruzan's naive thoughts. But, 
this can be an opportunity as well. Danzo entered into deep thought. He analyzed, for an umbu, maintaining their disguise is the most important. If their identity is leaked, then everyone who they targeted and their families will try to get back at them. Hiruzen has failed him by failing to protect his identity. I can use this to try and recruit him. In addition, the Spectral Swordsman is known to be very ruthless and efficient. His method seems to be very similar to mine. I could try to influence him with my ideology as well. He looked at a root ninja in his office and instructed, call the two elders here. Due to his analysis, Danzo was upbeat about his chances of recruiting Fujin. However, if he was to know that Hiruzen was planning to pass the route to Fujin in the future, one would wonder what Danzo's expression would be. Chapter 370 The people surprised by this bounty weren't limited to just village leaders. Akimichi Choza saw Fujin's bounty while looking through the new bingo book. A thought, such a high bounty. No wonder Lord Hokage wants to nurture him. But, I still don't understand why he wants to make someone this talented a negotiator. Yamanaka Inoichi thought while looking at Fujin's information, so this is the boy that has been giving Shikaku sleepless nights. Fumito is on his squad. I'll ask him to improve his relationship. Hyuga Hayashi analyzed, so this is the boy pushing Hoka to continuously become stronger. I hadn't paid much attention to him earlier. But if someone like him is pushing Hoka, then it'll be very beneficial for Hoka. A look of surprise appeared on Inazuka Tsum's face as she thought, I remember how dedicated he was to training during the Chunin exam. I knew he'd become strong. But I never imagined he'd reach such a level so quickly. The other clan leaders had similar reactions. However, because they hadn't been in direct contact with Fujin, they had to look up for more information on him. Since not everyone checked the bingo book regularly, the ones other than the clan leaders didn't get to know about Fujin's bounty immediately. But as the word about this matter, almost everyone in Konoha became aware of another talented youngster rising through their ranks. Of course, the one who was the most proud was Renjiro. A smile formed on his face as he muttered, It looks like I might not be able to keep up with him anymore. He looked at the sky and wondered, is this a sign for me to retire and leave active duty? Fujin was unaware of the fame he was gaining in his village. However, even if he had known, he wasn't in a state to think about it. The effect of the soldier pill had run out and he was in a deep sleep as his body and mind were completely exhausted. He rested for a couple of days before continuing his morning routine. To push himself to his limits, he started to use his training seal at 100% capacity for the duration of the training. After the training, he sat with his back against a tree while breathing heavily. He thought, 100% capacity is too much to handle with that intense workout. I should go at 92% from tomorrow and slowly increase it to 100% in a month. Fujin took a while to catch his breath. On recovering, he analyzed, in the last three days before the pill ran out of energy, I managed to create imprints for all the seals that I decided on. And my clones managed to learn both, the five element seal and five elements unseal. I will next create imprints for these two. Their complexity level is much higher than the other seals I imprinted. Once I manage to create imprints for them, I'll begin working on the four symbols seals imprint. My vacuum gatling is also at a usable level now. Its speed is around 71% of my vacuum bullet, and I can fire them at an angle of up to 45. In terms of firing rate, I can fire 4 rounds in a second and 10 in 3 seconds. Spending more time on improving any of these aspects would be pointless. Over the next few months, as I become more used to this jutsu, its speed should increase to around 90% of the vacuum bullet and the angle should increase to 60. The firing rate should also increase to 5 rounds in a second. I only need to train one more thing with the vacuum gatling. After I'm done with it, I'll begin working on an AoE vacuum jutsu. But, these can wait for some time. I need to do something more important today. Fujin kept resting until he had completely recovered and then got up and began moving towards another training ground. He thought, I hope this goes well. If possible, I would love to explore this route further as well. Maybe not to the limit, 
but close to that point. Fujin disappeared from his spot and moved at a rapid speed using body flicker. In one of the many training grounds in Kanoha, a voice could be heard reverberating among the trees. 894 895 896 897 898 899 Suddenly, the person stopped and looked up. After a moment, he continued doing his push-ups and asked enthusiastically, Fujin, how have you been? Fujin replied, doing well, Gai-san. How about you? Gai replied with the same enthusiasm, never been better. Why are you here? Also, just call me Gai. Fujin, sure. I need your help. My taijutsu skills are growing rusty and I was wondering whether you'd be up for some sparring. Guy said, so you want to spar? All right. Just give me a few minutes. 932 933 934 935 936 937 Fujin watched with a deadpan expression as Guy doubled his speed of doing push-ups. He sighed internally, as expected. Fujin moved away and began stretching his muscles until Guy was done. In less than a minute, Guy shouted, 1,000. He got up and said, All right, let's fight now. Fujin nodded and took his stance. A smile appeared on his face as he felt a sudden surge of excitement. He thought, My Guy. Though I have fought a lot of exciting battles, be it against Kakuzu, Derui, Rashi or Kitsuchi and have seen someone like Haruzen in action, no one comes close to this beast in terms of real strength. Despite it being over a decade, Fujin couldn't help but recall the scene of Uchiha Madara declaring Gai as the strongest in Taijutsu. Gai shouted, Here I come! Let the power of youth explode! Without further ado, Gai burst forward like a whirlwind at an incredible speed. At the same time, Fujin moved forward as well and unleashed a punch. Their fists clashed, producing a loud sound and a minute shockwave. A look of surprise appeared on Guy's face. It soon turned into a grin as he exclaimed, Good! I can feel the power of youth coursing through your body. A grin appeared on Fujin's face as well while he said, My guy, I have heard that you are the greatest taijutsu master in our village. A shame that I couldn't spar with you until now. I really hope you live up to your reputation because I haven't felt so excited about a fight in a long time. Fujin immediately unleashed a barrage of punches and kicks relentlessly, forcing Guy on a back foot. Guy blocked and dodged his attacks and in a few seconds, began counterattacking. The two exchanged blows without a break. As the fight continued, Fujin slowly started getting overwhelmed. He parried Guy's kick while thinking, such crazy raw power and speed. His experience in Taijutsu is far superior to mine as well. I haven't seen anyone apart from Aruzen move this fast. And we aren't yet using chakra to enhance our power and speed. Though Guy was better and was overwhelming Fujin, Fujin could still hold on. Since he was the one to request a Taijutsu spar, Fujin refrained from using chakra to enhance himself to get an advantage. If someone were to see this fight, they would be shocked. Both Fujin and Guy moved at such a tremendous speed that neither could be seen by an untrained eye. Only the sounds of their fists and legs clashing could be heard. Occasionally, some part of the ground would blow up or a tree or two would be broken. After five minutes of such intense combat, both fighters finally stopped and stood around ten meters apart while facing each other. Fujin's breathing was slightly rough. A few bruises could be seen on his arms and legs. However, none were serious. In comparison, Guy didn't have any injuries on his body. His breathing, though slightly heavier, seemed normal as well. Guy praised, Excellent, Fujin. You truly embody the spirit of youth. Fujin replied, Thanks, Guy. Your reputation doesn't do justice. A grin appeared on his face as chakra began flowing around his body. He asked, I wonder if you'd like to get serious now. Guy observed Fujin and said, The Senju Taijutsu style. Good. 
Other than Lady Tsunade, I haven't seen any other ninja from the Senja clan exerting more chakra than you. Dai took his fighting stance. Fujin immediately became extremely serious. He immediately concentrated chakra in his eyes. He could sense an intense chakra being radiated from Dai. It wasn't as strong as his chakra in quantity, but it felt far more intense. Sweat dripped down Fujin's forehead as he observed Dai's application of chakra. He could only think, this guy. Chapter 371 Looking at the serious look on Fujin's face and his glowing eyes, Guy said, My fighting style is called the strong fist style. Unlike the Senju Taijutsu style which uses chakra to just enhance the power behind the punch or the kick, this method enhances the entire body. Though it lacks explosive strength, its impact is much higher. Fujin was still surprised. He replied, I see. He thought, I should have expected his fighting method to not be merely taijutsu. His chakra is completely infused in his body. There is no leakage. But, this method is different from just concentrating chakra in one part of the body. Infusing chakra directly into the body puts intense pressure on muscles and the chakra network itself. I can understand infusing chakra in limbs. I should be able to do that as well though it might be a bit painful. But infusing chakra in vital organs is very risky. Is his chakra control and medical knowledge so good that he is so confident in not damaging himself? But that doesn't sound like Guy at all. Before he could analyze further, Guy made a move. He burst forward like a bullet and within the blink of an eye, he had reached Fujin. Fujin's eyes widened as he thought, so fast. He immediately clenched his right fist and concentrated a lot of chakra on it and punched at the incoming fist. The two fists collided, causing a strong shockwave to spread from the impact. Fujin and Guy immediately jumped back and created some distance between themselves. Fujin shook his right hand and complained, What is your fist made of? I felt like I was hitting iron. Guy chuckled, You aren't bad yourself. Get ready. I'm about to be serious. He moved towards Fujin and both exchanged a flurry of punches and kicks once again. Suddenly, Guy took a step back and began spinning while shouting, Severe Leave Hurricane. He unleashed a series of kicks, targeting Fujin's legs, waist and head in a random pattern. However, Fujin managed to block or dodge every kick. Suddenly, Guy jumped in the air and attacked Fujin with a heel drop. Fujin immediately moved out of the way and retreated. As he expected, as soon as Guy's kick landed on the ground, rocks were sent flying everywhere around him. Guy ignored those rocks and attacked Fujin again. As the two of them fought, Fujin analyzed Guy's abilities. He thought, in terms of speed, he is just barely slower than Haruzen. The only way I could be faster than him is if I use Assassin's Rush Jutsu. Though if he uses the inner gates, I doubt Assassin's Rush Jutsu would be able to keep up. Not to mention, Assassin's Rush only provides a linear speed boost. That said, though he is faster, I can still keep up and defend myself, even if just barely. One mistake and I'll take a bad punch or a kick. I'm very intrigued about this strong fist style though. His punches and kicks are enhanced with chakra. But not the same degree of chakra as the Senju Taijutsu style. I can concentrate far more chakra in my fists and legs than him. On the flip side, the Senju Taijutsu style consumes chakra at a much higher rate. And it doesn't buff speed or defenses like the strong fist style. Still, despite seeing it for a considerable amount of time, Fujin could still not wrap his head around one fact. He cursed, I still can't believe how fucking good guy's chakra control is. Isn't he supposed to be an untalented ninja who reached the top with nothing but hard work and determination? This changes my entire understanding of this world. Of course, Fujin would never say that out loud. Fujin and Guy kept going at each other relentlessly for over two hours before finally stopping. Fujin sat on the ground while breathing heavily while Guy sat on a broken tree while taking deep breaths as well. Guy said, You are good. No one other than Kakashi gives me such an intense fight. I see why you received such a huge bounty. 
Fujin was surprised to hear that. He asked, You know about my bounty? Guy replied, How could I not? It's the talk of the village as of now. Everyone is curious about you. Guy put on his trademark smile and gave Fujin a thumbs up as he said enthusiastically, seeing someone as young as you getting such a high bounty makes the youth in me explode. Fujin watched Guy and sighed in relief internally while thinking, Lucky. I thought he might begin shedding tears and summon a sunset right at noon. Fujin got up and said, I'm more impressed by you, Guy. Is it fine if I ask some questions about your strong fist style? Guy replied, Ask. I can't deny the request of someone so youthful. Fujin asked, How can you infuse chakra in your entire body? Doesn't it put a strain on your muscles, chakra network, and even your internal organs? Guy answered, It's simple. The answer is hard work. Fujin was confused. He asked, What do you mean? Guy put up his trademark smile again and answered, You just have to keep training day in and day out until the chakra infuses naturally in your body? Fujin's left eyebrow twitched. He asked, Do you mean that you don't do that via chakra control? Guy replied, No. That's too complicated. He gave Fujin a thumbs up again and said, You just need to keep training until that happens naturally. There is no other way. At least none that I know of. Fujin sighed internally and thought, I should have known. Top-tier chakra control and medical knowledge just don't match Guy's personality. He became serious as he analyzed, still, though the method is strange and unconventional, I don't think it will be risky. In fact, I have a feeling that this might be a prerequisite for learning the eight inner gates. Or at the very least, being able to strengthen the body this way could help in improving the ability to sustain the eight inner gates. The reason why I don't think this is risky is due to how often Guy might be using it. In the future, Lee would master this easily too. And it's possible that Mai Duwei knew this as well. Or perhaps he knew something similar and Guy improved upon it. Guy saw Fujin in a deep thought and asked, What are you thinking about? Fujin said, I have been feeling like my Taijutsu has been stuck at the same level for a couple of years. I was wondering whether you could help me develop a new training plan for myself. Guy raised his thumb again and replied with his trademark smile, You can count on me. Fujin said, Also, one of the reasons why my taijutsu was stuck was due to a lack of fights as I prefer using ninjutsu in combat. So, can you please spar with me on a regular basis? A grin formed on his face as Fujin added, I have a feeling that I'll improve rapidly if I keep sparring with you like we did today. Guy grinned as well and said enthusiastically, Of course. I can already see us unleashing our youthfulness in our spars. Do you have any other requests? A smile formed on Fujin's face. He said, Just one more thing. How much did you hold back against me today? A look of surprise appeared on Guy's face. However, it quickly turned into a smile. He said, I am surprised you noticed. Though Fujin had said that his taijutsu was growing rusty, he was still very confident in his taijutsu. He was confident in winning even against the Hyuga elites in taijutsu. The number of ninjas who could defeat him in taijutsu was quite low. However, despite his confidence, Fujin was one of the few who knew how insanely strong Guy was. In fact, even the ones who knew Guy's strength didn't know how strong Guy could be for sure. In fact, Fujin knew about it more than even Guy himself did. In addition, unlike Fujin, who trained in every aspect, Guy focused entirely on his taijutsu. Despite his confidence, Fujin clearly knew that he was far inferior to Guy in taijutsu. Guy answered, Not much. My speed and power are as you saw. I just pulled a few punches to not injure you. Fujin thought, I see. He didn't consider the eight inner gates. Fujin replied, All right. Thank you. Hopefully, you won't have to hold back against me soon. Let's start creating a training plan. Fujin and Guy began discussing Fujin's current body training plan and began creating a new one. Fujin's goal for this new training plan was to infuse the chakra in his body just like Guy could. Chapter 372 Fujin and Guy discussed the training plan for quite some time. 
It wasn't like when Fujin asked Jenki or Renjiro to help with training plans. Back then, his knowledge was too low and he merely followed the training plans they created with little input from him. But now, Fujin was quite experienced as well. In addition, his relationship with Guy was more like a colleague rather than a teacher-student relationship. So both were quite casual. After around half an hour, the plan was finalized. Fujin thanked Guy and took his leave. As he left the training ground, Fujin sighed involuntarily and thought, what a weird exchange. He recalled Guy's first words. After asking for Guy's help, Guy immediately created a complete training plan and explained it to Fujin with extreme enthusiasm. His words left Fujin completely speechless. Guy had created a training schedule that started at 5 a.m. and went on till 11 p.m. with extremely small breaks sprinkled in between for eating. In addition, some of the training involved embarrassing tasks like walking around Kanoha on his hands. Fujin thought, he is even more crazy than I remember. Training in such a manner is very harmful to the body. Not to mention, it is useless for anyone who doesn't want to abandon ninjutsu and jinjutsu. More than half the time we spent discussing it was to cut the training time from 18 hours to 4 hours. A good amount of the remaining time was spent on removing the embarrassing exercises. While I don't mind some strangers laughing if I can benefit heavily, those exercises don't provide any significant benefit. I guess he does it to improve his mental fortitude and to keep himself humble or grounded. But that isn't an issue for me. Fujin shook his head and thought, all the weirdness aside, the interaction went quite similarly to how I imagined it would. His nature is as helpful and straightforward as I remember. But, he definitely isn't as simple or naive as he was in the series. No, even in the series, though he acted as a fool, I didn't consider him as one. Though he wasn't the sharpest, he was still very mature, stable, and decently smart. But, in this treacherous world, he'd be even more smart. Regardless, since he has decided to help me, I don't need to worry much about it. This method of training will be very effective. Since my body is already very strong, I won't need a long time before I can replicate this. In maybe three to four months, I should be able to infuse chakra throughout my body. And, unlike Guy, I can combine the strong fist style with the Senju Taijutsu style. As long as I ignore the eight inner gates, my Taijutsu could surpass his level if I devote the majority of my time to it. Sadly, the gains won't be worth it as what makes Guy stand out is his skill with the eight inner gates. I wonder if he'd be willing to teach me the eight inner gates. Fujin analyzed for a bit and concluded, asking for it right away will be foolish. Let me first master the chakra infusion. In that time, I can improve my relationship with Guy considerably with regular spars. It'll be best if he proposes this idea himself. If not, I can ask him when I feel it'll be appropriate. If he refuses, I can only ask Haruzen whether Kanoha has this forbidden method. Haruzen should know about it considering that Madara was aware of this technique. So my Duwe shouldn't be its creator. Though I'm not interested in the eighth gate, the ones before that will be very helpful. The ability to open the second gate is the one I want the most. To be able to get a second chance in the middle of a fight is invaluable at the top level. Even if my enemy is too strong for me, I can at least get a second chance at running away. From the third gate onwards, if I can use that excess chakra to supercharge my ninjutsu while amplifying my taijutsu, it would instantly take me to the peak among the rank S ninjas for that duration. However, that might not be easy considering that there is no precedent for it. Oh well, I'll leave this matter for later. Fujin flickered towards Yakiniku as he remembered another matter. He thought, Guy said that my name is getting well known due to the bounty. I was afraid that something like this would happen. Sai, fame isn't good. Haruzen, Shikaku and Eagle have done a great job in keeping my identity under wraps until now. Even the elders didn't know about my identity. This sudden fame will probably pull me into this village's political mess sooner than I wanted to. I need to be more alert from now on. It was a lucky break that I learned seal imprints and developed a cool idea that happens to help me in this regard. Hee hee, I wonder who'll be making the first move against me. 
Though Fujin preferred dealing with matters with a swing of his sword, he didn't mind clashing with just intelligence either. Suno was still suffering due to the schemes he set in the process almost a year ago. He had also managed to get away safely from a terrible position against Mei with just a verbal exchange. Despite not wishing for it, he was looking forward to dipping his hands into Kanoha's internal mess. After having lunch, Fujin returned to training ground 23. He created a dozen shadow clones to think about how to create a wide-range vacuum jutsu. As for his main body, he decided to practice the training plan he had finalized after a long discussion with Guy. Fujin stretched his body while muttering, We packed an 18-hour workout session into four hours. I hope my body still stays in one piece after this. Fujin began the most intense workout session of his life until that moment. After a couple of hours, one of Fujin's shadow clones suddenly snapped his eyes open. He disappeared from his spot and flickered rapidly towards the border of the training ground. He landed on a spot and thought, that's weird. I locked onto a couple of minute chakra signatures that suddenly appeared. However, it dissipated as soon as I locked onto it. Other ninjas entering his training ground happen every once in a while. In most cases, it'd be someone who wanted to visit Fujin. In some rare cases, it'd just be someone who was passing through. However, it was the first instance of someone disappearing after being sensed. The clone squinted his eyes as he noticed something on the ground. He bent down and picked up two dead bugs. He analyzed, these should be the source of the chakra. What was an Abure ninja doing here? And why did he kill his own bugs and run away? He spread out his chakra field, covering a circular area with a radius of three kilometers. Immediately almost every high-level ninja in this area looked in the direction of Fujin's clone. Fujin's clone deactivated his chakra field and analyzed, I didn't find anyone hiding in nearby training grounds. Whoever it was should have mixed with the civilians and the ninjas. Regardless, why would the Aburame clan send a ninja to do something so fishy? He thought for a few seconds before shaking his head. A frown formed on his face as he concluded, No, this isn't the style of the Aburame clan. It should be Shimura fucking Danzo. Why the hell is that bastard crawling out of the ground? He took another look at the bugs and observed, These bugs aren't poisonous ones. Rather, they are the ones used for scouting and spying. He wants to collect my information. Knowing his record, he wants to either eliminate or recruit me. If it's the latter, I can handle him. But if it's the former... The frown on his face deepened. He thought, though I am confident in being able to go up against Danzo and even his remaining root ninjas in a fair fight, these bastards will never fight fair. In addition, though Haruzen is extremely devious, he has a soft spot for Danzo. Even though taking the root from him might seem a big punishment, it is very tame considering that he killed a rank S ninja, caused another rank S to go rogue and was the main reason behind the massacre of Kanoha's strongest clan. So even if Danzo makes a move against me, I can't count on Haruzen to back me up. And, I'll also need to be on guard against that freakish eye. Sigh, as I expected, fame is a pain in the ass. Danzo, I hope you don't make things difficult for me, else I don't care if Haruzen gets offended. I should wait till I take the Flying Thunder God though. It shouldn't be an issue as I doubt Danzo would make a move against me in a hurry. After completing his analysis, the clone clenched his fists. The dead bugs in his hand were cut into minute particles and cremated. A second later, he dispelled himself. Fujin was sweating heavily as he exerted his body to the max suddenly, his eyes widened as he received the clone's memories. His expression went back to normal and a smile appeared on his face as he thought, so you have decided to crawl out? It looks like things might not get boring even after I retire from the umbu. Chapter 373, Fujin didn't bother thinking about Danzo anymore and focused on his training again. After four grueling hours of relentless training, Fujin's body felt like it had been pushed beyond its limits several times. His muscles burned with a searing intensity, and every breath he took was a laborious effort. With a deep, ragged exhale, he finally released the tight control he had maintained over his body. He collapsed backwards onto the training ground, his back making contact with the earth. 
Drops of sweat glistened on his forehead before trickling down, mingling with the earth below. His chest heaved as he lay there, staring up at the sky. He muttered, finally done. What a fucking crazy training plan. And I have to put my body through this hell on a daily basis. Fujin closed his eyes and kept lying there, recovering both body and spirit. After around five minutes, Fujin finally got up. He stretched his sore muscles while thinking, no wonder the eight inner gates isn't popular. Only a maniac can put his body through this hell for years. Still, there is no doubt that this will be very beneficial for me. I should have gone to Guy Wright when Renjiro's training plan began losing effect. I should also make a new training seal. I will be comfortable with the maximum limit of this seal in less than a month with this training. Fujin dispelled his clones and received their memories. A look of surprise appeared on his face. He thought, that's weird. None of my clones could think of a good AoE vacuum jutsus. He began walking home while analyzing, the only decent idea they came up with was using several vacuum jutsus while using the infinite breakthrough jutsu at the same time. It would affect a wide range. But it isn't the same. It is merely spamming the normal vacuum jutsus. Though it would appear as a similar effect, it won't be the case. Not only will there be a lot of gaps to dodge the attack, but it won't be stronger than my normal vacuum attacks either. I need to think of something better. Fujin freshened up and had dinner before calling it a day. Lying in his bed, Fujin wondered, now, what to do about Danzo? He stayed quiet for some time while recalling all the information he could about Danzo. He analyzed, from what I remember, Danzo stayed inactive since the Uchiha's massacre until he put Sai on Naruto's squad. He didn't make a move during Konoha Crush or for the 5th Hokage either. While I can understand the former considering his actions during Payne's assault, the latter is very suspicious. Why didn't he try and claim the 5th Hokage's spot after Haruzen died to his own student? Fujin analyzed for a while before concluding, the only reason I can think of is the fame and reputation of Jiraiya and Tsunade. Perhaps, even if he tried, the other council members would push for Jiraiya to take the seat. After all, in terms of fame and reputation, Jiraiya is in a whole different league than Kakashi. Even if he tried using Shirsue's eye to influence the daimyo, everyone would become very suspicious of such a decision. So his secrets would be out and would be far more detrimental for him in the long run. Wait, now that I think about it, the Hokage's appointment needs a vote from Jounin's. Without a crisis created by Akatsuki and an opportunity to create and lead a shinobi alliance, he wouldn't be able to become the Hokage. No wonder he didn't fight for it. But, since he is making a move now, there might have been a change I'm not aware of, or perhaps my existence is tempting him to make a move. Either way, he has the potential to create a lot of mess. Fujin was unaware of the fact that Haruzen allowed Danzo to recruit talented orphans from the land of water into the root. Though the root was merely in the beginning stages of recruiting and the recruits didn't add any immediate power to the root, it increased Danzo's hope. It also gave him an opportunity to exert some political influence in Kanoha again. Fujin analyzed, if Danzo begins interfering, then he has the ability to change the future events. If he does that, I will lose a lot of my advantage needlessly. Though he won't be able to affect Akatsuki's operations much, he could alter the future by interfering in Kanoha's politics or worse, by interfering with Naruto and Sasuke. What to do? Fujin kept lying in his bed while thinking about the insane amount of complications that would occur if someone like Danzo began acting in a different manner than what he remembered. After a long while, he let out a sigh and decided, the best case scenario will be if he doesn't interfere beyond a certain limit. But if he does, then I might need to interfere. Though killing him will be difficult and raise too many questions, I can cut off his arms by eliminating the few loyal root ninjas he has one by one. Without them, his ability to act will be severely restricted. And though Haruzen has a soft spot, I doubt he'll give Danzo additional forces. He isn't that naive. But, I can't use wind release. Even though I can remove the traces, Haruzen and Eagle have too much information about me. They will become suspicious and begin keeping tabs on me. Fortunately, I still have a hidden card. 
lightning sparks appeared on Fujin's body before disappearing. Though Fujin's lightning jutsus weren't as broken as his wind jutsus, they were still strong enough to take on a jounin. More importantly, they were backed by his fearsome speed and strength. Normal jounin level root ninjas wouldn't stand a chance against him. Fujin analyzed, no one is aware of my skill in lightning release. To avoid any suspicions, I didn't visit the lightning training rooms. If I kill some root ninjas using lightning release, Danzo will suspect Kakashi. Since Kakashi wouldn't do something so drastic by his own will, he will suspect Haruzen. If a conflict between the two happens, then that'll be for the best outcome. Fujin yawned and muttered, enough planning for today. I'll have to wait to see what he does first. He closed his eyes and fell asleep within a minute. The training had drained him entirely. From the next day, Fujin followed this routine. He trained with the new training plan early in the morning. He would follow it up with a three-hour-long taijutsu spar with Guy. After lunch, he would experiment with the ideas he had for an AOE vacuum jutsu. This continued for five more days until Guy said, The power of youth overflows in you, Fujin. Unfortunately, I have to take a mission tomorrow. Fujin nodded and said, Good luck, Guy. Let me know when you return. I am usually in training ground 23 or the large house next to it. Guy gave Fujin a thumbs up and said, Definitely. Fujin took his leave. Guy's trademark smile faded away as Fujin left. He thought, Suzuki Fujin. I never thought that someone so talented in ninjutsu would be willing to undergo such a training regime for six days straight. His taijutsu is already better than Kakashi's if he doesn't use the Sharingan. His grin returned as he exclaimed, a junior is pushing himself so much. I need to increase my training even more. Before I leave, I will do a week's training in only a day. He immediately dropped down and began doing push-ups at such a speed that his body looked blurry and left several afterimages. Fujin didn't bother Guy anymore. He had another issue to take care of. While eating in Ichiraku, his mind was occupied by the issue he was being troubled with. He thought, it's almost been a week since I started. But I still haven't had any success in creating an AOE vacuum jutsu. Though I could create the idea I had, its effect was much lower than what I wanted. I won't be able to pierce a Sasano with this method. Unfortunately, I don't have any other good ideas. Creating a large enough vacuum core for an AOE attack is not possible. Perhaps spamming vacuum cannon might be the only way to replicate Danzo's success against the Sasano. I wonder how he does it. Unfortunately, no matter how hard Fujin thought, he couldn't come up with a decent idea. It came as a surprise to him considering how quickly he could create the other vacuum jutsus. The next day, after consuming the soldier pill, Fujin decided, there is no point in wasting a lot of time trying to figure this out. With vacuum gatling, vacuum blade, and vacuum slash, that IWA army will be helpless against me. So I don't need to worry much about this. I will begin working on taking my wind release to the next level. Hopefully, I'll find some inspiration as I work on it. Chapter 374 Fujin was sitting on the training ground while waiting for his chakra to recover. His clones had continued working on the remaining seals. Fujin didn't bother visiting the training rooms because he was deep in thought. His mind was occupied with thinking about what he wanted to create. Once his chakra recovered, Fujin got up. He began emitting chakra into the air from every chakra point on his body. As soon as the chakra was released, it transformed into the wind and mixed with the surroundings. If a normal person saw, he wouldn't feel anything different. However, any ninja would immediately feel the high amount of chakra concentrated in the area. Fujin analyzed, unlike the wind-style jinjutsu, this can be easily detected. But doing what I have in my mind can't be done with that little amount of chakra. But, it shouldn't be an issue. Even though I'm sacrificing stealth, it will be compensated by the abilities of this technique. Fujin focused his eyes on a branch of a tree in front of him. More accurately, he focused on the wind around the branch which had his chakra mixed in. In an instant, the wind attacked the branch. The winds caused the branch to sway. 
A few leaves fell, but no damage was inflicted to the branch. Fujin furrowed his eyebrows as he analyzed, this will take a lot of time. He closed his eyes and continued emitting more chakra in the surrounding area. As he did, he also focused all his attention on sensing his wind chakra that was mixed into the surroundings. After five minutes, he snapped his eyes open and exerted control on the chakra he had released. Immediately, winds began flowing around him. The branches of the trees around him began swaying in the wind and a few leaves broke off. Fujin sighed and thought, it's very difficult to exert control over this chakra. Making it sharper is even more difficult. Though my control over wind jutsu is normally very good, it is because I manipulate it however I want before it leaves my body. Even though I have some more control over jutsus like blades of wind and infinite breakthrough due to inyang manipulation, it still has more to do with what I do before I launch the jutsu. As I speculated, this will be a rather difficult technique to create. Memories regarding his idea flashed into his mind. Fujin thought, it has been a long time since I wanted to create something like this. I first had the idea after seeing the rank E wind jutsus. But the idea was very vague back then. And I didn't have any idea of how to even start working towards it. That changed when I fought with Susumu. His application of wind release to cast Jinjutsu gave me an idea of how I could start. My idea is to emit chakra into my surrounding winds and control it. If it goes as I want it to, then I should be able to create extremely high speed winds at will. I should also be able to make those winds extremely sharp. At a later stage, I should also be able to mix vacuum blades in this technique. Once it is completed, it will be akin to the wind variant of the Rakage's Cloak of Lightning. Though it won't buff my speed or physical defense and attack like the Cloak of Lightning, the entire area around me will be a death zone. I can use the winds to tear apart anyone who enters in the range of this technique. I can also use the winds to defend against ranged attacks. And though I'm not sure whether I can use this to buff my speed, this could potentially aid me in another way. That is, the power of flight. A glint appeared in Fujin's eyes. The ability to fly and to create such a domain around him were among the top abilities that he craved. He thought, considering the nature of this technique, it can't be called a jutsu. Instead, I will call this my wind domain. Once I master it, even Abito would be very wary of Sneak attacking me in the middle of a battle. He can enter my domain, but he can't deactivate his intangibility while he is in it. Unfortunately, this technique will be very difficult to create. According to my calculations, I'll need at least a year of extreme training to make this technique workable. Raising it to a level comparable to Rakage's Cloak of Lightning will need even more time. In addition, I will have to break this technique into several parts as trying to directly master it in its entirety will be doing too much at the same time. Also, these parts would help me keep track of my progress. As for what these parts will be, Fujin chuckled as he thought they would be the rank E jutsus in the library. Wind levitation jutsu, projectile control jutsu, wind retrieving jutsu and the rank D propelling winds jutsu will be ideal for creating this technique. It's just that instead of using my own chakra, I need to perform these jutsus with the chakra I have emitted into the surroundings. Of course, these alone won't be enough. They can improve my control but won't help me much in attack. For that, I need to create blades of wind and later vacuum blades with the emitted chakra. In addition, I need to create a new jutsu. The jutsu will be the ninjutsu variant of wind-style jinjutsu. While maintaining the stealth aspect, I want to form an attack with the wind chakra I have emitted. Since the chakra will be very low, I can only create one attack. One simple cut with sharpened winds at the neck. I will call it the silent cut jutsu. This will have two usages. The first one is obviously for assassination. The second is to use this to sneak attack anyone who detects my technique, stays a safe distance away and is able to defend against me. Hmm. Though I have a few more ideas, this should be enough for now. I'll begin my training. Fujin created five shadow clones. Fujin and his clones spread out around the training ground. Each of them emitted their chakra into the air and tried using it to use the wind-retrieving jutsu. 
Fujin quickly became engrossed in his training. Though the Jutsu had the potential to require a large amount of chakra, Fujin didn't have much mastery over it. So he and his clones only released as much chakra as they could control. Due to this, Fujin's chakra regenerated at a much faster rate than he and his clones could use. So apart from needing a break after dispelling and recreating the clones working on Fujinjutsu, Fujin didn't need any other break. Fujin ignored everything else and continued his training. Three days later, a ninja wearing a mask appeared in an underground tunnel. He walked towards a room and entered it. He knelt and respectfully said, Danzo-sama. Danzo looked at him and said, Toryun, report your observations. Toryun reported, I tried keeping an eye on Suzuki Fujin for the last ten days. For the first six days, he woke up at 4.30 a.m. He went to training ground 23 at 5 a.m. He stayed there until 10 a.m. From 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., he went to the training ground where my guy was at. He spent three hours there before going to have lunch in either Yakiniku, Ichiraku, or his house. He returned to the training ground 23 after lunch and spent another four to six hours there before going back to his house. On the seventh day, Guy had to go on a mission. So Fujin stayed in the training ground 23 until lunchtime. But, in the last three days, he has stayed all the time in the training ground 23. He hasn't left for food or sleep. I believe he is using a soldier pill to train continuously. Danzo was surprised. He thought, so much training? Is he preparing for something? Or is this how he always is? He asked, what is he training in? And did you inspect his house? Torian answered, I planted some of my insects to spy on what he and Guy were doing. They both sparred for three hours straight on a daily basis. Fujin's taijutsu is very good. He uses the Senju taijutsu style. In a pure taijutsu fight, I don't think any root ninja will be a match for him. As for what he did in training ground 23, he took a pause before continuing, I couldn't find out. He keeps his chakra field activated in the training ground all the time. I tried sending in some insects, but he detected them and even tried looking for me. I planted some bugs in the training ground in the night, but he could somehow find and kill all of them before he began doing whatever he was doing. So I have no idea what he does there. As for his home, Sweat gathered behind Torian's mask before he could give an answer. Chapter 375, Danzo asked, What about his house? Torian answered, Whenever Suzuki Fujin leaves his house, he puts a five-seal barrier tag on the door. I managed to find two more tags within a day. But despite searching for a long time, my bugs couldn't find the two remaining tags around his house. I can't say for sure, but I think that there are a lot more seals on and around his house. I got a feeling that if I had gone to inspect myself instead of sending bugs, I would have been discovered even if Fujin wasn't there. Danzo was stunned. He began analyzing such carefulness while training and such protection for his house. Even the Uchiha clan wasn't so much on guard despite knowing that we could attack preemptively. What is he up to? Danzo became very suspicious of Fujin. No other Kanoha ninja took so much effort to protect their secrets. The only one who did was Danzo himself. Danzo analyzed, there shouldn't be anything fishy in what he does in the training grounds. Hiruzen can inspect them anytime he wants to. However, his house might contain a lot of secrets. But, why didn't Hiruzen look into it? Such behavior is even more brazen than what Orochimaru did. At the very least, he didn't do anything in his own house and created secret bases around the village. So why didn't Hiruzen look into it? Or could it be that he has given the boy his approval? Danzo analyzed for a few more minutes before concluding, I forgot that Suzuki Fujin is only 14 years old. What secrets can he hide? Apart from some sessions to learn mystical palm, he has no record of any expertise in medical ninjutsu. Hiruzen is likely using that boy to bait me. The seal should have been placed when Hiruzen understood that it was inevitable for his identity to be leaked. Once I make a move, he will get a reason to take the orphans I just recruited. Danzo looked at Torian and instructed, 
don't spy on him continuously for now. Instead, you will spy on him for two days once every fortnight. Select the days randomly. Toryun replied, I will, Danzo-sama. Toryun left his office. Danzo watched him leave and thought, though this might be a trap, I can't stop spying on him. There is a lot about this boy that doesn't add up. To recruit him, I will need information about his personality, values, ideology, and his abilities. I can then find a way to drive a wedge between Haruzen and him. A frown formed on Danzo's face as Haruzen's face appeared in his mind. He thought, Haruzen is up to something. He is hiding a lot about this boy. Despite pushing him so much in the last meeting, he refused to tell us anything about the boy's abilities that wasn't already mentioned in the bingo book. Seeing how secretive he is, there should be a lot more to this boy. Unfortunately, Danzo had no way to know what was being hidden. He could only stay patient and wait for Torian to find something. Though Fujin had an idea that Danzo's subordinates were likely spying on him, he didn't know who was doing the job. After the first mistake, Torian was extremely careful. He stayed long away and only sent scouting bugs to check on him. He avoided doing anything that could expose him. He didn't send his bugs when Fujin was inside the training ground and stopped planting bugs in the training ground during the night after Fujin got rid of them thrice. As a result, Torian managed to stay hidden. But as a consequence of such carefulness, he wasn't able to get any information about Fujin's abilities other than his taijutsu. He did collect some other data like the restaurants Fujin preferred to visit, his schedule and similar miscellaneous information, which was important as well. However, Fujin was aware that there was no way of hiding such basic information about himself. So he didn't bother trying to hide them. Instead, he just raised his guard against any attempts to poison him. Since Torian didn't expose himself again, Fujin stopped caring about him and continued his training. His progress with the window main was slow but he made rapid improvements in taijutsu after Guy returned from his mission. However, his biggest gain was something else entirely. Fujin was sitting in his basement, his mind completely focused. His eyes were glued to his left arm, which was entirely covered in various symbols. Under Fujin's control, the symbols began rearranging themselves, forming a seal on his left arm. Fujin let out a sigh of relief. A smile appeared on his face as he muttered, for symbol seal imprint is done. He focused once again. The seal on his arm began moving to a point on his left palm. Within minutes, it completely disappeared. Fujin observed his hand and thought, finally I have a reliable method to deal with Jinchurikis. However, for it to be successful, I'll need to use the seal before they transform into their tailed beast mode. Otherwise, it might be very risky. However, I can't say for sure until I experiment. Experimenting on tailed beasts right now isn't possible. But I should try to experiment on other stronger beasts. Though the four symbol seal is mostly used for tailed beasts, there is no reason why it can't be used to seal other beings. The scene of the gigantic whirlpool appeared in Fujin's mind. He shook his head and analyzed, but, unlike the tailed beasts, the other beasts can probably not be used as a chakra battery. The best way to use them would be a summoning contract. If they disagree or lack intelligence, then I can seal them with this seal and release them for rampaging around. They would serve as a good distraction. I also need to create the 8 trigram divination seal. That would require some experimentation as well. Once that is done, I can begin working towards an original seal. I will have my clones working towards this after the remaining seals are learnt. Shouldn't be too long now. I should be done with this in the next round of training. Fujin left his house and went to the training ground to continue with the window main training. Fujin walked to the center of the training ground while inspecting the training ground with his chakra field and stood facing a tree. After confirming that there was no one spying, he began emitting chakra into the air. Soon, the entire surrounding was filled with his chakra. Fujin concentrated on the chakra in front of him. Winds formed and began moving towards the tree. However, instead of moving normally, the wind moved in a unique pattern. 
a large amount of wind concentrated together as if it was forming something. Soon, it took the form of a human hand. Its size was as large as a normal person and instead of fingers, it had sharp-looking claws. Fujin controlled it and used it to grab a branch of the tree. Immediately, around a quarter of the leaves on the branch were pulled off. The branch itself was assaulted by the wind several times. Fujin observed the attack and thought, though I haven't made any groundbreaking progress in the wind domain, I am progressing steadily. This attack is a result of three weeks of training. I will call it the ghost palm. Once I master it, I can use it to grab or just slash my opponent. If I grab it, then I can use it to either immobilize him or to shred him. Fujin controlled the ghost palm and pulled all the leaves that were broken off towards him. The ghost palm slowly dissipated while a few hundred leaves moved towards Fujin. The branch stopped swaying. Some of its bark was peeled off but the branch itself was largely unharmed. Fujin analyzed, its power is still lacking but I still have more than a month of vacation left. By the time it's over, this attack will be ready. Regardless, the wind domain has a lot more applications than I thought. Due to my chakra getting mixed with the wind, I get a lot of control over it. I can use it to concentrate the wind in one spot and decrease its density in the remaining places. It's this ability that I use to form the ghost palm. And by doubling down on this, I can use the ghost palm to create an immobilizing effect. Even without the ghost palm, if I just increase the concentration of air around and above an opponent, he will feel immense pressure. And, once the wind domain is properly developed, I'll be able to do the vice versa as well. Every ninja, barring a bido, pains six bodies, and maybe the likes of Kakuzu, Haydn, and Sasori, needs air to survive. Though this technique wouldn't be effective by itself as even an academy student can move out of the range, if I combine it with a few injuts of battlefield, this will be an easy killing move. If my opponent doesn't have a space-time movement jutsu like reverse summoning to escape, they'll die helplessly. Chapter 376 Fujin continued analyzing, the ability to control the wind and increase and decrease its density also has another advantage. My projectile control jutsu is on a whole new level inside my wind domain. As my control improves, I'll be able to use it to redirect my vacuum bullets and gatling. Though the control over them wouldn't be too high, it'll be sufficient to deal with anyone who tries to preemptively dodge them or barely dodge them by a few inches. Though this slight redirection can happen only inside the domain, it's fine as I could redirect them just before they leave the domain. And... Fujin's eyes sparkled as he had a terrible idea. He analyzed, if I can go one step forward and control individual gases in the air inside my domain, then I'll reach a similar level of battle prowess as Hashirama and Madara despite having far lesser chakra. Controlling what my opponents breathe. They wouldn't even know how they died. Unfortunately, I have no clue how to differentiate between gases, let alone control them. The difficulty of learning how to do either of that will be insane. It'll be like trying to come up with a new Kekiai Jinkai. Leave it. This kind of thing can't be forced. It's like what Renjiro said for Kekiai Jinkai. If I'm lucky and have the inspiration or somehow manage to merge the two elements properly instinctually, I'll learn the Kekiai Jinkai. Otherwise, I might not learn one even after spending decades working on it. Besides, even if I can't learn this, I do know how to learn a rank S jutsu that could neutralize almost all rank S ninjas if I hit them. The Raisin Shuriken. Should I try to learn it? Fujin fell into deep thought. After a few minutes, he concluded, there are a lot of drawbacks. Though my body is strong, I doubt it compares to Naruto's in healing and resilience. The backlash I'll receive will be even more severe. However, I could circumvent that by just having my shadow clones use that jutsu until I am strong enough. The other issue is time. Despite having the right idea, Naruto still needed several days or weeks with hundreds of shadow clones to learn this jutsu. Though this soldier pill is impressive, it is shit when compared to Kurama. Even if I assume that my affinity for wind is significantly greater than Naruto's, I will still need a lot of time to master this jutsu. And, these aren't even the main issues. 
How do I explain to Haruzen how I learnt Raisingan? That bastard regularly peeks at my training with that perverted crystal ball. What's so entertaining about my training to peek so frequently? Can't he just watch girls like his perverted student? Anyways, he will notice my training if I train anywhere other than my basement. But learning such a destructive jutsu in my house is a strict no. Even with barriers, I don't think my house will last for long. I had hoped that the Raisingan would be in section A of the library. That would have given me the perfect explanation for how I know this jutsu. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. Apart from some scrolls about Minato mentioning this jutsu, there is no information about Raisingan or how to learn it in the library. Fujin began thinking again. Unfortunately, he couldn't think of any method that could work. He sighed and decided, leave it. I'll learn this technique after I master the Flying Thunder God. I can just leave the village and create shadow clones to learn it where no one is prees. Suddenly, Fujin's eyes widened as he had an idea. He thought, wait a minute. Why do I have to say that I replicated Minato's Raisingan? I'll use the same reason that Minato gave. I'll say that I was inspired to create this technique by Rashi's tailed beast bomb. I can even say that I thought that the fourth Hokage's jutsu sounded similar to the tailed beast bomb and was inspired to create it this way. Since I'll be trying to merge wind into it to create something that Minato failed in, I can claim the Raisin Shuriken to be my personal invention. The only flaw in this line of reasoning is that it's been just around eight to nine months since I saw it. Minato needed three years to create this jutsu. Fujin thought for a few minutes again and decided, screw Minato. Let Haruzen think that I'm more talented than him. Or let him think that I got lucky and got the right inspiration quickly. However, showing Raisingan will undoubtedly attract some suspicion from Haruzen. I'll wait until I get the Flying Thunder God from him. After that, there isn't much that I'll want from Haruzen. The only things that come to mind are Edo Tensei and 8 Trigram Divination Seal. But the 8 Trigram Divination Seal isn't very complicated. I already have a basic idea and should be able to create it quickly. As for Edo Tensei, Haruzen won't give it to me no matter what. So it's pointless to think about it. Alright, after I get the Flying Thunder God, I will also begin learning Raisin Shuriken. Until then, I'll continue working on my wind domain and Tai Jets. Fujin suddenly looked to his left. Someone had entered the training ground. A confused look appeared on Fujin's face as he wondered, why is he here? A few seconds later, Hoka appeared in front of him. He had a serious look on his face. Fujin asked, hey, did something happen? Hoka shook his head and replied in a serious tone, Three years have passed since the day we made that promise. Fujin became silent. He recalled the promise he made to Hoka in front of Mieko's grave. He also recalled the words they exchanged when they met a few months ago. Fujin said, I am still a part of the Umbu. I can't go on a hunt right now. Hoka replied, It's fine. We can start once you quit. But since you are here, let's fight. I want to see how far I have progressed. If I beat you, we will begin looking for and hunting Uchiha Itachi. Fujin asked, You haven't ever defeated me yet. Are you confident in doing so now? Hoka took his fighting stance and said, I have trained every day for the past three years. Don't underestimate me, Fujin. It'll be the worst if we meet a calamity in the future because you didn't take me seriously today. Fujin was surprised by Hoka's words. He thought, so he figured that out? I wonder if it was time, experience, or guidance that made him understand. Hoka was thinking about the same matter as Fujin. He thought, three years ago, I was very impulsive and naive in wanting to hunt someone who could exterminate the entire Achiha clan alone. Thankfully Fujin stopped me and put forth this challenge. I didn't completely understand him back then but I now understand why he wanted me to defeat him before we could begin our hunt. I understand why Renjiro Sensei didn't try to get revenge. If I can't fight Fujin equally, then we will stand no chance against someone like Uchiha Itachi. In order to kill someone like Uchiha Itachi, we need to be strong enough to defeat the entire Hyuga clan by just ourselves. Fujin took a deep breath. 
he deactivated the training seal on his body. He grabbed a pebble, looked into Hoka's eyes, and said, Get ready. I won't hold back. We start when the pebble hits the ground. Fujin tossed the stone into the air. Unlike Hoka, he didn't bother getting into a fighting stance. He didn't even bother looking at the pebble. Instead, he just stared straight into Hoka's eyes. As soon as the pebble hit the ground, Hoka attacked. 8 Trigrams, Vacuum Palm Hoka thrust his right palm at Fujin's chest. A vacuum shell compressed with gentle fist style was fired at Fujin's heart. However, Fujin's figure disappeared and reappeared a meter to the left. Hoka's eyes widened. He thought, so fast. Fujin disappeared again. This time, he was moving rapidly towards Hoka. Hoka slammed his hands on the ground. Earth Release, Stone Shuriken Jutsu In an instant, hundreds of stone shurikens formed and were fired at Fujin. They targeted Fujin as well as his escape routes. However, contrary to Hoka's calculations, Fujin didn't retreat. Instead, he continued moving forward while easily navigating through the gaps in between the hundreds of stone shurikens flying towards him. Hoka was surprised once again. He analyzed, his speed has increased too much. But why is he closing the distance between us? I calculated that he'd stay far away and tire me out with clones and long-range jutsus. Fujin's approach to the fight was completely different from any of his previous spars with Hoka and Mieko. It made all of Hoka's plans useless. But, it wasn't an issue with Hoka's strategic skills. Logically, Fujin should have maintained a distance from Hoka to avoid getting his chakra points blocked by gentle fist style. If he doesn't, then he'll be allowing Hoka to use his speciality against him. But for some reason, his approach to the fight was completely opposite of his normal fighting style. Hoka thought, all my plans were to force you into a close-range fight. But if you want to fight me with Taijutsu yourself, then I don't need to bother with any distractions and complicated tactics either. Regardless, you are in my range. He immediately took his stance. 8 Trigrams, 32 Palms Chapter 377 As soon as Fujin appeared in front of him, Hoka unleashed a barrage of strikes. He didn't increase his attack step by step and directly unleashed 32 consecutive strikes. Fujin looked at the flurry of incoming attacks and thought, correct response. His arms moved at an even faster speed than Hoka's. But instead of attacking, he blocked all 32 consecutive strikes from Hoka. Hoka didn't manage to block even one chakra point on Fujin's body. After blocking the last strike, chakra concentrated on Fujin's right fist as he punched towards Hoka. Hoka's eyes widened as his Bikugan noticed the high amount of chakra concentrated on Fujin's fist. He immediately moved backwards and released chakra from all of his chakra points and immediately began spinning. 8 Trigrams, Palm Rotation Fujin followed him and punched the protective shield around Hoka. The rotational force of Hoka's jutsu repelled Fujin's attack with an equal amount of power, forcing Fujin back a couple of dozen meters. Hoka wasn't spared either. The force of Fujin's punch was too high and he didn't have enough time to reach his maximum rotation speed. As a result, he felt the full impact of the force as well and was sent flying backwards towards a tree. Hoka flipped at the last moment and landed on the tree's trunk on his feet, before jumping back on the ground. Fujin shook his right hand while looking at Hoka and evaluating him. He analyzed, not bad. I would have been disappointed if 32 palms was the best he could do. I wonder how he learned it. Did he copy it like Niji or did Hayashi teach him for some reason? He said, palm rotation, the secret taijutsu of Hyuga's main clan. It's impressive that you learned it. Hoka was in no mood to hear Fujin's praise. His mind was in shock at how good Fujin's taijutsu was. Not only did he take on the 32 palms head-on, but he also made a dent in his best defense. He asked, Did you ever take me or Mieko seriously in a spar, Fujin? Fujin answered, I always take all my fights seriously. I just prefer fighting in a way that has the least amount of risk. Hoka immediately realized, 
He is fighting in this manner so that I won't be able to complain about not being able to use my forte in the spar. Fujin said, Don't get distracted. He disappeared and appeared behind Hoka and attacked him with a kick. Hoka barely managed to dodge the kick and counterattack with gentle fist. Both entered into an intense taijutsu fight. Hundreds of punches and kicks were exchanged every minute. Neither Fujin nor Hoka made a single unnecessary movement. All their strikes were precise. Fujin had an advantage in speed and power. However, Hoka relied on his gentle fist style to counter all his attacks and forced Fujin to pull his attacks back several times, despite having the advantage to avoid getting his chakra points blocked. After four minutes of intense fighting, Fujin finally created an opening. He had blocked Hoka's arms and Hoka was barely off the ground. He immediately kicked towards Hoka's chest. Hoka saw the kick and cursed, shit. I won't be able to block or dodge it. He immediately emitted chakra from the chakra points on his chest. Fujin ignored it and his kick landed on Hoka's chest. Hoka immediately coughed blood and was sent flying back. However, Fujin had a thoughtful expression. He analyzed, I was planning on decreasing the amount of chakra I concentrated on my leg to not kill or injure him badly. But, I didn't expect him to emit such a large amount of chakra from his chest to soften the impact of the kick. He has improved a lot. However, it isn't enough. Though Fujin wasn't known for his taijutsu, it was at a very high level as well. Sparring with Guy for a couple of weeks had resulted in rapid improvements due to how rarely Fujin had sparred in taijutsu prior. As such, Fujin was sure that no one in the Hyuga clan, barring Hayashi, would be able to defeat him in a taijutsu fight. By giving Fujin such a close fight, Fujin was sure that Hoka was one of the strongest among the Hyuga clan despite his young age. Hoka, who was flying backwards, gritted his teeth and ignored the pain and blood as he began weaving hand signs. Water Release, Water Dragon Jutsu Hoka spat out a large amount of water as soon as he landed on the ground. It immediately took the form of a dragon and began moving towards Fujin who was just observing it. Fujin analyzed, his ninjutsu is the biggest surprise though. To be able to create such a huge water dragon so quickly. Combined with his taijutsu, he is definitely at the jounin rank. However, he is still some distance from the elite jounin rank. As for rank S. Fujin sighed and muttered internally, that's just too far. Just like Fujin, Hoka was thinking a lot as well. He had a bitter expression as he thought, my plan was to use ninjutsu to force Fujin into fighting me with taijutsu or at least his sword. To think that I'm the one resorting to ninjutsu in order to buy some time. The water dragon reached Fujin. Fujin ignored it and just flickered out of its path. Though the jutsu was impressive, it was just too slow to be of any threat to Fujin. He flickered again to approach Hoka. Hoka's Byakugan were glued on Fujin. As soon as he saw Fujin, he immediately attacked the spot he was moving towards with the vacuum palm jutsu. Fujin immediately sidestepped it, but Hoka continued spamming the attack to target Fujin. Fujin continued dodging while getting closer to Hoka step by step. He wondered, did he take inspiration from my wind explosion jutsu? Not a bad tactic but he doesn't have my chakra reserves to support such a high chakra expenditure. In order to spam such tactics, the basic requirement was that your chakra reserves had to be higher than your opponent's. As Hoka fired the vacuum palm jutsus rapidly, he concentrated chakra under his feet. His eyes followed Fujin closely. After Fujin dodged the last attack, Hoka thought, that's it. He immediately jumped towards Fujin at blinding speed. At the same time, he shot the last vacuum palm. A smile formed on Fujin's face as he thought, as I expected. He was trying to lure me in. He dodged the incoming vacuum palm and got ready for Hoka's attack. Hoka took his stance and muttered, You are in my range. Hoka attacked Fujin twice, but Fujin blocked his wrists and didn't allow Hoka to hit him. Hoka followed with four strikes, eight strikes, 16 strikes and eventually 32 strikes, his momentum increasing each time. However, Fujin blocked all of his attacks perfectly. 
Hoka gritted his teeth and began attacking with even more ferocity and speed. 8 trigrams, 64 palms. This attack finally forced Fujin to his limit. However, instead of being bothered, a smile appeared on Fujin's face as he continued blocking the attacks and thought, now that's more like it. Fujin's arms moved at the same speed as Hoka's as he continuously blocked every strike that Hoka did. Hoka had a grim expression. He had already attacked 48 times without any success. He gritted his teeth harder and pushed himself to his utmost limits. Fujin finally started having trouble keeping up. He barely managed to block 12 more strikes. However, just after he had blocked the 61st strike, Hoka's right arm passed through his defenses. Hoka's eyes lit up. He thought, finally. His right palm reached very close to Fujin's chest. However, before he could hit Fujin, blood sprouted out like a fountain. Hoka was shocked. The blood that erupted was from his right arm. He didn't understand how he was hit. The sight and pain made him stop momentarily. Fujin used that small opening and kicked his stomach, sending him flying across the training ground once again. This time, Hoka couldn't recover. Though Fujin hadn't concentrated chakra in the last kick, the attack had caught Hoka completely off guard and stunned him. In addition, he was mentally and physically tired from using the 8 trigrams, 64 palm jutsu. So he couldn't brush off the kick and fight back like the previous times. Hoka slammed into a tree and dropped to the ground. Fujin observed him and realized, it looks like he isn't used to using the 64 palms attack. All his focus was on the attack and he didn't have the capacity to focus on anything else. A frown formed on Fujin's face as he thought, I expected him to get much stronger than this. Did he lose the conviction that he had on that day? Or did he think that his current level was sufficient? This time, Hoka didn't get up. Instead, he just sat there while coughing. Though the kick hadn't done a lot of damage and the cuts on his arm were shallow, Hoka understood that he would have died had Fujin concentrated chakra on his leg. He muttered in disbelief, I lost. Chapter 378 Fujin sighed on hearing Hoka's words. He flickered next to Hoka and tossed him a bottle stored in his bracer. Hoka caught it and began drinking the water. After a minute, he said, Thank you. Fujin nodded without replying. He wasn't sure what would be the appropriate thing to say in that situation. Both stayed there silently. After a couple of minutes, Hoka said, You have become very strong, Fujin. I managed to defeat my father for the first time in the last month. I even learned several ninjutsus to improve my medium and long-range fighting abilities. So I thought that I'd at least be able to fight equally with you. I never imagined that your taijutsu would be as good as mine. And he looked at the cuts on his right arm and continued, and that it would be so good that I forgot about your wind jutsus during our fight. Fujin extended his palm towards his arm and began healing him while replying, You have grown strong as well. Palm rotation would have been an obstacle if I had used ninjutsu. And I heard that only the main family in your clan can use the 64 palms attack. Hoka nodded and said, I haven't yet mastered it. I managed to push myself to the limit in the last week as our challenge was close and barely managed to learn it. I still can't do it successfully every time. That said, I didn't know you learned medical ninjutsu. Fujin stopped healing him as the cuts had already closed up. He replied, just the mystical palm jutsu. It is a handy skill to have. Especially if you get trapped in enemy territory. It can save your or your teammates' lives. You should learn it as well. You can ask about it in the hospital when you go to check your chest and abdomen. With your expertise in the gentle fist style, you should pick it up very quickly. Hoka chuckled and said, We Hyuga ninjas already serve as the best support on any squad due to our Byakugan and ability to protect ourselves. If we learn medical ninjutsu as well, then our clan would be known as the support clan, ha ha ha. Fujin chuckled as well and commented, Yeah, that's true. Hoka said, Well, at least I didn't lose to you in just taijutsu and forced you to use a winjutsu. I would have been extremely embarrassed if that happened. Ha ha ha. 
Fujin didn't join in his laughter and had a peculiar expression. Hoka immediately noticed it. His eyes widened as he cursed, asshole. Don't tell me you held back. Fujin replied awkwardly, well, not exactly. It's just that I could have just stepped back to avoid your attack which broke through my defense. Even though we were clashing using taijutsu, it wasn't a reason for me to defend against every attack. And seeing how much attention and energy you had to put into the 8 trigrams, 64 palm, you'd probably be defeated quickly with my counterattack. Hoka's expression immediately fell. He muttered, You don't want to leave me any dignity, do you? Why did you use ninjutsu if that was the case? Fujin shrugged and replied, You didn't have any guard up. So I couldn't resist the temptation of using it. Besides, I had defeated you several times by exhausting you to your limits. I didn't want to do the same this time. Hoka's head fell due to being depressed. He muttered, I didn't have any chance, did I? Fujin didn't reply. The two fell silent once again. After a couple of minutes, Hoka looked at Fujin and asked in a serious tone, Fujin, since you are so strong right now, why are you still against hunting Uchiha Itachi? If you catch him off guard, you can kill him with a single vacuum bullet. Fujin didn't answer Hoka's question and instead replied with another question. He asked, You were recently dispatched to the land of Waterfall, weren't you? Hoka nodded. Fujin asked, Do you know why our armies were dispatched there? Hoka furrowed his eyebrows. He didn't understand where Fujin was going with this. He answered, We were dispatched due to some weird movements made by IWA. They first kidnapped a large number of civilians and later released most of them and tried to pin the blame on Kanoha. However, I have no idea why they did that or how they were discovered. Fujin nodded and replied, They were discovered by my squad. Hoka was surprised. He hadn't expected that the situation would have anything to do with Fujin. Fujin continued, I fought with Kitsuchi in the land of Waterfall. Hoka's eyes widened. He exclaimed, You mean that Suchikij's son-in-law? The rank S ninja? Fujin nodded and continued, He can barely be considered a rank S ninja. Kinda like the previous Achiha clan leader, Wicked Ifugaku. But due to his Sharingan, I believe that Fugaku would be a much more difficult opponent on the battlefield. Hoka nodded. He had frequently struggled against Mieko due to her Sharingan. By comparison, he had a much easier time against others at her level. He asked, What are you implying by this? Fujin replied, If I had fought against Kitsuchi in a one-on-one -on -one battle to the death, I would have most likely been the one to die. Uchiha Itachi killed someone stronger than him along with the rest of the Uchiha clan ninjas at the mere age of 13. Just like how we became stronger in the last three years, it is very likely that he has gotten stronger at the same rate. Hoka became silent on hearing Fujin's words. He sighed internally. Hoka's entire basis for revenge was Itachi getting overconfident and cocky and not becoming any stronger than he was three years ago. He thought, though I want to deny it, what Fujin said is true. If Itachi became stronger, then we might die without even getting a chance to escape. Fujin continued, We probably can't even beat the Itachi that killed his entire clan. Even if we assume he hasn't grown even a bit since that day, our chances of victory are very low. To make matters worse, we don't know what skills he might have been hiding back then or the new skills he might have picked up since then. We also don't know what he has been up to since going rogue. I did try to look at his information in the Umbu, but there was no news about him. If he is alone, we could try to test him out. But if he has made any allies or created a base, then the matter will become far more complicated. Hoka stayed silent. What Fujin said wasn't a lie. The Umbu had no record of Itachi's movements after he went rogue. Though Haruza knew about Itachi's movements and Akatsuki, he hadn't passed the information to anyone other than the elders. Even Shikaku was kept in the dark though he had some estimates. As for the abilities of his Manjikyu and his spirit weapons, Fujin wasn't sure whether even Haruzen and Danzo were aware of either of them. After some time, Hoka sighed and said, You are right. 
Trying to attack him with our current ability and information will be suicidal. I will continue training. But, how strong do you think that we need to be to hunt him down? Fujin replied, We will both need to be at least rank S ninjas. That will allow us to fight and retreat several times so that we can force him to expose all his cards one by one and create strategies to eliminate him. Killing him will take several rounds of battle. And that is assuming he has no help. But if we are both at rank S, then we could even test out his allies. Hoka sighed and said, Rank S is more difficult than I thought it to be. Fujin nodded and said, Even your clan leader isn't a rank S ninja. To become one, you'll have to defeat him at the very least. Hoka winced at that thought. Though Hayashi didn't use the threat of the cursed seal liberally, it always stayed in the back of the mind of every branch family member of the Hyuga clan. He sighed internally and thought, becoming stronger than the clan leader himself. I hope nothing bad happens. Fujin looked at the expression on Hoka's face and immediately understood his dilemma. He sighed internally, what teammates I received. One whose death was a certainty and another whose life and death aren't in his own hands. Though there isn't a record of Hayashi abusing this power, who would like to leave their life and death in someone else's hand? Fujin understood Hoka's internal struggle. The main job of the members of Hyuga's branch family was the safety of the main family. The clan leader was always looked at as the leader. If a member of the branch family gained higher strength or higher influence than the clan leader, then that member could be looked upon as a threat. For this reason, the Hyuga were kept out of Umbu, Root, and any high-level positions in the village. Chapter 379 Despite his complicated feelings, Hoka said, I will train even harder, Fujin. Though our target is very strong, I'll be disappointed in myself if I don't even try to avenge our friend. Fujin nodded and said, Good luck. You will need to train a lot more. The difference between a Jounin and a rank S ninja is very high. A couple of years of training isn't enough to bridge that gap. In addition, you will also need a lot of strong fights during missions to help understand what you lack. Hoka nodded and smiled. He said, I believe you aren't too far from that level. Good luck, Fujin. I am sure Sensei will be proud of you for becoming one so quickly. Fujin smiled and said, Thanks. But I still have a lot to grow. Don't count on me to slack off just so that you can catch up to me. Hoka grinned and replied, I will be disappointed if you do that. If that happens, then it won't be satisfying to finally defeat you. Fujin chuckled and said, Don't forget to visit the hospital. I don't have much expertise in detecting or healing internal wounds. Hoka nodded and took his leave. Fujin looked at his back and thought, though I was a bit harsh, it was needed. Mieko is already dead. There is no point in meaninglessly joining her. Though he is strong, if I give him false hope and he tries to go after Itachi by himself, he will die without a doubt unless Itachi convinces his partner to leave him alive. If Hoka doesn't surpass Hayashi and reach the rank S, then it is pointless for him to even think about revenge. As he left the training ground, Hoka sighed and muttered to himself, I thought that I was training too much for the last three years. My parents as well as clan elders frequently told me to take it easy. But Fujin, how hard did he train for his taijutsu to become better than mine? And the information in the bingo book says nothing about his taijutsu meaning that his ninjutsu skills should be even more fearsome. I will have to train like a crazy person if I am to have any hope of catching up to him. After all, he doesn't have anyone to tell him to take it easy. Fujin was lost in thoughts as well. After Hoka left the range of his chakra field, Fujin sighed. He thought, though everything I said was what almost everyone believes to be true, I didn't tell him that I am probably the one who knows the most about Itachi's abilities though I am quite strong, and probably could even barely be considered a rank S ninja or at least extremely close to it thanks to the jutsus I learned in the last two months, defeating Itachi is still pretty much impossible. He can neutralize me at a glance using Tsukuyami. Though I am confident in my speed, if I mess up and get hit by Amaterasu, it would be deadly as well. Now that I think about it, I should make a seal imprint for sealing Amaterasu. 
It could be useful if I do end up fighting him or Sasuke. Anyways, in addition to being vulnerable to his attacks, I have no methods of piercing through his Sasano. Even if I did, he still has the Yana mirror to block anything I can throw at him. That asshole is full of cheats. And that's not even considering Kisame or Jozu who might be with him. Anyways, what's the use of killing someone who is suffering himself, be it mentally or from a deadly disease? He is already dead inside and isn't even the true culprit behind the event. If there is a culprit. Fujin looked in the direction in which he had sensed the bugs around three weeks ago. A frown formed on his face as he thought, Danzo, I hope you don't give me a reason to eliminate you so soon. Just keep hiding in the roots and wait for the death I have planned for you. I promise you, it will be a death in every possible meaning of that word. Fujin stopped thinking about Danzo and Itachi and returned to his training. However, there was a bit of restlessness in him, a restlessness to become stronger quickly. Fujin suppressed it and continued his training. Unfortunately, it didn't diminish much even after he was done with his training. While eating dinner, Fujin sighed and thought, this restlessness is similar to what Ryo had pointed out. I was already upset at being countered that badly by IWA. I haven't even gotten a chance to repay the tail beast bomb Rashi shot at me. And now Hoko brought back memories of Mieko and reminded me of the abilities of those crazy bastards. Fujin sighed once again and thought, I hope the opponent in my last Umbu mission gives me a good fight. I have been itching for one ever since my fight with Rashi. That said, I need to return to Mount Matiki to calm myself a bit. Impulsiveness and restlessness are the bane of any ninja. A moment's distraction is all that is needed to lose my life. The next day, after sparring with Guy, Fujin informed him that he would be away for a few days and return to Mount Matiki to meditate and calm his mind. He spent three days at Mount Matiki, mostly flying extremely high in the sky while meditating on Kaido's back. He also used the environment to improve his control over the window main at a much faster speed. After returning from the small break, Fujin returned to his routine of training to his limit. Though the progress he made wasn't visible on a day-to-day -day basis, the massive amount of hard work he put in finally started showing results. One week before the end of his three-month-long vacation, Fujin was training in the training ground along with a dozen shadow clones. Standing facing a tree, Fujin extended his right arm ahead and made a grabbing motion. In an instant, a claw formed around the trunk of the tree. Following the motion of Fujin's hand, it grabbed the trunk as well. The sharp winds that made the claw immediately pierced into the tree, breaking it in two. A smile formed on Fujin's face. He analyzed, the ghost hand is finally ready to be used in combat. It also provided me with a lot of insights into the entire wind domain. The reason why I managed to make the ghost hand sharp so quickly was because of the increase in the concentration of air to create the ghost hand. Though it's good enough for the ghost hand, I don't want to do this with the window main. If I have to concentrate the air in one place to make it sharp, it will make the process very slow. And anyone will be able to sense the change in air density, making dodging the attack much easier. For the window main to be as effective as I want it to be, I need the wind blades to be created spontaneously without any signs or a lot of time. ALS Fujin suddenly received a bunch of memories. So did his shadow clones. Immediately, everyone stopped training. An elated expression appeared on Fujin's face. A massive grin broke on his face. He muttered, It's done. I'm a few injutsu grandmaster. Fujin's clones had learned each and every seal in section A of the library. He had fulfilled the requirements of becoming a grandmaster in few injutsu. Fujin almost began moving towards Haruzan's office to demand the Flying Thunder God Jutsu when his foot stopped. A frown appeared on his face as he realized, though Haruzan unknowingly promised me the Flying Thunder God after the Chunin exam, knowing how cunning he is, I doubt he will hand it to me so easily. How do I ensure that he does so? Fujin dispelled the shadow clones in the training ground. At the same time, he created a new shadow clone and dispelled itself. Immediately, the clones that were still in the basement received a message. One by one, they dispelled themselves as well after short intervals. 
while he received their chakra and memories, Fujin sat down on a rock with his chin resting on his right hand while thinking about how to approach Haruzen to raise the probability of his success as much as he could. Fujin's mind was completely focused. He completely exerted himself and extracted every last ounce of shamelessness hidden in each and every cell in his body to come up with arguments to confront Haruzen and create contingency plans in case they didn't work. When the last clone dispelled himself, Fujin decided, there is no foolproof way. I did think of two arguments to appeal to him emotionally and another five to appeal to him logically. I can only hope that they work. If he still denies me the jutsu, then that would mean that the chances of getting this jutsu in a fair manner will be very low. Or rather, he would only give it to me when I make a huge contribution to the village. But, there is no significant event that is about to happen for me to make such a contribution. And when one happens, Haruzen will be the one kicking the bucket unless my actions change the future. And getting it from Tsunade or the elders will be even more difficult as I have little to no connection with them. So waiting obediently is out of the question. If he doesn't give it to me willingly, I can only force him to give it unwillingly. As for the method. A sadistic smile appeared on Fujin's face. If Haruzen had looked at Fujin's expression at that moment using his crystal ball, he would have shivered involuntarily. Chapter 380 Fujin decided, if Haruzen doesn't give me the flying thunder god jutsu at all costs, I will take Naruto under my wing. I will first teach him the shadow clone jutsu and then teach him the wind jutsus that would be perfect for pranks. And since he is so gullible, I'll convince him that in order to become a Hokage, he will have to successfully prank the current Hokage 1,000 times. Though I don't think Haruzen would refuse to relent after that, if he does, I will drop hints of intending to teach Naruto the great breakthrough jutsu and also of teaching him how to supercharge it. Fujin almost laughed in an evil manner while imagining the scene of a thousand shadow clones spamming a supercharged great breakthrough jutsu. He seriously doubted whether Kanoha would continue to remain standing. There was no way Haruzen wouldn't take that threat seriously. He began walking towards the Hokage building. En route, he thought, maybe that's why Kakashi never taught Naruto any jutsu to take advantage of his ridiculous chakra levels. But still, it's such a waste to know 1000 jutsus if you aren't going to use them yourself or teach them to his students. Could have at least given Naruto a few jutsus that weren't too destructive in nature. Fujin stopped thinking about Naruto and went over the plans he had come up with to convince Haruzen. After all, Naruto was his last resort. He'd prefer getting the jutsu directly from Hiroin on that very day. If he failed, then he could think of all the nefarious plans for however long he wanted to. Soon, he arrived at the building and knocked on his door. Haruzen looked towards the door and wondered, why is he here? He put a smile on his face and said, come in. Why are you here, Fujin? Fujin entered and put up the same smile as Haruzen. He said, Grandpa, I have something to tell you. But it has to be alone. Haruzen wondered, alone? Did he figure something out about Iwa's intentions? Or is he here to ask me for some favor? Due to his previous interactions with Fujin, Haruzen was on a high alert. He nodded and said, sure. His eyes moved towards the ceiling. Immediately, all four Umbu guard flickered out of the room and shut all doors and windows. Haruzen activated the seals and said, Speak. Fujin said in an excited tone, Grandpa, I have learnt all the seals from the library. I'm now a Fuinjutsu Grandmaster. Haruzen immediately understood. He thought, so that's why he is here. As I guessed, he wants something. Knowing what Fujin wanted, Haruzen relaxed. He said, that's good. Have you created an imprint for the four symbols seal as well? Fujin nodded. He extended his left arm. Immediately, a seal spread out from his left palm and covered his left hand and forearm. Haruzen observed the seal imprint and analyzed, hmm, this is good enough. Since he could create a seal imprint for such a complicated seal so quickly, I don't need to test all his remaining seals. Haruzen nodded and said, You have done a good job. Congrats. You are the 11th Grandmaster in Fuinjutsu in our village. 
Fujin immediately replied, Thank you, Grandpa. Hiruzen asked, Do you want to keep this a secret, or should I make your status as a Grandmaster in Fuinjutsu public knowledge? There were quite a few advantages of making the knowledge public. As a Fuinjutsu Grandmaster, Fujin's status would be on an entirely new level. His prestige would increase. A lot of ninjas and even the clan leaders would try to create good relations with him. Though it would put a mark on Fujin's back, Fujin already had a 50 million Rio bounty. So, by no means would it make his situation any worse. And, unlike most grandmasters who focused entirely on Fuinjutsu and hence had limited combat strength, Fujin's main focus was ninjutsu. So he didn't have that weakness just like Hiruzen, Jiraiya, and Danzo. However, Fujin still preferred keeping his cards hidden. He replied without thinking much, keep it a secret. If need be, we can make it public any time we want to in the future. Hiruza nodded and said, all right. Fujin said, actually, there is one more thing. Hiruza thought, here it comes. Fujin continued, after I became a Chunin, you promised that you would teach me the Flying Thunder God Jutsu after I became a Fuin Jutsu Grandmaster. So could you teach it to me now? He looked at Hiruzen with a hopeful look on his face as thoughts clashed at the speed of light in Fujin's head to counter anything Hiruzen might say to decline his request. Hiruzen sighed internally and thought, I just said it so that he would stop bugging me. How would I have even known that he would become a Fuinjutsu Grandmaster from nothing in less than four years? It almost feels like he already knew that this was a requirement and baited me into saying it. Hiruzen couldn't help but wonder, I wonder what Sensei would think if I started giving the Flying Thunder God as a reward for breaking a record in the Chunin exams. Hiruzen could imagine Tobarama lecturing him on making promises so carelessly. He thought, well, this won't be the first time I have disappointed Sensei. As Fujin expected, Hiruzen shook his head. However, Hiruzen's words were something he never imagined. Hiruzen said, I have no talent for space-time ninjutsu. The only ones I can use are summoning and reverse summoning jutsus. So I can't teach, guide, or even help you in this regard. But, I'll hand you the scroll for learning the Flying Thunder God jutsu that the second Hokage created and the fourth Hokage improved. Whether you can learn it or not depends upon you. Fujin was stunned by Hiruzen's words. He thought, that's it? He isn't going to make me work to get the scroll? And he isn't going to give me a will of fire lecture for three hours? Hiruzen continued, I will arrange the scroll for you in a week. You can take it from me after you return from your next Umbu mission. Fujin was still speechless. He had calculated numerous schemes and arguments for so long. He never imagined that Hiruzen would just hand it to him. He just nodded absent-mindedly. Hiruzen asked, Anything else, Fujin? Fujin gathered his thoughts. He shook his head and said, No. Just keep this a secret as well. Hiruzen nodded and replied, Of course. You have done very well, Fujin. Though no one knows it yet, Kanoha is proud of you. If you manage to learn the Flying Thunder God Jutsu, then you will be a beacon of hope for our village, just like the fourth Hokage was. Even if you don't, you are still doing very well. So don't force yourself too much. Fujin nodded and replied, I will, Grandpa. Thank you. I will see you later. Hiruzen nodded and Fujin took his leave. Fujin didn't talk to anyone and just began walking back to the training ground at a slow speed. He was still processing his thoughts. Finally, he let out a sigh and thought, I should be happy and ecstatic for receiving this jutsu so easily. But for some reason, it feels like I have just suffered a great defeat. It almost feels like there is an empty feeling in my heart. Why is that? Meanwhile, in the Hokage's office, Hiruzen continued his work. He recalled his earlier interaction with Fujin and chuckled. He thought, does he still think that he is eleven or that I don't know him? I could smell his intention to fight for that jutsu from miles away. Why would I even bother making things difficult for myself when I intended to give him that jutsu eventually in any case? Though Fujin had tricked Hiruzen four years ago, Hiruzen didn't mind it. In his view, 
Fujin was already capable enough to receive a jutsu like the Flying Thunder God. After all, he had given it to Minato when he was even younger and weaker than Fujin. Though he would prefer to make Fujin contribute more to Konoha before giving him the jutsu, Hiruzen decided against it after recalling Fujin's actions in the Land of Wind and the Land of Grass and his way of contributing. Fujin reached the training ground but was still a bit down. He shook his head and thought, ah, screw it. I got the jutsu. That's all that matters. I'll teach Naruto some wind jutsus to compensate for the emotional roller coaster Hiruzen put me through. Besides, I will need some entertainment in my retired life. But since Hiruzen gave me the Flying Thunder God Jutsu without any trouble, I'll leave out the Shadow Clones, Supercharging, and the part about pranking the Hokage a thousand times. Having cheered himself up, Fujin returned to training. Chapter 381 In one of the many training grounds inside Konoha, it looked like a calamity had struck. Hundreds of trees were broken. The ground had dozens of craters. In fact, the entire training ground was covered in cracks. In this training ground, two individuals sat on broken stumps while breathing heavily. Guy said, you are growing very rapidly. Small quantities of chakra have already started infusing into your body. Exhaustion could be heard in Guy's tone. Fujin's breathing was even rougher. He said, it's thanks to your training plan. I already feel much stronger. In another couple of months, this process should reach the initial completion stage. In the last month, Fujin visited Yoshi in the Kanoha hospital several times to confirm that the process wasn't harmful to his body. Though he trusted his analysis and Guy's intentions, there was no harm in being more careful. Fortunately, the process was very safe and beneficial for him. Guy nodded and said, Yeah. Your progress will slow down once you reach that stage. But don't be discouraged. As long as you keep training, your body will keep getting stronger. He grinned, gave Fujin a thumbs up and said, There is no limit to how much our bodies can improve. Fujin nodded and thought, Yeah. Who'd have imagined that this crazy guy would nearly kill Madara who was at a level far beyond what he was in his prime? Fujin said, Don't worry. I'll keep working on my body. He chuckled and added, I'd hate it if I couldn't make you go all out in our spars. Guy chuckled as well. Fujin continued, but we won't be able to spar for a few days. I'll be going on a mission. Guy replied, actually, our spars will have to become less frequent. Fujin raised his eyebrow and asked, why? Guy grinned and said, because I'm going to be a sensei. Fujin acted surprised and said, Ah, I nearly forgot that a new badge will be passing out from the academy. He chuckled and teased, but I didn't think you were the sensei type, Guy. Ha ha ha. Guy ignored the teasing tone and claimed proudly, my squad will have a very promising youngster. In the future, he may even give you a tough time, Fujin. So don't get too comfortable with your power. Fujin waved his arm dismissively and replied, I'm still a few days away from my 15th birthday. So, I am still in my youth and have a lot to grow. It's you and Kakashi who are getting older and have to be worried about being surpassed. Guy immediately stood up and exclaimed passionately, Don't underestimate the power of my youth. Fujin chuckled and said, I'll see you around, Guy. Good luck with your new students. He disappeared from the training ground. Guy muttered in annoyance, did Kakashi send him to me so that I wouldn't challenge him anymore? He snorted and exclaimed loudly, Kakashi. My eternal rival. We need to have another competition before we both become sensei. He disappeared from the training ground as well. Fujin returned to his home. Since it was the last day of his vacation, he decided to rest so that he would be at his full strength during the mission. Fujin analyzed, this vacation was very fruitful. I created an array of new vacuum and wind jutsus that compensate for my previous weakness. Though a new counter can be created for my new fighting style, it will be more difficult and take a longer time. More importantly, they would have to know about these new jutsus. And I have several methods of keeping them hidden. Beyond that, my biggest gain was becoming Fuin Jutsu Grandmaster and creating seal imprints. My taijutsu has also made massive improvements. 
and I have made my idea of the wind domain a reality, though it still needs a lot of work. After I quit Umbu, I will have to keep working on my Taijutsu and wind domain. Along with them, I'll have to work on learning the Flying Thunder God and creating the 8 Trigram Divination Seal. Of these four, the 8 Trigram Divination Seal should be the easiest. Once I'm done with it, I'll create its seal imprint and then begin working on creating a battlefield as Uchiha Sora did. Sigh, the next year is going to be as hectic as my last three months. And that's without considering any outside interference. Fujin rested for the remaining day. The next day, he returned to the underground Umbu headquarters after three months. As usual, the Umbu headquarters had several Umbu moving around it. A few glanced at Fujin before continuing with their work. Fujin noticed their glances and didn't mind them. He just entered his assigned room. Unknown to him, one Umbu ninja became serious about seeing Fujin. However, he didn't glance at Fujin for more than a second, due to which Fujin didn't notice anything odd. He thought, that's Suzuki Fujin, the spectral swordsman. Though he is wearing a mask, I can easily identify him. Danzo-sama said that he had taken a three-month-long vacation. Since he is back, he should be taking a mission today. He immediately moved towards Eagle's office. Inside his room, Fujin met up with his team. He looked at all three and asked, So, did you enjoy the vacation? Banjiro grinned and answered, Of course. I was afraid that my sensei would have broken his ties with me had the vacation been any longer. Hearing his words, Yu Gao's expression also became weird. She had made Hei teach her so much that he had fallen sick. Fortunately, she was wearing her mask. She and Fumito nodded. Fujin said, I would have loved to spar with you guys once again. But we will be hitting the ground running. Our next mission will be completed by you three. I will be just observing you three and will only interfere if you can't handle the mission. Yuga replied, You can leave it to us, Captain. Fumito nodded and added, I have been wanting to test my skills for some time as well. Fujin nodded and said, Good. I'll go take a mission from Eagle. You three wait here. By the time I return, decide on which disguise you want to use during the mission. We will be completing the mission under disguise. After the last mission, Fujin didn't want laziness to be the reason for getting caught in another trap. Though maintaining transformation jutsu all the time strained chakra reserves and concentration, it wasn't unbearable. The trio nodded. Fujin left his room. While Fujin was talking with his team, Danzo's subordinate entered Eagle's office and approached him. Eagle looked up and asked, Tiger, does your team want to go on a mission again? Tiger nodded. He was an Umbu captain just like Fujin. Of course, he was much weaker. Eagle quickly handed him a mission. Tiger read the mission information and asked, Can I look into the other missions as well, in case there is one that suits my team more? Eagle nodded. Umbu ninjas picking out missions for themselves during peacetime wasn't strange. Pretty much everyone did it regularly unless there were special instructions from the Hokage or a mission required a particular set of abilities. Tiger quickly looked into all the available missions. After a couple of minutes, he shortlisted two. He analyzed a diplomatic mission to the Land of Grass. Danzo-sama said that Fujin was frequently given diplomatic missions in the last year. So he could be given this mission. But... Tiger looked at the second mission and analyzed, but the situation in the Land of Waterfall is more important. We have to eliminate an entire noble family because they are planning for a deep cooperation with IWA. They will have a few Jounins protecting them and IWA ninjas could also be involved. With his past record, Fujin would likely be sent here. Tiger said, I want to take this mission to the Land of Grass. Eagle replied, All right. Your team can take it. Tiger nodded and left. As soon as he left, he created two shadow clones. One shadow clone went out to inform his teammates while the other shadow clone snuck into the root facilities hidden underground. He himself kept waiting in the hall. His shadow clone reached Danzo's office in a minute. Danzo noticed him and asked, Did Suzuki Fujin appear? 
Tiger nodded and said, he and his team have appeared in the Umbu headquarters. I believe they will take a mission today. I checked up on all the missions. There were two that I thought he would be given. I have taken one of them. So he should be dispatched to the land of Waterfall to eliminate the Anagi family. Danzo nodded and analyzed the Yanagi family. They are trying to enter into an alliance with the Wadakure due to the previous events. A good mission. The presence of a Wadakure ninjas wouldn't be seen as suspicious. He said, good work. Return to your duties. Send me a confirmation when you see him leaving. After that, just complete your mission properly. Chapter 382 Tiger nodded and dispelled his shadow clone. Danzo got into action as well. He dispatched a couple of root squads. Both squads consumed soldier pills and traveled straight to Awabakure. Their goal was to inform Awabakure of the fact that Fujin was sent to eliminate the Anagi family. Danzo saw the two squads leave and thought that Awabakure suffered heavily at Fujin's hands last time. They should understand that his threat is far greater than the benefits of befriending the Anagi family. So Anoki will use this opportunity to set up a trap to lure and kill Fujin. But, according to my calculations, they will fail. Anoki and the Jinchurikis can't move. They can only send Kitsuchi and more Jounins. Though I'm not sure what training Fujin did, considering how intense and secretive it was, I believe he should have trained in a way to counter Kitsuchi and other IWA ninjas. So Fujin won't die. But the same can't be said about his teammates. However, losing three Umbu ninjas in exchange for dozens of Awabakure Jounins is beneficial for the village. This clash, in addition to the previous one, will significantly weaken Iwa's morale and confidence. More importantly, getting ambushed for the second time will make Fujin question Haruzen and the Umbu organization's competence and intentions. I can use that to recruit him. Hiruzen has been giving Fujin diplomatic missions and taking him along for negotiations. Such a waste of his potential. Only under my guidance can he contribute the most for Kanoha. Danzo's strategy was extremely treacherous. Even more impressive was that he came up with it in mere minutes. His scheme would cause heavy damage to Awadakure and create a deep wedge between Fujin and Hiruzen. If everything went according to his plan, then he could get a very capable subordinate. Even if calculations were inaccurate and Fujin ended up dying, Danzo wouldn't suffer any losses or lose any sleep over it. Fujin was unaware of the treacherous trap targeting him. Though he had taken sufficient precautions against Danzo, he never imagined that Danzo would use such an unconventional method to create trouble for him. He entered Eagle's office. Tiger, who was near the office, noticed him entering. Eagle saw Fujin and said, It's good to have you back. Fujin nodded and said, It's good to see you again as well. We will be hitting the ground running. Have any good missions? Eagle nodded and handed Fujin the mission to eliminate the Anagi family. Fujin read the information and analyzed, hmm, a typical elimination mission. They have two Jounins, but they are from Taki and not one of the five major villages. It won't be any challenge to eliminate them. However, since Iwabakure is involved, a couple of their umbu could also be hiding there. That could make things interesting. But, Fujin sighed internally and thought, it'll be a rather lousy mission for my last umbu mission. Fujin placed the mission file back on the desk and said, it's not good enough. Do you have any rank S mission? Eagle was confused. He said, this is a rank S miss. Fujin interrupted him and said, It's too easy. I want a tougher mission to test my team. Something that will have multiple Jounin level ninjas in the enemy ranks. Eagle wondered, Is he upset that his team wasn't much help in the previous mission and wants to put them to the test? Suddenly, Eagle's eyes widened. He asked, Do you intend to? Fujin nodded and said, It's time. Yugao and Fumito are already very capable. Eagle nodded and said, All right. He went through his files and grabbed another file. He handed it to Fujin and said, This is a mission from the land of hot water. Their southern territory has seen a lot of attacks from rogue ninjas from Kirigakure. 
The high number of attacks shows that there is some sort of cooperation among those rogue ninjas. Lord Hokage believes that Kirigakure itself is involved in these attacks and these rogue ninjas are just a front. As we aren't sure of the situation, we were planning to send three Jounin squads left by two elite Jounins to deal with this situation. However, since you want a more difficult mission, your squad can take it. But, you will ascertain the situation first. If it is beyond what you can deal with, you can retreat. We will be sending the units we plan one week later. You will cooperate with them to get the job done. Fujin went through the details in the file and said, All right. We will take this mission. He tossed a seal to Eagle and said, If we can't complete the mission, this seal will burn. Eagle took the seal and said, All right. Good luck. Meet up with the Daimyo of Hot Water to get updates on the situation. They could have already found out the location of any enemy bases in their country. Fujin nodded and stored the file in his bracer before leaving. He quickly met up with his team and they left the Umbu headquarters. Tiger noticed their movements and thought, I was right. He quickly sent another shadow clone to Danzo to inform him about Fujin's team's departure. Unfortunately, despite making an excellent plan on the go, Danzo failed to consider that Fujin would refuse the assigned mission and take a mission that required several squads to complete and wasn't supposed to be an Umbu mission. So the root ninjas he deployed moved in the complete opposite direction of Fujin's squad. While Tiger could glance a few times at Fujin inside the Umbu headquarters, he didn't dare to chase Fujin outside to keep an eye on his movements. So Danzo would stay unaware of the real mission that Fujin took for a few days, making it too late for him to do anything about it. Fujin's team moved rapidly through the land of fire. En route, they had used transformation jutsu to disguise themselves. No one would be able to link them to Fujin and his team. They rested at the border between the two countries at night and continued moving the next day. At noon, they reached Yugakure. They quickly flickered in front of the Daimyo Palace. The samurai guards were startled to see four masked ninjas suddenly appearing out of nowhere. Before they could ask anything, Fujin tossed a file and said, We come from Kanoha regarding the mission Lord Daimyo issued. Inform him of our arrival. The samurai caught the file and looked at it before replying, All right, stay here for a few minutes. He immediately sent a servant inside to deliver the message. Opposite the daimyo palace was a small shop. As soon as Fujin's squad arrived, his eyes immediately moved towards them. He observed them and within a second turned them away. He thought, from Kanoha, eh? If Fujin had known that the words he spoke were heard by a shopkeeper across the street, he would be surprised. After all, though he wasn't too soft, his voice wasn't loud enough to be heard on the other side of the street. The shopkeeper analyzed, two fatties, one skinny and one with a slightly decent build, all four men. Lord Rakage had said that the squad he is looking for has one girl who has long purple hair, a blonde man and two with black hair. And none of them were fat. This isn't the squad he is looking for. He went about his business and didn't look at the Kanoha ninjas again. Unknowingly, Fujin had dodged two menacing bullets in two days. Had he known about it, he'd be amused and be thankful that luck was finally with him. Unfortunately, he had no way of knowing the two devious schemes he avoided unknowingly. After a few minutes, Fujin and his team were invited in. They were escorted to the conference room. On entering the room, Fujin noticed the daimyo sitting on the farthest seat from the door. Several nobles were also sitting in the room. In addition, there were a few samurais in the room. There was a familiar face as well. Fujin looked at a large man sitting next to the daimyo and thought, Takuhiai. Since when did he start sitting next to the daimyo? Is there a change in the internal politics of this country? Takuhiai was one of the few who advocated for more funding for the ninjas in the land of hot water. On the other hand, the daimyo and most of the nobles wanted to completely stop funding for the ninja academy due to numerous reasons. Though Fujin was intrigued, he didn't have any time to investigate it. The daimyo said, this mission will require more than just four ninjas. And it will be a joint mission with our ninjas. Why did Lord Hokage send just the four of you? Fujin replied, 
Lord Hokage believes that Kirigakure might be the ones backing the Rokiri ninjas. So this mission could be far more complicated than what you imagined it to be. Chapter 383, A Frown Formed on the Officials from the Land of Hot Water Takuhi I said, we have that suspicion as well. But it still doesn't answer why there are only four of you here? Fujin answered, we will be entering into their territories to investigate. If Kirigakure is involved, then Lord Hokage will send the required forces a week later. You can join them, but be prepared. The conflict could be a lot more intense than what you have calculated. If Kirigakure isn't involved, then we will be completing the mission by ourselves. Takuhi I thought for a bit and replied, All right. Fujin said, Hand over what you have already analyzed so that we won't waste any time repeating the same or searching fruitlessly. Takuhi I nodded and placed a map on the table. He quickly explained their findings and analysis to Fujin and his team. After getting all the required information, Fujin and his squad left immediately. After they left, Takuhi I sighed and muttered, It is so difficult to cooperate with the umbu of other countries. However, one of the nobles snorted and commented, At least they are willing to undertake such risky missions. Takuhi I looked at the noble but didn't say anything. The amount of ninjas in the land of hot water was already pitifully low. He had no intention of wasting their lives just to prove a point. Fujin's team rapidly moved through the land of hot water towards the coastal areas. While moving, Fujin instructed, As I said, this mission will be up to you. Yugao, you will take over my role. I will keep an eye out from far and will jump in if need be, but operate under the assumption that I'm not here. Everyone nodded. Within a couple of hours, they reached one of the locations that Takuhi I had pointed out. The location was a small hill that had a large cave within it. Fujin stayed back while Yugao took charge. She moved close to the cave along with Fumito and Bunjiro. Bunjiro softly said, The cave seems to be abandoned. Yugao nodded and instructed, Fumito, send a shadow clone through the underground. See if you can feel any chakra signatures. If you don't, then activate your chakra field and inspect. Fumito nodded and created a shadow clone. The clone moved through the ground into the cave. He tried to feel any chakra fluctuations in the cave passively but didn't sense anything. After a few minutes, the clone activated his chakra field. It covered the entire hill. He didn't detect anyone and came out of the ground and began inspecting the cave. After some time, the clone dispelled himself. Fumito received his memories and said, There is no one inside the cave. There aren't any traps inside either. Even if there was anyone here earlier, all traces have been eliminated. Yugao said, All right, we will move on to the next location. The group immediately began moving towards other bases that Takuhi I had pointed out earlier. However, every base they went to turned out to be empty. Yugao fell into a dilemma. After thinking for a bit, she said, The mission also requires us to check up on the villages in this area. We will do that before moving closer to the shore. Fumito and Bunjiro nodded. They arrived at the first village. However, to their surprise, it was empty as well. Bunjiro frowned and asked, What the hell is going on here? Why is everything that guy pointed to empty? Fumito muttered, I'm afraid that something huge is happening here. Fujin, who was observing from a bit away, wondered, That's strange. Why is this village empty as well? If there was a clash, there would at least be bloodstains in the village. But there is nothing of that sort. It's as if everyone left obediently. He thought for a bit before his eyes suddenly widened. He thought, Don't tell me Haydn is planning his ritual. I haven't heard any news of his slaughter yet. Things will be a lot more complicated if he gets involved. Yugo instructed, let's check up on the other villages. They immediately began moving. The next village turned out to be empty as well. Fujin wondered, exactly how many people does he need for the ritual? Hmm, now that I think about it, Haydn would be the perfect target to master reading memories perfectly. But should I kill him now? It'll create some changes in the Akatsuki. Fujin was on the fence. 
he followed his subordinates while analyzing, right now, Haydn is the only future Akatsuki member that I'm confident in defeating other than Daidara who hasn't gone rogue yet. I can cut him into pieces and seal him up. But who would partner up with Kakuzu if I eliminated Haydn now? It will be a pain in the ass if the pairings of Akatsuki are changed. It could change the future completely. If they decide to not recruit Daidara and partner Sasori and Kakuzu, then I'm not sure how the Gara rescue mission would go. I will have to convince Tsunade, or Hiruzen if he lives, to add me to that squad as well to ensure that the future doesn't get too disrupted. Fujin suddenly looked up and a frown appeared on his face. He decided, I'll decide when I encounter Haydn. Just like Fujin, the expressions of his teammates became dark as well. Despite wearing masks, their gloominess could be sensed. Bunjiro entered the village and muttered, which bastard would do something like this? After finding five empty bases and two empty villages, the group finally entered a village that wasn't empty. Instead, it was dyed in blood. The streets were littered with dead bodies. The three of them immediately began inspecting the bodies. Fujin entered the village as well and began observing. He thought, it looks like everyone was killed by a sword. It doesn't look like a ritual. He was confused. He wondered, this should be done by Rokiri ninjas. So is Haydn not involved? Or did he take the opportunity of the chaos to kidnap normal civilians for his ritual? Banjaro asked, should we bury them? Yugao shook her head and said, they are already dead. There is no point in wasting time here. The killings happened more than a day ago. We will move to the next village. Bunjiro didn't argue. He knew that saving the ones alive was more important than burying the dead. They immediately began moving towards the next village. After a few minutes, they arrived in the next village. This time, they finally found someone alive. The village was largely abandoned as well. Only a few dozen elderly and a handful of younger people were in the village. The people immediately became tense after seeing them. Yugao approached an elderly man and started having a small conversation. After learning that they were sent by the daimyo, the people finally relaxed. Yugao asked, Why are there so few people in the village? The elderly man sighed and said, Around two months ago, all the money in our homes started disappearing. Every house in the village had most of their money taken away. And not a single person saw anything. So we believe that a ninja stole all our money. Yugao and the rest were surprised to hear that. The elderly man continued, it caused a lot of unrest in the village. However, we slowly moved on from it as nothing could be done. But then it happened again a month ago. That made many people leave the village and migrate closer to Yugakure. Until the day before yesterday, around half the people had migrated. However, yesterday, one person came running to the village. He told everyone that everyone in the neighboring village was killed and their bodies and blood littered the village. That caused almost everyone in the village to panic and escape immediately. Only us old fellows who don't want to leave our home stay behind. Yugao, Fumito, and Bunjiro let out a sigh. They understood the trauma those people would have faced. However, they were glad to realize that the people in the empty village were moving to Yugakure instead of being dead. Yugao said, Thank you for telling us. We will take action immediately. The elderly man and others around him immediately thanked her. The Kanoha ninjas moved out and began moving towards the shore. As she moved, Yugao thought, being a captain is a lot more taxing than just having to follow orders. I have to accept the responsibility for the lives of so many people. One wrong decision could result in more massacres like the one in the previous village. No wonder Lord Hokage hasn't promoted me yet. A few dozen kilometers away, along the shores of the land of hot water, a miserable shriek was heard. A person, dressed in civilian attire, was on his knees. Though he looked ordinary, he was a jounin from Kirigakure. His right arm had been cut off at the elbow. However, instead of being concerned about it, he looked hatefully at the person standing in front of him. In front of him was a tall and slender man. He had no eyebrows, creases under his eyes, 
and a cross-shaped scar on his right cheek. His hair and eyes were dark gray in color and his hair was short and spiky. He also had a red grid-shaped marking covering his jaw. However, the thing that stood out the most was that he held a sword that was as long as his height. Chapter 384 The Man Cursed, Juzo You bastard! Our village raised you and trained you for years. The third Mizukage even gave you that sword. Why the hell did you betray us? And why are you attacking me? Did you forget how long we fought together before you were chosen as one of the seven swordsmen of the mist? Also, what's with that weird cloak? Juzo didn't answer his question and instead asked, Mitsuru, were you the one to slaughter those two villages? Mitsuru frowned. He asked, what of it? We have done the same thing so many times in the past war. Our village needs funds for defeating those fucking rebels. Don't tell me you have gone soft after betraying our village. Suddenly, a grin appeared on Juzo's face. He said, I don't care about that trash. I have just been asked to collect the bounty on your head. In the next moment, Juzo disappeared from his spot. He appeared behind Mitsuru. A second later, Mitsuru's head flew from his head. He looked at Juzo hatefully as he, a Jounin from the Mizukage faction, died. Juzo collected his head while recalling his interaction with Pain. A few days ago, in a hidden base inside the Land of Rain, a silhouette suddenly appeared. Two pairs of eyes glanced towards the figure. The Deva Path Pain instructed, Juzo, go to the southern shores of the Land of Hot Water. A large number of Kiri ninjas have infiltrated there and are causing several massacres. You will collect the bounties of the Kiri ninjas that are attacking. A frown formed on Juzo's expression. He said, I already informed you that I have no intention of dealing with Kiridikur. You can send Kakuzu or Itachi there instead of me. Payne shook his head and replied, Kakuzu is finding information about the two Jinchurikis in Iwabikur. However, he had hit a dead end. Itachi will be sent there to cooperate with him. Not to mention, you are more familiar with how the Kiri Shinobi operate. For that reason, I have also sent Kisame to that location. Juzo sighed and said, All right. Payne nodded and instructed, Both of you will leave right away. His figure disappeared from the base. Soon after, Itachi and Juzo disappeared as well. One moved towards the land of earth while the other moved in the opposite direction and entered the land of fire. As Juzo stored Mitsuru's head, he thought, though he asked me to collect the bounty, I believe his main concern was the innocent people who were dying due to the actions of the Mizukage. Being soft like that won't be of any help in fulfilling his goal. Regardless, I need to speed up. Once the Kiri ninjas learn about Mitsuru's death, they will escape. I need to find their main base before that happens. That said, I have to admit that they have become far better at hiding. From what I remember, they should have been moving openly in a weak country like this one. I wonder what changed after I left. He sighed and wondered, why couldn't he send Kakuzu here and send me with Itachi instead? Isn't collecting bounties his job? Also, why does Akatsuki need so much money? I don't recall any operations needing money so far. He disappeared from his spot and began looking for the remaining Kiri ninjas. Just like him, another group was searching for the Kiri ninjas near the shores. After searching for almost half a day, Yugao and the rest had gone through every suspected base and had returned empty. With his shoulders dropped, Bunjiro complained, this land of hot water is completely useless. Not a single base they marked had anyone inside it. Forget people, we didn't even find any signs of the bases being occupied previously. Fumito sighed as well. Since no conflict occurred, he had to do all the work. Though Yugao and Banjaro were sensors as well, they paled in comparison to Fumito's sensing skills. Since the opponents were suspected to be quite strong, they didn't take any unnecessary risks. Yugao said, it's already past midnight. Let's take a break. We will begin our investigation again tomorrow. The three of them began looking for a decent place to rest for the night. While looking for it, they found a cave that was very well hidden from sight. 
They were about to walk towards it when all three suddenly stopped and hid behind trees. A moment later, two ninjas appeared out of the cave. All three Kanoha ninjas had a peculiar expression. They cursed in their minds, We searched for these bastards all day. And just when we were about to quit and take a break, they appeared in front of us by themselves? Of the two ninjas that appeared from the cave, one was a Jounin while the other was a Chunin. The Chunin exclaimed, Finally, we can move out again. I can't spend any more time in that dull cave. He looked at the Jounin and asked, Captain, why do we stay so careful? Unless Yudakir mobilizes its entire force, they won't be able to do anything to us. The Jounin frowned and said, Don't get too overconfident. This isn't the first time we're doing such a mission. The last time we tried it, we suffered heavy losses. That is why we are acting so carefully this time. The Chunin was surprised. He asked, How could Yudakir have someone who can defeat us? The Jounin answered, It wasn't Yudakir Ninja. They issued the mission to Kanoha who sent that cowardly swordsman. That coward cut down dozens of our dispersed ninjas one by one. If we hadn't been lucky, we might not have even understood who it was. But, by the time we realized it, our forces had already suffered a heavy loss. When we grouped together, he didn't attack us even once. The incident that he said was before Fujin had become an Umbu captain and the title of the Spectral Swordsman wasn't given to him yet. During one assassination during the mission, three Kiri Jounin suddenly appeared, forcing Fujin to retreat. It was the first instance of him being seen in action by someone who didn't end up dead. The Chunin was shocked. He said, I had heard rumors about the spectral swordsmen. But I thought they were just rumors. Why would Kanoha dare to attack us? We are a major village too. The Jounin replied, But we are embroiled in a war. At such a time, we can't afford to go to war with Kanoha. Besides, we didn't know for sure if it was Kanoha back then. But now we do. The Chunin nodded. He said, that's enough depressing talks. Let's just go and steal from those losers again. The Jounin nodded. Both he and Chunin began moving towards a village. Though Yugao and the others couldn't hear their words, they understood that the Kiri ninjas were moving out to attack the villages. All three exchanged glances. At the same time, all three disappeared from their spots and silently trailed the two Kiri ninjas. After moving a sufficient distance away from the cave, they immediately sprung into action. Yugo grabbed her sword. Hazy moon night she flickered and moved towards the Jounin. Though he hadn't sensed the Kanoha ninjas, as soon as Yugo made her move, he became alert. He grabbed a kanai and turned around while shouting, There are enemies. The Chunin also became alert. The Jounin saw Yugo moving rapidly and the afterimages of her sword. A grim expression appeared on his face. Yugao appeared in front of him and swung her sword straight at his neck while utilizing her high speed. To her surprise, the enemy Jounin blocked her sword with his kunai perfectly. Yugao quickly followed up with several dozen high-speed sword attacks. The Kiri Jounin also moved his kunai rapidly and blocked every attack while retreating backwards. The Kiri Chunin was shocked to see such a high-speed battle. He was about to attack Yugao when he noticed another figure from the corner of his eye. Bunjiro appeared and threw six shurikens at the Chunin. The Chunin blocked a couple with his kunai and dodged the rest. The Jounin moved towards him and shouted, Send a signal immediately. I will cover you. The Chunin shouted, I will. The Jounin couldn't take his attention off Yugao for even a second. He was having difficulty in blocking her sword and due to her fast-paced attacks, he didn't have any time to weave hand signs. The Jounin blocked another Yugao's sword once again and cursed, I will make you Rieger. Ugh! In horror, he turned his head to look behind him. His subordinate had stabbed him with his kunai instead of sending a signal. Before he could understand what was happening, Yugao took advantage of the distraction and beheaded him. He died without understanding why his loyal subordinate had betrayed him. Chapter 385 Bunjiro flickered next to Yugo. Both of them looked at the Kiri Chunin. The Chunin looked at them and said, Tie me up as usual. 
Yugao and Bunjiro nodded. They knew that it was Kumito who was hiding earlier and took over the Chunin's body. In a few seconds, the Chunin was properly tied up. Fumito released his jutsu and returned to his original body. The Chunin had just regained consciousness when he was knocked out by Yugao. Fumito immediately began reading his memories. After around 10 minutes, he said, there are 23 ninjas inside that cave. All are Kirigakure ninjas and none have gone rogue. Of them, four are Jounins while the rest are Chunins. A frown appeared on Yugao's face. She muttered, we won't be able to take on such numbers in a direct conflict. We will have to sneak into the cave and eliminate them silently one by one. But even that will be very risky. She looked at Fumito and asked, Did you see the internal layout of the cave from his memories? Is there a way to target the ninjas inside one or two at a time? Fumito answered, I did see the layout. Unfortunately, there is no way to do that as we won't be able to enter the cave without being detected. The cave is covered in numerous seals. They can detect if anyone who isn't a part of their group enters the cave. And there are numerous barriers as well. This man doesn't know which seals were used. I could read the Jounin's memories, but I doubt they would help much either. Yugo nodded and said, I see. We can't infiltrate in that case. We don't have the same few Injutsu skills as Captain. Fumito and Bunjiro nodded. Yugao said, I guess that leaves us with just one option. Her eyes moved towards the unconscious ninja. She asked, where were they planning on going? And will the others inside the cave be moving out as well? Fumito answered, these two were heading towards a village. Their goal was to steal all the money inside it. As for others, they won't be moving out. They have a rule that only two pairs of people can move out at the same time. The rest stay within the cave. The second group is already out. So the others won't move out until the other group returns. Yugao analyzed for a couple of minutes and said, read both their memories. Find out who was in the other group that is outside. Find any other information you will need to impersonate them. You will be the one infiltrating inside the cave. Fumito nodded and got to work. He ate a soldier pill and began reading memories of the dead Jounin and the unconscious Chunin. In an hour, he had collected all the information that he wanted. He learned that Mitsuru had moved out alone a couple of days ago. He stopped reading memories and sat down to relax for a bit while informing Yugao about what he found. Yugao immediately created a basic plan and explained it to Fumito. A few minutes later, the unconscious Chunin finally showed signs of waking up. Fumito got up. He grabbed a pill and swallowed it. Bunjiro and Yugo did the same. Fumito looked towards the Kiri Ninja and made a hand seal. Ninja art, mind transfer jutsu. His consciousness turned into spiritual energy and entered the Chunin's body once again. At the same time, his body collapsed. Bunjiro caught Fumito's real body while the Kiri Chunin's eyes snapped open. He looked at Yugo and nodded. Yugo grabbed her sword and cut off his bindings, freeing him. He got up, stretched his body, and said, Look after my body. Keep it at the same location that we were hiding earlier so that I can return to it immediately. Yugo said, We will move first. Memorize the location properly. I'll leave a clone to watch over your body. He nodded. Yugao and Bunjiro immediately left while carrying Fumito's body. Fumito saw them leave. He waited for a few minutes and got used to the new body. At the same time, he took a kunai and made numerous light cuts on his arms, legs and cheeks. He made a few more preparations. After five minutes, a look of panic appeared on his face and he began running towards the cave. Fear could be seen on his face. As he reached the cave, he glanced towards the spot where Yugao and Bunjiro were hiding and saw his body. He continued running, entered the basement and shouted as loudly as he could, There is trouble. His loud voice immediately woke up every sleeping Kiri ninja. Fumito continued running towards the central room in the cave while breathing roughly. All Kiri ninjas, including the seal master, arrived in that room as well. 
The Kiri ninjas immediately noticed all the blood covering his clothes and the injuries on his body. Everyone immediately became serious. One asked, What's the situation? Fumito spoke hurriedly, Mitsuru-sama was attacked while he was returning here. We saw him fighting with eight ninjas by himself. So Captain and I jumped in to help him. However, they were too strong for us. They bought an opportunity for me to escape. We have to reinforce them quickly. His words immediately made everyone's expression grim. The seal master immediately said, We need to se. Suddenly he noticed something odd and took a look at the ninja. His eyes had become unfocused as if he was waking up from a sleep. At the same time, he sensed a bit of chakra emitting from his body. He wasn't the only one. The other Jounins also noticed something odd. Before they could say anything, the Kiri Chunin exploded with a massive bang. So the explosion was incredibly powerful. Fire and shockwaves immediately engulfed the surrounding Kiri ninjas, most of whom were completely caught off guard. Only the Jounins and a few Chunins managed to react in time and retreated backwards. Thirteen Chunins took the full brunt of the explosion. Their bodies were blasted into the walls of the cave. Not a single one survived. Another four Chunins managed to barely retreat in time. They were still hit by the explosion which left burns of varying degrees on their bodies. The remaining two Chunins and the four Jounins managed to retreat safely. However, everyone had grim expressions. One cursed, that incompetent bastard. Another said, how will we explain such losses to the Mizukage? The third one asked, was he under a Jinjutsu? But who can cast such a strong Jinjutsu? The seal master thought for a bit and said, it could be Jinjutsu or the Yamanaka technique. Regardless, we are in danger. The culprit should be waiting outside for us. We need to prepare for a bat. He stopped speaking and suddenly began coughing non-stop. Several drops of blood fell on the ground. Immediately, the others also began coughing. After some time, one of them cursed, poison. That explosion also contained poison. The seal master said, our health will get worse with time. We need to retreat into the sea. Just after he said it, sounds of explosion were heard once again. Soon, tremors were felt as the cave started collapsing. While running inside the cave, Fumito had discreetly planted a few explosion tags on the floor and walls of the cave. The cave's structure was already damaged heavily due to the earlier explosion. The new explosions immediately caused the cave to collapse. Outside the cave, Bunjiro's clone said, that was a good explosion. The cave is collapsing. Fumito, who had just returned to his body, said, it better be. I had stuck 60 explosion tags on that guy's body. I'm surprised that the cave is still standing despite that explosion. I wanted to use the other tags to ambush them while they were escaping. Inside the cave, the surviving ninjas immediately used jutsus to ensure that the cave didn't collapse. Using that time, they began escaping from the cave. As they moved, they prepared themselves for a fight. Everyone had a grim expression as the poison was making it difficult for them to move normally. As soon as they exited the cave, Yugao and Bunjiro along with their clones bombarded them with kunai that had explosion tags attached to them. The Kiri ninjas noticed it and immediately made hand seals. Water release, water wall jutsu. Multiple water walls went up in front of them. The kunais hit them and exploded. The water walls collapsed but the explosions were stopped. As soon as the water walls collapsed, Yugao appeared next to one of the Kiri ninjas who was injured. He turned his head and his eyes widened as he saw several afterimages of her sword. At the next moment, his head was sent flying in the air. Before the others could react, another head was sent flying. Finally, the Jounins managed to react and counterattacked, forcing Yugao to retreat. However, she was very determined. As Bunjiro and her clones bombarded them with another round of explosion tags, she prepared herself to attack once again. At the same time, Fumito was also looking for an opportunity. Fujin's eyes glowed as he observed the conflict while standing on a tree branch. He analyzed, hmm, that's good. 
they were heavily outnumbered and outmatched as well. But by killing many of them in a trap and poisoning the rest, they have a complete advantage now. This mission has been completed almost perfectly. The only imperfect factor was that a bit of luck was involved in how they found the cave. Still, both Yugao and Fumito are good enough to be Umbu captains. Not many Umbu captains would be able to replicate such a result. The Kiri ninjas were fighting desperately while retreating to save their lives. They absolutely hated Yugao and the others. But unknown to them, an even stronger enemy was watching them. Actually, not one, but two. Unknown to Fujin, another terrifying ninja was hiding and watching the fight. Juzo watched Yugao cut down four Kiri ninjas while thinking, they were supposed to be my targets. But that ninja's sword style. They are from Kanoha. I don't know why Akatsuki needs money, but my mission will fail if the Kanoha ninjas leave with their bodies. Yugao had just completed her second round of attack and was forced to retreat once again. However, before she could relax, she immediately slashed her sword to her right. A much larger sword clashed with her sword. Chapter 386 Yugao had just completed her second round of attack when she sensed a grave danger. She swung her sword to her right, clashing with a much larger sword coming her way. The force behind Juzo's sword forced Yugao back, but she managed to hold on and not let go of her sword. At the same time, her eyes widened when she saw Juzo's face. She thought, one of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist? But hadn't he gone rogue? Don't tell me that it was a lie as well. The Kiri ninjas, who were in a clutch, were surprised as well. They recognized Juzo in an instant. A few of them thought, Juzo? Why is he here to help us? Does he want to take this chance to return to the village? But didn't he hate the village a lot? Fumito and Bunjiro were surprised as well. Neither saw nor sensed Juzo's movements. They wanted to help out Yugo, but the Kiri ninjas attacked and stalled them. A wide grin appeared on Juzo's face as he felt Yugo struggle. Yugao's eyes widened while the others on the battlefield were stunned as they felt Juzo's intense bloodlust. He said, Not bad. You should be able to keep me entertained for a while. He suddenly applied a lot more pressure on his sword, forcing Yugao to her knees. At the same time, he formed his left hand into a claw and was about to attack Yugao. However, he stopped and leaned backwards. Multiple vacuum bullets tore through the space he was previously occupying. Since he was too close to the bullets, the bullets tore through his cloak and left a few small cuts on his chest and upper arms. Juzo's eyes widened as he immediately stepped away from Yugao while thinking, vacuum attacks? I didn't even sense them. Who is it? Yugao immediately took the opportunity to move away from Juzo. Juzo, who was now on full alert, turned around and swung his sword behind him. As he did, he noticed Chakra flowing through Fujin's sword through the corner of his eyes. In an instant, Chakra began flowing through his sword as well. The two swords clashed, producing a loud sound. Both were equally matched. However, instead of engaging in a sword fight, Fujin forced his sword out of the way and punched Juzo with his left hand. Noticing the Chakra concentrated in his hand, Juzo concentrated some chakra in his feet. He used the force of Fujin's sword to step away from him and kick the incoming punch. Unlike the swords that were equally matched, this time Juzo was sent flying for a few meters. He winced as he felt a pain in his foot. However, he ignored it and flipped in the air to land on the ground while staring at Fujin. His entire attention was on Fujin. Seeing Fujin take action, his teammates sighed in relief. They didn't have any confidence in taking on one of the few remaining seven ninja swordsmen of the mist. At the same time, the Kiri ninjas were shocked once again. They were already surprised to see Juzo. But seeing him getting forced back so easily was an even greater surprise. Fujin didn't continue his attack. He was in an even more serious mood as compared to Juzo. He cursed internally, What the hell is Juzo doing here? And since he is here, does that mean Itachi is here as well? Shit! Fujin activated and spread his chakra field over a radius of three kilometers. 
However, other than Juzo, his team, and the Kiri ninjas, he didn't detect anyone. However, a frown existed behind his mask as he analyzed, I can't fully trust my sensory skills. Itachi might be able to stay hidden. Though I will sense him if he uses his chakra. Another one I need to look out for is Zetsu. I can't use the skills I want to keep a secret if he is spying on me. But without them, defeating Juzo would be very challenging. Since Fujin didn't press on the offense, Juzo managed to get a breather. Fujin's team and the Kiri ninjas were on alert as well. The battlefield entered a deadlock as no one made a move. Juzo broke the silence as he chuckled and said, I thought I was only attacking some small fries from Kanoha. To think that I would draw out the spectral swordsman. Haha, <laughs> what a lucky day. Though Fujin was wearing his mask, using the vacuum jutsus gave away his identity easily. Juzo thought, this bastard has a higher bounty than all these Kiri ninjas combined. Kakuzu would be pissed at missing out on such a bounty. Ha ha ha. Hearing the name, the expressions of the Kiri ninjas became grim. However, they soon recovered as they had Juzo who looked to be on their side. But they weren't too sure as everything happened too suddenly. Fujin instructed, Leave this guy to me. Hunt down the rest. Yugao, Fumito and Bunjiro immediately flickered. Juzo didn't move. Unlike what the Kiri ninjas thought, he was here to collect their bounties. It didn't matter to him whether he killed them himself or collected their dead bodies from the Kanoa ninjas. The Kiri ninjas immediately retreated leaving only Fujin and Juzo facing each other. Fujin continued scanning everything in his surroundings properly and talked with Juzo to buy some time. He asked, Haven't you gone rogue? Why are you getting in the middle of my mission? Juzo replied, If you let me kill you, I will let your team complete the mission and go back to Kanoha. Otherwise, all of you die. As he said, he once again unleashed his bloodlust. Fujin was unaffected by his bloodlust. He muttered in a soft but audible voice, Juzo Biwa, one of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist, known throughout the world for your inhumane brutality and slaughtering the weak without any reluctance. A grin appeared behind his mask as he unleashed his killing intent as well and said, It's not often I meet someone with a more intense bloodlust than mine. I wonder whether you live up to your reputation. Though Fujin had killed a lot of people in the past three years, it still paled in comparison to someone like Juzo who was known to inhumanely slaughter for a longer time than he spent in this world. Fujin flickered and appeared in front of Juzo, swinging his sword at full power. Juzo replied in the same manner. The two swords clashed. However, the result was different from the earlier clash. Juzo's eyes widened as he noticed a large amount of force behind Fujin's sword. In addition, a crack appeared on his Kubikuribucho's sword. However, even before he could react to that danger, he noticed another grave threat. Instead of engaging in a pure sword fight, Fujin shot a dozen vacuum bullets at a close range. Juzo immediately retreated and barely managed to dodge the incoming vacuum bullets. However, several more cuts appeared on his body. At the same time, he became very serious as he realized his reputation isn't fake. This will be a tough fight. Fujin didn't give Juzo any time to rest. He flickered behind him and shot a vacuum cannon at Juzo. Juzo immediately got out of the way and counterattacked with water bullets, forcing Fujin to dodge as well. As for the vacuum cannon he dodged, it kept traveling through the forest. Weirdly, it didn't hit a single tree and kept moving in a straight line for 200 meters, as if Fujin had aimed it in a manner to avoid all the trees in its path. Finally, it was about to hit a plant that had a weird shape and was made of two distinct colors, unlike every other plant in the forest. In an instant, that plant moved and went underground. As soon as it did, one of its halves exclaimed, That was scary. That attack nearly killed us. But how did he know that we were here? Or was that attack just a fluke? The other half, which was completely black, said, He was sensing the entire area earlier. I felt his chakra field at our location a few times, but he didn't focus on us. So I thought that he couldn't sense us. His information in the bingo book isn't accurate. 
With such sensing abilities, he is among the best sensors out there. As soon as the Zetsu moved, Fujin sensed their chakra fluctuations. A smile appeared behind his mask as he thought that area felt a bit off for some reason. My guess was right. That bastard Zetsu is keeping an eye as usual. Juzo didn't notice that Fujin's real attack wasn't aimed at him. He continued attacking. Several water dragons formed in front of him and moved towards Fujin. Fujin moved back and jumped on top of the trees. Several vacuum bullets formed in his mouth and he aimed at the heads of the water dragons. The vacuum bullets pierced through the water dragons and dispersed the jutsu. Juzo ignored them as they weren't heading at him, but they kept traveling and pierced the ground a long distance away. Chapter 387 Zetsu, who was hiding underground, instantly felt something drilling through the soil. It immediately went deeper into the ground. A fraction of a second later, the vacuum bullets passed through the space it was in earlier, barely missing its head by a few inches. It pierced through the Venus flytrap-like extensions around its head, tearing away a good chunk of it. White Zetsu looked at the damage and said, This guy is scary. He almost killed us again. I'm afraid Juzo will have a tough time if he can even find time to attack us while fighting him. Black Zetsu said, Juzo is strong as well. But we need to inform Toby and Payne. This fight will be a close one. Let's first ask Hisame to reinforce him. Zetsu immediately left the battlefield. Fujin sensed his movement and wondered, did I scare it away? He dodged Juzo's attack and analyzed, unlikely. Black Zetsu doesn't want to expose its fighting abilities. He should have gone to Colin for reinforcements. I will have to end the fight before they arrive. I can't take on two ninjas close to the rank S at the same time. I should also consider the possibility of just one half having left and the other half staying back to observe or interrupt. Though I doubt he would want to expose himself, I should maintain my chakra field in case he does so. He turned his attention towards Juzo as he wondered, why is he so determined to kill me? I have given him several opportunities to retreat. Sigh, I didn't want to get on Akatsuki's radar so quickly. Despite being aware of him, Fujin barely had any memories of Juzo. After all, he was barely even shown in the series. Though Fujin did collect all his information available with Konoha, it didn't include any information about how loyal Juzo was to Akatsuki and Pain as Haruzen couldn't make information he received from Itachi Public. So Fujin couldn't guess his intentions. As they battled, Fujin felt Juzo's killing intent increasing steadily. He thought, I don't remember who killed him and how, but I know that he will end up dead soon. So I wasn't very interested in killing him. But if he wants to go all out, I can't afford to hold back. A slash in, the timeline regarding Juzo's death is very messed up. Without having to monitor Zetsu's location, Fujin became very determined and focused entirely on Juzo. He flickered to dodge the incoming attacks and flickered again to appear next to Juzo and slashed his sword at his waist. However, Juzo flickered away without any seals as well. He appeared behind Fujin and attacked him with his sword. However, Fujin flickered out of the way as well. Juzo immediately followed him. Both Fujin and Juzo flickered continuously trying to outspeed one another and land a fatal blow. Loud sounds of their blades clashing with each other were heard several times. Several scars were left in the ground and several trees were cut. However, Fujin was unharmed while Juzo didn't take any more damage. Fujin appeared in front of Juzo once again and attacked with his sword. Juzo flickered away to dodge. Fujin stopped swinging his sword and immediately flickered as well. Both appeared close to each other at the same time. Having the initiative, Fujin slashed horizontally aiming to hack Juzo into two. Juzo raised his sword defensively while building up his chakra. Fujin's sword hit Kubikuri Bocho once again. And yet again, a new crack appeared in the sword. This one was the largest yet as it moved almost halfway into the sword. The large Kubikuri Bocho had around a dozen cracks in it by now. Though Juzo was also proficient in using Chakra Flow, his Chakra Flow didn't have any element to it. Due to Fujin's Wind Chakra, 
His sword was much sharper than Juzo's despite the Kubikuri Bocho being a better sword. Juzo used the force of Fujin's attack to fly backwards while spitting out a large amount of water towards Fujin. Due to its volume, it built momentum and began collapsing towards Fujin. Fujin stood his ground and built up chakra as well. Wind Release, Infinite Breakthrough Jutsu He exhaled extremely strong winds. The winds directly broke through the water and forced it back. They continued moving towards Juzo who was quickly backing away while leaving hand signs. Water Release, Great Waterfall Jutsu Juzo expelled a large amount of water from his mouth high into the sky. After reaching high enough, it began cascading down towards the windstorm heading at him. The winds broke into the water and changed its direction back towards Juzo. However, the high volume of water dulled the wind blades in the Jutsu and slowed down the Jutsu until it was harmless. Fujin didn't attack anymore and just observed Juzo getting hit by his own attack despite knowing that it wouldn't harm him. He analyzed, he is strong. Very strong. Though I have an advantage in chakra reserves and strength, I don't have an advantage in speed. His movement and combat speed are as fast as mine while his reaction speed is even faster. Due to his significantly richer battle experience, he is able to negate my advantage in terms of strength very easily and has no issue dodging my vacuum bullets and blades of wind. Even if I use vacuum slash, I will probably be only able to cut that sword in half while he will flicker away. It will be the same with vacuum gatling. Fujin sighed internally as he thought, these attacks can easily rip into those IWA Jounins trained to counter me. But against Juzo, though I will make things difficult for him, I won't be able to land a killing blow. Not to mention, I doubt this will be my last clash with the Akatsuki. Exposing those skills now would put the entire Akatsuki on guard against those attacks. It will be disadvantageous for me in the future. As Fujin was analyzing, mist began covering the entire region. Fujin stood in his spot as the mist engulfed him. Unknown to Juzo, a glint appeared in Fujin's eyes. Just like Fujin, Juzo was thinking hard as well. He thought, from the reports, he should be barely 15 years old. To be able to give me such a hard time at such a young age. Another fearsome talent has appeared in Kanoha. Juzo couldn't help but shudder as he suddenly had a thought. It was, they still have the third Hokage in addition to the two Sanans who are in their prime. And from Itachi's words, Hataki Kakashi and Mike Guy are very impressive as well and live up to their father's reputation. Now this guy. If Kanoha still had Uchiha Fugaku and Itachi in addition to them. Juzo felt a chill at that thought. Once Fujin, Kakashi and Guy reached rank S, Kanoha could have had a greater number of rank S ninjas than Akatsuki. Juzo stopped thinking about such a hypothetical scenario and turned his attention back to Fujin who was being engulfed by the mist. He was confused as he wondered, why didn't he push on the attack? Is he afraid of fighting me when there is a lot of water around me? But that doesn't explain why he is letting the mist engulf him and not blowing it away. Juzo had expected Fujin to use a wind jutsu to blow the mist away. He intended to take action at that time and create an opening. However, Fujin's inaction made his tactic pointless. So Juzo decided to make use of the mist and made a hand seal. Water Release, Water Clone Jutsu For water clones appeared around him. They immediately moved silently towards Fujin's location. Juzo looked at the cracks in his blade and thought, I will have to let Kubikuri Bocho drink some blood now. He disappeared and began moving through the mist. Not a single sound was heard as he moved. The four water clones arrived where Fujin was standing. To their surprise, he was still standing in his spot with his eyes closed. They observed him for some time, but Fujin didn't make any movements at all and stayed like a statue. All four clones wondered, what scheme is he cooking? In order to not let him bide time, two of the water clones moved towards him. One appeared behind him and another appeared in front of him. Both swung their swords at the same time. Fujin's eyes snapped open and gazed into the eyes of the water clone in front of him. Despite the attack, he didn't move. The two swords cleaved him into three pieces. However, no blood was spilled. Instead, 
the two clones felt a breeze. At the very next moment, Fujin exploded, launching wind blades around him. Both the water clones were too close to react and were hit by the blades. Though the attack wasn't extremely fatal, it was enough to dispel them both. Juzo's remaining two water clones were surprised. They realized, a wind clone. Juzo, who was hiding not too far away, was shocked as well. He thought, impossible. I didn't feel him move at all. Where is he? I can't feel him at all in this mist. Juzo and his clones became very alert. Not being able to find Fujin in the mist made Juzo nervous for the first time. He stayed on alert, but his eyes suddenly widened. He thought, the mist is mixed with some foreign chakra. Shit! Chapter 388 Juzo felt a chill in his heart. He turned around while swinging his sword with full strength. Fujin chuckled internally while attacking with his sword as well. He thought, though the hiding in mist assassination technique is impressive, how can it compare to Tobarama's bringer of darkness? It even counters the Manjiku Sharingan to a certain extent. In order to prepare myself for any future fights with Itachi, Abido, or Madara, I have trained a lot in that darkness. Compared to it, fighting in this mist is a child's play. The two swords clashed. Fujin's sword hit the largest crack in Kubikuri Bocho. The crack immediately began enlarging and moving across the blade. At the same time, Fujin shot several vacuum bullets at Juzo. To his surprise, Juzo didn't flicker away like before and instead dodged them without using any jutsu. At the same time, he disrupted his own chakra flow. Due to the close distance and being taken by surprise, Juzo couldn't dodge by a large distance. In fact, one vacuum bullet grazed past the right side of his abdomen. Several new and deeper cuts opened up on his arms and legs. The vacuum bullet that grazed past his abdomen took out a large chunk of flesh as it passed him, causing it to bleed profusely. However, despite injuring him, Fujin wasn't happy. He thought, he realized that my wind chakra was infiltrating into his body and hence didn't flicker. TSK, so much for keeping it a secret. I was hoping to kill him or at least fatally injure him. Juzo flickered away and disappeared within the mist. Though Fujin couldn't see him, he could hear Juzo's voice from all directions. Juzo said, You know Susumu's wind style Jinjutsu? So you were the one who made that mess in the land of wind. Though Akatsuki wasn't interested in the affairs of Sunagakir, they were forced to look into it when they received the news that Suna's Jinchuriki was injured. So Juzo was aware of the events that occurred back then despite not interfering in it. Juzo's remaining two water clones moved towards Fujin. Two wind clones formed around Fujin and moved to intercept them. As for Fujin, a dense wind chakra began flowing through his sword once again. Suddenly, a sound of metal hitting the ground was heard. In an instant, Fujin flickered to that spot. The large crack that he had created in Kubikuri Bocho expanded along the length of the sword as it snapped into two. Though Juzo was aware of his sword's state, his attention was more towards the injury on his abdomen. This created a temporary opening. As soon as Fujin appeared, he attacked with his sword while preparing more rounds of vacuum bullet. Despite having just half of his sword, it was still larger than Fujin's sword. Juzo's chakra flowed through Kubikuri Bocho as he used it to block Fujin's sword and flickered away to dodge the vacuum bullets. At the same time, he constantly disrupted his chakra to not be affected by any Jinjutsu. Fujin gave chase and the two engaged in high-speed combat once again. The two water clones were dispelled by kamikaze attacks by the wind clones. Due to how evenly they were matched, Fujin knew that the clones would be in a deadlock as well. So Fujin chose to explode his clones to finish their battles in a rush and gain an advantage. After all, if both of them consumed their chakra at an equal speed, he would get the advantage. While Fujin and Juzo were fighting, Yugao and the rest chased down the Kiri ninjas. Though the Kiri ninjas put up a good resistance, the poisoning kept worse as time passed on. So they kept on getting weaker and had difficulty in dodging and controlling their chakra. Eventually, despite reaching the sea, they were still all killed by Fujin's team. As they sealed and stored the bodies, 
Banjaro said, getting poison with an unknown poison before a battle is extremely disadvantageous. Fumito nodded and said, we would have lost easily and the captain would have to step in if they weren't poisoned. But the situation was completely reversed. Yugao sealed the last body and said, we still have to help our captain. Juzo is one of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist. He is incredibly strong. Though we have to be careful about not getting in his way. Fumito thought for a bit and replied, I don't think mind-body switch will work on him if we can't pin him down first. Even if I succeed, maintaining it will be very difficult. Yugao nodded and said, Yes. Let's go back and observe the situation first. What happened? As Yugao was talking, she noticed Fumito's eyes widening all of a sudden. A look of shock appeared on his face. Fumito looked towards the sea and thought, What an immense chakra. Who is it? He quickly said, Retreat. In an instant, all three flickered and began moving towards Fujin. En route, Fumito explained what he had sensed. Fujin and Juzo continued fighting without any external interference. As the two fought, Fujin's expression became grim. Despite his injuries, the only effect it had was that Juzo became more and more bloodthirsty. He became far more aggressive in his fighting style. Fujin didn't mind that and wanted to take advantage of any opening he might get due to overaggression. However, Juzo didn't give him a single opening. Fujin analyzed, his resilience is mind-blowing. Despite those injuries and the blood loss, he is fighting as if he hasn't been injured at all. He is also constantly disrupting his own chakra to eliminate any chances of me casting Jinjutsu on him. Despite the bloodlust he was projecting on Fujin, Juzo's mind was calm and serious. He analyzed, not good. Despite having an advantage, this kid isn't getting cocky and seems content to slowly whittle me down. I can't deal him a fatal blow if he maintains such a guard the entire time. More importantly, my sword is almost completely ruined. Juzo was no longer uncaring about his sword. Due to their frequent clashes, it was completely covered in cracks and it was only a matter of time before it crumbled entirely. Though he could repair his sword later, Juzo understood that he would be in deep trouble against Fujin without his sword. As they were fighting, Fujin's eyes suddenly widened. Juzo noticed that and instantly attacked Fujin's wrist with his free hand as their swords clashed once again. Fujin saw the attack and hardened his right arm with the iron skin jutsu while kicking Juzo's elbow. Despite hardening his arm, the strike on his wrist caused Fujin to open his hand and lose his sword. Fujin's kick did the same. It knocked the sword from Juzo's hand and worsened the cuts on his right arm. Fujin ignored his dropped sword and unleashed a flurry of punches and kicks on Juzo. Fujin knew that if he concentrated chakra in his fists, Juzo would run away. So he didn't bother doing it and focused entirely on the speed of his punches. As he didn't sense any chakra concentrated on his fists, Juzo fought back as well. However, to his surprise, he was outmatched once again. Though he defended himself well, Fujin's fists landed on his chest and abdomen several times. He had to use his bleeding arms to defend himself several times, especially because Fujin kept targeting the injury on his abdomen. Even though none of the hits were fatal, Juzo felt the impact of every punch, causing him to cough blood as he fought. Finally, he raised his leg to block Fujin's kick and used it to get away from him. At that moment, Yugao and the rest arrived and landed next to Fujin and shouted, Captain. However, Fujin ignored them and fired a few vacuum bullets at Juzo who was still in the air. Juzo immediately shot water from his mouth into the air and used the force to fall back to the ground. He barely managed to avoid the bullets, but he crashed into the ground and was dragged due to his speed. Fujin flickered and summoned his other sword in his left hand. Juzo quickly recovered and got onto his feet. He saw Fujin appearing in front of him and swinging his sword vertically, aiming to hack him in two. Without his sword, he had no method of defending against the sword. He moved back while building up his chakra and weeding hand signs. Water Release, Water Prison Jutsu A water bubble began covering Jozu in order to provide him with some defense. At the same time, he concentrated chakra on his chest, 
neck and head to slow down Fujin's sword. Despite the dense water, Fujin's sword easily pierced into the water prison. Juzo gritted his teeth and weaved hand signs. He thought, I'll endure this hit and use my body to slow him down. Once his sword lands on me, I'll kill him. Fujin understood Juzo's thought but he wasn't concerned about his counterattack. He was confident in cutting him in two before Juzo could attack. He kept going. However, at that very moment, another figure broke into the water prison and appeared in front of Juzo. A large white sword blocked Fujin's sword and began sucking the chakra flowing through it. Chapter 389 As Fujin's sword slashed into the water prison, a tall, muscular ninja with a shark-like appearance appeared in front of him and blocked his sword with a large sword that was wrapped in a white cloth. Even before the two swords clashed, the wind chakra flowing along Fujin's sword was sucked by the sword. As their swords clashed, both Fujin and Kisame stared into each other's eyes. However, their confrontation was cut short as Juzo completed his hand seals. Water Release, Water Bullets Jutsu He shot several water bullets at Fujin. Fujin pulled back and flickered out of the line of attack and appeared next to his sword that was knocked out earlier. He picked it up and flickered next to his team while storing the other sword back in the storage seal on his bracer. Fujin's squad had very grim expressions. Just taking on one of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist was already an extremely difficult task. If not for Fujin, they would have retreated after just seeing Juzo. So facing two was just too much for them to think about. Kisame didn't press on the attack immediately and checked on Juzo first instead. On seeing that his injuries weren't fatal, he chuckled and asked in a taunting tone, Looks like the kids roughed you up pretty badly. Can you still fight? Juzo gathered himself and stood up. He replied annoyingly, Stop mocking me. Of course, I can. His tone became serious as he warned, Don't underestimate that spectral swordsman brat. He is strong. While Kisame was checking up on Juzo, Fujin instructed, Prepare to fight. Also, be ready to retreat in case more of them appear. Fujin's teammates were surprised. They had expected Fujin to focus on retreating. With his summons, none of them felt that retreating would be difficult. Yugao said softly, Captain, we need to retreat. We can't take on two swordsum. Fujin cut her off and commanded, It's fine. Focus on the fight. When you get a chance, help me distract one of them. Yugao had a bitter smile behind her mask. She couldn't help but recall Haruzen's words to her before she joined Fujin's squad. She recalled his warning about Fujin's tendencies to take the missions to an extreme. Unfortunately, there wasn't anything she could do in that situation. Fujin was insistent on facing the enemies and she didn't have any time to logically argue against him. Kisame nodded on hearing Juzo's warning. He turned his attention to Fujin and said, The Spectral Swordsman of Kanoha. Do you think that you can increase your reputation by taking on the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist? Fujin ignored his question and said, Biwa Juzo and Hashigaki Kisame. Two of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist joined Akatsuki? Juzo and Kisame were surprised to hear the name of their organization. Akatsuki wasn't very active around Kanoha. Kisame said, I'm surprised that someone from the mighty Kanoha knows about me and the Akatsuki. Unlike Juzo, Kisame hadn't gained much fame in the world. After all, he had joined Akatsuki immediately after getting one of the Seven Swords. And despite being strong, he didn't have much fame as he hadn't accomplished anything spectacular. Fujin ignored him once again and continued, I had heard that your group was active around the land of Earth and the smaller countries around there. But by showing here and assisting Kiridakure, are you two also fake rogue ninjas who keep serving the Mizukage obediently? Or is Akatsuki secretly controlled by the Mizukage? Regardless, it is impressive. Every other village considers Kiridakure to be very weak right now. But now, everyone will need to reconsider Kiridakure's forces. Fujin was very careful with his words. He said nothing about the Jinchurikis like Kakashi had. If he did, he didn't doubt the fact that returning to Kanoha would be an incredibly difficult task. Kisame was amused by Fujin's analysis. 
he had no reason to correct Fujin. However, Juzo was offended. He snorted and asked loudly, Do you think I'll work for those scumbags? Fujin asked, So why did you stop us? Why are you even fighting and risking your life? Juzo answered in an annoyed tone, I already told you. I want your bounty. Just hand over your head obediently and I'll let your subordinates escape. Both Kisame and Juzo began charging up their chakra. Though they had the advantage and had a confident expression, both were very alert towards Fujin. After all, his vacuum attacks still posed a great danger to them. One careless moment could cost them their lives. At the same time, Zetsu spectated the fight once again. This time, Fujin couldn't detect his presence. On seeing them charge their chakras, Yugo, Fumito, and Bunjiro grabbed their weapons and took a fighting stance. Fujin, holding his sword in his right hand, also began exerting his chakra. However, instead of attacking, he looked at Kisame and said, Why would I want to take on the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist to enhance my reputation? A group that was claimed to have the capability of hunting Akage but was annihilated by a mere jinin. If I was a part of your little playgroup, I would have long killed myself from shame. Juzo's expression immediately became dark. Kisame was a bit offended as well. It was truly as Fujin said. My Duwei had dragged the name of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist through the dirt. Even though Duwei had power beyond the Kage level, he was only a jinin officially. Once the news regarding their defeat spread in Kirigakure, their reputation hit rock bottom. The seven ninjas, who were treated as the heroes in Kirigakure, became the butt of all jokes. Though none of them committed suicide, their situation was far worse than Hataki Sakumo's. It was one of the main reasons why two of the remaining three betrayed Kiri. Of course, Fujin didn't care about that. Instead, he was one of the very few who knew about Mai Duwei and admired him. He had only said those words for one reason. A glint appeared in Fujin's eyes as soon as their expressions became dark. He just wanted a momentary distraction. In an instant, twelve wind clones appeared around Fujin. Kisame and Juzo immediately became alert. However, that moment's delay was sufficient for Fujin. All his clones flickered and surrounded Kisame and Juzo on all sides. At the same time, all twelve blasted infinite breakthrough jutsu from all directions. The process of creating twelve clones, surrounding the two Akatsuki members and blasting them with infinite breakthrough jutsu from all sides took merely a fraction of a second. So Juzo and Kisame barely had any time to react. They quickly stood with their backs to each other while leading hand signs rapidly. They completed their hand seals at the same moment and expelled a massive amount of water from their mouths. The water surrounded them on all sides and began rushing out and hit the intense winds, acting as a barrier for the two swordsmen. Fujin's teammates were surprised by the quick attack. Fujin didn't pay any attention to them as his entire attention was on Kisame and Juzo, who were trapped at the center while surrounded by water and intense winds. Though the situation was temporary, Fujin thought, this is sufficient. Chakra flowed through Fujin's sword once again as he took a step forward. Juzo shouted as he controlled the water around him, look out for vacuum bullets. They are very fause. Suddenly, both Juzo and Kisame felt danger. Juzo looked at his body while Kisame turned his eyes towards Juzo. Juzo immediately tried to cover his own body with chakra. But it was too late. With multiple loud booms, a series of explosions went off on Juzo's body as if his body was covered in explosive tags. Chapter 390 First, an explosion went off on Juzo's right foot. Immediately after, around a couple of dozen explosions went off on his chest, abdomen, and arms. Each explosion was just slightly weaker than the explosions from an explosive tag. Kisame, due to being very close to Juzo, was caught off guard. He was caught in some explosions. Fortunately, he was facing Juzo's back, so the explosions didn't harm him much. Only his cloak was badly damaged. He immediately moved away from Juzo and looked at him with a frown on his face. He wondered, what the hell? Why did so many explosions go off on Juzo's body? 
He turned his attention towards Fujin and wondered, did he do it? But how could he set up Juzo? As Juzo was hit and Kisame was distracted, their control over the water defending them from the winds was lost. So the wind immediately began piercing through the water. Noticing the danger, Kisame took control of the water around them. It gathered around him forming a protective barrier. At the same time, twelve powerful jets of water were launched at the twelve wind clones who were still blasting them with infinite breakthrough jutsu. In addition, Kisame also launched water towards the winds to reduce their momentum and dull its sharpness. Though it consumed a high amount of chakra, Kisame's quick action forced the wind clones to stop attacking and take evasive actions. It also dealt with the winds trapping him and Juzo. Having caught a breather, Kisame looked towards Juzo. His eyes widened and his pupils dilated as he saw Juzo's condition. The smoke around Juzo due to the explosion had finally cleared. Despite the explosions, Juzo still stood straight. However, his condition was terrible. The skin on his right foot's sole was torn off due to the explosion. Attempting to walk on it would be worse than any physical torture. His arms were in a similar state. The explosions were even worse here due to pre-existing cuts on his arms. In some spots, the impact was so bad that all skin and muscles had been blown off and his bones were exposed to the air. However, they weren't visible due to being covered with blood. The worst was his chest and abdomen. They were a complete mess. Despite having already seen a lot, Fujin's teammates were still affected by the gory state of his chest and abdomen. It was a shock that Juzo could still keep standing. Kisame was shocked as well by the sudden change in the situation. So was Zetsu who was observing the fight from some distance. Only one person was unaffected by it. It was Fujin, who was observing without any emotion behind his mask. The entire situation played out exactly like he had pictured it in his mind. Kisame's breather was short-lived. As per the plan, the wind clones turned their attention towards Kisame and fired multiple vacuum bullets at him. Despite being much stronger than the clones, Kisame had no choice but to give those attacks all his attention and take evasive actions. Fujin's teammates also understood Fujin's intentions behind his actions and words earlier and moved. All three attacked Kisame from range to keep him occupied. With Kisame occupied, Fujin made a move. He shot a vacuum cannon at Juzo while moving towards him. The vacuum cannon easily pierced through the water surrounding Juzo and moved towards him. At the last moment, Juzo snapped his eyes open and moved out of the way. His resilience shocked Fujin once again. Despite such lethal injuries, Juzo moved as if he wasn't injured at all. However, it wasn't going to be enough to survive. After all, Fujin wouldn't take pity on someone who tried to kill him. Fujin swung his sword to blow away all the water around Juzo and appeared in front of him. Juzo looked at Fujin and asked in a coarse voice, You are a few Jutsu Grandmaster? Fujin didn't answer. However, Juzo knew he was right. But he was still confused. He wondered, Why couldn't I sense the explosive seals he placed on my body? Though I wasn't expecting him to be able to do this, I should have sensed it after he placed one on me and taken the required precaution. Fujin could easily guess what Juzo was thinking. The answer to it was the break Fujin had taken earlier. During his vacation, Fujin created seal imprints for the explosive seal. His idea was to simply put these seals on enemies when engaging them in taijutsu or even touching them in general and blow them up after he had accumulated sufficient seals on the enemy's body. But he faced one major issue. It was that the seal could easily be detected when a ninja circulated their chakra. So using them to surprise his enemies on the battlefield wasn't viable. Understanding the danger, any ninja would cut off that part of their skin in order to survive. Only Chunin level and weaker or indecisive ninjas would fall prey to it. While it would still give Fujin an advantage, he wasn't satisfied with it. In order to make it usable, Fujin's clones worked for several days in order to mix components of various stealth seals into the explosive seal. That was why Fujin took longer to master all the seals in the library. After spending more than the equivalent of a year, Fujin's clones finally succeeded. 
The result was a seal that was very difficult to detect unless the opponent was a grandmaster in Fuinjutsu as well or had incredible sensor skills. The only drawbacks were that the power of the explosion was reduced a bit and the seal was far more complicated. However, thanks to seal imprints, that wasn't an issue. Fujin immediately removed the earlier seal imprint and created new ones. And he hadn't created just one but instead created four of them. Two on his palms and two more on his knuckles. So every time Fujin's punch landed or he used his hands to block his enemy, he could create one explosive seal on the enemy's body. Against an opponent of Juzo's caliber, Fujin wasn't sure if his new vacuum jutsus would have much impact on the battle. So he decided to keep them hidden and instead decided to expose his Fuinjutsu. As luck would have it, Akatsuki wasn't aware of Fujin's capabilities in Fuinjutsu. Anoki hadn't exposed Fujin's expertise in Fuinjutsu to anyone other than Kumogakur who had paid a large price, hoping that he would be able to take out some of the ninjas, especially from Akatsuki, who tried to hunt him before going down. Anoki's little scheme succeeded on this battlefield. Juzo didn't even consider that Fujin had put a seal on his foot right at the beginning of their fight. Instead, he was more focused towards Fujin's ability to concentrate large amounts of chakra easily. Later, when Juzo tried to unarm Fujin, Fujin gladly accepted the exchange because he wanted to engage in a taijutsu to fight to put more seals on Juzo's body. As a result, Fujin managed to put several seals on Juzo without him even suspecting Fujin. Of course, Fujin had no intention of explaining this to Juzo. He moved forward. Kisame noticed it and wanted to interfere, however, the vacuum bullets made it extremely difficult for him to interfere directly. He muttered to himself, so annoying. Having to keep an eye on twelve ninjas who are ridiculously fast and keep spamming jutsus that I can't block or afford to take is a headache. And then there is also that ninja who uses lightning jutsus into the water I am controlling. He turned his gaze back to Juzo and thought, you will have to hang on for a few seconds, Juzo. Suddenly, everyone in the battle felt a massive amount of chakra emanating from Kisame. The chakra was incredibly intense and massive. It was as if a tailed beast had arrived on the battlefield. A massive amount of water appeared around Kisame and began flowing in all directions. Fujin's team became nervous but kept attacking from a distance. As for Fujin and his clones, they knew that even with a large amount of chakra, Kisame still wouldn't want to get hit by the vacuum bullets. So they weren't concerned. Seeing Fujin rushing towards him with a sword in his hand and sensing Kisame's massive chakra and the water he released, Juzo's hands moved to weave a hand seal. However, his right hand suddenly stopped. Dark markings suddenly appeared on Juzo's body, paralyzing him. Shock could be seen in Juzo's eyes as he realized, the self-cursing seal? When did he put it on me? And why didn't he use it until now? Just like the explosive seals, Fujin had placed this seal on his body when they had engaged in a taijutsu. Fujin had used his left palm to stop an incoming punch and had put the seal on his at that instant. Fujin didn't activate it earlier as Juzo could try and break through it with his chakra, but in his current exhausted state, he stood no chance. Before he could get any answer, he saw Fujin's sword flash past his neck. Unable to move or resist or get any help, he was beheaded and his head was sent flying away from his body. Juzo, one of the last two surviving members of the original seven ninja swordsmen of the mist, died at the hands of Suzuki Fujin in the land of hot water. The number of the swordsmen from the mist kept decreasing. Chapter 391 the act of beheading Juzo immediately gained everyone's attention. Despite working with him for over a year, Fujin's squad were still surprised to see Fujin kill off such a fearsome ninja so quickly. After all, though Fujin had fought with Rashi and Kitsuchi in the past, he hadn't succeeded in killing any of them. Of course, the one who was shocked the most was Kisame. He couldn't help but exclaim, Impossible! Had Juzo managed to hold on for a few seconds, Kisame would have been able to rescue him and force Fujin to retreat. However, to Kisame's disbelief, Juzo didn't last for even a short while. Some distance away, White Zetsu said, he is indeed scary. Poor Juzo was so helpless. Black Zetsu agreed and added, 
Yeah. He also used him as a trap to hit Kisame. Had Kisame not been careful, he would have been hit by the explosions as well. In that case, he could have tried to kill them both. Black Zetsu's mind quickly began calculating why Juzo suffered a loss so quickly. Despite the achievement of killing such a high-level ninja, Fujin didn't get lost in it. Instead, at the very next moment, he opened up a scroll, sealed Juzo's body and quickly moved towards his head. However, multiple jets of water were launched at him suddenly. At the same time, water was moving towards him like a tsunami. Fujin's team and his clones were already retreating. Fujin was about to seal Juzo's head when a water jet hit Juzo's head and pierced into his brain, destroying it from the inside. Fujin frowned and retreated. He looked at Kisame. Annoyance could be seen in his eyes, but it was just an act. Though taking Juzo's head would seem like Kanoha would get a lot of information and would benefit heavily, it was actually extremely counterproductive. Itachi was a spy Haruzen sent to Akatsuki. So he already had a lot of information about the Akatsuki without the Akatsuki, except Abito, knowing about it. As for Fujin, he was the person who was the most clear about what Akatsuki was, who their members were and what their goals were. So any information that Juzo might have was borderline useless for both Fujin and Kanoha. On the contrary, Akatsuki would know that Kanoha had a lot of information about them. So they could be forced to make a move on Kanoha and effectively change the future to a large degree. It was something that Fujin didn't want to see. That is why he first sealed Juzo's body and used a storage scroll to seal his body instead of one of the many storage seals on his bracer to waste some time without making anyone suspicious of his actions. It warned Kisame and gave him an opportunity to destroy Juzo's head. As they retreated, the massive amount of water kept following them like a tsunami. Fujin said softly, back me up. He immediately began building up his chakra. His clones and teammates immediately felt a massive amount of chakra from him. While his teammates would usually be very impressed, at that moment, the chakra that Fujin built up was much less than Kisame's. Regardless, everyone prepared themselves too. Wind Release, Infinite Breakthrough Jutsu. Wind Release, Air Bullet Jutsu. Fire Release, Searing Migraine Jutsu. Lightning Release, False Darkness Jutsu. Almost at the same time, Fujin and his team launched their attacks. Fujin led with a massive infinite breakthrough jutsu. Bun Gyro couldn't use water jutsus while his wind jutsus were far weaker than Fujin's. So he just shot a few air bullets in his attack. Yugao shot her fireball on one side of the infinite breakthrough while Fumito launched his lightning jutsu on the other side. They were followed up by Fujin's wind clones who exhausted all their remaining chakra and launched vacuum jutsus into the combination attack. The massive combination attack combined seamlessly and hit the incoming tsunami that Kisame had started. The intense winds put a stop to the water's momentum temporarily and even forced some of it backwards. Some sharp winds pierced into the water but couldn't travel far within it. The fire evaporated a lot of water but wasn't very effective considering the large amount of water. Only Fumito's lightning spears managed to enter the water and electrify it. However, Kisame created layers within the water and controlled their flow to keep the electrified water away. The vacuum jutsu shot by Fujin's clones pierced into the water easily and moved towards Kisame. However, due to the disturbance they caused in the water, Kisame could easily see and dodge them. Sweat gathered behind Fujin and his team's masks. Despite the four of them attacking together, they were only evenly matched with Kisame. In fact, some water had already begun moving towards them through the intense winds. Fujin analyzed, this guy is nuts. Kiri was crazy to use him merely to kill his teammates. He is already in a whole different league as compared to someone like Juzo. Though Fujin was already aware of how strong Kisame would be by the start of the Fourth Great Ninja War, he was interested in checking how strong he already was. His observation made him very unwilling to fight Kisame so far away from Kanoha. Fujin decided, it's time to retreat. But running away from him will be difficult if he doesn't intend to let us off. Even though I'm faster at escaping, the other three won't be able to shake him off. Sigh. I'll have to expose my summons as well. 
Fujin was about to summon Kaido when he suddenly sensed something. A look of surprise appeared behind his mask as he wondered, what are they doing here? He suddenly put over 10% of his chakra into the infinite breakthrough jutsu. The sudden infusion of chakra into the jutsu powered it up considerably, causing it to force its way through the water Kisame was controlling. His actions surprised Kisame and his teammates. Kisame retreated backwards while wondering, what is he intending? Though he forced me back, such a chakra expenditure will be very disadvantageous for him. Suddenly, three shadow clones, each with 10% of his maximum chakra, appeared around Fujin. At the same time, a seal lit up on his bracer and 600 explosive tags appeared in front of him. He said, Retreat. Fujin's teammates, who weren't able to understand the reason behind his actions, immediately flickered in the opposite direction along with Fujin. They finally guessed the reason behind Fujin's actions and wondered, does he intend to delay Kisame long enough that we escape his detection range? But why is he still keeping his chakra field active? And why did we fight first if he wanted to withdraw? Unlike Fujin, his teammates weren't aware of Zetsu's existence and his abilities. Due to Zetsu, Fujin knew that escaping like usual wasn't possible. The only way to escape was by either deterring Kisame from chasing them or flying away. Unfortunately for them, Fujin didn't bother clearing their doubts. He consumed a soldier pill and said, We will keep running until we reach Kanoha. No breaks. And at least one of us will keep chakra fields active at any given time. If any more strong enemies appear, we will avoid them. His teammates nodded and kept moving at a fast speed. Back on the battlefield, Fujin's shadow clones controlled the explosive tags and rained them down towards Kisame in waves. Kisame immediately spat out more water to douse those explosions. As he did, he realized, despite having so many tags, he is only using a few in every wave. He wants to delay me until he can get out of the range. It looks like he doesn't know about Zetsu's abilities. Kisame didn't mind wasting some time to defeat the shadow clones. He could find Fujin easily with Zetsu's aid. He blocked all the waves of the explosive tags and then rode a water wave to move closer to Fujin's clones. Fujin's clones analyzed, this might be a good time to test some of Kisame's abilities. For instance, would contact with the sword immediately pop up a shadow clone due to its ability to suck chakra? One of the clones flickered and appeared on top of Kisame. Chakra concentrated on his fist as he punched Kisame. Kisame immediately raised his sword to block the punch. The chakra gathered around the clone's fist was easily absorbed by the sword. Despite that, when the clone's punch landed on the sword, Kisame felt an intense force. Had he been weaker, he would have been forced under the water. As soon as his fist landed on the sword, the sword began absorbing his chakra. The clone analyzed, hmm, so the clone won't be dispelled in an instant. I guess it will only happen after it sucks away enough energy. As he was analyzing, sharp scales broke through the bandages and hit the clone's hand. Fujin's clone immediately used iron skin jutsu to harden his fist, however, the chakra the sword absorbed caused his jutsu to fade away instantly and created deep cuts in his arm, dispelling him. Chapter 392, Zetsu, who was observing the fight, felt something and turned its head around. Its eyes immediately widened as it thought, not good. We can't stay here. Kisame turned his attention towards the remaining two clones as all the bandages around his sword were torn apart by Samahana. Neither clone had made any move. He wondered, why are they just observing like they want to test out my abilities? I thought that he wanted to buy some time. The clones received the memories of the dispelled clone and realized, it looks like the Senju Taijutsu style is ineffective on him. No, rather, it benefits him instead of harming him. And he also absorbs the chakra flow from my swords. Sigh, what an annoying fighter. Apart from those annoying Menjiku and Rinnegan users, Kisame might be the toughest opponent for me. Immediately, a sword appeared in each clone's hands as they prepared for another clash with Kisame. Kisame weaved hand signs rapidly. Water release, shark bomb jutsu. Immediately, 
the water around Kisame transformed into five sharks and moved towards the clones rapidly. Both clones just slashed their swords, generating wind slashes that destroyed the sharks. At the same time, both flickered away from Kisame as a lot of water was flooding towards them from behind the sharks. Kisame riled up his chakra and was about to attack when he suddenly stopped and looked behind. From the ground, two Venus flytrap-like extensions emerged before Zetsu became visible. Immediately, the eyes of Fujin's clones began glowing as they observed Zetsu, or more specifically, Black Zetsu. One of the clones muttered aloud, What kind of freaks do you have in this organization? What is that? A Venus flytrap? Zetsu ignored Fujin and said in an urgent tone, Kisame, you need to retreat. A large number of Kiridakir ninjas are rushing towards us. Meanwhile, Fujin's clones observed, he has such a strange body. I can barely detect anything from him. I wonder if the Sharingan or the Byagukin can see more. Probably not considering how much Madara trusted him and that no Hyuga mentioned anything odd about him. I'll need someone like Orochimaru to dissect him and study him properly. Kisame was surprised. He looked at Fujin's clones and said, I see. So you retreated on sensing them. Kisame had felt Fujin's chakra field while approaching that place. So, he was aware of how large the range of his sensor ability was. One of Fujin's clones nodded and answered, Yes. Though I wasn't sure who it was, I guessed it was Kiri. However, I'm surprised that you want to retreat so quickly. Aren't you just an undercover Kiri ninja? I thought that you would ally with them and outnumber us. Kisame understood that Fujin's clone was talking because he wanted to waste time and keep Kisame there until the Kiri ninjas arrived. He said, I will remember you. Next time, you won't escape so easily. Fujin's clone chuckled and replied, If there is a next time, that is. Do you think that escaping will be so easy? Immediately, both clones flickered and peppered Kisame with vacuum bullets. They had only one goal, and that was to delay Kisame. Though they were just shadow clones, Kisame couldn't dispel them easily as they kept their distance from him and dodged all attacks. He tried escaping in other directions, but the clones would always follow him and slow him down. Half a minute later, another figure appeared on the battlefield. He observed, Kisame? What is he doing here? Didn't Mitsuru say that Juzo was the one attacking him? Where are he and Juzo? And who is that masked ninja making Kisame retreat? Zetsu had already disappeared under the ground. So he wasn't seen by the newcomer. His appearance immediately attracted Kisame and Fujin's clone's attention. Fujin's clones thought, ah, he is the one leading them. Not bad, he is quite strong. It'll be interesting to see how this goes. Meanwhile, Kisame had a serious face as he muttered, Hozuki Mengetsu. Fujin's clones immediately flickered and moved to a location such that Kisame would be between them and Mengetsu. They launched supercharged infinite breakthrough jutsu at Kisame, cutting his path off and forcing him to defend. As Kisame defended, Fujin's clones observed Mengetsu. To their disappointment, Mengetsu didn't make a move to attack Kisame and instead observed the situation carefully from a distance. The clones realized, I see. He is unclear about what the situation is. Or perhaps he wants us to fight it out and then take advantage of our weakened state. They understood Mengetsu's thoughts as Fujin would have had similar thoughts had he been in Mengetsu's place. Immediately, one clone looked at Kisame and loudly declared, You are lucky that your allies have arrived. Next time, I will kill you and take your sword. In an instant, both clones disappeared by using wind instantaneous body jutsu and escaped in opposite directions. Kisame was incredibly annoyed. He thought, what an annoying piece of shit. Kill me my ass. Had he stayed, he would have been the one to die. He just wants to force a conflict between me and Mengetsu and reap benefits without risking anything. Mengetsu heard his words and thought, so my presence forced him away? No matter. Seeing his speed, catching him would be impossible anyway. And without an unknown factor, Kisame wouldn't be able to escape me. Mengetsu flickered and appeared behind Kisame in the blink of an eye. 
Unlike Fujin, he wasn't wary of stepping into the water while fighting Kisame. He was more proficient than Kisame in fighting on water. Kisame immediately turned around and swung his blade to block the incoming strike. A large sword hit the Samahana and immediately a series of explosions took place, forcing Kisame to retreat. Both Mangetsu and Kisame moved away from each other. Kisame looked at Mangetsu and the Shibuki sword he was holding. He said, Mangetsu, I didn't expect to meet you here. Mangetsu looked at Kisame and said, I didn't expect to meet you here either. I know Faguki was a traitor. So I won't hold you to his murder. But I want the Samahana back. Give it up and you can go. Kisame grinned and asked, Do you think you can take it from me? A massive amount of chakra was released from Kisame. The chakra was so intense that even Mangetsu was surprised for a moment. His expression changed to normal immediately as he threatened, If you don't hand it over obediently, then I will have to take it from your corpse. As soon as Mangetsu finished his statement, several figures appeared. In a second, they became visible. Kisame became serious as he observed, 2400 ninjas. Though Kisame's display of his chakra surprised Mangetsu, he wasn't worried about taking him on due to the backup he had. Both sides immediately entered into an intense conflict. The two sides battled for about half an hour before the battle concluded. Unknown to any of the parties involved, a pair of eyes observed their entire battle. Fujin's squad kept moving rapidly through the land of hot water. As everyone had eaten soldier pills and frequently used the body flicker jutsu, they moved very quickly. They weren't too far away from the border with the land of fire. Suddenly, Fujin's eyes widened as he received new memories. He realized, I see, so they were all hunter nins from Kiri and were led by Mangetsu. Still, Kisame still managed to escape. And he also killed seven hunter nins before getting away. Fujin analyzed, that was expected though. I don't see Kisame being killed so easily. I am surprised that he had to face as much trouble as he did. Mangetsu is quite strong. And, he also has several of the seven swords. Even without the reinforcements, he would have managed to hold Kisame back for a long time. Kisame's performance was surprisingly underwhelming against the Kiri ninjas as compared to me though. But it is probably due to our fighting styles. My taijutsu and sword skills were completely nullified by him. And, the large amount of water allowed him to create sufficient distance from me, giving him plenty of time to dodge or stop my wind attacks. By comparison, Kiri ninjas who weren't afraid of stepping into that water were able to give him a tougher fight. And since they don't use chakra flow or supercharged jutsus, they don't provide Kisame with a lot of opportunities to absorb their chakra. Of course, the biggest factor was Mangetsu himself. He has mastered all seven swords so it is likely that he has raised special forces to target the seven ninja swordsman members who went rogue, kind of like what IWA did against me. This fight also made me realize. I completely overlooked an important aspect during my training. Now that I think about it, I was lucky that I didn't manage to kill Juzo quickly and hence got to fight Kisame. Otherwise, I wouldn't have thought of it even though it was so obvious. Chapter 393 Back on the battlefield, Mangetsu stood along with seventeen hunter ninjas. They were treating the wounded and sealing the dead. One ninja approached Mangetsu and hatefully said, Kisame managed to escape. We need to organize more hunting parties to trap and kill him. However, Mangetsu shook his head and said, No. His words surprised his subordinates who were around him. Mangetsu explained, It's pointless. Kisame was already in a battle before we found him. And despite outnumbering him so much, we weren't able to kill him. So any hunting squads we send will be killed by him. Even if they manage to inform us, what's the use if we can't kill him? Only Mizukich sama can kill him, but he can't move around so lightly. The hunter ninjas sighed on hearing the explanations. None of them argued against him. They had just fought Kisame and his strength was far beyond their expectations. Suddenly, a hunter ninja approached Mangetsu with excitement and said, Captain, look what I found. Mangetsu immediately looked at the ninja. 
His eyes widened as he saw what the hunter ninja was holding. He immediately grabbed it and observed it properly. After a couple of minutes, he nodded and said, There is no mistake. This is the hilt of Kubikiri Bocho. But... His voice became a bit unsteady as he asked, Who damaged it to this extent? There is almost nothing left of the sword. Also, where is Juzo? No one answered him. Mangetsu instructed, Search this battlefield. See if you can find any pieces of the blade. Also, see if you can find any dead bodies. The hunter ninjas nodded. The ones who weren't gravely injured immediately got to work. Due to the high intensity of the battle, neither Fujin nor Kisame had any time to pay attention to and pick up Juzo's sword. In addition, the entire battlefield was flooded by Kisame. So, the sword was a few meters under the water. Even if they had time, neither Fujin nor Kisame were very interested in that sword. Only Zetsu could collect the sword, but it didn't see any point in doing that as Juzo was dead. As the ones who managed to hold onto the battlefield until the end, the sword landed in the hands of the Kiri ninjas. They quickly found some of the shattered pieces of Kubikiri Bocho. Mangetsu observed them and concluded it looks like they were cut by wind. The masked ninja that Kisame was fighting was using wind jutsus. Did he defeat Juzo before fighting Kisame? While Mangetsu was storing the pieces of Kubikiri Bocho, a ninja appeared holding the damaged head of Juzo. The head was very damaged. Kisame's attack had poked a hole through Juzo's head and destroyed his brain. A large part of his face was unrecognizable. So the hunter Nins weren't able to identify him. However, having fought alongside Juzo for so long, Mangetsu had no doubts. He sighed and muttered, Biwa Juzo was killed by that masked ninja who was engaged with Kisame in a fight. From our reports, Kisame and Juzo had joined the same organization. It looks like they came in a conflict. His words silenced the ninjas around him. Though they were trained to hunt them down, everyone knew how difficult that task was. To see that one of their famed swordsmen was killed left them with a complicated feeling. Finally, one ninja asked, Who could that masked man be? To first kill Juzo and then fight Kisame. Mangetsu muttered, he used wind vacuum jutsus and wielded swords. From the recent rumors, there is only one such person who is very active. The expressions of all the hunter Nins became serious. Finally, one hatefully said, the spectral swordsman. Mangetsu nodded and said, yeah. Though I suppose we need to be thankful to him for once. He killed Juzo and didn't even take the sword away. In addition, he also allowed us to attack Kisame and understand how strong he is. The hunter Nins weren't sure what to say. After clearing the battlefield, they looked for the base they had created. Unfortunately, the base was in ruins. They could only collect the dead bodies buried under the cave and retreated from the land of hot water. The high losses forced them to call off their operations in that country. While the Kiri ninjas were retreating, Fujin was wrecking his mind trying to find a solution to an issue he had realized. He analyzed, though my plans for creating a wind domain are excellent, I overlooked one important aspect. That is ninjas who can absorb chakra. If I just emit chakra and let it form a domain around me so that I can control winds, doesn't that mean someone like Kisame can just absorb it? Granted that there aren't many ninjas with this ability, but the ones who do are absolutely broken. Pain, Madara, and later Abito and Sasuke would all be able to directly absorb the chakra I emit. If I can't use my main fighting style against them, then my chances of victory would drop hard. How do I counter that? The only thing I can think of so far is to directly convert all the chakra I emit into wind. This way, they can't absorb wind. Hmm, no, Rinnegan might still be able to absorb it, but there is nothing I can do about that. Regardless, I won't be able to make the wind sharper or concentrate them in one place without chakra. Though I could create sharp winds out of their absorption range, it will lose effect as they will have sufficient time to dodge. Fujin thought for several hours, but he couldn't come up with any ideas he could implement at that time. He sighed internally and thought, the only way I could stop them or make them pay is if the chakra I emit is nature chakra. 
but I haven't learned Sinjutsu yet. Sigh, there is no other way I can think of currently. If I can't think of a good way, I'll have to be very careful while fighting any of them. Without the wind domain, I won't have much of an advantage against them. Fortunately, Madara is dead while Abito and Sasuke won't have that ability for quite some time. Nagato won't expose himself and I can escape from Kisame. Not to mention, I still have a long time before I master my wind domain. If I can learn the Flying Thunder God by then, then I can escape easily even if I encounter Nagato and create an alternative fighting style that is equally dangerous. While Fujin was wrecking his brain and the Kira ninjas were returning to Kirigakure, a meeting between eight rank south ninjas was taking place. In a cave, the illusionary bodies of the Akatsuki members appeared. As soon as they did, Orochimaru joked, we seem to be missing some members. No one joined in his joke. Pain informed the group, Biwa Juzo is dead. In the last three days, we have lost two members. Everyone's attention was immediately drawn to Kakuzu, whose partner was missing as well. Sasori asked, how did they die? Zetsu answered, Juzo was killed by Kanoha's spectral swordsman during a mission. The other one died in friendly fire. Once again, everyone stared at Kakuzu who replied unapologetically, he was too slow. Orochimaru asked, you attacked him, didn't you? Kakuzu didn't bother replying. Orochimaru turned his attention to Itachi and asked, Juzo was your partner, wasn't he? I wonder who you would team up with next. Itachi didn't respond. Pain offered Kakuzu and Itachi to team up, however, both refused. So, Pain announced that they would begin looking for new members. Kakuzu looked at Zetsu and asked, Spectral Swordsman is on my hit list for his bounty. How strong is he and what are his abilities? Quite a few Akatsuki members were interested in the answer. Though Fujin had gained a lot of fame recently, none of them expected him to kill an Akatsuki member. White Zetsu answered, he is very strong and dangerous. His vacuum jutsus are far more lethal than what the bingo book mentions. His sensor skills are top-notch as well. He nearly killed us a couple of times. Black Zetsu added, he is a Fuinjutsu Grandmaster and can apply explosive and paralysis seals stealthily. Juzo died because he wasn't aware of those seals being applied on his body. In addition, his chakra reserves and speed can be categorized as rank S. More importantly, he is very cunning and schemes continuously. Even Kisame fell into a tough spot due to him. Don't underestimate him or you might lose a few hearts. Zetsu's words weren't too much of a surprise for the Akatsuki members. After all, Fujin wouldn't have been able to kill Juzo had he been weak. Still, no one was too alarmed as Juzo was one of the weakest members of Akatsuki. Since no one had anything else to add, Payne said, we will be taking the first step towards our goal soon. Our target is Han, the Jinchuriki of Five Tails. Chapter 394 Fujin was unaware of the developments taking place inside Akatsuki. But he wasn't very concerned about them as Akatsuki didn't have any record of taking revenge for their fallen comrades. He kept thinking about more ways to counter ninjas who could absorb ninjutsu until Kanoha appeared in their sight. Fujin looked at the village and thought, leave it, I'll think about it after I develop it completely. Anyway, this mission wasn't bad. I kind of expected things to go south when Akatsuki got involved. Fortunately, everything went well. I managed to collect some information on Zetsu and Kisame and got to see Kisame and Mengetsu in action. And the only loss I suffered was that my Fuinjutsu mastery was revealed to them. But that is fine. Even if they are aware of it, Fuinjutsu will be a big pain in their ass. Though I also use the wind-style Jinjutsu, I doubt they would be aware of it. Zetsu had probably gone to call Kisame and we were covered by mist. But, even if that stays a secret, it won't be very effective against rank S ninjas. All of them are too sensitive towards such chakra. More importantly, I got an opportunity to fight two very strong ninjas. It showed me a lot of my weaknesses. The new range of vacuum jutsus that I developed, though effective, won't have any chance of killing a rank south ninja or ninjas close to that level. But, it's fine. 
I created them to cut through Jounans who were trained to counter my previous fighting style. And if killing rank S was so easy, then they would have already been dead. Besides, even if they can dodge them, it will create a lot of pressure on them. Especially when I use them along with wind style Jinjutsu and Fuinjutsu. Hee <laughs> hee, they will be incredibly annoyed to face me when I go all out. One small mistake will cost them their lives. A glint appeared in Fujin's eyes as he thought, of course, my biggest gain was Juzo's death. Though he wasn't a rank S ninja, Juzo was very close to that level. To be able to kill such a ninja, especially in the presence of another rank S ninja, I can be considered as a rank S ninja. A 15-year-old rank S ninja, he he he. Who would have thought that the thing that would help me breach the gap between rank A and rank S level would be Fuinjutsu? When I first arrived in this world, this was the step I wanted to reach. At this level, killing me would be incredibly difficult. I no longer have to worry about offending anyone or being targeted by someone with malicious intentions. A smile appeared behind Fujin's mask. Though he had long gained the ability to phase and escape from rank S ninjas, finally reaching that level gave him an entirely different feeling. It was as if he was no longer bound by anything. As he stepped into Kanoha, he felt a sense of freedom like never before. It was a feeling he hadn't experienced in either of his lifetimes. Fujin looked at his teammates and said, I will report to Lord Hokage. You guys can go back home if you want but meet me in our room in half an hour for a meeting. Yugao, Fumito, and Bunjiro were a bit surprised by the sudden meeting. They nodded and went their separate ways. Fujin continued forward to Haruzen's office. He flickered directly outside Haruzen's office. Haruzen, who was busy with paperwork, looked above and noticed Fujin. A bit of confusion appeared in his eyes as he thought, he feels a bit different. He said, come in. At the same time, he looked at the ceiling at the hidden Umbu guards. They immediately left the room and closed all doors and windows. Haruzen made a hand seal, activated the seals, and said, you are back early. Eagle informed me that you took the rank S mission to the land of hot water. Was the mission successful? Fujin nodded and said, yes. It was as you calculated. They were ninjas from Kirigakure who were creating trouble. All were eliminated. Hiruzen said, good. Send me the report later. Thanks to his previous record, Hiruzen wasn't surprised that Fujin managed to complete the mission with just his squad. Unfortunately, Hiruzen was completely oblivious to the several shocks he would receive very soon. He went through his drawers and grabbed a scroll. He tossed it to Fujin and said with a gentle smile on his face and a hint of tiredness, I copied all the details regarding the Flying Thunder God Jutsu in this scroll. It has insights from both the second and fourth Okage. The rest will be on you. I hope you learn this Jutsu. Fujin grabbed the scroll and looked at it. A smile appeared on his face as he thought, sweet. Even though he fakes a smile and tiredness to invoke sympathy, he is truly magnanimous. Now, how do I break the news to him? Fujin stored the scroll and looked at Haruzen. He said, the missions had a few complications. You might still need to send a couple of squads led by elite Jaunans to sweep that place. Haruzen raised an eyebrow and wondered, you couldn't say that before I gave you the scroll? Why does it feel like I was baited into giving him this scroll? Also, what is this different feeling I am getting from Fujin? It's as if something about him has changed. He asked, what complications? Fujin said, I didn't do the mission and left it to my subordinates to complete it. Yugao acted as the leader. They encountered 25 Kiri ninjas, 5 Jounins, and 20 Chunins. All were eliminated by the three of them. Hiruzen was surprised to hear that. He had thought that Fujin was the one to cut down most of the Kiri ninjas. He thought, I didn't expect Yugao and the rest to kill five Jounins and twenty Chunins by themselves. Such efficiency. They have already exceeded the requirements of becoming an Umbu captain. Fujin continued, unfortunately, while they were fighting, Yugao was ambushed by Biwa Juzo, one of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist. Hiruzen's eyes widened. 
he asked, has he also gone rogue just in name? And is Yugao fine? At the same time, he wondered, why was Akatsuki there? Did he encounter Itachi as well? Fujin answered, I had thought the same as well. But that wasn't the case. Yugao and others are fine. I confronted Juzo while they eliminated the Kiri ninjas. I asked his intentions of fighting us several times. But he only said one thing. He said that he wanted the bounty on my head. From his actions, that seems to be the case. Hiruzen knew that Akatsuki was looking for funds. So he wasn't surprised by what Fujin said. He asked, All right. How did you manage to get away from him? Also, did he have any allies? Hiruzen hadn't heard about Itachi in a long while. So he was curious as to how he was doing. At the same time, there was some sorrow inside him due to what they had forced Itachi to do. Fuji nodded and said, Yeah, he had two allies. While we clashed, I sensed a being hiding in the forest and later underground. When I attacked it, it escaped. Some time later, Hashigaki Kisame arrived to reinforce Juzo. That being who escaped showed itself later. I am not sure what it was. It looked like a Venus flytrap plant. It had a humanoid body inside, one half of it was white while the other half was completely black. It certainly didn't look like a human. Hiruzen analyzed, that sounds like the Akatsuki member called Zetsu. To Hiruzen's surprise, Fujin tossed him a scroll. Hiruzen caught it and asked, What is this? Fujin answered, It contains Juzo's headless body. I tried to seal his head as well, but it was some distance away from me and Kisame destroyed it. Hiruzen's eyes widened. He instantly realized, I understand why I am getting this feeling from Fujin. Fujin continued, I managed to catch Juzo off guard thanks to Fuinjutsu. He wasn't aware of my expertise in it. Unfortunately, that is leaked now. I clashed with Kisame as well. Our information regarding him is incorrect. This guy is incredibly strong. His chakra is insanely high. He was in a whole different league as compared to Juzo. I didn't see any way of defeating him. Thankfully, I received some aid and managed to escape. Hozuki Mangetsu arrived with 24 hunter ninjas. I am not sure who informed him or why they were there. Anyways, in the fight, Kisame managed to kill seven hunter ninjas before escaping. I am not sure what Mangetsu did later. But considering that we killed 25 Kiri ninjas and Kisame killed seven more, they should have retreated from the land of hot water. The squads you send will just have to confirm that they did. Hiruzen nodded and said, The mission was indeed very complicated. It's good that everything went well. Fujin handed him a few scrolls and said, These scrolls have the dead bodies of the ninjas my teammates killed. Their memories can still be checked to understand what their mission was. Hiruzen nodded and replied, All right. Anything else? Fujin nodded and replied, Yes. Seeing the performance of Yuzuki Yugao and Yamanaka Fumito in this mission, I recommend both of them be promoted to the Umbu Captain ranks. Hana Banjiro is growing strong as well, but he still needs some time before he is ready to be promoted to the Umbu Captain rank. I will send a report later highlighting their performance in this mission. Hiruzen had expected Fujin to say that as he had made them complete the mission by themselves. He nodded and replied, I will have them take an Umbu promotion mission. Good work in ensuring that they become capable enough to reach this level. Fujin replied, I didn't do much. All three of them are highly motivated. They have grown stronger rapidly and are very well versed in Umbu's strategies and tactics. I'm sure they will become capable captains in the future. As he spoke, Fujin removed his mask. He looked into Hiruzen's eyes and said with a smile on his face, Just one more thing. I'm retiring from Umbu. Chapter 395 Hiruzen was stunned. His eyes widened. In the last few minutes, Fujin had given him one surprise after another. Be it the unfamiliar feeling, his team's performance or the involvement of Akatsuki. Juzo's death had shocked him the most, but he had still managed to hold it together. However, 
the sudden announcement of retirement completely shocked him. It was important to remember that Fujin had just turned 15. It was the age when most joined the Umbu. In all the decades that Hiruzen had been the Hokage, this was the first time anyone asked to retire from Umbu at such a young age. No, Fujin didn't even ask him. Fujin chuckled internally and thought, I don't know why, but seeing Hiruzen rattled is so exciting and satisfying. Hiruzen finally composed himself and asked, What do you mean? Fujin tilted his head and asked in a confused tone, What else can it mean? Hiruzen shook his head and asked, No. I mean, why do you want to retire? Fujin was an integral part of Hiruzen's plans. He wanted Fujin to take over the route or even become the Hokage depending on the situation. But for that to happen, Fujin needed a lot of accomplishments. And the Umbu was the perfect place to gain such achievements and to prove himself. Hiruzen even planned to replace his eldest son with Fujin as the commander of the Umbu to give him more exposure and experience. So Hiruzen didn't want Fujin to leave the Umbu. Taking inspiration from Hiruzen, Fujin faked a sigh full of tiredness and exhaustion and answered, For the last three years, I have been running around the elemental nations killing one guy after another. During this time, I have frequently encountered ninjas who were far stronger than me and would kill me had I made just one mistake. I am exhausted from all this killing and fighting on the edge. My recent clashes, be it with Rashi, IWA, or Kisame, all show me that I need to work on my jutsus a lot. But I barely have any time to train to make myself stronger while the enemies I face keep getting stronger. And between my training and missions, my schedule has become very hectic leaving me little or no time to rest. So. I want to retire from the Umbu and take a long break to learn new techniques and rest my mind. Hiruzen was speechless. He thought, hectic? He is the only Umbu who regularly asks for vacations. I just gave him a three-month-long vacation. And I rarely gave him a mission that required killing in the last year. Don't tell me he is complaining about not getting enough time to meditate in the training rooms. After nearly emptying all our wind crystal reserves, he is complaining about it. Hiruzen said, if you quit, you won't be able to train in the Umbu training facility. Fujin asked in a pleading tone, not even for a little while, Grandpa? Hiruzen said in a strict tone, no. The tactics he could use as a kid had long lost their effect on Hiruzen. Fujin sighed and said, that's unfortunate, but I expected as much. He thought, the wind crystals don't have any effect on me anymore. As for fire and earth, my affinity for them isn't very impressive. So the absorption speed is too slow for it to be of much help. So the elemental crystals are no longer of any help to me. Hiruzen was surprised. He analyzed, so it wasn't because he wanted more crystals. But why does he want to retire? It can't be because of exhaustion. Kakashi took missions non-stop for years without needing a break. So did I when I was younger. In fact, there has never been an elite Jounin in Kanoha who retired due to the workload. He asked, why don't you just take training breaks and continue being in the Umbu? Hiruzen sighed internally and thought, why does everyone keep giving me headaches? This kid barely ever socializes with anyone. He has almost no connections. I was planning to give him Umbu ninjas who are already ready to become Umbu captains and increase his influence through them but he wants to quit after influencing just two? How will I even increase his reputation enough to make him a possible candidate for Hokage? Hiruzen couldn't directly tell Fujin that he wanted to raise him to become the next Hokage. After all, he couldn't guarantee that Fujin would become the Hokage. Not to mention, telling something like that or even hinting it would create various complications. So, Fujin was unaware of Hiruzen's plans to make him the Hokage. In fact, the thought of competing for the Hokage position didn't even cross his mind. Despite his impressive talent, Fujin had no connection to any of the Hokage. The first and second Hokage were brothers. The third Hokage was a student of the second Hokage. The fourth Hokage was Jiraiya's student who was the third Hokage's student. In the future, the fifth Hokage would be the student of the third Hokage, the sixth Hokage would be a student of the fourth Hokage. 
while the seventh Hokage would be the student of the sixth Hokage and the son of the fourth Hokage. Fujin didn't have any such connections. Though he took advantage of Haruzen's weird obsession to become every kid's grandpa, he was well aware that their relationship wasn't as deep as Haruzen's relations with his students. Of course, the most important factor was that Fujin was aware of the future. Had Haruzen known how strong Naruto and Sasuke would grow in the future, he wouldn't have bothered spending so much effort on nurturing Fujin. So Fujin was in a weird spot. At the present time, due to his young age, he had no way of becoming the Hokage. If anything were to happen to Haruzen, both the Sanans and Kakashi had a much higher chance of becoming Hokage than him. His name might not even be brought up by the council and even Shikaku would be preferred over him despite being weaker than him. Even if he kept becoming stronger and gained a lot of achievements, six years later, Naruto's reputation would reach a level far beyond any other ninja in history. So Fujin didn't see much hope of becoming the Hokage. Even if he did, he wasn't particularly interested in the post. Though he did see some benefits of becoming the Hokage, such as getting access to all the forbidden jutsus, holding onto that post for a long time was something he wasn't interested in. Being a Hokage was a selfless and thankless job. While he did enjoy playing mind games, he wasn't particularly interested in doing that all the time. After all, it was fun to do so when Haruzen and Shikaku had to deal with all the consequences. It won't be the same when he would have to deal with such situations on a regular basis and clear up messes that others create. So, on this topic, Fujin and Haruzen weren't on the same page and both were completely unaware of each other's thoughts. Fujin didn't think much and replied, No, I think I'm done with the umbu. Sorry, Grandpa. Haruzen was lost for words. His last offer would have allowed Fujin to use the training rooms as much as he wanted. And still, Fujin rejected him. He understood that Fujin had already made up his mind. He sighed and said, All right. Let me know if you change your mind. Fujin nodded and said, I will. Thank you, Grandpa. He left the room and shut the door behind him. Haruzen let out another sigh and muttered, They are all the same. He thought, the weird feeling I got from Fujin earlier is the same one I got from Jiraiya, Tsunade, Orochimaru, and Minato. By killing Juzo, he should have understood that he is a rank S ninja. This realization brings about a change in mindset that is hard to determine. When Jiraiya reached this level, he left Kanoha and began touring around the world to fulfill his prophecy. When Orochimaru did, he began doing experiments. Tsunade didn't change much on the surface, but she became willful enough to try to forcefully revamp Kanoha's medical ninjas in the middle of a war. By comparison, Minato didn't change much other than becoming very confident in himself. I never imagined that Fujin would reach this level at such a young age and the changes he would experience would lead him to quitting Umbu. According to my estimates, I had thought that he would have needed at least four to five more years before reaching this level. That would have been enough for me to increase his reputation by several levels in Kanoha. But now! Haruzen had a massive headache. Chapter 396 Haruzen grabbed his smoking pipe and got up from his seat. He looked outside the window, staring at the Hokage faces as he thought, this brat is indeed good at giving headaches. No wonder Shikaku was so annoyed by him. So many plans I had made. All are useless now. His mind rapidly calculated what he could do next. After a few minutes, he concluded, without him being in the umbu, I can't increase his influence among the younger generation. And from his words, it looks like he doesn't intend to take missions unless they are compulsory to take. The only way I can increase his reputation now is if I tell everyone what his achievements are. But... A frown appeared on Haruzen's face as he continued thinking, but he wants to keep all his achievements a secret. Exposing them could make him resent me. And I can't casually say that he is the spectral swordsman without facing a diplomatic disaster. Even though everyone knew and believed that Fujin was the spectral swordsman, the smaller countries around Kanoha didn't act against Kanoha. They were already facing threats from other major villages and if they offended Kanoha as well, they would face a lot of problems. So they wanted to bury the whole thing as much as Kanoha did. 
As long as the spectral swordsmen didn't act openly against them, they wouldn't say a word. But, if Hiruzen was to openly admit that Fujin was the spectral swordsman, then those smaller countries would have no choice but to act against Kanoha and restrict their ties with Kanoha due to pressure from their own nobles and ninjas. So Hiruzen couldn't do that. He sighed again and muttered, the only way for him to become popular quickly now would be a war. As long as he kills several ninjas at Juzo's level in a war or kills hundreds of enemy ninjas in an open battle, his reputation would increase in no time at all. But until such a war happens, he won't be able to compete with Kakashi for my seat even if he becomes stronger than Kakashi. Leave it. Until a few years ago, I hadn't expected Fujin to become so strong. By killing Juzo, he has pretty much announced that he is a rank S ninja. As long as he doesn't completely slack off, he will reach around my level by the time he grows up. Having such a ninja is very beneficial for Kanoha, irrespective of how reputed he is or which post he has. And with his strength, gaining reputation won't take a long time once he decides to build some. Hiruzen decided to stop worrying about Fujin. He knew that strength was far more important than reputation. Though Fujin foiled his plans by quitting Umbu, Hiruzen could still make use of his strength when needed. In fact, he had already thought of one method to increase Fujin's fame within Kanoha immediately. He deactivated the seals and got back to work. As for the person who had just given Hiruzen a lot of headaches, he was chilling in his Umbu room, waiting for his teammates. Since he had nothing to do, he wondered, why was Hiruzen so desperate to keep me in the Umbu? My first guess was that he just wanted someone who could keep taking missions non-stop like how I was doing and how Kakashi was doing before me. But that last offer gave me a lot of advantages. To take long training breaks while an Umbu would have allowed me to go through the reserves of elemental crystals. Did he have any other intentions? Fujin thought for a bit, but couldn't think of any good reason. So he just kept thinking while waiting for his subordinates to arrive. In a few minutes, Yugao, Fumito, and Bunjiro arrived and saw Fujin sitting without his mask and in deep thought. Fujin looked up and noticed them. He smiled and said, You guys are finally here. Sit down. I have a few important announcements. Yugao and Fumito immediately guessed what it would have been about. After all, their last mission was a bit strange. They immediately sat down. As they expected, Fujin said, we have been working as a team for the last year. During this time, I have carefully observed your progress. And, I am very impressed by it. Especially you, Bunjiro. Your abilities and mission awareness have improved several times over the last year. You are now a full-fledged Umbu Ninja. However, you still need more experience and still need to improve the speed and scale of your wind and water jutsus. Bunjiro nodded and replied, Thank you, Captain. I will keep working on it. Fujin looked at Yugao and Fumito and said, Both of you were already very close to the Umbu Captain level a year ago. I have judged that both of you are ready to be the Umbu Captain right now. I have already talked with Lord Hokage. Both of you will be given Umbu promotion mission soon. Yugao and Fumito were immediately excited by the news. They said in unison, Thank you, Captain. Fuji nodded, looked at Bunjiro and said, Don't be discouraged. I'm sure you'll be able to take this mission in less than two years. Bunjiro replied, I understand, Captain. Don't worry, I will keep training under you. However, Fuji shook his head and said, Our team will be disbanded. I am quitting Umbu. Eagle will assign you a new squad. Fujin's words shocked his three subordinates. Just like Hiruzen, they didn't see any signs of Fujin retiring from the Umbu. In fact, they had the front row seats as they saw Fujin fight with opponents who were famed throughout the world and create one trouble after another. So this sudden announcement caught them off guard. Bunjiro asked, Why? Fujin shrugged and replied, I had some time to think about what I wanted to do during our training break. After thinking for a while, I decided to quit. All three were left speechless and looked at Fujin with a deadpan expression. Though Fujin had answered, it was equivalent to not saying anything. Fujin chuckled and said, 
don't worry. Take care of yourselves. Next time, I won't be around to back you up. Everyone nodded. Knowing that they won't be meeting very frequently in the future, Yugo, Fumito, and Bunjaro asked all the queries they had. Fujin answered all of them patiently. Around half an hour later, no one had anything more to say. Fujin said, though we won't meet up much in the future, you all know where I live. Feel free to visit if you need anything. Good luck with your future missions. Yugao, Fumito, and Banjaro said their farewells and thanked Fujin once again. All three took their leave. As he left, Banjaro thought, I was dreaming about becoming Umbu captain before I turned 16. To think that Fujin would quit Umbu at my age. Did he quit because the Umbu missions weren't challenging him? Banjaro had a lot of excitement in following Fujin's footsteps and becoming an Umbu captain. But he wasn't sure about it anymore. However, he still had the determination to become as strong as Fujin. Fujin packed up all his stuff from the room and thought, three years. I spent three years in the Umbu. During this period, my strength has increased from Jounin level to rank S. Though fighting other rank S ninjas will be fun, I have some things to do before that. Fujin left the Umbu headquarters and walked on the streets as he decided, now that I'm rank S and have also become a few Fujutsu Grandmaster, I can start implementing my ideas one by one. How successful I am in implementing them will indicate how much farther I can go. Once I am successful, I can begin taking advantage of the future events that I know will happen. Even though I did mess up with Suna badly, which could have some effect on Kanoha Crush, the events regarding Akatsuki shouldn't be influenced much. Though I did kill Juzo, he was supposed to die anyway. Kisame should join up with Itachi. Unless the one who killed Juzo can also kill Kisame, it won't have any effect on their activities. Anyways, for now. Fujin looked at the Ichiraku ramen stall and entered. He thought, though I don't need to eat due to the soldier pill, there is no harm in eating to treat myself. As soon as he entered, I am noticed him and said, Fujin, come in. What do you want to eat? Fujin sat down and replied, just the usual three bowls. I am said, coming right up. She immediately went to assist her father in making the ramen. Within a few minutes, the first bowl was ready. I am delivered it and Fujin began eating. Fujin ate, enjoying the delicious taste and the peace and tranquility. Suddenly, a certain someone came running into the stall and sat on the stool next to Fujin's and shouted, two miso ramens for me. Chapter 397, I am heard Naruto's shout and said, Wait for a few minutes, Naruto. I'll prepare it right away. She and Tuchi got to work while Fujin enjoyed his meal and Naruto impatiently waited for his. A few minutes later, I am brought out two bowls and placed them in front of Naruto and Fujin. Naruto immediately said loudly, Thank you, and dived into his bowl. Despite sounding happy, I am could clearly make out the annoyance in Naruto's voice. She asked, Did something happen in the academy, Naruto? Naruto replied, Iruka sensei failed me once again. I have to keep studying until next year. I am consoled him and said, Oh, don't worry, Naruto. I am sure you will pass with flying colors next year. Naruto replied enthusiastically, Of course I will. I will become the Hokage. Believe it! I am smiled noticing that Naruto wasn't depressed. Suddenly, she remembered that Fujin was sitting next to Naruto and realized, now that I think about it, I don't think Fujin and Naruto have ever met. That's weird. Both of them come here so frequently. It is strange that they never showed up at the same time. Despite finding it odd, I am didn't dwell on it for long. After all, her mind couldn't comprehend the fact that Fujin purposefully avoided Naruto until that day. She cheerfully said, Fujin, you haven't met with Naruto yet, right? Fujin looked up at her and asked in a questioning tone, Naruto? He looked at Naruto sitting beside him and asked, him? Naruto, who was busy eating, immediately looked up as he realized that Ayam was talking about him. He looked back at Fujin who was looking at him. I am introduced Fujin by saying, Naruto, he is Fujin. 
He is a very strong ninja. Though I am didn't know much about Fujin, she knew that he graduated at 10 and became a chunin at 11. Though there were a few other ninjas who became chunin at that age, their number was very low. So despite not knowing Fujin's real strength, her words were spot on. Hearing that Fujin was very strong from Ayam's mouth, Naruto was surprised. He looked back at Fujin to see that he was still staring at him without saying anything. He introduced himself, I am Uzumaki Naruto. I will become the Hokage. Believe it! Fujin replied, the Hokage, huh? Naruto looked into Fujin's eyes. I am noticed it and suddenly became nervous. She thought, ugh. I forgot that most villagers avoid Naruto for some reason. I hope Fujin isn't one of them. Tuchi also looked at Fujin. Though he liked Fujin, he didn't want anyone to mistreat Naruto. Fujin stared at Naruto just like the rest of the villagers. However, Naruto noticed some differences. The most important difference was that Fujin's gaze wasn't cold. Naruto was surprised and wondered, though he is staring at me, it doesn't feel like he hates me or wants me to disappear. But what is this look? Naruto had never seen someone looking at him in this manner. So he didn't understand that Fujin's gaze was full of curiosity and amusement. As someone who had seen Naruto several times, it was natural for Fujin to be curious towards him. Though he has observed Naruto several times, this was the first time he was interacting with him. This curiosity was something that no other person in Konoha had. As for the amusement part, Fujin couldn't help but think, in my previous world, we debated several times about who was the best manipulator in Naruto. The normal choices for the same would be Danzo, Orochimaru or even Black Zetsu at times. But, they don't come anywhere close to Haruzen. How the hell does someone, whose existence is not acknowledged, who has to hear things terrible enough to leave mental trauma on a daily basis for years, and who is pretty much hated by everyone, want to do nothing but look after and care for the very people who put him through such torture and be willing to give up his life for them? Fujin couldn't make any sense of it. He could only marvel at how capable Haruzen was. He even wondered whether the reason Haruzen kept Naruto in such circumstances was to fuel his dream of becoming the Hokage even further. However, even if that was the case, Fujin didn't agree with the method. He chuckled and said, Sure. And I will become the god of this world. Believe it! Fujin's reply left Iam, Tuchi, and Naruto speechless. None of them had expected such a reply. Soon, a smile appeared on Tuchi's face and Iam began giggling. Naruto's face immediately became red in embarrassment. He immediately jumped from his stool and shouted, Don't mock me. I will become the Hokage, believe it. Fujin chuckled and asked, Do you know of a Hokage that failed the graduation exam? Naruto immediately became a bit nervous and argued back, No. But I only failed in the clone jutsu. I can perform the substitution and the transformation jutsu perfectly. Fujin still maintained a sly smile and asked, Do you know of any Hokage that know only two jutsus? Lord Third is said to know every single jutsu in Konoha. Getting constantly berated by Fujin annoyed Naruto. He slammed his hand on the table while claiming, I will learn even more jutsus the. Suddenly, his eyes moved towards the table. His hand hit his ramen bowl causing it to move and fall. His eyes widened in horror as he saw the ramen bowl turn over and his precious ramen falling towards the ground. However, suddenly, it felt like a miracle took place. The ramen, which was falling towards the ground, suddenly stopped. Winds flowed around the falling ramen and the bowl. Naruto, Ayam and Tuchi saw an astonishment as all the falling ramen went back into the bowl and the bowl moved back to the table and floated around an inch above the table. Slowly, the bowl landed on the table and the winds moving around it dispersed. The entire room was quiet due to the sudden display. None of them had ever seen something like that. Naruto turned his attention towards Fujin and thought, how did he do that? I haven't even seen Iruka sensei do something like this. To see someone, who just said his dream was impossible, do something so crazy shocked him. However, his shock soon turned into excitement. 
His eyes almost sparkled as he said in excitement, that was so cool. How did you do that? Fujim replied, it's a basic application of wind nature manipulation. Naruto exclaimed, wind nature manipulation? That sounds cool. Can you teach it to me? Fujim raised an eyebrow and asked, teach you? He continued eating noodles as he said, it might be basic, but it is still very complicated. To learn, you will have to train for hours daily for months. Do you think you can focus on training that long? Naruto was surprised. This wasn't the first time he had asked anyone to teach in Jutsus. He had asked nearly all teachers in the academy and had also bugged Hiruzen when he met him. But this was the first time his request wasn't denied right away. Naruto said, Of course I can. I will train nonstop until I learn it. Believe it! Fujin asked, Do you know where Training Ground 23 is? Naruto replied, No, but I can find it in no time, believe it. Fujin said, All right. Show up there at five in the morning tomorrow. If you can learn how to control the wind as I can, then I'll believe that you can become the Hokage. Naruto was immediately elated. It was the first time anyone had agreed to teach him. He immediately shouted in excitement, I will be there and learn it in no time. Believe it! Naruto's reactions were completely like Fujin aspect. All his words to Naruto were well measured. He first made Naruto agitated by saying that his dream was impossible, then blew his mind with the sudden display and finally agreed to Naruto's request of teaching him and gave him a way of making him convince Fujin that he could become the Hokage. As a result, Fujin's impression in Naruto's eyes skyrocketed. Considering how few people treated Naruto well, Fujin's favorability immediately rose near the top in Naruto's eyes. Fujin sighed internally and thought, this is too easy. After engaging in mind games with Hiruzen, trying to manipulate Naruto is like going from insane difficulty mode to baby mode. He is lucky that I have no ill intentions. Fujin couldn't help but wonder, now that I think about it, doesn't Hiruzen always target little kids? Most of his will of fire speeches are given in the academy. He has influenced Naruto since he was young. The same could be said about Itachi. If Naruto and Itachi were older like me, would they have fallen for his manipulations? Tuchi and Ayam weren't aware of what was going through Fujin's mind. They just smiled. Though neither were ninjas, both were happy to see Naruto being treated well. Having interacted with Fujin for so long, they knew that he wouldn't harm Naruto or leave him hanging. Tuchi said, Your ramen is getting cold, Naruto. Eat it quickly. Naruto immediately began eating while Tuchi brought out the last two bowls of ramen. Chapter 398 Fujin finished up his bowls of ramen before Naruto. He got up and said, I'll be waiting for you tomorrow morning. Don't be late. Naruto quickly swallowed the noodles and said, I will be there on time. Believe it! Fujin nodded and left. As he left, he heard Naruto talking to Ayam in excitement claiming that he would be able to control winds like Fujin in no time. Naruto seemed to have already forgotten about failing the graduation exam. Fujin ignored it and began walking home. He sighed and thought, I forgot how much of a punk Naruto was. Even though it's understandable considering his situation, it'll be rather annoying to deal with all the time. Should I curtail it? Fujin thought for a bit before deciding, leave it. It's a thankless job and will require a lot of time and effort. I'll just have him act properly in front of me and compensate for that by filling his head with more prank ideas. As long as I'm not the one he annoys, I don't care. Besides, considering the amount of trauma he has, it will be better for him to let some of it out through pranks rather than bottling it all up. Fujin then began thinking about what to train Naruto in. Since Hiruzen had handed him the Flying Thunder God peacefully, he didn't intend to create much trouble for him. He thought, training Naruto. It is something I have contemplated for a long time. He recalled his analysis, the advantage of doing so is very simple. Naruto's stocks are set to explode in the future. And no one, including Naruto himself, knows about this. Investing in him at this time, when very few others have, 
will make him feel indebted to me and make him take my side or support me as long as I don't do anything that is totally against his morals. No, even if I do something evil, he will still fight for my forgiveness. So, if some of my future plans go horribly wrong and put me in a dangerous situation or make me an enemy of the elemental nations, I will always have a path of retreating. Regardless, if things happen just as in the canon, there are only benefits in doing this. Even if things don't pan out the same, having a rank S ninja that I can easily influence is something invaluable. However, there is a big problem with this. If I train Naruto, and if that helps him become stronger quicker than the canon timeline, then the story could change in ways that I might not be able to calculate, costing my advantage of future knowledge. And the changes start at a very basic level. For instance, if my training somehow makes him competent enough to learn the clone jutsu, then he will graduate and Mizuki won't be able to make him steal the scroll. That would mean that Naruto wouldn't learn the multi-shadow clone jutsu until the sun rises from the west and Kakashi or Jiraiya decides to teach him the jutsu that is tailor-made for him. And I have no idea how much that would impact his ability to fight or even survive in his future fights. Luckily, this change is easy to see and fix. I can just teach him the multi-shadow clone jutsu myself as a gift for graduating. Though I will lose my chance to sneak a peek at the contents of the Forbidden Scroll, I doubt the scroll he stole was the actual Forbidden Scroll. There's no way the Haruzen I know would be this careless. But regardless, such changes will happen in the future. At least the events during the Chunin exams will change. Fortunately, the major events, like Akatsuki's movements, shouldn't be affected by the increase in his strength. Suna and Odo's invasion might be affected, but that's more due to me rather than Naruto. Fujin let out a sigh and muttered, so many complications. What do you want? As Fujin walked, he reached a street that was completely deserted. In an instant, a masked ninja, wearing the Umbu outfit, appeared behind Fujin. The masked ninja heard Fujin's question and said in a monotonous tone, stay away from Uzumaki Naruto. Without turning around to face him, Fujin asked in a plain tone, why? The ninja answered, Lord Hokage's orders. Fujin replied, that's funny. I don't recall him passing such orders. So why don't you stop beating around the bush and say the real reason? The ninja was surprised. He didn't expect someone to actually question him back. After all, very few ever questioned the umbu. He said, UCA. However, Fujin cut him off and said, I thought Root was dissolved. What are you doing keeping an eye on the citizens of Kanoha? Fujin was very well aware of Umbu's operating style. During the last three years, he had gone on combined missions with several teams. So it was very easy for him to realize that the ninja behind him wasn't from Umbu. The Root Ninja was shocked once again. Not only did the youngster in front of him not obey him, but he also revealed his identity. Not knowing how to handle the situation, he released a bit of his killing intent at Fujin and said, Do as you are told. For the first time, Fujin turned his head and looked into the eyes of the Root Ninja. In the next second, the Root Ninja immediately jumped away. His eyes widened in shock and disbelief as sweat appeared behind his mask. He wondered, Who is he? And how many people did he kill? Instead of backing out, Fujin had unleashed his own killing intent at the Root Ninja. As someone who had spent the better part of the last three years killing a large number of ninjas and nobles, the amount of people he killed far exceeded what the Root Ninja had. Though Fujin couldn't compare to Juzo in this regard, a Root Ninja, who wasn't even at the Jounin level, wasn't his match. Since the entire killing intent was focused on him, the Root Ninja couldn't endure it. He felt that he would lose his life if he didn't move away from Fujin. Fujin muttered, The next time you or any other root ninja sneaks up on me, I won't be polite. Without looking back, Fujin walked away. The root ninja was still in shock. It was his first time seeing someone from Kanoha who had no regard for either the umbu or the root. He wondered, Who is that guy? All ninjas are very polite towards the umbu. If they know that I am from root, they become even more polite and slightly fearful. But he directly threatened me and other root ninjas? 
he quickly retreated and rushed towards the underground root base. Fujin ignored him and continued walking home. He thought, that's weird. I thought all root ninjas would be aware of me. Even if Danzo didn't tell them, do they not read the bingo book? That said, he felt quite weak and was probably only at the Chunin level. Maybe Danzo kept him busy for some mission. Regardless, Danzo has gone completely silent. I had expected him to do something after spying on me. Though I didn't sense anyone later, I am sure that he still kept an eye on me. But it's been nearly three months. And I also went out on a mission. It is strange that he hasn't tried anything. The main reason why I was so provocative in this little interaction is to see what Danzo would do now. If he has some malicious intentions, then this would provide him a good excuse to take action. Even if he doesn't take any action, I'll be able to get some clues on his intentions. Fujin was very interested in seeing Danzo's schemes. If Danzo hadn't tried spying on him, Fujin would have ignored his existence until it was the right time. But since Danzo displayed some intentions against him, Fujin knew that just waiting passively would give all initiative to Danzo. Once he ascertained Danzo's intentions, he would have a better idea of how to proceed forward. Fujin reached his home and entered the basement. He finally took out the scroll and opened it as he muttered in excitement, Flying Thunder God Jutsu. Finally, I can learn it. He immediately began reading all the information regarding it. While Fujin began studying, a figure appeared in the underground base of Root. He was the same Root ninja who tried warning Fujin. He went straight to Danzo and after getting permission, entered it. He bowed respectfully and said in a hurry, Danzo-sama, there is an issue. A shinobi interacted with Uzumaki Naruto and promised to train him. I warned him and asked him to stay away from Naruto, but he refused to do so. Danzo was surprised. He asked, didn't you threaten him? Sweat gathered behind the root ninja's mask as he recalled how his threat went. Chapter 399, the root ninja nervously reported, I tried, but he arrogantly claimed that the Hokage didn't tell him to stay away from Uzumaki Naruto. Then he somehow recognized that I was from the root and asked what I was doing keeping an eye on the citizens of Konoha. When I tried to threaten him, he unleashed his killing intent and forced me to retreat. I'm not sure who it was, but that ninja has killed a lot of ninjas. Danzo was surprised. He wondered, who did he encounter? And since when did someone start threatening root ninjas? He asked, who was it? The root ninja replied, I didn't identify him, but when he was inside the Ichiraka ramen shop, I overheard that he was called Fujin. Danzo's eyes immediately widened before going back to their usual size. He wondered, Suzuki Fujin? Hasn't he gone to the land of Waterfall? The two squads I sent to the land of Earth even made a Wagakure Senkitsuchi and a few dozen Jounins to set a trap for him there. Why is he still here? The Root Ninja was surprised to not receive any response from Danzo. He looked up and asked, Danzo-sama? Danzo replied, I will look into it. For now, stay away from him. Continue spying on Uzumaki Naruto, but maintain distance. The Root Ninja nodded and left. Unlike his steady voice, Danzo's mind was in a mess. He calmed himself down and analyzed, did Tiger make a mistake in identifying him? No, that's unlikely. So why is Suzuki Fujin back in Konoha? Or could it be possible that he never left? Danzo analyzed for a few minutes and concluded, no, he should have left the village. Otherwise, Toriyu would have informed me. The mistake I made should be in assuming the mission he took. He should have taken a different mission that allowed him to return so quickly. But which mission did he take? While Danzo was aware of the mission issued by the daimyo of the land of hot water, he wasn't informed that Fujin's squad had taken that mission. Hiruzen and Eagle didn't have any reason to inform him and they continued creating a strong squad to send to that mission in spite of the fact that Fujin's squad had taken the mission. So Danzo was completely clueless. He continued thinking, I will find that out later. For now, the important question is why he wants to teach the Nine Tails Jinchuriki? Naruto was someone who Danzo wanted to control. 
Unfortunately, Haruza never allowed him that. However, Danzo used the political situation in Konoha and Haruzen's worries perfectly to ensure that no one else managed to gain control over Naruto either. For Fujin to suddenly take an interest in Naruto baffled Danzo. He analyzed that ramen shop. Torian said that Fujin visits it frequently. And so does Uzumaki Naruto. That is the only common point between the two of them. But if that's the case, why did he wait for so long before taking an interest in him? And what gives him the confidence to offend Root for that boy? He realized, it feels like I am missing something. Something important should have happened in these last three to four days. I need to gather sufficient information to understand what the situation is. Only then I can decide what move to make. Danzo immediately understood that he was missing a lot of information. So despite Fujin's provocation, he decided to not respond and decided to wait until he had a better picture of the situation. Inside his basement, Fujin had gone through all the information inside the scroll. He thought, of all the scrolls I have seen in this world, this one is the most detailed one. It contains the optimal method of learning this jutsu. It contains a ridiculous amount of theory on space-time ninjutsu. It also contains Tobarama's research leading to the creation of this jutsu and how Minato improved upon it. And despite saying that he doesn't have any talent in this field, Hiruzen has still added his thoughts and tips in this scroll. Fujin took a deep breath and recalled the method of learning the Flying Thunder God. He summarized, the process of learning the Flying Thunder God jutsu is divided into several steps. And each of these steps is extremely difficult. The first step is learning to make the seal required for this jutsu. In terms of complexity, this seal can be considered to be at a higher level than the four symbol seal. This means that if the ninja isn't a grandmaster in Fuin Jutsu or close to that level, it will be impossible to even complete the first step of this jutsu. However, there is one shortcut Minato created so that seal masters who show some affinity to space time ninjutsu could learn this seal as well. Of course, its effect isn't as good as learning the seal yourself. Regardless, for me, this step should be the easiest. The second step is sensing the space coordinates of the seals I create. Sensing space coordinates is different from normal sensing. I can't use my chakra field. Instead, I will have to use a space-time sensing technique to sense its location. This step is very difficult. According to what Aruzen wrote, he failed at this step. Almost everyone who tried learning the Flying Thunder God Jutsu fails at this stage. This step shows whether you have an affinity for space-time ninjutsu or not. I suspect that the reason why Ginma and the other two were selected by Minato is that they should have shown some talent in this step. Though they aren't grandmasters in Fuin Jutsu, the scroll states that Minato developed a simpler version of this Jutsu. The Thunder God Formation Technique I suspect that he somehow created the seals himself for the three of them to sense. It's likely that Minato tested every eligible ninja and found just the three of them. Or perhaps there were more but they couldn't complete the last step. Sigh, I hope I am able to complete this step. Fortunately, Minato made this step a bit simpler by improving the structure of the seals slightly. It decreases the time needed to sense the seals and makes sensing over longer distances easier. According to what Haruzen added, it was only due to these improvements done by Minato that Kanoha began discovering more ninjas who have talent for space-time ninjutsu. The third and final step is the main step. After sensing the seal, I have to move to that location. It sounds a bit similar to the summoning jutsu, or rather, the reverse summoning jutsu. Basically, I have to be summoned to the location of the seal. Only, there is one big issue. During reverse summoning, the one who does the reverse summoning uses his or her chakra to do so. But here, there is no one to do that at the seal. Another issue is that reverse summoning needs a lot of chakra. To do that a few times will be fine. But doing that hundreds or even thousands of times repeatedly like how Minato would do, would use up all the chakra in an instant. The initial form of this jutsu that Tobarama created actually used this concept. Minato's Thunder God Formation Technique also uses this principle. So, the initial form of this jutsu couldn't actually be considered teleportation. 
It was a long-distance movement jutsu that Tobarama created by using numerous existing concepts and techniques. Though it was still remarkable, it wasn't very usable in battle. Understanding the drawbacks, Tobarama improved the step to actually moving through space-time and arriving at the location of the seal in an instant. This consumes far less chakra and is much faster, making it viable to use in combat. However, it is far more difficult to learn. Regardless, as long as I succeed in step 2, even if I fail in this step, I could still copy the reverse summoning trick and use this jutsu for traveling long distances. Of course, if I manage to master step 3 as well. A wide grin appeared on Fujin's face. His speed was already ridiculously high. Apart from the top-tier ninjas, no one could keep up with him at his current level. His vacuum jutsus and fuin jutsu further restricted his opponents. However, if he were to add the flying thunder god jutsu to his arsenal, he would become the fastest ninja alive in a heartbeat. Even the fourth rakage and abito would struggle to keep up with him. Fujin calmed himself and muttered, I need to learn this first. I can get excited later. In an instant, a hundred shadow clones appeared in the basement. Everyone began learning the Flying Thunder God Seal. While Fujin occupied himself in learning the Flying Thunder God Seal, Shikaku entered Hiruzen's office and asked, What is the matter this time? Hiruzen looked at Shikaku and said seriously, Fujin took the mission in the land of hot water with his squad. He returned some time ago. Shikaku immediately had a dark expression. He sighed and thought, I will miss my next few months' sleep. Chapter 400 Hiruzen noticed Shikaku's expressions. Though he was amused, his mind was still occupied by Fujin's resignation. He thought, without Fujin creating trouble, Shikaku will become lazy again. I need to think of something to keep him busy now. Shikaku muttered, Say it. What upheaval did that boy cause this time? Sorrow could be heard in Shikaku's tone. It was as if someone was about to steal his most precious belongings and he could do nothing but see it happening with his eyes. Hiruzen looked at his umbu guards, who immediately left the room and locked all the doors and windows. Hiruzen activated the seals and said he encountered the Akatsuki organization as well as the Mizukage faction during the mission. Shikaku was puzzled. He asked, what was that mercenary organization doing there? Aren't they active in the West? Hiruzen replied, Fujin couldn't figure that out. Our only guess right now is that they received a mission in the land of hot water and encountered them fighting. Regardless, Biwa Juzo wanted to collect his bounty and was killed by Fujin. Shikaku was shocked. He asked, he killed Juzo? Hiruzen nodded. Shikaku immediately became serious as he analyzed the implications. He said, Killing Juzo will imply that Fujin is a rank S ninja. And he is merely 15 years old. Shikaku was stunned. Knowing all the shit Fujin pulled over the last year, Shikaku expected Fujin to reach that stage. But he didn't expect him to reach it so quickly. Hiruzen nodded and said his victory wasn't a fluke. He also found out more information. Hiruzen informed Shikaku about Fujin's analysis of Kisame and mentioned Zetsu's abilities. He even told him about the actions of the Mizukage faction. Shikaku analyzed everything thoroughly and said, The Mizukage faction is getting desperate. If the fourth Mizukage falls, then their faction will collapse in no time. Kisame's power is a surprise. But we didn't hear much about him after the end of the last war. For his strength to rise significantly over the last decade, though difficult, isn't impossible. That plant-like creature sounds like it will be good at spying and infiltration. We may need to upgrade our barriers considering that it was able to hide within Fujin's chakra field. The more important question is, would the mercenary organization retaliate? Hiruzen shook his head and answered, unlikely. It's not a hidden village. So they don't have the same sense of camaraderie. And this isn't the first time one of them has been killed. So it is very unlikely. Shikaka didn't have much information about Akatsuki's movements and actions. He was worried about such high-level ninjas ambushing Kanoha ninjas on the field. But since Hiruzen wasn't worried, Shikaku stopped thinking about it. 
However, he was puzzled. He asked, everything sounds well. Why did you call me? Shikaka thought, I was expecting a lot of work, but so far, he has only given me good news. The Mizukich faction will retreat from the land of hot water. One deadly rogue ninja is dead and no one will avenge him. And, Konoha has a new and young rank as ninja. This would make the village's position very stable. Did he call me here to just give me good news? Haruzen sighed and said, Fujin resigned from the umbu. He will be taking a long break to train and rest. Shikaku's eyes widened. He exclaimed in shock, he resigned. Almost immediately, his shock changed into delight. He thought, Fujin retired from Umbu and will take a long break? Unbelievable! He indeed called me to give me good news. Fujin had been a huge headache for Shikaku. In fact, Suno was still sending ninjas to the fire capital occasionally. In addition, the situation with the Wabakir was continuously getting tense ever since Fujin and Rashi clashed. Though nothing happened on the ground, the tensions always existed. So Shikaku was always very busy. He had to move around Kanoha ninjas several times and had to recalibrate Kanoha's strategy very frequently. Considering Fujin's age, Shikaku had mentally prepared himself to be continuously tortured for at least a decade. This sudden news was like an unexpected blessing for him. With Fujin no longer taking missions actively, Shikaku felt like a large amount of pressure was lifted from his shoulders. Hiruzen said, you could at least act to not be so pleased. Shikaku coughed and said, I am just happy that our village has a new rank as ninja. It will make planning much simpler in the future. Kakashi and Gai should be close to or at the same level as Fujin as well. In a few more years, Kanoha will regain the influence lost due to Minato's death and Orochimaru's betrayal. Hiruzen nodded. What Shikaku said was completely true. He had increased the number of Kanoha ninjas as well as the number of Jounins aggressively in the last few years. Once Kanoha gained three new rank S ninjas, it would bring them closer to the strength they had during the previous war. However, he clearly knew that it wasn't the reason for Shikaku's happiness. Hiruzen said, I called you here because I need your opinion on a matter. Shikaku became serious and asked, What is it? Hiruzen said, With Fujin no longer a part of Umbu, I can't use my previous method to increase his reputation. Shikaku recalled the conversation he had with Hiruzen a year ago. He nodded. Hiruzen continued, So I have decided to do that using two methods. The first one is promoting him to elite Jounin officially. That shouldn't be an issue. However, I'm not sure what the impact would be of the second method. I want your opinion on it. Shikaku listened carefully. Despite his intelligence, Hiruzen's next words surprised him. Hiruzen said, I am planning to create a new seat in the council. A council member who will represent the civilian ninjas. And I want to give that to Fujin. Shikaku hadn't expected Hiruzen to think of such a thing. He immediately began analyzing if it was feasible. After some time, he said, until now, civilian ninjas don't have a seat on the council. Though Jiraiya and Orochimaru participated at times, it was due to their status as the Sanans. Fujin doesn't have the same reputation and influence as they did. But if you create a new seat, that won't be an issue. Creating a new seat should be fine as well as there are already a few non-ninja civilians on the council to handle the civilian matters. The only issue is Fujin himself. He is still too young. And, we clan leaders represent our clans. But, can Fujin really represent all the civilian ninjas? Currently, the number of civilian ninjas far exceeds that of any clan. Since he doesn't have any fame here apart from his bounty and his title, it will raise a lot of questions and perhaps some dissatisfaction from the civilian ninjas. Do you need to give him that post so impatiently? There is no harm in waiting for a few more years. Hiruzen replied, I have been sending him on almost all negotiations. If I don't give him a seat on the council, then other countries will think that I am sending the spectral swordsmen to intimidate them during negotiations. But if he is an official council member, then it sends an entirely different message. 
At the same time, it gives him the authority to close deals. As for his reputation and dissatisfaction from others, it isn't an issue. With time, as his strength gets slowly exposed, his reputation will grow by itself and the voices of dissatisfaction will disappear as well. Shikaku nodded and said, That's true. All right, go ahead. I'll ask Inoichi and Choza to support your proposal. The civilians will support you easily as well. So there shouldn't be any trouble in passing the proposal to create a new seat even if some clan leaders or elders oppose that. Though Fujin's appointment might face some opposition, it can be easily resolved by informing the clan leaders about Juzo's death. None of the clan leaders would oppose him in that case. Hiruzen nodded. He discussed a bit more with Shikaku before letting him go. As Shikaku appeared back in his office, a smile appeared on his face. He thought, that troublemaker finally quit. This was a good surprise. I can finally sleep no. Suddenly Shikaku's eyes widened as he realized something. He thought, wait a minute. Why did Hiruzen allow Fujin to retire? Does that mean anyone can retire? Why does he keep blocking my retirement plans then? I need to know how Fujin convinced Hiruzen to let him go. Fujin was unaware of Hiruzen's plans. He was more concerned about Hiruzen's friend instead. He worked on the seal all night until an alarm rang. Fujin shut the alarm and thought, I lost track of time. It is 4.45 in the morning. Naruto should arrive soon. That's the end of this tale for now. Thank you for watching. I appreciate the recent support and with that being said I'll see you in part 9. Peace.